Welcome to the CCSP Exam Cram 2023 edition. This is the complete course designed to help you get further faster in your exam prep. With coverage of all six domains of the CCSP exam, along with exam prep strategy guidance leveraging proven learning techniques used successfully by many thousands before you. As someone in a cybersecurity leadership role who works with these technologies every day, I'm certain you're going to find the CCSP exam challenging, but equally confident you'll find the skills you take away very relevant in your future cybersecurity roles. More importantly, last year I helped hundreds of thousands just like you achieve cybersecurity certifications like the Security Plus, the CISSP, and now bringing that formula to the CCSP exam to help you prepare for exam day without the need for expensive boot camps. And because this is the complete course, we'll be covering all six domains from the CCSP exam and covering every line item from the official CCSP exam syllabus. And you'll notice the domains have approximately equal weighting from domain one to domain six, so we'll be giving these equal time throughout this course. As always, I recommend the CCSP Official Exam Study Guide and Practice Test Bundle to help prepare, which includes a thousand practice questions, two practice exams, and flashcards to help you review. You can find a link to the latest and least expensive copy on Amazon.com in the video description. Because it's frequently requested, I've included a PDF copy of these presentation materials in the video description so you can download and review at your leisure as you prepare for exam day. And I've also included a clickable table of contents in the video description so you can jump forward and back throughout this video and indeed throughout the series as you prepare for the exam. So let's talk a moment about the exam itself. So the last update to the CCSP was in 2022 on August 1st, the new version was released. It includes now 150 questions up from 125. That includes 50 unscored pretest questions, which in the words of ISC squared are included to help protect the security and integrity of the exam. They're really protecting against question dumps, sometimes called brain dumps, which are against the NDA of the exam and truth be told, very unnecessary anyway. This is a multiple choice exam. It's four hours in length. It used to be three hours when ISC squared added the extra questions. They added an hour to the allotted time. Now, in terms of experience, candidates must have a minimum of five years cumulative paid work experience in information technology, as well as three years in information security and one year or more in one of the six domains of the CCSP common body of knowledge. However, there's a nice surprise. If you earn ISC squared's CISSP credential, that can be substituted for the entire CCSP experience requirement. CISSP comes with its own five-year experience requirement, albeit less specific than the CCSP, but you can just wipe that off the map by taking the CISSP exam. And I have a link to my free CISSP exam cram course. That's a very popular cert with employers and a great exam to focus on when you're three to five years into your cyber career. Passing score for the CCSP, 700 of 1,000 possible points. And there is no award for longest study time, so I recommend you make the most of your time and you knock this exam out in the least amount of time you need to master this material. So I'd like to talk for just a moment about my recommended exam preparation strategy. I have a number of techniques here that have a lot of science behind them to help you get further, faster in your exam prep. I wanna start by talking about the power of repetition. In particular, I want to talk about a technique called spaced repetition. So every time you study a piece of material, over time, you're going to forget part of what you've learned. We call that the forgetting curve. But what you'll find through repetition is that with each repeating session, you're going to remember a bit more for a bit longer. So in other words, the forgetting curve becomes a bit longer and a bit shallower with repetition. So how much time does it take to remember anything for the long term anyway? So to memorize material quickly, 
you'll need to go through that process of spaced repetition in shorter cycles, repeating right after learning and then a few minutes to a few hours apart. This is great if you're trying to remember content for the short term. You're doing it all within potentially even a couple of days. And this can be effective if there are just rough spots that you have that you can't quite commit to memory just before exam day. Now, to remember concepts for a long time, we need to space those repetitions, those repeating sessions out uh, from a few minutes to a few hours to a few minutes and then days, weeks, and even months potentially. So you can see the process is parallel, but the space between the repetitions uh, makes a difference in how long we commit that information to memory. And that actually explains why those five-day, $3,000 boot camps are actually so effective in getting you through exam day. They cram a lot of material in there, you repeat it quite a few times, and you remember it long enough to get through that exam. Many of us were labeled as a specific type of learner as children, perhaps a visual learner, or an auditory learner, or even a tactile learner. Since that time, research has actually shown that everyone benefits from a variety of sources. So I recommend you mix and match the techniques you like best as you prepare for the exam. That might include targeted reading from the official study guide, practice exams, live quiz or flashcard review, per perhaps with a partner, PowerPoint review, you can review the PDF that comes with this course, and video content like this course tends to be my anchor. I like to use video learning and then mix in other techniques to fill in my rough spots. But Mix, match, and repeat based on your preferences. Now, there's a question I get a lot, and that is, what do I mean by targeted reading? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, use the official study guide for topics you are struggling with, but not as a book you will read cover to cover. Use it when and where you need it to make the most of your time. Very unlikely, cover to cover in the official study guide is going to be your best approach. And it's also been shown that understanding concepts before you attempt to memorize greatly improves retention because you understand what it is you're trying to memorize. It's not simply memorizing words. All right, so let's get down to business in domain one, cloud concepts, architecture, and design. Again, I will cover every topic mentioned in the exam syllabus, and I'm also going to incorporate examples of concepts using different cloud providers when possible to supplement your knowledge in areas where you may not have exposure to a cloud service provider yet. The CCSP exam is what we'd call vendor agnostic. It doesn't focus on a specific vendor like AWS or Microsoft Azure, but you'll find that the examples I provide give you context to help you more effectively remember the concepts. So I'd like to talk for a moment about what the official study guide calls exam essentials critical exam topics that according to the guide are very important to remember for the exam. Not the only topics, but definitely amongst the most important. For domain one, they call out the different roles in cloud computing, like service providers, service partners, access service brokers, identifying the key characteristics of cloud computing, like on-demand self-service, multi-tenancy, elasticity, and scalability. Explaining the three cloud service categories, IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, and the differences between them. Describing the five cloud deployment models, public, private, hybrid, community, and multi-cloud. Identifying important related technologies. And you see a lot of cutting edge modern tech here, machine learning, AI, DevSecOps, quantum, we're going to touch on all of them. And finally, shared considerations in the cloud interoperability, portability, privacy, resiliency. We'll touch on them all, and I'm going to give you a tour of the shared responsibility model for cloud, which will provide a foundation that makes onboarding all the concepts related to this exam much easier. So let's get into 1.1, which is understanding cloud computing concepts. We have cloud computing definitions, so literally the definition of cloud computing according to NIST. Cloud computing roles and responsibilities. You're going to hear some roles here you've probably heard of, like cloud service provider, and others maybe you haven't. We'll touch on key cloud computing characteristics. What are the promises of the cloud? Concepts like on-demand self-service, broad network access, multi-tenancy, 
elasticity and scalability, and just as importantly, what's the difference between those two. And we'll finish out 1.1 with building block technologies, diving into virtualization, storage, networking, databases, and orchestration, again with examples from your various cloud service providers wherever I can give them to you. First up is NIST Special Publication 800-145, which is the NIST definition of cloud computing. This is a model for enabling universal, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources that might include networks, servers, storage, apps, and services. It depends on the cloud category and the specific service we're working with that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. And that's the promise of the cloud, that resource consumption for the customer is easier while the cloud service provider handles the care and feeding of the underlying cloud infrastructure. And now on to cloud computing roles, we'll begin with cloud service provider. That's the company that provides the cloud-based platform, the cloud infrastructure, and applications to other organizations, to customers, as a service. Examples here, Amazon's AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, those are the big three. If you see the CSP acronym in a question, they're talking about the cloud service provider, not to be confused with cloud services partner. A cloud services partner is a company that helps organizations to obtain and deploy cloud services. They may offer consulting services, they may offer software that runs in the cloud, or both. On the services side, Avanade, Tata, Accenture, all good examples of big cloud services partners. Next, we have the customer. That's the business or individual consuming the cloud services from the CSP. They're often using public cloud to complement or augment existing on-premises compute, resulting in a hybrid cloud configuration, currently the most common cloud implementation. And then we have the cloud service auditor. This is a third party that can conduct an independent assessment of cloud services, information systems operations, performance, security, around the cloud implementation. Truly, the audit scope may vary. The key here is an independent assessment. That means the auditor is external to the customer or CSP organization. Then we have the cloud broker. This is an entity that manages the use, performance, and delivery of cloud services. So more directly, they often negotiate relationships between cloud service providers and cloud service consumers. So between the CSP and the customer, they serve as an intermediary, an advisor, a negotiator between customer and CSP. So let's go a level deeper on the functions of a cloud broker. So they may serve in the area of service intermediation. So enhancing a given service by improving specific capabilities and providing value added services to the cloud consumer, to the customer. They may help with service aggregation. This is where we combine and integrate multiple services into one or more new services. And then service arbitrage, which means the broker has the flexibility to choose services from multiple agencies, potentially resulting in a multi-cloud architecture. Now let's take a look at a few other cloud computing roles. These are less likely to appear on the exam, but just in case worth knowing before you walk into the exam room. There's the cloud administrator responsible for implementation, monitoring, and maintenance of the cloud, not unlike a systems administrator on-prem. Cloud application architect, the person who's adapting, porting, and deploying the applications. Let's talk about that word porting for a moment. So porting an application means moving that application, its associated services and databases, from an on-premises environment to the cloud. That may include some refactoring to prepare that application for operation in the cloud. And we have the cloud architect who designs and develops solutions, so not unlike an architect on-premises. The cloud operator responsible for daily operational tasks the cloud data architect who manages data storage and data flow within as well as to and from the cloud. So you may notice a pattern here that some of these roles, while they have the word cloud in them, definitely look parallel to roles that we've seen in IT on-premises. 
We have the cloud service manager responsible for business agreement and pricing for the cloud customer. So maybe working as an employee within the customer, negotiating contracts with the CSP or partners. We have cloud storage administrator managing storage volume and repository assignment configuration and potentially security. The cloud service business manager overseeing business and billing administration. So this is the person doing the uh, paperwork with regards to paying that bill, that operational expenditure. And then cloud service operations manager who prepares systems, operations, and support for the cloud and administers services. And the further we went down this list, the more niche I'd say these roles are. You're not going to see all of these roles in any organizations, and, and most of them certainly only in the larger organizations. So finishing out cloud computing roles, one more less likely to appear on the exam, but important to mention, the Managed Security Service Provider, or MSSP, which is a company that maintains the security environment for companies running in the cloud. They may manage firewalls, IDPS, your SIM solutions, and other security services and infrastructure. And they may even provide an outsourced security operations center that's staffed to monitor security operations and provide incident response. Now we're going to take a look at key cloud computing characteristics, those characteristics common in cloud platforms and services. There's on-demand self-service, where customers can scale their compute and storage needs with little or no intervention or prior communication from the provider, from the CSP. They can use what they want, when they want. And their technologists can access cloud resources almost immediately when they need to do their jobs, providing agility in service delivery. They're going to be more responsive. And broad network access. Services are consistently accessible over the network regardless of the user's physical location. And it's no accident for this reason that your big CSPs all have a global presence across not only every major continent but across the busiest countries and regions within those countries. So close points of presence. We have multi-tenancy, which means many different customers share use of the same computing resources. Physical servers that support our workloads might be the same physical servers supporting other customers' workloads. And the underlying cloud infrastructure, the compute, the storage, the networking, it's all shared, and shared generally by multiple customers. You should also be familiar with the concept of oversubscription. Cloud providers are going to oversubscribe their total capacity, which means they'll sell more capacity than they actually have. So why would they do that? Well, because in the big picture, customers won't collectively be using all of that capacity simultaneously. And this is true in IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS scenarios, all three. Now, the level of cloud service provider responsibility will vary in those IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS scenarios. We'll talk about that in the shared responsibility model later in this video. We have rapid elasticity and scalability. This allows the customer to grow or shrink the IT footprint as necessary to meet their compute needs, their storage needs, without excess capacity. These two are related, but they're unique. So let's talk about the difference between elasticity and scalability. Elasticity is the ability of a system to automatically grow and shrink based on app demand. Capabilities can basically be rapidly provisioned and deprovisioned. Think auto scale, scaling out and scaling in, adding additional instances quickly, auto deploying these instances. They are ephemeral instances available only for the time they are needed. Scalability, on the other hand, is the ability of a system to handle growth of users or work, the ability to grow as demand increases. The scalability is generally controlled by a SKU or service tier selection or the number of instances you're deploying. Scalability is more about deploying the necessary capacity for steady state operations day to day. Elasticity is adding that burst capability when we have sudden increases in traffic. Then there is resource pooling. This enables the cloud provider, the CSP, to apportion resources as needed across multiple customers. So resources are not underutilized and they're also not overutilized or overtaxed. 
This enables the provider to make capital investments that greatly exceed what any single customer could provide on their own using their own budget in their own data center. And it allows the provider, the CSP, to meet demands from multiple customers while remaining financially viable, while remaining profitable. One of the downsides here is this can result in some degree of location dependence that's beyond the customer's control. However, most of your major CSPs, and I'm talking about AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform off the top of my head, do generally provide flexible options enabling customers to choose location even in their SaaS offerings. And the ability for a customer to choose location can be very important in data residency compliance. So if our data needs to reside in a particular country, as would be true in Germany and potentially in the EU with GDPR, that flexibility to choose where data resides in particular is one that is top of mind. And rounding out cloud computing characteristics, let's talk about measured service, which means that almost everything you do in the cloud is metered. It's measured and tracked for management and billing. And your cloud providers will measure metrics of resource consumption. They'll be looking at the number of minutes a virtual server is running. They'll look at the amount of disk space you consume. They'll look at the number of function calls you make in a serverless scenario and potentially the amount of network egress and ingress. Generally with cloud service providers, network ingress, so getting data into the cloud is free, but when you try to take it out, you're often going to pay for that. It's a tough uh, metric to predict, so you do want to be careful in looking at how a service is built. And measured service is also known as metered service. So whether you see measured service or metered service on the exam, two phrases for the same concept. Finishing up section 1.1, we're going to talk about the five building block technologies of the cloud, which are compute, network, storage, databases, and orchestration. So let's begin with compute. And in the area of compute, infrastructure as a service, or IaaS, is the basis for compute capacity in the cloud. The CSP provides the server, the storage, and the networking hardware, and virtualization of all of these components. The customer installs middleware and applications on virtual machines, and the customer only pays for what they use. The charges stop when the instance is stopped or deleted. We're going to dig into the boundaries of responsibility a bit later in this video in the shared responsibility model. Again, something not mentioned in the official study guide, but you're going to appreciate the context it brings to everything we're learning in this series. Let's talk about the basics of network. So cloud networking in the cloud is all virtualized to allow customers to design and customize the network to their needs. This enables customers to segment networks and restrict access however they'd like, implementing preferably a zero trust network architecture. And physical network components are virtualized into a software defined network or SDN. Examples in major CSPs include VNet in Azure and VPC in AWS and Google Cloud Platform. So let's talk about an SDN. This is a network architecture approach that enables the network to be intelligently and centrally controlled or programmed using software. And SDN is defined by three separate planes or layers, if you will. There's the management plane, the business applications that manage the underlying control plane and are exposed with northbound interfaces. I'll visualize a northbound and southbound interface for you in a moment. We have the control plane, which is where control of network functionality and programmability is made directly to the devices through the southbound interface. OpenFlow was the original protocol at the control plane and is still common today. And then we have the data plane, and the network switches and routers located at this plane are associated with the underlying network infrastructure. Now, data forwarding happens here, so this is also sometimes referred to as the forwarding plane. So just to visualize for you here, we have the control plane, the SDN controller, and the management plane, which is exposed to the control plane through the northbound interface, and the data plane, where our switches and routers, our underlying network infrastructure reside. So again, management plane exposed through the northbound interface, data plane exposed to that controller through the southbound interface. And to dig in just a bit further here, the northbound interface ensures only trusted authorized applications access critical network resources. 
and open flow as a protocol at the control plane interfaces with devices through the southbound interface. Let's move on to storage. And storage varies by model. So whether we're talking about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service, your storage is virtualized as you'd expect. And the CCSP exam considers three types of storage, long-term, ephemeral, and raw. So ephemeral is relevant for IaaS instances and it exists only as long as the instance, the VM, is up. That would be a temp disk generally. And raw storage maps to a LUN, to a logical unit number on a storage area network attached to a VM. So that concept pops up more in a hybrid scenario where we're dealing with a SAN directly on-prem. You're not going to see much around SAN in a cloud portal itself. It's, it's all really virtualized. Now, long-term storage offered by some CSPs is tailored to the needs of data archiving. That may include features like search, immutability, and data lifecycle management. And long-term storage typically uses either volume or object storage infrastructure. So let's talk about each of those. So an example of a volume or block storage would be Amazon EBS and Azure Disk Storage. An example of object storage would include Amazon S3 and Azure Blob Storage. So let's talk about storage in the context of platform as a service. Here the focus is on databases, usually multi-tenant relational SQL database as a service. It might be Microsoft SQL, it could be MySQL, it could be PostgreSQL. And then there's big data as a service. These are non-relational or NoSQL data repositories like document, graph, column, or key value stores. Examples here include MongoDB, Cassandra, and HBase. You should also be familiar with the concept of storage consistency, which describes the time it takes for all data copies to be the same. We have strict consistency at one end of the scale that ensures all copies of the data have been duplicated amongst all relevant copies before finalizing the transaction to increase availability. And then there's at the other end of the scale eventual consistency where data consistency is relaxed and it reduces the number of replicas that must be accessed during read and write operations before the transaction is finalized. Data changes in this case are eventually transferred to all data copies via asynchronous propagation over the network. And depending on the NoSQL flavor you're working with, some cloud services will offer you degrees of consistency. So you'll have options somewhere between strict and eventual to set the level of consistency that works in your application's model. So let's talk about storage in the software as a service or SaaS context. So we have content or file storage. So this is file-based content stored within the application. Microsoft Office is the perfect example. A content delivery network is where content is stored in object storage and then replicated to multiple geographically distributed nodes to improve internet consumption speed. What that does is places content near the points of presence where customers will access a service. There's information storage and management. So data entered into the system via the web interface and stored within the SaaS application. This often utilizes databases, which are in turn installed on object or volume storage. And when we think about software as a service, that's really just a service we use and don't think too much about the underlying infrastructure. So we'll talk about the boundaries of responsibility there in the shared responsibility model uh, later in this video. So let's move on to databases. So multiple options are available. You have multiple flavors of relational and non-relational that we touched on a moment ago, but there are managed database services, so PaaS options that shift infrastructure maintenance to the cloud service provider. There are also IaaS hosted databases that are an option where PaaS is not possible or practical. So you have examples on the PaaS side of Azure DB for Microsoft SQL. Uh, they also have a MySQL flavor, a Postgres flavor, on the Amazon side, you see Amazon RDS and DynamoDB. And generally, PaaS is preferable, but we see the IaaS uh, database options pop up where customers have isolation or compliance requirements that make PaaS just not practical at all. So let's talk about 
Orchestration, the fifth building block. So cloud orchestration creates automated workflows for managing cloud environments. And they're building on the foundation of infrastructure as code, reducing manual administration tasks. And orchestration may be a script, a function, a runbook, or developed in an external workflow engine. So a few examples here, you have Azure Automation, AWS Systems Manager, or you could even look at third parties like Zapier that integrate with hundreds of services and multiple cloud platforms. We're going to close out section 1.1 with a look at some virtualization concepts you may see on the exam. So virtual assets can include virtual machines, which we talked about previously. Virtual machines can factor in a virtual desktop infrastructure or VDI solution, a managed desktop, if you will, software defined networks, and virtual storage area networks. So these are all virtualization concepts. And hypervisors are the primary components that manage virtual assets, but also provide attackers with an additional target. So both hypervisors and the VMs that run on them need to be patched and secured. So we have our compute, our network, and our storage. Let's talk about security issues with cloud-based assets. So storing data in the cloud increases our risks. So steps may be necessary to protect that data, depending on the value of that data. We need to focus on our valuable assets. When releasing cloud-based services, you should know who is responsible for the maintenance and the security. And depending on the category we're working with, IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS, the level of responsibility of customer versus cloud service provider will vary. We're going to touch on these and break them down in the shared responsibility model shortly. The cloud service provider provides the least amount of maintenance and security in the IaaS model. So let's talk about hypervisors. We have the type one or bare metal hypervisor that's installed directly on to the server hardware. Flavors there include VMware ESXi, KVM, and Microsoft Hyper-V. And then we have the type two or hosted hypervisor, which is installed on top of a host OS like Windows or Linux. Varieties here include VMware Workstation and Oracle VirtualBox, to name a couple. So let's look at the characteristics of the Type 1 hypervisor to start. So it certainly has a reduced attack surface when we compare it to the Type 2 hypervisor that has a host operating system. And this makes the Type 1 hypervisor more secure if implemented properly. We see Type 1 hypervisors typically implemented for QA load testing and production scenarios. And the type one hypervisor is typically more expensive than a type two hypervisor. Now switching gears to the type two hypervisor, the characteristics here vary just a bit. We have the increased attack surface due to the host operating system. And this makes it slightly less secure versus type one, even if implemented properly. It's commonly used for individual development and lab scenarios, and it's typically less expensive than a type one hypervisor. That brings us to section 1.2, describe cloud reference architecture. So here we'll touch on cloud computing activities, cloud service capabilities, cloud service categories. This is where we touch on IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. We'll talk about Cloud deployment models, including public, private, hybrid, community, and multi-cloud. We'll talk about the shared considerations of cloud. But just ahead of cloud deployment models, I'm going to slip in a quick talk on the shared responsibility model, which is really going to ease your onboarding of most of these concepts. Then we'll touch on the impact of related technologies. Everything from data science and machine learning and AI to containers, quantum, and DevSecOps. Let's start with cloud computing activities, and we'll begin by looking at activities according to ISO 17789 cloud reference architecture, and which parties map to which activity. So according to ISO 17789, the following are the responsibilities of the customer. So certainly using cloud services, performing any service trials to ensure the appropriateness of a specific cloud service, monitoring, administration, uh, billing and usage reports. You know, certainly the cloud platform, the CSP will provide billing and usage tooling often, but billing and usage reporting 
falls to the customer. And also operations, handling problem reports, performing business administration, administering cloud tenants, selecting and purchasing services, and requesting audit reports. These are all, again, customer responsibilities. Now, according to ISO 17789, these are the responsibilities of the cloud service provider, the CSP. Preparing systems, providing the services, managing assets and inventory, providing audit data, whether contractual or required by law, managing customer relationships, handling customer requests, performing peering with other cloud service providers, ensuring compliance, at least where compliance is mandated by law or the CSP promises compliance with regulations such as GDPR or FedRAMP or HIPAA, and providing, of course, network connectivity. And again, that's the CSP responsibility. Now let's look at the third party here, the partner. So partner responsibilities, according to ISO 17789, include design, creation, and maintenance of service. So that would be typical in an architecture scenario where the partner is providing consulting services. Testing, potentially performing audits as an independent assessor setting up legal agreements, assessing customers, assessing the marketplace, so really determining where the partner can effectively provide services that are value-add in the cloud scenario. So just as a quick refresher uh, on partner versus provider. So we have the CSP that delivers the cloud platform and infrastructure that customers subscribe to and use. And then we have the partner that provides guidance and implements uh, services, and potentially software. So Microsoft, Amazon, and Google are providers, and partners are the service and software companies. We talked about some of these like Accenture, Tata, Avanade. And again, anywhere you see the CSP acronym, that is absolutely referring to the cloud service provider. Next on the agenda are cloud service capabilities, the capabilities, advantages, and efficiencies of the public cloud. So first we have application capability types, where we see an overall reduction in cost, reduced application and software licensing, reduced support cost, and a reduction in the need to worry about our backend systems and those capabilities. Our cloud service provider gives us the ability as a customer to focus on business use cases while they handle the care and feeding of the underlying platform and infrastructure that previously would have been in our data center. Then platform capability types, language and framework support, support for multiple environments, and allowing customer choice and reducing vendor lock-in, as well as improving a customer's ability to auto-scale, giving us that ability to scale in and out as demand necessitates. And then infrastructure capability types. Again, scale, converged network, shared capacity. Remember the cloud service provider oversubscribes, so they give us the appearance of infinite capacity. Self-service, on-demand capacity, high reliability, service resilience through distribution across regions. And where this is a capital expense on premises, it's an operational expense in the cloud. So as organizations move to the cloud, we see a shift in budget from CapEx to OpEx. And remember, the customer only pays for what they use. So let's talk about cloud models and services. In particular, I want to talk about the shared responsibility model as it applies to IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. And this will help to differentiate the responsibility of the CSP versus the customer in your mind as we go through different scenarios. So when we're on premises, responsibility is easy. It belongs 100% to the customer. The customer is responsible for resiliency, availability, redundancy, all the way down to the wire. 100% yours. As we move into the cloud, in the IaaS model, infrastructure as a service, we see the cloud service provider takes on care and feeding of our virtualization infrastructure, the servers, the storage, the networking, and the hypervisor. We're really just consuming virtual machines running on top of the hypervisor. When we move into PaaS, we see 
the cloud service provider taking on more responsibility now managing the OS, middleware, and runtime. And as a customer, we're really just responsible for our applications and our data. And when we move into SaaS, thinking services like Office 365, you see the cloud service provider, the CSP, takes on even more responsibility. And now we have a shared responsibility there for data and application configuration, but largely we're just using the service. So you see, as we move from IaaS into PaaS and SaaS, the CSP is progressively onboarding more and more responsibility, allowing us to focus as a customer on simply using the service. So just to name the advantages here, you know, the CSP provides the building blocks, network, storage, and compute in the IaaS scenario. The CSP manages the staff, the hardware, the data center, and that gives us some key benefits here. Usage is metered, so we're paying for what we use. It eases our scale, our scale up, our scale out, our scale down. It reduces our energy and cooling costs in the data center because we're shifting our data center to the CSP's data center, right? Examples here include Azure Virtual Machines, Amazon EC2, and Google Cloud Platform's Compute Engine. So moving into PaaS, here we saw the customer is responsible for deployment and management of apps and the CSP manages provisioning, configuration, hardware, and the operating system. They're taking on more responsibility for us. Key benefits in PaaS is that the core infrastructure is updated by the provider. It's really entirely off our plate. Global collaboration for app development and running multiple languages seamlessly. So in the PaaS construct, if we're hosting web apps or functions, uh, we're going to have a good idea of the language support that comes from those CSPs, but they're generally going to support a variety of languages. Examples of PaaS services on the Microsoft platform would be Azure SQL, their API management function, uh, Azure App Service. So all PaaS services where we're really just focused on the application and our data. Then finally in the SaaS bucket, again, we're just configuring features as a customer. The CSP is responsible for management, operation, and service availability. And SaaS brings even more advantages here. The customer still has some responsibility in terms of access management and data recovery. For example, in Office 365, we typically have backups of that data. So if we have a ransomware attack, we can recover more quickly. Certainly in many of these SaaS scenarios, we'd be able to recover with the built-in capabilities of the SaaS service, but the customer can step in and add some recoverability of their own. Key ad advantages here, key benefits, would include limited administration responsibility and really limited skills required. The bar for entry is very low when it comes to SaaS. You're just a consumer as a customer. And the service is always up to date. We're never worrying about the care and feeding the patch management, it's all handled for us. And again, we have global access here. So available across continents, countries, and regions. Examples of SaaS services, Office 365, ServiceNow, Salesforce, all well-known SaaS applications. I want to talk about just one bit of nuance in the PaaS, in the platform as a service bucket. And that's really how is serverless, when we see that term serverless, how is serverless different from platform as a service in terms of customer responsibility? So we have PaaS on one hand, serverless on the other, and they do have some commonalities. In, in both cases, devs have to write code and there is no server management. So we're really focused on our application and deploying that app. Now, there are some differences though between PaaS and serverless. So for example, in PaaS, we have more control over the deployment environment. If I think about hosting web applications in PaaS, we can typically pick service tiers that give us some control over scale and isolation and some of our features. On the serverless side, we have less control over the deployment environment. Now on the PaaS side, the application has to be configured to auto scale. We typically have to configure the scale in, scale out through whatever mechanisms the PaaS service offers. Serverless generally scales automatically. On the PaaS side, the application typically takes a while to spin up. If you have a web app that hasn't been accessed in a few hours, the threads are going to die. It's going to take a few seconds for that app to spin up. On the serverless side, application code only executes when it's invoked, when it's basically called. 
So it means it's going to start faster. It also means it's only going to be billing for execution typically. So it's going to be very inexpensive. Certainly PaaS is going to reduce our operating expense versus the IaaS model and serverless may in certain use cases reduce our costs even further when serverless is the right tool for the job. So just talking through serverless architecture a bit further, it's a cloud computing execution model where the cloud provider dynamically manages the allocation and the provisioning of the servers. It's hosted on a pay-as-you-go model based on use. And the resources are stateless, servers ephemeral, and often capable of being triggered. Function as a service is a great example of serverless architecture. Azure Functions, for example. Or Amazon Lambda would be the equivalent on the AWS platform. And services integration. So provisioning of multiple business services is combined with different IT services to provide a single business solution. Next up, we're going to dive into cloud deployment models. But let's start with just a quick recap of the benefits of cloud computing. It's cost effective. It's global. We have presence around the world. Secure, scalable, elastic, always current. So the cloud allows us to focus as a customer on our business use cases and to hand over a lot of the care and feeding of the infrastructure and the platform to the cloud service provider. Now let's talk about the public cloud. So in the public cloud model, everything runs on your cloud provider's hardware. So the advantages here, we have the perception of infinite capacity, easy scalability, agility, a pay-as-you-go model. So we're not investing large amounts of capital in the data center, we're paying for what we use. No maintenance, low barrier to entry in terms of skills. The private cloud, on the other hand, where we're hosting 100% in our own data center, offers advantages of its own. So certainly in legacy scenarios, a dedicated environment to our infrastructure can make a lot of sense. It allows us to support legacy applications where maybe we're not ready to bring it up to a supported version for the public cloud. Maybe we need control over the environment. Maybe we have specific compliance requirements. So the, the private cloud enables greater control of upgrade cycles and legacy apps and support for some compliance scenarios. These are key use cases where private cloud factors prominently today. And a hybrid cloud combines public and private clouds, allowing you to run your apps in the right location. And most would say that this is the most common model today, that organizations have by and large moved at least some of their workloads into the public cloud, but they still have in large environments an on-premises data center, or at least some presence of on-premises infrastructure. So hybrid cloud where we're connecting the private cloud to the public cloud is very common today. And it gives us flexibility in the legacy and compliance and scalability scenarios. If we have a legacy scenario where we need control, where we have compliance concerns, we can leave that in our private data center, in our private cloud. And for apps where we don't have those hurdles, we can move those into the public cloud in the near term. But it enables the organization to control the pace of public cloud adoption. And then there's the community cloud. This is similar to private clouds in that they're not open to the general public, but they are shared by several related organizations in a community. So you could see this with an industry group, for example, that wanted to take advantage of the benefits of public cloud and perhaps take on the learnings and the risks together. And then the multi-cloud scenario. This combines resources from two or more public cloud service providers. This allows organizations to take advantage of service and price differences, but it can add some complexity. And we do see multi-cloud in scenarios where customers are moving to a new cloud for that price advantage, but it's easier said than done to take all of your services out of that old cloud, so we wind up in a multi-cloud scenario. So at the end of the day, confidentiality, integrity, and availability are core objectives of security. So let's just touch on what we call the CIA triad briefly. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality. Access controls to ensure that only authorized subjects can access objects. 
on exams, if you see subjects, subjects are generally talking about people, uh, security principles, accessing objects. That's our data, our assets. Integrity ensures that the data or system configurations are not modified without authorization. And availability. Authorized requests for objects must be granted to subjects within a reasonable amount of time. If we don't have availability, all of our security is for naught. Now we're going to get into cloud shared considerations. So considerations in a multi-tenant environment like the cloud. The first is interoperability. So the ability of one cloud service to interact with other cloud services. That could be within a single CSP. It could be between CSPs. It could be another third party. Most of your CSPs also have a cloud marketplace with certified apps and services that provide paths for interoperability across platforms as well. Another consideration, reversibility. So this speaks to the process for cloud service customers to retrieve their data and their application artifacts and for the CSP to delete all cloud service customer data and contractually specified cloud service derived data after an agreed period. Now, customer access to data also appears in some regulations. GDPR is one that comes immediately to mind. So let's talk about the five facets of cloud interoperability. The first is policy, the ability of two or more systems to interoperate while complying with governmental laws, regulations, and organizational mandates. The next is behavioral, where the result of the use of the exchanged information matches the expected outcome. The third is transport, the commonality of the communication between cloud consumer and provider and other providers. And this really speaks to known standard secure methods of transport, HTTPS, for example, or various message queuing standards. The fourth is syntactic, two or more systems should understand the other system's structure of exchanged information through encoding syntaxes, such as JSON and XML would be two good examples. And the fifth is semantic data, the ability of systems exchanging information to understand the meaning of the data model within the context. So virtual machines, containers, storage, and networking concepts. So continuing down the path of considerations, portability. The ability to move applications and associated data, as in stored within storage or database repositories, between cloud service providers, between legacy and cloud environments, or between public and private cloud environments. So think hybrid cloud, for example. And a couple of sub-considerations here. Cloud data portability, the ability to easily move data from one cloud service to another without the need to re-enter that data. We see this commonly with blob storage or with databases where we need to move a database to migrate it from one provider to another. And then cloud application portability, the ability to migrate an application from one CSP to another or between a customer's environment and a cloud service. Portability prevents vendor lock-in. So let's talk about the three facets of cloud data portability, and they are Syntactic, so transferring data from a source system to a target system using formats that can be decoded on the target system with features like XML or open virtualization format. The second is semantic, so transferring data from a source system to a target so that the data model is understood within the context of the subject area by the target. And the third is policy, transferring data from a source system to a target so that governmental laws, regulations, and organizational mandates are followed. The fact of the matter is, if you want interoperability and you want portability, you need to pick cloud service providers that offer services that are highly standardized, that are using open and standard communication formats like XML, like JSON, like HTTPS. So continuing with shared considerations, availability. So systems and resource availability defines the success or failure of a cloud service. That's no surprise. You want to check service level SLAs and how multi-service SLAs are calculated. Your major CSPs like Microsoft, like AWS, will provide instructions in their documentation for how 
and SLA is calculated when you've incorporated multiple services into an integrated solution. And then resiliency, so the ability of a cloud service data center and its associated components, including your servers, storage, and so on, to continue operating in the event of a disruption. And you want to look for a cloud provider with global presence, regional redundancy, and then zone redundancy within that region. When it comes to availability, we'll talk about SLAs, OLAs, and PLAs in depth in Domain 6. So that's service level agreements, operating level agreements, and privacy level agreements. Now let's shift gears and just talk through an example. So the, the following example here explains these concepts in Microsoft Azure. AWS and Google Cloud Platform support the same concepts, and in fact, the terminology is generally very similar, or in some cases, even the same. Remember, the CCSP exam is cloud service provider agnostic. So I wanted to give you an example I had in hand to give you context. So we'll start at the global level and work our way down. So starting with an Azure geography. So this is a discrete market, typically containing two or more regions that preserves data residency and compliance boundaries. So with Azure, they have geographies. And you can see here, there's a geography for North America, for Europe, for Australia. China has its own geography for political reasons and, and legal reasons. You see Africa, you see South America. Similar concepts exist in AWS and Google Cloud Platform. And then we have regions. So this is a set of data centers deployed within a latency defined perimeter and connected through a dedicated regional low latency network. So regions, we'd call these. So if I just look at the map here, you can see Azure includes regions all around the world. I see Japan East, UAE North, West Europe, Canada Central, Central US, West US. So regions all around the globe. And then we have region pairs. This is where it really starts to get interesting. This is a relationship between two Azure regions in the Microsoft case within the same geographic region for disaster recovery purposes. So imagine redundancy in the event of regional data center failure. So region pairs, for example, you'll find that there is a pair, a primary and a backup chosen by the CSP, Microsoft in this case. Generally speaking, there's 300 plus miles between those two data centers and your various services like the storage platform, like the database platforms have configurations that facilitate automatic failover of those services to the backup region. So if a region goes down, you're not dead in the water necessarily. Now availability zones are unique physical locations within a region with independent power, network, and cooling. It's comprised of one or more data centers and it's tolerant to data center failures via redundancy and isolation. So it's really focused on data center failures within a region. So my load balancer, for example, would be zone redundant across the data centers within the region. So for example, West US for Azure is not a single data center sitting in the West US. It's several data centers, multiple data centers within that region, fairly close together, that give us these availability zones. But the focus here is data center failures within a region. But know that these concepts exist equally in AWS and Google Cloud Platform. I just wanted to give you an example in case you don't have exposure. So let's talk about security as a shared consideration. So protection of customer data, access control, data encryption, very important. Protection of cloud applications against attacks, for example, attacks of scale like distributed denial of service. Protection of cloud infrastructure the underlying servers, storage, and network running the environment. The shared responsibility model explains who is responsible for security in each model and scenario. We talked about that earlier in this video. If you skipped over shared responsibility model, go give it a watch. Continuing down the road of shared considerations, let's talk about privacy. So data privacy and cloud computing allows collecting, storing, transferring, and sharing data over the cloud network without putting the privacy of personal data at risk. So there are a couple of prominent sources of privacy concerns. Number one, 
Oftentimes the customer does not have knowledge about exactly how their personal information is stored and processed in the cloud. Your major CSPs do a pretty good job in terms of transparency. Those contracts, those agreements are long-winded, so not always easy to find in some cases. And then the reality that we have data breaches in recent years that have brought data privacy to the forefront is a crucial factor in cloud computing. Now, privacy versus confidentiality. I wanted to touch on the difference here. So privacy focuses on the right of an individual to have some control over how their personal information, their personally identifiable information, their protected health information is collected, used, and potentially disclosed. Confidentiality is the duty to ensure private information is kept secret to the extent that is possible. That's a legal obligation in regulatory scenarios like GDPR and a due care obligation in U.S. law. So to state all this more simply, privacy focuses on the rights of the individual person or the customer. Confidentiality focuses on the data, keeping that data confidential, private, encrypted. Next, we have performance, which is the ability of a service to remain responsive to requests of that service with an acceptable level of response latency or processing time. Remember, one of the benefits of public cloud is it delivers the perception of unlimited scale, typically for less than the cost a customer would incur to develop the same level of service in their own data center. And there's governance, enforcement of security policies and regulatory requirements, often through policy controls and regular audits. CSPs often have policy automation in which restrictions can be defined and automatically enforced throughout the service lifecycle. In fact, in Microsoft Azure, that feature is called Azure Policy that allows us to do exactly that. Next up, auditability. The ability to provide clear documentation of the actions in a data event, like a data breach or unauthorized access. And there are a couple of related activities that we need to ensure in place in order for auditability to be true. The first is accountability, the ability to determine who caused the event. This is known sometimes as identity attribution. This requires non-repudiation, so we must have unique accounts for end users, for example to ensure that we can pin that event back to a specific individual. And then there's traceability, the ability to track down all events related to an investigated event. Bottom line, auditability is only possible with proper logging, providing accountability and traceability. So these two things must be true for auditability to also be true. So service level agreements, these stipulate performance expectations like maximum downtimes, and often include penalties, financial penalties, if the vendor doesn't meet expectations. Service level agreements are typically used with vendors. Now, operating level agreements and privacy level agreements, OLAs and PLAs, may also show up on the exam. We're going to touch on those in Domain 6. Let's talk about outsourcing for a moment. Obtaining goods or services, like cloud services, from an external Supplier. This introduces considerations like reversibility, interoperability, and vendor lock-in, all of which we've talked about previously. It's worth noting that vendor lock-in can be a technical or a contractual constraint that prevents a customer from moving from a provider. Now we're going to move into impact of related technology. So called out explicitly in the syllabus, we see data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, blockchain, DevSecOps, Internet of Things, containers, quantum computing, confidential computing, and edge computing. Now I'm going to throw a couple of extras related or mentioned in the official study guide just in case, and that's deep learning, fog computing, and post-quantum cryptography. Related topics I think you should be familiar with. But let's start with data science. So data science is the study of data to extract meaningful insights for business. Now it combines principles and practices from multiple fields, mathematics, AI, computer engineering, to analyze large amounts of data. And it helps data scientists to ask and answer questions about past, current, and future events 
purely through evaluation of data. Now, cybersecurity data science is the practice of applying data science to prevent, detect, and remediate cybersecurity threats. Data is collected from cybersecurity sources and then analyzed to provide timely, data-driven patterns at scale. At the end of the day, the goal is to deliver more effective security insights at high scale in an automated fashion, really. So let's talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Knowing the difference can definitely help on really any security exam. So artificial intelligence focuses on accomplishing smart tasks, combining machine learning and deep learning to emulate human intelligence. And machine learning is a subset of AI using computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and the use of data. Machine learning algorithms learn by being fed data to process and learn from. And deep learning is a subfield of machine learning concerned with algorithms inspired by the structure and function of the human brain called artificial neural networks. And certainly in the realm of cybersecurity, data science, AI, and machine learning go hand in hand. So knowing the difference amongst these will be helpful somewhere in your career and potentially on this exam. Blockchain was originally a technology that powered Bitcoin. It does have broader uses, though. It's a distributed public ledger that can be used to store financial, medical, or other transactional data. Anyone is free to join and participate. It's a public ledger. It does not use intermediaries such as banks and financial institutions. The data is chained together with a block of data holding both the hash for that block and the hash of the preceding block. To create a new block on the chain, the computer that wishes to add the block solves a cryptographic puzzle and sends the solution to other computers participating in that blockchain. This is known as proof of work. And we have IoT, Internet of Things, which is a class of devices connected to the internet in order to provide automation, remote control, or even AI processing in a home or business setting. Due to the relevance of this topic, it's safe to guess that questions involving IoT devices are a bit more likely to appear in the 2022 exam update. Now, IoT devices suffer from some common attack vectors. One of these is default settings. Every device that you put on your network to manage has a default username and password. Often the defaults are open and available for anyone to use. And this is true of Wi-Fi and IoT devices both. Those defaults may be well known and botnets and offensive security tools will find and exploit devices with weak default settings still in place. Just change these defaults to shut down the attack vector. That's pretty simple. In a business setting, we find that these default settings lingering generally point to a process issue. When we onboard devices to a business network, we'd expect the default settings are going to be updated to a more secure standard. We see IoT and wearables. You might be wearing an IoT device like a fitness tracker or a smartwatch. They come in the form of facility automation, which would be more relevant in a business scenario. In a large facility, IoT devices are able to manage the heating and AC, lights, as well as motion, fire, and water detection. And they enable facility managers to be able to configure automation and monitoring a device function. But for critical functions like this, it's important that we shut down the uh, low-hanging fruit that attackers are going to be looking for. And you'll even see IoT and sensors. Vehicles have very specialized sensors uh, embedded, assisting with vehicle function often. Containerization will come up more than once in this course. We'll introduce the concept here. It's a lightweight, granular, and portable way to package applications for multiple platforms. It reduces the overhead of server virtualization by enabling containerized apps to run on a shared OS kernel. In other words, containers do not have their own OS, although the containers in the app within won't know that. They share many of the same concerns as server virtualization, isolation at the host, process, network, and storage levels. But it can be used in some cases to isolate existing applications developed to run in a VM with a dedicated operating system, just allowing us to get greater density out of our compute because we can run more apps than we could using virtual machines. So there's a cost advantage. 
You'll hear about containerization and topics related to Docker and Kubernetes. So quantum computing. This is a rapidly emerging technology that harnesses the laws of quantum mechanics to solve problems too complex for classical computers. It replaces the binary one and zero bits of digital computing with multi-dimensional quantum bits known as qubits. No widespread use cases as of 2023 for quantum computing, so there's very little impact outside the world of scientific research and testing. And that being said, I don't think there's a lot you could see on the exam. A quantum computer, though, could render all modern cryptography completely ineffective and require the redesign of new, stronger quantum encryption algorithms. Now, this is where post-quantum cryptography can help. Let's talk a bit more and you'll understand why I bring up post-quantum cryptography in just a moment. So quantum cryptography is the practice of harnessing the principles of quantum mechanics to improve security and detect whether a third party is eavesdropping on communications. It leverages the fundamental laws of physics, such as the observer effect, which states that it is impossible to identify the location of a particle without changing that particle. Now, quantum key distribution is the most common example of quantum cryptography. By transferring data using photons of light instead of bits, a confidential key transferred between two parties cannot be copied or intercepted secretly. Now, post-quantum cryptography is something else altogether. Post-quantum cryptography refers to cryptographic algorithms, usually public key algorithms, that are thought to be secure against an attack by a quantum computer. Now, post-quantum cryptography focuses on preparing for the era of quantum computing by updating existing mathematical-based algorithms and standards. So, Let's go a bit further with post-quantum. It's really the development of new kinds of cryptographic approaches that can be implemented using today's conventional computers. But that will be impervious, will be resistant to attacks from tomorrow's quantum computers. Post-quantum algorithms are sometimes called quantum-resistant cryptographic algorithms. I actually go much deeper into post-quantum cryptography in my CISSP exam cram. You're not going to need it for this exam, so we're not going to go there. Let's talk about edge computing. So some compute operations require processing activities to occur locally, far from the cloud, out in the field. This is common in various Internet of Things scenarios like agricultural, science and space, military, even healthcare. All the processing of data storage is closer to the sensors rather than in the cloud data center itself. With large network connected device counts in varied locations, data encryption, spoofing protection, and authentication are all going to be important. Now related to edge computing is fog computing. Now while not called out in the syllabus, this is mentioned in the official study guide. So this complements cloud computing by processing data from IoT devices. Fog computing often places gateway devices in the field to collect and correlate data centrally, but at the edge. Generally, it brings cloud computing nearer to the sensor to process data closer to the device in a centralized fashion. So this is important to speed processing time and reduce dependence on cloud or internet connectivity for mission critical situations. Healthcare is a great example of this. Next up, we have confidential computing. So the problem solved by confidential computing is that sensitive data must be encrypted in memory before an app can process it, leaving the data vulnerable. So confidential computing solves for this by isolating sensitive data in a protected CPU enclave during processing. This enclave is called a trusted execution environment and it's secured with embedded encryption keys. And embedded attestation mechanisms ensure that the keys are accessible only to authorized application code. Next, we have DevSecOps. This is a portmanteau, a combination of development, security, and operations, DevSecOps. It integrates security as a shared responsibility 
throughout the entire IT lifecycle. DevSecOps really preaches that security is everyone's responsibility, and it builds a security foundation into DevOps initiatives. It appears in the CI CD process, throughout the process, really moving back to the left to the beginning of the process. And it often includes automating some of the security gates in the DevOps process. And in the last couple of years, we've really seen DevSecOps elevated to become kind of the de facto approach. Infrastructure as code. This is the management of cloud infrastructure, your networks, VMs, load balancers, storage, your topology described in code. And just as the same source code generates the same binary, code in the infrastructure as code model results in the same environment every time it's applied. So what I mean by that is if you had an infrastructure as code template that defined an environment with four virtual machines, if you applied that template and only three virtual machines were present, it would redeploy the fourth. If you deployed that infrastructure as code again and it saw four VMs were present, it would not deploy any VMs because the environment matched the template. We call that behavior idempotence. But infrastructure as code is a key DevOps practice, and it's used in conjunction with continuous integration and continuous delivery, or CICD, creating the CICD pipeline. But infrastructure as code, CICD, and DevOps are standard elements of deployment, change, and release in the cloud. And DevSecOps, as I mentioned, is quickly growing in popularity as well. And these four all go hand in hand in the same conversations. So that does it for 1.2. Moving on to section 1.3, which is understand security concepts relevant to cloud computing. We'll touch on cryptography and key management, identity and access control, data and media sanitization, network security, virtualization security, common threats, and security hygiene. And you see some specific examples called out under the headings here. We'll absolutely touch on all of those and more. So let's start with cryptography and key management. So trusted platform module. This is a chip that resides on the motherboard of a device, like a laptop, for example. It's multi-purpose, like storage and management for keys used for full disk encryption solutions, like BitLocker, like DMCrypt on the Linux platform. And it provides the operating system with access to keys, but it prevents drive removal and subsequent data access. And then there's a hardware security module, commonly referred to simply as an HSM. This is a physical computing device that safeguards and manages digital keys, performs encryptions and decryption functions for digital signatures, strong authentications, and really a variety of cryptographic functions. In many ways, it's like a TPM, but these are often external devices. So let's talk about the key management strategy for the encryption key lifecycle. So encryption keys should be generated within a trusted, secure cryptographic module. FIPS 140-2 validated modules provide tamper resistance and key integrity, so that's a clear bar of high security. And then encryption keys should be distributed securely to prevent theft or compromise during transit. Best practice here, encrypt keys with a separate encryption key while distributing to other parties. And then storage. Encryption keys must be protected at rest and should never be stored in plain text. This includes keys in volatile and persistent memory, so we shouldn't have keys sitting in memory unencrypted. And then in use, so think of clients, whether those are users or their devices, they will use keys for resource access as access controls allow. Acceptable use policy sets the guardrails for data usage. So when a user is onboarded, they should sign an acceptable use policy that establishes what is and is not okay with regards to data. Revocation, we need a process for revoking access at separation, in the event of a policy breach or a device or key compromise. For example, in the world of PKI, you would revoke the certificate on the issuing certificate authority. And the final phase of 
the life cycle is key destruction. This is the removal of an encryption key from its operational location. And key deletion goes further and removes any info that could be used to reconstruct that key. For example, in mobile device management systems, they will remove certificates from a device during device wipe or retirement. When I say mobile device management, I'm talking about solutions like Microsoft Intune or AirWatch. But regardless of how those keys are issued and how those devices are managed, there needs to be a process, an operational process, for key destruction and or deletion. There are some other key management concepts we should touch on. So level of protection. So encryption keys must be secured at the same level of control or higher as the data they protect. And the sensitivity of the data is what dictates this level of protection. It's defined in the organization's data security policies. And when we're accessing that data, the system we are accessing the data from must be secured at the same level as the data as well. Key recovery. Circumstances where you need to recover a key for a particular user without that user's cooperation, like in termination or key loss. You always want to have a way to recover keys so we can get to data in those odd circumstances. Key escrow. Copies of keys held by a trusted third party in a secure environment, which can aid in many other areas of key management, including recovery. So let's talk about key management in the cloud, key management systems in particular. So all of your CSPs, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, they all offer a cloud service of some sort for centralized secure storage and access control for application secrets, a vault solution. In Azure, it's called Key Vault. AWS, it's KMS. Google Cloud Platform, it's Cloud KMS Vault. A secret in this context is anything that you want to control access to, like an API key, could be a password, certificates, tokens, cryptographic keys. And the service will typically offer programmatic access. They may have GUI access, of course, through a portal, but also programmatic access, often via an API to support DevOps and your CICD automation. Access control is available at the Vault instance level and to the secret stored within the vault. So generally, control plane access and then data plane access is how I'd, I'd phrase that. And secrets and keys can generally be protected either by software or by a FIPS 140-2 level 2 validated HSM. And whether you let the CSP manage keys in the back end or you require hardware management yourself or, or need to bring your own keys, that level of support is going to vary by CSP and you'll want to have those conversations directly. So let's shift gears and talk identity and access control. So in the cloud, services should include strong authentication mechanisms for validating the user's identity and their credentials, not unlike on-premises. That means we need to standardize, streamline, and develop an efficient account creation process as well as a timely deprovisioning process. So when a user departs from the company at the point of separation, we need to deprovision access quickly and efficiently. Centralized directory services, Active Directory, you know, tends to be the most common on premises. We have Kerberos and NTLM authentication there, Kerberos being preferred. And from a privileged user management perspective, we want to manage our privileged access accounts and to enforce least privilege and need to know at all times. Separation of duties, also a good idea as an effective risk mitigation technique. We'll dive into these a bit deeper in just a moment. And then from an authentication and access management perspective, we want to focus on the manner in which users can access required resources. That means we need to design a secure authentication and authorization experience. And that's where multi-factor authentication comes into play. That's where we authenticate a user with something they know, like a PIN or a password, something they have, like a trusted device, a mobile phone with an authenticator app, for example, something you are, biometric, thumbprint, really common that we use Face ID or, or thumbprint on our mobile devices now. And this is going to be a prevention mechanism for multiple types of attacks. Phishing, spear phishing, key loggers, 
credential stuffing, brute force reverse, brute force attacks, man in the middle. MFA can solve a lot. So let's talk about how we limit access and damage. So need to know in the principle of least privilege I mentioned are two standard security principles that are implemented in secure networks. And they limit access to data and systems so that users and other subjects have access to only what they require. That's going to help prevent security incidents. And if we have a security incident, it's going to help limit the scope of damage. So when we apply these principles, we're going to minimize the potential impact. When we ignore need to know and least privilege, we're going to expose ourselves to potentially far greater damage in the event of a security incident. So let's talk about fraud and collusion. So collusion is an agreement amongst multiple persons to perform some unauthorized or illegal actions. Separation of duties helps here, a basic principle that ensures no single person can control all the elements of a critical function. So for example, the person who configures and approves privileged access shouldn't be the person who is then using that privileged access to carry out a task. If I can grant myself God rights and do that work and then reverse those rights, if there's not a separate person in that process, that's a problem. That's a risk to the organization. And even if it's not malicious, someone might grant themselves too much permission, too much access. Job rotation is another one. If employees are rotated into different jobs or tasks are assigned to different employees, that helps with collusion for sure. But implementing these policies helps prevent fraud because it limits the actions individuals can do without colluding with others. So getting specific to cloud, let's talk about account types. So we have service accounts in the cloud. I see those commonly called service principles uh, or managed identities we'll see on some platforms like Azure, for example. Now, when software is installed to run on a computer or a server, it may need privileged access to run. Uh, when we have cloud apps, they may need an identity as well, a service principle. It's a lower level administrative account and the service account is really what fits the bill in many of these cases. A service account is really a type of administrator account used to run an application. When we get into the cloud, that service principle can be configured with the specific permissions the application needs. How that service principle is referenced will vary by platform. What they call it in Azure will be a bit different than AWS and Google Cloud Platform but the concept certainly carries over to cloud. When we have people who perform the same duties like members of customer service, they could use a shared account. That happens. But when user level monitoring, auditing, or non-repudiation are required, you absolutely must eliminate the use of shared accounts. Non-repudiation is how we guarantee that an action was performed by a specific person and we can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, so they cannot deny it. With a shared account, non-repudiation is broken. Most cloud identity providers have options to eliminate the need for shared accounts. So let's talk about privileged access management for a moment. This is a solution that helps protect privileged accounts within a tenant, preventing attacks. It also provides visibility into who is using privileged accounts and what tasks they are being used for. So native to some cloud identity providers today, you may see a just-in-time elevation feature that allows users to activate a privileged role to perform their tasks, and then that privilege is removed when they indicate they are done with the task or after a period of time, a finite period of time, which is great because it's a more granular interpretation and application of least privilege when we have that just-in-time elevation feature that automatically removes those rights. It's, it's definitely a process enhancement. And that's definitely true in Azure Active Directory, which is the identity provider that Microsoft gives us in the cloud. It's the identity provider with Office 365. You'll see similar capabilities with identity providers on other cloud platforms as well. Data and media sanitation may come up on the exam and the relative security of each of the methods, so we'll cover a few here. The first is erasing, performing a delete operation against a file, files, or the media itself. 
Clearing, or also known as overriding, this is preparing the media for reuse and ensuring data can't be recovered using traditional recovery tools. Now, overriding may involve one or multiple passes, and it may use random data or zeros depending on the chosen methodology. Purging is a more intense form of clearing that prepares the media for reuse in less secure environments. Now, media is reusable with any of these methods, the media itself. Data may be recoverable with forensic tools. So in the case of overwriting, which is called out explicitly in the syllabus, so you should definitely know it, data may be recoverable depending on whether the overwriting method uses one or multiple passes with random data or zeros. Fact is, it depends. Now, more secure data destruction, crypto shredding, called out in the syllabus. Cryptographic erasure is another way to say this one. Data is encrypted with a strong encryption engine. The keys used to encrypt the data are then encrypted using a different encryption engine. Then, keys from the second round of encryption are destroyed. So the pro here is data cannot be recovered from any of the remnants on the media. The downside is this definitely involves high CPU and performance overhead. If the exam poses a question on secure data destruction, crypto shredding is almost certainly the answer. Then we have data destruction on media like hard drive or DVD or CD-ROM. These are a bit less likely to come up on the exam, but will could be distractors on questions, so we'll cover them just to be thorough. Degaussing, which creates a strong magnetic field that erases data on some media and destroys electronics. We have shredding. You can shred a metal hard drive into powder. You can pulverize a drive with a hammer or drill through all the platters, rendering it inoperable. Media is not reusable with any of these methods. Data is also not recoverable by any means with any of these methods. But again, overwriting and crypto shredding are called out in the official exam syllabus and therefore the most likely to appear on the exam. Next up is network security. So we'll start with network security groups, which provide an additional layer of security for cloud resources. They act as a virtual firewall for virtual networks and the resource instances within those networks, like your VMs, your databases, and your subnets. They carry a list of security rules that include IP addresses and port ranges that will allow or deny network traffic to resource instances. But they act as a virtual firewall for a collection of cloud resources within that network with the same security posture. And how a network security group works exactly varies slightly from CSP to CSP. In Azure, for example, you can apply a network security group to a subnet or to a network adapter but it's going to give you that IP port range filtering functionality, so it's essentially like a layer four firewall. Network segmentation involves restricting services that are permitted to access or be accessible from other zones using rules to control inbound and outbound traffic. Rules are enforced typically by IP address ranges of each subnet, and within a virtual network, segmentation can be used to achieve isolation. Oftentimes, we'll see network security groups used to implement port filtering. So for example, we could put database servers in their own subnet and restrict inbound traffic just to listening database service ports. API inspection and integration. So REST APIs are the modern approach to writing web services. And this enables multi-language support and REST can handle multiple types of calls, return different data formats. And APIs published by an organization should include Encryption, authentication, rate limiting, throttling, and quotas. And in fact, in many of your CSPs, you'll find a PaaS service that allows you to publish and manage your APIs and to implement these security controls. Traffic inspection. We're really talking about packet capture here. And packet capture in the cloud generally requires specialized tools or services designed for this purpose in that particular CSP environment because traffic is often sent direct to resources and promiscuous mode on a VM network adapter is not possible and maybe not effective. So what you'll find is your CSPs have a service to do this. 
Uh, for example, in Azure, it's called Network Watcher. In AWS, it's VPC traffic mirroring. But your CSPs will offer tools to facilitate packet capture within your tenant. Geofencing. So geofencing uses global positioning system, GPS, or RFID, to establish geographic boundaries. And once a device is taken past the defined boundaries, the security team would be alerted typically. So for example, we could use geofencing to restrict access to systems and services based on where the access attempt is being generated from. We could prevent devices from being removed from the company's premises in high security situations. And we can use this to identify unusual traffic patterns and prevent misuse. Next, we're going to talk about zero trust security in the network context, but first I want to cover just a few zero trust basics. So zero trust addresses the limitations of the legacy network perimeter-based security model with a firewall and trusted and untrusted networks. It treats user identity as the control plane. It really addresses the reality that we have users that work who are much more mobile than they used to be working from anywhere. And it assumes compromise or breach in verifying every request. Essentially, no entity is trusted by default. So let's just touch on the core three principles of zero trust security. The first is verify explicitly. We always authenticate and authorize based on all available data points. We're going to look at the user's identity, the location they're coming from, are they coming from a healthy compliant device, what service or workload are they trying to access? Are they trying to access sensitive data? Is there anything anomalous about the request? And we always use least privilege access. We limit user access. We use just in time and just enough access. Risk based adaptive policies. So we're going to you know, definitely deny authentication requests where we see, for example, impossible travel or a very unexpected location or other anomalous behavior that raises that user's risk profile and data protection like DLP data loss prevention policies and we assume breach we're going to segment access to minimize the scope of impact and we'll verify end-to-end -end encryption we'll use analytics to get visibility and drive threat detection and improve defenses so the zero trust security in the network context means Micro-segmentation of our network, network security groups, firewalls, inbound and outbound traffic filtering, inbound and outbound traffic inspection, IDPS, looking for potentially malicious traffic, attachments, anomalous traffic patterns, and centralized security policy management and enforcement. We talked about the policy engines that our CSPs have, for example, Azure Policy. You'll also find in some cases CSPs will offer centralized policy for their firewall services, for their software-based firewalls. Containerization we touched on earlier, examples being Docker and Kubernetes. Remember the key difference between containerization and server virtualization is containers do not have their own OS. They share a single OS kernel. And we can use containerization in some cases to isolate existing applications that were developed to run on a VM with a dedicated operating system. The container does fool the application into believing it has its own kernel, even though it doesn't. So if we look at the type one bare metal hypervisor, we talked about this earlier, VMware ESXi Microsoft Hyper-V. With virtualization, we have virtual machines with each VM in its own OS kernel and memory resulting in more overhead. And when we look at a container host, which is generally itself a virtual machine, you'll see that the container has its binaries, its libraries, its applications, and those containers are sharing a single operating system. So they're sitting on a single host OS. That's the real difference. Each VM has its own OS kernel and memory, so the overhead is greater. Containers are isolated, but they share a single OS kernel as well as binaries and libraries where they can. And to unpack that just a bit further, the core components in a container platform like Docker or Kubernetes will include orchestration, a scheduling controller, 
network and storage, a container host, which is a virtual machine, container images. Think of container images as the equivalent of a VM template. A container image is to a container as a VM template is to a virtual machine. And a container registry, which is where we store our container images, and we need to secure access to that container registry. The isolation with containers is logical. We're isolating processes, compute, storage, network, secrets, and the management plane. There's a lot of isolation happening on that container host. You needn't be an expert in containerization for the exam, but you'll want to understand the concepts that we're talking about here. Now, when we look at containers in the cloud context, really what is the de facto standard today is managed Kubernetes. What you'll find is your container host or cloud-based virtual machines. This is where the containers run again, but your CSPs offer hosted Kubernetes services. And these handle the critical tasks for you like health monitoring and the management cluster. You basically pay for the agent nodes within your clusters. You don't pay for the management clusters. You're really paying for the container host and the compute that you're running there. Your major CSPs also offer some sort of monitoring solution that will identify at least some potential security concerns in your Kubernetes environment. And like I said, this shares many of the concerns of server virtualization, but you need to enforce isolation of network data and storage access at the container level. But really you're going to find that managed Kubernetes is really the de facto standard that everybody is using in the world today. And your big three CSPs all have a managed Kubernetes service. In the Microsoft world, it's Azure Kubernetes Service, it's EKS on the Amazon platform, and GKE on Google Cloud Platform. So we talked about serverless technology back in section 1.2, just a couple of concerns around security related to serverless. So where possible, using an API gateway as a security buffer to protect that serverless endpoint to avoid distributed denial of service attacks, attempts to exhaust capacity. And we want to configure secure authentication, whether that's OAuth, SAML, OpenID Connect. We might use multi-factor authentication if it's an endpoint being accessed by a person directly. We'll want to separate our development and production environments, implement least privilege, so some pretty standard security practices here, but applied in the serverless context. Now, ephemeral computing is the practice of creating a virtual computing environment as a need arises. So basically, the environment's destroyed once needs are met and resources are no longer needed. The primary use case here would be in auto-scaling scenarios where we need elasticity, rapid scale up as demands increase. And while security more or less should take care of itself in some respects in that when you're scaling out any security guardrails you have through security policy for the service itself should apply to the compute instances scaling out uh, and security should take care of itself in that when the environment's no longer needed, the resources are destroyed. You do want to make sure that when you have a service that auto scales out, that it automatically scales back in, that in fact those instances that were created are in fact destroyed and they're not sitting there dormant, but accessible. Now we're going to talk about some common threats. So the first is data breach, where sensitive data is stolen. This could include personally identifiable information or protected health information often due to poor application or database security design or configuration where data is exposed without proper authorization. This is preventable by following secure development practices and adhering to recommendations in the secure data lifecycle, which we're going to touch on just a bit later in this video. And then there's data loss when sensitive data is unknowingly exposed to the public. This is often through a system or service misconfiguration or oversharing. We'd see this commonly in the early days of cloud with Amazon S3 storage buckets that were not secured by default, exposing data unexpectedly. But a data breach is typically the result of a cyber attack. Data loss is sometimes called a data leak. It's unintentional. 
We have common threats to our APIs, our web services like SOAP or RESTful services. These are exposed interfaces that allow programmatic interactions between services. And they're definitely an avenue for security breach if they're not implemented properly and secured. So REST uses the HTTPS protocol for web communications to offer API endpoints. REST is the standard you're going to see most commonly today. But that API endpoint in HTTPS makes it a target for distributed denial of service attacks. Security mechanisms include API gateway, authentication, IP filtering, throttling, quotas, data validation. Most of your major CSPs offer a PaaS service that you can use to host and to secure your web services. And you'll also want to make sure that you store, distribute, and transmit your access keys for your APIs in a secure fashion. So malicious insiders. These are disgruntled employees that can wreak havoc on a system. Internal acts of disruption may include theft or sabotage. So sabotage being intentional destruction. And then there's traffic hijacking. When attacks are designed to steal or wedge themselves into the middle of a conversation in order to gain control. Abuse of cloud services. Sometimes customers misuse their cloud services for illegal or immoral activities. Insufficient due diligence, which is the process or effort to collect and analyze information before making a decision or conducting a transaction. That's due diligence. And failure to perform due diligence can result in a due care violation. Knowing the difference between due diligence and due care is actually important for your career and will be helpful in understanding what insufficient due diligence means. So let's just talk about the difference between the two briefly. So due diligence is the process of collecting and analyzing information before making a decision or conducting a transaction. Due care is doing what a reasonable person would do in a given situation. It's sometimes called the prudent person rule. So together, these will reduce senior management's culpability and downstream liability when a loss occurs because the organization has a responsibility of due care, of implementing reasonable security to protect user data. So let's just break these down a bit further. So if we have a decision, due diligence typically happens before the decision. There's research, planning, evaluation, largely before the decision. And due care is the implementation, the operation and upkeep, the reasonable measures of security, that the doing after the decision really. So due diligence increases our understanding of the situation and therefore reduces our risk. And due care, that prudent person rule, implementing reasonable measures to reduce our liability and our exposure. But the evaluation that we perform in due diligence really helps us to determine what we need to implement as part of our due care obligation. To look at it another way, due diligence is about thinking before you act, and due care really dictates that actions speak louder than words. So you get the idea here. Another way, due diligence, do detect, and do care, do correct. That's just a little mnemonic you can use to remember the difference between the two. So hopefully that clarifies due diligence versus due care. And just to give you a couple of examples here on the due diligence side, knowledge and research of laws and regulations, industry standards, best practices, and examples of due care would be delivery or execution, including reporting security incidents, security awareness training, disabling access at separation in a timely way. So another common threat in cloud, shared technology vulnerabilities. So the underlying infrastructure of the public cloud was not originally designed for the types of multi-tenancy we see in the public cloud. Modern virtualization software does bridge most of the gaps. Now, what threats remain in a shared public cloud infrastructure? Well, cloud infrastructure can still be vulnerable to insider threats, for sure. Unintentional misconfigurations are also a concern, and to a lesser degree, 
disruptive attacks of scale, denial of service, or distributed denial of service, most of your CSPs have some layer of protection by default and additional services you can implement to reduce your DDoS exposure. Noisy neighbors can be a problem. So when you're in a multi-tenant scenario, if you have another tenant sharing a server capacity, for example, and they are noisy, meaning that they're taking up a lot of capacity, they're a heavy user, that can potentially impact you in the wrong circumstances. Less concern today. Now, for regulatory compliance and high criticality scenarios, CSPs often offer some higher isolation and flexible scale-out options. In fact, in recent years, we've seen for the highest security scenarios, you can even find some dedicated physical host scenarios available in a public cloud. So let's talk about baselining, and this really comes in the context of configuration and change management. So I'd like to tackle the bigger topic. So configuration management ensures that systems are configured similarly, configurations are known, and they are documented. So baselining ensures that systems are deployed with a common baseline or starting point, and imaging is a common baselining method. Now, change management helps reduce outages or weaken security from unauthorized changes to that baseline configuration. And versioning uses a labeling or numbering system to track changes in the updated versions of our baseline, whether that's an image, an application, or other system. And it requires changes to be requested, approved, tested, and documented. So finishing up security hygiene here at the end of section 1.3, we have patch management. This is the process of identifying, acquiring, installing, and verifying patches for products and systems. It's a function included in change management. Patches correct security and functionality problems in software and firmware. Both applicability and install are often automated with management tools. An applicability assessment is performed to determine whether a particular patch or update actually applies to a system before an attempt is made to install that patch. You'll sometimes see patch management referred to as update management. That brings us to section 1.4. Understand design principles of secure cloud computing. So here we'll touch on the cloud secure data lifecycle cloud-based business continuity and disaster recovery planning, business impact analysis, functional security requirements, security considerations and responsibilities for different cloud categories, and finally, DevOps security. So let's start with the cloud secure data lifecycle. So the lifecycle begins with data creation. Data can be created by users. For example, a user creates a file. Data can also be created by systems, a system logs access. To ensure data is handled properly, it's important to ensure data is classified as soon as possible after creation. Ideally, data is encrypted at rest. Data should be protected by adequate security controls based on its classification, controlling its use, and when data is shared or in transit, it should be secured anytime it's in transit over the network, preferably encrypted. Archival is sometimes needed to comply with laws or regulation requiring the retention of data. And the secure data lifecycle ends with destruction. When data is no longer needed, it should be destroyed in such a way that it is not readable nor recoverable. Crypto shredding happens in this phase. So I mentioned multiple potential states of data in the secure data lifecycle. Let's just touch on these briefly. We have data in transit, which is data on the wire in flight, commonly protected with transport layer security, certificate-based security, or tunneled through a VPN. We have data at rest in storage on disk in a database, protected through encryption quite typically. And we have data in use, data in memory, in RAM, CPU, or cache. It should be flushed from memory when transaction is complete or the system is powered down. 
and sensitive data should always be encrypted in memory. So how can we encrypt different types of data at rest? Well, there's storage service encryption. So your CSP storage providers usually protect data at rest automatically. They usually encrypt by default before persisting it to manage disks, object file, or queue storage. We have full disk encryption, which helps you encrypt Windows or Linux ISVMs using BitLocker on the Windows platform and the DMCrypt feature of Linux to encrypt your OS and data disks. And then there's transparent data encryption. This helps protect Microsoft SQL database and data warehouses against the threat of malicious activity with real-time encryption and decryption of database backups and transaction log files at rest without requiring app changes. It's transparent and has essentially no performance impact. Some database platforms also provide row-level encryption, column-level encryption, or data masking. On the topic of data security, you may see questions regarding data roles on the exam. So two roles you should definitely know for the exam. Data owner, who holds the legal rights and complete control over a single piece of data. Usually a member of senior management. They can delegate some day-to-day -day duties. They cannot, though, delegate their total responsibility for that data. And then there's the data custodian who's responsible for safe custody, transport, and storage of data, implementation of business rules, technical controls, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, audit trails, usually someone in the IT department. They don't decide what controls are needed, but they do implement those controls for the data owner. Tip here, if the question mentions day-to-day -day responsibility, that's the custodian. So there are a couple of GDPR data roles that are worth knowing just in case for the exam. That's the data processor, a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body that processes personal data solely on behalf of the data controller. The data controller is the person or entity that controls processing of the data. These are in the official study guides. So they may well appear on the exam and other data roles. There's the data subject, and I've mentioned this briefly earlier in the course. This refers to any individual person who can be identified directly or indirectly via an identifier, the subject, I called them. Identifiers may include name, an ID number, location data, or via factors specific to the person's physical, psychological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural or social identity, any, any way we can identify that person. And then the data steward, who ensures the data's context and meaning are understood and business rules governing the data's usage are in place. They use that knowledge to ensure the data they are responsible for is used as intended. So let's talk about business continuity and disaster recovery. A couple of definitions related to business continuity and disaster recovery worth knowing. So we have the business continuity plan, which is the overall organizational plan for how to continue business. And then the disaster recovery plan, which is the plan for recovering from a disaster, impacting IT and returning the IT infrastructure to operation. So what's the difference between business continuity planning and disaster recovery planning? Well, business continuity planning focuses on the whole business, where disaster recovery planning focuses more on the technical aspects of recovery. Business continuity planning will cover communications and process more broadly. Basically, business continuity planning is an umbrella policy, and disaster recovery planning is part of it. Disaster recovery is built into cloud architecture, and there are some concepts we covered earlier that come into play here. Region pairs address site-level failure, so we could lose an entire region, like West U.S., for example. And region pairs are 300-plus miles apart. They're selected by the CSP to ensure that a disaster doesn't impact both the primary and the backup. Availability zones address data center failures within a cloud region. So remember, within a region like East U.S. or West U.S., you have multiple data centers in fairly close proximity. 
a CSP region like East US would include multiple data centers, not just a single regional data center. And availability sets address rack level failures within the data center itself. Now this consists of two or more fault domains for power or network, etc. You may see questions around business impact analysis on the exam. And a business impact analysis contains two important items a cost benefit analysis and a calculation of the return on investment. Now, a cost benefit analysis lists the benefits of the decision alongside their corresponding cost. And it can stop there. A cost benefit analysis can be strictly quantitative, just adding the financial benefits and subtracting the associated costs to determine whether a decision will be profitable. A thorough cost-benefit analysis will consider intangible benefits, those that you cannot calculate directly. Functional security requirements. So what's the difference between functional and non-functional security? Well, functional security requirements define a system or its component and specifies what it must do. It's captured in use cases. It's defined at a component level. For example, application forms must protect against injection attacks. We do this by writing input validation into our application forms. It specifies a specific function. Non-functional security requirements, on the other hand, specify the system's quality, characteristics, or attributes. They apply to the whole system, the system level. For example, security certifications are non-functional. If we say a system must be FedRAMP certified or ISO 27001 or HIPAA certified. Security considerations for different cloud categories. We'll touch on IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, the three core categories of cloud computing. So in the IaaS space where we're thinking about server virtualization, we have VM attacks our virtual network, hypervisor attacks, VM-based rootkits, virtual switch attacks, co-location, denial of service. On the PaaS side, we have system and resource isolation, user-level permissions, access management, protection against malware, backdoors, and trojans. And in SaaS, we have data segregation, data access and policies, and web application security. Notice here, as we move from IaaS to PaaS to SaaS, the list of considerations gets shorter. And if you remember back to the shared responsibility model, the customer has the most responsibility in the IaaS category, and the cloud service provider takes on more and more responsibility as we move to the right. So your considerations are fewer as we move from left to right on this page. The attack service, shared responsibility, and data sensitivity all influence attack and defense strategies. But if you go back to the shared responsibility model, it makes sense why we see fewer concerns as we move from left to right on this chart. So virtualization-focused attacks. There's VM escape, where an attacker gains access to a VM, then attacks either the host machine that holds all the VMs, the hypervisor, or even some of the other VMs. Protection from VM escape, we, we ensure patches, and hypervisor and VMs are always up to date. Guest privileges are low, and server level redundancy, intrusion prevention and detection are also in place and in effect. There's VM sprawl, when unmanaged VMs have been deployed onto your network, and because IT doesn't know it's there, it may not be patched and protected, and thus it's more vulnerable to attack. So to avoid VM sprawl, enforcement of security policies for adding VMs to the network, as well as periodic scanning to identify new virtualization hosts on our network. And these would apply to both VMs and VM container hosts that we use in containerization, like Docker and Kubernetes. Application attacks. So these are attacks attackers use to exploit poorly written software. We have rootkit, which is escalation of privilege. These are freely available on the internet and they exploit known vulnerabilities in various operating systems, enabling attackers to elevate privilege on a system. 
And we can stop most rootkit-based threats by simply keeping security patches up to date. Anti-malware software is good. Uh, EDR, XDR solutions installed on our host to watch for malicious activity. Backdoor attacks, these are undocumented command sequences that allow individuals with knowledge of the backdoor to bypass normal access restrictions. These are often used in development and debugging operations, a backdoor for the developer. Countermeasures here would be firewalls, anti-malware, network monitoring, and code review to catch these backdoors before they make it into production. We want to make sure that backdoors don't exist, generally speaking. Network attacks. There's denial of service, which is a resource consumption attack intended to prevent legitimate activity on a victimized system. And then there's distributed denial of service, DDoS, which is a denial of service attack utilizing multiple compromised computer systems as sources of attack. Countermeasures are firewalls, routers, intrusion detection, a SIM solution, disabling broadcast packets entering and leaving our network, disabling echo replies, patching. DOS attacks are really a class of attacks. There are many different types of denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks, so we consider these a class of attacks. So types of distributed denial of service. You have network based attacks which are targeting flaws in network protocols. They often use botnets, techniques like UDP, ICMP, flooding, SIN flooding. Application attacks. So exploit weaknesses in the application layer, the layer 7, by opening connections and initiating process and transaction requests that consume the finite resources like disk space and available memory. We have operational technology or OT uh, DDoS attacks. These target weaknesses of software and hardware devices that control systems in factories, power plants, and other industries like IoT devices. They often target weaknesses using network and application techniques that we described above here in the other two. There are a few effective countermeasures to DDoS attacks. Intrusion detection and prevention, uh, rate limiting, limiting the number of requests that can come to a system in a given period of time, uh, firewall egress and ingress filters. And your cloud service providers will generally have DDoS protections built into their platform. So there's really an invisible layer of protection that's there by default. And they even in some cases have a premium SKU of DDoS protection you can buy that has additional levels of configurability for your cloud services and your environment. And wrapping up section 1.4, we have DevOps security. So DevOps relies heavily on deployment automation to deliver continuous integration and continuous delivery, that CI, CD automation we talked about earlier. And security control should be implemented to mitigate risks. So you have two categories of security controls. You have technical controls, like automated software scanning, vulnerability scanning, web application firewalls, software dependency management, access and activity logging, and application performance management. And then we have administrative controls, like developer application security training, documented policies and procedures, code review, approval gates in our CI CD process. And that brings us to section 1.5, Evaluate cloud service providers. In fact, section 1.5 is the last in domain one. So we'll finish up with a look at verification against criteria and we'll touch on ISO IEC 27017 as well as the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard or PCI DSS. And we'll talk about system product certifications. We'll have a look at common criteria as well as the Federal Information Processing Standard, or FIPS 140-2. So let's start with ISO IEC 27017. So this provides guidelines for information security controls applicable to the provision and use of cloud services. It provides cloud-based guidance on several ISO IEC 27002 controls, along with seven cloud controls that address who is responsible for what between the cloud service provider and the cloud customer, 
the removal and return of assets when a contract is terminated, protection and separation of the customer's virtual environment, virtual machine configuration, administrative operations and procedures associated with the cloud environment, customer monitoring of activity within the cloud, and virtual and cloud network environment alignment. PCI DSS stands for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. It's a widely accepted set of policies and procedures intended to optimize the security of credit, debit, and cash card transactions. And it's not a government enforced regulation at all. It was actually created jointly in 2004 by four major credit card companies, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. And it's enforced contractually between these card companies and their vendors, their merchants. So it's based on six major objectives. A secure network must be maintained in which transactions will be conducted. Cardholder information must be protected wherever it's stored. Systems should be protected against the activities of malicious hackers. Cardholder data should be protected physically as well as electronically. And networks must be constantly monitored and regularly tested. And finally, a formal information security policy must be defined, maintained, and followed. Next up, we have ISO IEC 15408 Common Criteria, which enables an objective evaluation to validate that a particular product or system satisfies a defined set of security requirements. It ensures customers that security products they purchase have been thoroughly tested by independent third-party testers and meets customer requirements. The certification of the product only certifies product capabilities. If it's misconfigured or mismanaged, software is no more secure than anything else the customer might use. It's designed to provide assurances for security claims by vendors. And in fact, common criteria is used almost exclusively by government agencies. Let's talk about FIPS 140-2. That's Federal Information Processing Standard. It was established to aid in the protection of digitally stored, unclassified, yet sensitive information. It was developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, for use in computer systems by non-military American government agencies and government contractors. So there are three FIPS security levels you want to be familiar with. There's level one, which is the lowest level of security. There's level two that specifies the security requirements for cryptographic modules that protect sensitive information. And level three that requires physical protections to ensure a high degree of confidence that any attempts to tamper are evident and detectable. And as we close out domain one, I want to point you to some useful documentation from CSPs and industry groups with guidance on cloud design and security. So in the architecture category, we have the AWS Well-Architected Framework, the Azure Well-Architected Framework, and the Google Cloud Architecture Framework. From industry groups, we have Enterprise Architecture Reference Guide from the Cloud Security Alliance, the Cloud Computing Reference Architecture from NIST. And these really obviously focus on architecture more than security, but there's going to be some security content in there. Now, security focused, we have the Microsoft Cybersecurity Reference Architecture, the AWS Security Reference Architecture, and the Google Cloud Security Foundations Guide. Now, from the industry, we have the Enterprise Cloud Security Architecture from SANS, the Security Technical Reference Architecture from CISA, and the Cloud Computing Security Reference Architecture from NIST. Skimming the SANS, CISA, and NIST docs may be helpful for the exam, purely optional if you're curious. And that's a wrap on Domain 1. So let's get into Domain 2, Cloud Data Security. And I will cover every topic mentioned in the official exam syllabus. I will also provide examples and concepts when possible. And in this particular installment, I'll actually 
provide a little show and tell in a couple of cases in a live cloud environment just to give you that additional bit of context to ensure that these concepts really sink in. This is a multiple choice exam, but a little real world exposure always helps. Let's take a quick look at the exam essentials, those areas the official study guide says will factor prominently on exam day. We have risk and controls in each phase of the cloud data lifecycle, which risks appear in each phase, and which controls should be used to address. Various cloud data storage architectures. We touched on these in the building blocks in part one. We'll expand on that coverage here in domain two. How and why encryption is implemented in the cloud. The role of cryptography, encryption, key and certificate management, HSM. Practices of obscuring data, masking, anonymization, tokenization, and a few others. Elements of data logging, storage, and analysis, and the importance in the data lifecycle, as well as the importance of egress monitoring. So this will include data loss prevention, identification through tagging, pattern matching, and labeling. What you really see here is the role of all of these in the cloud secure data lifecycle. So we need to be familiar with these technologies, but also where and why we apply them throughout the secure data lifecycle. Data flows and their use in a cloud environment. And we'll take a look at an actual data flow diagram I put together for you so you can see the concept in action. The purpose and method of data categorization and classification. So how to assign data categories and classifications, as well as data mapping and labeling. Again, all in the context of the secure data lifecycle. Roles, rights, and responsibilities of data ownership. So roles like data subject, owner, controller, processor, and custodians. We'll touch on the most important roles for this exam. Data discovery methods, the difference between structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. We see that semi-structured category pop in with the 2022 update of this exam. Objectives and tools for information rights management. And finally, policies for data retention, deletion, and archiving. So retention and disposal formats, which we touched on in domain one, and how these affect regulations and our policy lifecycle. So in section 2.1, which is described cloud data concepts, we'll get right to it, starting with a look at the cloud data lifecycle phases, where we need to apply these technologies to our data throughout its lifecycle. We'll touch on data dispersion, as well as data flows, and we'll have a look at the data flow diagram I mentioned a moment ago. Now the Cloud Secure Data Lifecycle, this is the model put forward by the Cloud Security Alliance and it starts in the create phase. Data can be created by users. A user creates a file, for example. Data can also be created by a system. A system logs user access, for example. Now in the store phase, to ensure data is handled properly, it's important to ensure data is classified as soon as possible. Only through classification can we apply appropriate security controls. And ideally, data is encrypted at rest. And in the cloud, that is doubly important. In the use phase, data should be protected by adequate security controls based on its classification. And sharing refers to any time data is in use or in transit over a network. Next, we have the archive phase. Archival is sometimes needed to comply with laws or regulations that require retention of data. And finally, the destroy phase. When data is no longer needed, it should be destroyed in such a way that it is not readable, nor is it recoverable. Crypto shredding happens in this phase. We talked about crypto shredding as a more secure method of data destruction. And if you see a question on the exam around data destruction, Odds are crypto shredding is going to be the answer. You'll want to know the cloud secure data lifecycle well for the exam. And we'll touch on various phases of the secure data lifecycle throughout this domain. Data dispersion. This is a core principle of business continuity that says it's important that data is always stored in more than one location. In other words, data is dispersed across multiple locations. And this is actually easier in the cloud because the CSP owns the underlying complexity that delivers site-level resiliency. And cloud storage for IaaS includes several different levels of storage redundancy, including local, where we see replicas within a single data center, zone, where we see replicas to multiple data centers within a region, and global, 
where we see region level resiliency, where replicas are backed up to a backup region. We talked about those local zone and global concepts back in domain one in section 1.2. So data flows, let's take a look at a data flow diagram, which is useful to gain visibility to ensure that adequate security controls are implemented throughout our cloud infrastructure. So for example, in our CSP environment, this may be Azure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, we may implement a database subnet, which would typically be private, an app subnet, also often private. So by private, I mean not directly accessible from the internet. And then we have our perimeter subnet. This is internet facing. So we may have an API gateway. We may have a web app firewall for user requests coming to our website. But you see here we have micro segmentation. So we've carved up our network so we can secure these individual workloads appropriately to restrict ingress and egress, only allow traffic from expected endpoints on expected ports. And then we'll map the flow of data through our infrastructure based on the types of requests. So for example, a system API request, and we see the data flow. We'll map our user request, a typical HTTP request coming through a web app firewall hitting a front end website, which may also hit that back end database. But you see, we've called out authentication and authorization here. And we have our data flows and our security controls we can call out at each layer as appropriate. So we talked about network security groups as an example back in domain one. So just an example, but that is basically the data flow diagram concept. You're going to map out your infrastructure, your application, your data flows, and your security controls. And you'll want to be familiar with the benefits of the data flow diagram for the exam. So our benefits include decreased development time and faster deployment of new system features and with reduced security risk visibility into data movement, which is going to be critical for regulatory compliance where data security is often mandated in law. So we need to understand how our data is flowing so we can add appropriate security controls at every layer, encrypting at rest, encrypting in transit, encrypting in use. So some compliance frameworks actually require data flow diagrams to capture specific information like geographic location of data flows or ownership of systems where data is flowing. Bottom line, creating that data flow diagram can be both a risk assessment activity and a crucial compliance activity. So moving on to 2.2, which is design and implement cloud data storage architectures. So here we'll touch on storage types as well as threats to storage types. Now for the exam, you'll want to be familiar with the types of storage and the security concerns associated with storage for all your cloud computing categories. So we're talking about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Now, if you watch domain one, you may recall we covered the storage types in the building block technology section of domain one. If you've not watched the domain one video, definitely worth going back and having a look. But I'll go ahead and touch on these again briefly here. So starting with the IS category, we have raw storage, that would be physical media. And you know, in the private cloud world, that's what we'd use to map a VM to a storage LUN on a storage area network. Uh, volume storage attached to an IaaS instance. So there we're talking about uh, a lettered volume in the form of a virtual disk. And then object storage, that's your S3 storage bucket or Azure storage, where you commonly see blob storage. In the PaaS category, we have structured data, that's your relational databases like SQL, MySQL, Postgres, and then unstructured or big data, sometimes called NoSQL. And in the SaaS category, we have information and storage management, that's your data entered via the web interface of a SaaS solution. Content or file storage, so that's your file-based content like you'd see with Box, Dropbox, OneDrive. Ephemeral storage, that's any temporary data storage for cache, buffer, session data, swap volume. And then finally, uh, content delivery network. That's geo-distributed content for a better user experience, or UX for short. So we see CDNs used to place content closer to users around the world to deliver that content more quickly, be that web content, file content, video content, etc. These are just a few key examples, not an exhaustive list, but I wanted to make sure you're prepared for the exam. 
Let's shift gears and look at threats to storage types. So there are universal threats to data at rest, regardless of location, be that on-premises or in the cloud. Naturally, we're going to be more focused on the cloud in the CCSP exam. But let's start with a look at universal threats from the perspective of the CIA triad. So unauthorized access threatens confidentiality. Improper modification of data threatens integrity. And loss of connectivity threatens availability of that data. Other threats include jurisdictional issues, denial of service, data corruption or destruction, theft or media loss, malware and ransomware, and improper disposal. Now, all of these can happen in the cloud. It's largely a question of who's responsible for prevention and recovery. So let's run through these one by one. So we'll start with unauthorized access. So a user accessing data storage without proper authorization presents an obvious security concern, right? The customer must implement proper access control. The CSP must provide adequate logical separation. If we go back to the shared responsibility model, we'll remember that a customer has responsibility for access control, at least to some degree, even in the SaaS model. Unauthorized provisioning. So this is primarily a cost and operational concern. So ease of use can lead to unofficial use, unapproved deployment, and unexpected cost. That unapproved deployment and unexpected cost comes from what we call shadow IT, a very common issue where folks lay down a credit card, they start using cloud services that aren't formally approved by the IT department. Then loss of connectivity, pretty straightforward. Loss of connectivity for any reason, whether that's network connectivity, access controls, authentication services, that takes away availability of our data. Jurisdictional issues. So data transfer between countries can run afoul of legal requirements, regulatory requirements, and privacy legislation bars data transfer to countries without adequate privacy protections. And the customer definitely bears some responsibility. By customer, I mean the consumer of cloud services. Certainly in the GDPR context, when I think about businesses in Germany, a customer using a cloud, which would be a business, is going to bear responsibility for making sure they meet the privacy requirements, the laws and legislation of the country of origin. And then denial of service. So in the event a network connection is severed uh, between the user and the CSP. Your CSPs are going to be better prepared to defend against distributed denial of service attacks and other disruptive attacks at scale. They have the infrastructure to support it. They have the services in place. Many of your large CSPs have built-in DDoS defenses that they don't even charge you for. Protections that you may not even be aware of as a customer of those CSPs. Then there's data corruption or destruction. So that's human error and data entry, malicious insiders, hardware and software failures, natural disasters that render data and storage media unusable. So some of these uh, issues intentional, others maybe not. But all concerns we must protect against. That means implementing least privilege access, role-based access control, or RBAC we call that, and off-site data backups. Then we have theft or media loss. So in the cloud, CSPs retain responsibility for preventing the loss of physical media through appropriate physical security controls. Even in the infrastructure as a service model, where we have physical servers with hypervisors hosting our VMs, where the customer has the most responsibility of any cloud model, the CSP still owns the care and feeding of the physical server and the associated physical media. Malware and ransomware. So ransomware not only encrypts data stored on local drives, such as in an IaaS model, but it also seeks common cloud storage locations like SaaS apps. So think Box, Dropbox, or OneDrive. Ransomware that infects an endpoint, a client endpoint, like a Windows workstation, will try to crawl into those SaaS folders and encrypt that data. Responsibility there is going to vary by cloud category, though. Improper disposal. So ensuring that hardware that has reached the end of its life is properly disposed of in such a way that data cannot be recovered. Now, in that case, the CSP is definitely responsible for hardware disposal. 
I want to shift gears and talk ransomware for just a moment because this is such a significant threat to virtually every organization. So we have some common countermeasures to ransomware. So backing up your computer, storing those backups separately. So if the files on a computer are encrypted, we can restore those from an alternate location. File auto versioning is very handy. So being able to revert to a previous version of a file. Now some of your cloud hosted email and file storage services ease that process. Microsoft OneDrive is one that comes to mind that offers access to 500 previous versions of a file. Although you can imagine uh, that's handy. It's also going to be very labor intensive if you're restoring files one at a time in that fashion. So that's where a backup stored offsite can come in very handy and perhaps backing up all the files in your SaaS service. So preventative techniques, updating and patching computers, just shutting the door on known vulnerabilities, using caution with web links and email attachments, verifying email senders, and email is the most common way in the door for ransomware attacks through web attachments and email attachments that are carrying that malicious payload. We really just need to be careful what we open. Now there are preventative software programs that give us protections at the email layer that will detonate email attachments that will check web links to make sure they're not malicious before we are directed to that link. Uh, there are AI driven cloud services that offer help with these. So you'll find endpoint focus services, you know, XDR, uh, whether that's Microsoft 365 Defender or any of your third parties. You have email-based protections in services like Proofpoint or Microsoft Defender for Office 365 that give us those email protections with the detonation chamber to make sure that our web links and our attachments are safe. But user awareness training, that's the most important defense of all. If we can teach our users to exercise caution when looking at messages from external senders and being careful about the links that they click and the attachments they download. That's going to be the best way to prevent ransomware exposure. So let's talk regulatory compliance. So certain cloud service offerings may not meet all the organization's compliance requirements, which leads to two security concerns. And the customer bears responsibility in making sure that the services they are subscribed to meet the organization's compliance requirements. But our two main concerns here are the consequences of non-compliance. These can include fines or even suspension of business operations. The second is data protection. Now, requirements may include the use of specific encryption standards, handling, retention, the geographic location where the data is stored. Now, all the regulatory standards you need to be prepared for this exam are going to be covered in this exam cram series. I'll be touching on them throughout the six domains, but if I don't mention it, it wasn't called out in the exam syllabus. And that brings us to 2.3, design and apply data security technologies and strategies. In this section, we'll touch on encryption and key management, hashing, data obfuscation techniques, including masking and anonymization, tokenization, data loss prevention, a big topic in and of itself, as well as management of keys, secrets, and certificates. And certainly at least a couple of these topics are areas I find folks tend to be a bit less familiar. So we're going to touch on some fundamentals. I'll provide clear explanations, examples where I can, and we'll even jump over into a cloud service provider portal and look at a couple of services so you can see these concepts in a real world context. Now this is a CSP agnostic exam. It doesn't focus on any one cloud service provider, but it always helps to see examples and I'll provide those where I can give them to you. So let's start with symmetric versus asymmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption relies on the use of a single shared secret key. Now it lacks support for scalability, easy key distribution, and non-repudiation. And by scalability, I mean scaling from one to many users because key distribution is a real challenge with symmetric encryption on its own. Asymmetric encryption relies on public-private key pairs for communication between parties. It supports scalability, easy key distribution, and non-repudiation. Symmetric encryption tends to be faster, therefore it's used for bulk data encryption. Asymmetric encryption is scalable. It's easy to scale to many parties, 
So we often use asymmetric encryption to distribute keys for symmetric algorithms. The two can work together in that respect. Encryption is a difficult topic for many, so we're going to dig just a bit deeper here. So symmetric encryption, to touch on this again, the sender encrypts the data using that single shared key. The recipient then decrypts that data using that same shared key. In asymmetric, we see the sender encrypting data using the public key of the recipient and the recipient decrypts the message using their own private key. So let me put that into an example to make it a bit more clear. So we have Franco who sends a message to Maria requesting her public key. Maria sends her public key to Franco. He then uses Maria's public key to encrypt the message and sends it to her. Maria uses her own private key to decrypt the message. Because that private key is unshared, and that is the only key that can decrypt the message that was encrypted with Maria's public key, we know that only Maria will be able to decrypt that message, assuming she has kept her private key private. So recapping there on asymmetric keys, public keys are shared among communicating parties. So anyone can encrypt a message using another user's public key. The private keys are kept secret. So to encrypt a message, you use the recipient's public key. To decrypt a message, the recipient uses their own private key to decrypt the message that was encrypted with their public key. For digital signatures, to sign a message, you use your own private key. To validate a signature, you use the sender's public key. Each party has both a private key and a public key in asymmetric encryption. So if we're sending messages back and forth with asymmetric encryption, we each need a private key to decrypt the message sent by the opposing party encrypted with our own public key. The scenario we saw in that example a moment ago often comes in the form of certificates, which contains a public-private key pair. And the trust model explains how different certification authorities which issue certificates, trust each other, and how their clients will trust certificates from other certification authorities. The four main types of trust models that are used in public key infrastructure, in certificate services, that is, are bridge, hierarchical, hybrid, and mesh. We'll dive into PKI a bit further in just a couple of minutes in case you're unfamiliar, so let's put a pin in that. I want to talk about key management for a moment, and key escrow addresses a common problem. That is the possibility that a cryptographic key may be lost. The concerns usually come with symmetric keys, that single shared key scenario, where if we lose that key, our data is encrypted and can't be decrypted, or with the private key in asymmetric cryptography, the key that is not shared. Now, if that occurs, there's no way to get the key back, then the user can't decrypt the message in either case. So organizations establish key escrows to enable recovery of lost keys. So having a copy of those keys with a third party, with an external entity. Now let's talk key management strategy for our encryption key lifecycle. So encryption keys should be generated within a trusted, secure cryptographic module. And they should use strong random keys using cryptographically sound inputs like random numbers. FIPS 140-2 validated modules provide tamper resistance and key integrity. We'll dive into FIPS 140-2 in a couple of other spots in the series. Now, encryption keys should be distributed securely to prevent theft or compromise during transit. We talked about that challenge of key distribution with symmetric algorithms. Best practice is to encrypt keys with a separate encryption key while distributing to other parties. That's where we can take that symmetric key, that shared key, and encrypt it for transport using an asymmetric algorithm. And you want to plan for securely transferring symmetric keys and distributing keys to the key escrow agent as well. So in case a key is lost, we can recover and decrypt that data. In terms of storage, encryption keys must be protected at rest and should never be stored in plain text. 
And this includes keys in volatile and persistent memory. So we shouldn't have a scenario where our encryption keys remain unencrypted in memory of a computer or other device. That concept of secure storage extends to a key stored in a key vault or on a physical device, really anywhere that key may be stored. And we also want to consider handling in the process of storing copies for retrieval if a key is ever lost, that concept of key escrow we discussed a moment ago. Usage focuses on using keys securely primarily for access controls and accountability, authentication and authorization. Revocation refers to a process for revoking access at separation, like employee separation, or in the event of a policy breach, or a device or key compromise, perhaps a private key has been compromised and stolen through an infected workstation, then we need to revoke that compromised key. Now, if that compromised key were the private key of a certificate in a PKI scenario, we would revoke the certificate on the issuing certification authority. We also need a process for archiving keys no longer needed for routine use in case they are needed for existing data. Now, key destruction is the removal of an encryption key from its operational location. That's the last phase of the key lifecycle. And key deletion goes further and removes any information that could be used to reconstruct that key. For example, mobile device management systems remove certificates from a device during a device wipe or retirement. I'm talking about MDM systems like Microsoft Intune or AirWatch. So for the exam, you will want to understand where encryption can be deployed to protect the organization's data and systems. And not only knowing the layers and the services where you can enable encryption, but also your options for key storage and management and some basics about whether keys are CSP managed or they're self managed and why that would make a difference. So for key storage, many of your CSPs offer FIPS compliant virtualized HSMs. That's the hardware security module that we can leverage to securely generate, store and protect our secrets, our cryptographic keys in this case. Now, self managed keys are typically not the default and they may have a cost. It's worth understanding what would drive the need to self-manage your keys because the CSP is generally speaking always going to default to offering to manage those keys for you. So organizations that use multiple cloud providers may need to retain physical control over key management and use a BYOK or bring your own key strategy. So do know that generally to let the CSP manage the keys is a good idea unless you have requirements that mandate your organization manages the keys. For example, regulatory compliance sometimes necessitates BYOK or self-managed strategies. To recap, multi-cloud and regulatory compliance are two scenarios that can drive the need for BYOK or self-managed key functionality. There are a few other cloud encryption scenarios related to storage, cloud services, and applications you should be familiar with on the exam. We'll touch on a few of those here, starting with storage level encryption. That's encryption of data as it's written to storage, utilizing keys that are controlled by the CSP, at least by default, unless you opt otherwise. And generally speaking, you'll find that your CSPs now, AWS and, and Azure, for example, will encrypt data in their storage accounts by default, just out of an abundance of caution. Volume level encryption provides encryption of data written to volumes connected to specific VM instances, utilizing keys controlled by the customer. The underlying technology in this case is quite usually BitLocker for Windows and DMCrypt for Linux. And then we have object level encryption, which is encryption of objects as they are written to storage, in which case the CSP likely controls the keys and could potentially access the data. That would typically be an insider scenario, a malicious insider, but possible. So to give you a bit of context, I want to do a little show and tell of storage level encryption in the cloud. And again, the CCSP exam is cloud service provider agnostic. I'm going to show you an example in Microsoft Azure. AWS has 
similar functionality. You're not going to see any hands-on questions on the exam, but this will be important context to help you understand what's typically available and how it works. So here on the Microsoft Azure portal, I'll click on storage accounts, and then I'm going to click on one of my existing storage accounts, and we'll start under encryption. And here I can see with the message by default, this storage account is encrypted. It encrypts the data as it's written into the data center and then automatically decrypted when we access it. And for storage services in your major cloud service providers, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, I would say that's generally speaking the default. You'll notice that infrastructure encryption is possible. So this is an additional layer of encryption, a second layer of encryption. They sometimes call double encryption. And you'll also see here that it shows me that Microsoft is managing the keys, but we do see that there's a customer managed keys option, should that be necessary for my scenario. Now I'm going to scroll down a bit and look at some other security related settings. So I see here that we can require secure transfer. That means we are disallowing HTTP without that TLS encryption. We are disallowing unsecure versions of server message block commonly used in file services. I can allow or disallow blob public access. So I can configure even anonymous access if my scenario requires it. And I can also allow or disallow account key access. When we disable this, any requests to the account that are authorized with a shared key would be denied. Disabling that setting once enabled could allow me to reverse a previous decision that I regret. Now I'm going to go up under data management here and click on data protection and just see what other features are available to me here. So I see I can enable operational backup with Azure Backup, point in time restore, soft delete. Think of soft delete as a recycle bin for your deleted items from your storage blobs or containers. We can enable permanent delete for soft deleted items, some version tracking and a blob change feed. So really some audit trail of a fashion. And if I scroll up here under networking, I'll click on networking under security and networking. You'll see here that I can enable or disable public network access. I can enable from selected virtual networks and IP addresses. And you see I can add existing virtual networks or new networks. And then I also have a resource firewall here, a storage resource firewall. I can add my own IP address. You see it automatically identifies my IP, but I can add IP addresses or CIDR ranges. And when I scroll down here under exceptions, you'll notice that they allow Azure services on the trusted services list to access this storage account. That's going to be very handy if we're using multiple Azure services and we need one of those services to access data in this storage account. And that concept of essentially a resource firewall that we see here is not specific just to storage. You'll see resource firewalls come up in multiple cloud service contexts. Enabling us to restrict the flow to cloud services from the internet. So we see here in the storage example, uh, that's definitely a handy feature. So I hope that little show and tell was helpful. So back to our cloud encryption scenarios. Next up is file level encryption, which is implemented in client apps, word processing apps like Microsoft Word or collaboration apps like SharePoint. How encryption is implemented will vary by app and CSP platform, of course. Then there's application level encryption, which is implemented in an application typically using object storage. Data entered by the user is typically encrypted before storage. And then we have database level encryption. This is transparent data encryption. It encrypts database files, logs, and backups. Uh, we have column level and row level encryption as well as data masking. Now the functionality is going to vary by your relational database management system. So Microsoft SQL functionality will differ slightly from MySQL and PostgreSQL. Typically, they all have some flavor of every one of these options. You'll need to be familiar with data obfuscation techniques for the exam, and I thought we'd cover these through an example, a use case, reducing our GDPR exposure. So if we wanted to reduce or eliminate our GDPR requirements, 
We could try data anonymization, which is the process of removing all relevant data so it's impossible to identify the original subject or person. If we do this effectively, GDPR is no longer relevant for the anonymized data. On the other hand, we can no longer recognize the original subject or person, so this is only good if we don't need the data. Anonymization is sometimes called de-identification. In fact, de-identification was the term used in the 2019 version of the exam. We don't see that in the syllabus any longer. Then we have pseudonymization, which is the de-identification procedure using pseudonyms or aliases to represent the other data, the original subject or person. This can result in less stringent requirements than would otherwise apply under GDPR. You want to use this if you need the data and you want to reduce your exposure. I find it helps to explain hashing by talking about how hashing is different from encryption. So encryption is a two-way function. What is encrypted can be decrypted with the proper key. Hashing is a one-way function that scrambles plain text to produce a unique message digest. Conversion of a string of characters into a shorter fixed length value. There's no way to reverse a hash if it's properly designed. A few common uses would include verification of digital signatures, generation of pseudo-random numbers, and integrity services. So we see hashes used with a file hash, for example. I can hash a file, send it to another person. They can then produce the hash for that same file if I'm using the MD5 hash, for example. If the recipient produces the MD5 hash and it matches the hash of the original file, we know that the integrity is intact. We received the same file that was sent. But that file hash comparison is far and away the most common that comes to mind. So a good hash function has five requirements. They must allow input of any length. They must provide fixed length output. And they make it relatively easy to compute the hash function for any input. They provide one-way functionality. What is hashed cannot be reversed. And it must be collision-free. And that collision problem is one of the reasons we don't see the MD5 hashing function used anymore. It's because it has a collision problem in certain scenarios. We'll see MD5 hashing used in file hashing in comparison, but that's really about it these days. So data masking. So we only have partial data left once we've masked data in a field. For example, a credit card would be shown as a series of asterisks with only partial data. We'll see a similar technique used for social security numbers. Commonly implemented within the database tier, but it's also possible in code of front-end applications. And we have another good opportunity here for a quick show and tell for database level encryption in the cloud. We'll take a quick look at Azure SQL Database. Again, the exam is CSP agnostic, and the features we look at here will vary by relational database management system, but this will give you a good idea of some of the features available for a PaaS database solution in a major CSP. So here in the Microsoft Azure portal, I click on SQL servers and I see the server instances for the Azure SQL database service. So if I click on one of these servers, I can scroll down here and under data management, I can see some information about backups. So there's a built-in backup feature in this PaaS service and you'll notice it mentions databases are backed up automatically and the backups are listed below. Now, if I jump over to retention policies, I can see a bit more information. I can configure my retention policies, it mentions, and my point in time restores are available from one to 35 days based on my preference. And my long-term retention policies enable me to keep full backups for up to 10 years. Definitely very relevant when we're talking about data retention later in this video. Now I'm going to go down just a bit further and under security, I'll click on networking and here I'll see some familiar features. You'll notice I can enable or disable public network access. So it's either disable or selected networks. And if I scroll down, I can configure virtual networks. I can gate which virtual networks in my subscription can get to this particular service instance. If I scroll down a bit further, you see firewall rules. So again, that resource firewall functionality. So I can add an IP address or even a CIDR range. And when I scroll a bit further, I see the exception 
checkbox to allow Azure services and resources to access this server. And I'm now going to click on SQL databases and we'll look at some database level functions under one of my database instances here. And again, I'm focused on security, so I'm going to scroll down and under security, I'll look at auditing. I see I have an option here to enable audit trail. So default audit settings include a set of action groups. So it's going to audit queries and stored procedures executed against this database, as well as successful and failed logins. Going a bit further down the list, I see dynamic data masking. And what I notice here is that it's even recommending a field that it suggests I mask, the email address field. That's going to be personally identifiable information of a sort for a user. And you'll notice here it tells me what the mask function looks like by default. So I have some native capabilities that are more or less provided for me at, with no additional effort, very little configuration effort. And just a couple of clicks down here in the menu, I see transparent data encryption, which is on here. So that's going to encrypt my database file, my backup files, and my log files. And just an FYI for later in this video, you'll also notice here a data discovery and classification feature. So when we're talking about data classification, mapping, and labeling a bit later, we see there's some built-in functionality here for our structured data. Another data protection and obfuscation technique called out in the syllabus is tokenization, where meaningful data is replaced with a token that's generated randomly, and the original data is held in a vault. It's stateless, stronger than encryption, the keys are not local. And I want to compare that to a technology we called out earlier, which is pseudonymization. It's a de-identification procedure in which personally identifiable fields within a data record are replaced by one or more artificial identifiers or pseudonyms. So reversal requires access to another data source. So in this case, tokenization goes further than pseudonymization, replacing your pseudonym with an unrecognizable token. Data loss prevention. So DLP is a system designed to identify, inventory, and control the use of data that an organization deems sensitive. It spans several categories of controls, including detective, preventative, and corrective. Policies can typically be applied to email, SharePoint, cloud storage, removable devices, and even databases. And it's a way to protect sensitive information and prevent it's inadvertent disclosure. It can identify, monitor, and automatically protect sensitive information in documents, and that automation is a very common and important characteristic. It monitors for and alerts on potential breaches and policy violations like oversharing, but the protections travel with the document, file, or other data, preventing local override of DLP protections. And preventing local override is a key point there. So let's shift gears and talk keys, secrets, and certificate management. So keys are most often used for encryption operations and they can be used to uniquely identify a user or system. Keys should be stored in a tool that implements encryption and requires a strong passphrase or MFA to access in the cloud. That is typically a key vault, which we talked about in domain one. Now secrets are often a secondary authentication mechanism used to verify that a communication has not been hijacked or intercepted. Certificates are used to verify the identity of a communication party and they're also used for asymmetric encryption by providing a trusted public key. Remember the trusted public key is used by the sending party to encrypt the data which is then decrypted by the recipient using their private key which hasn't been shared. And we also talked about how certificates and asymmetric encryption are often used to encrypt a shared session key or other symmetric key for secure transmission. So it helps us overcome that weakness of symmetric encryption, which is key distribution, secure key distribution. Next up, we have key management services. So all your CSPs offer a cloud service for centralized secure storage of application secrets called a vault. 
And in Azure, that's Key Vault. In AWS, it's called Key Management Services. In Google Cloud Platform, it's Cloud KMS Vault. And a secret in this context is anything that you want to control access to, like API keys, passwords, certificates, tokens, or cryptographic keys. And the service will typically offer programmatic access via API to support DevOps and continuous integration and continuous deployment or delivery, which is CICD. Access control is generally offered at the Vault instance level as well as to the secrets stored within. So I think of that instance level security as management plane security and then to the secrets that's data plane security. But your secrets and keys can generally be protected either by software or by a FIPS 140-2 level 2 validated HSM. This is a good opportunity for another quick show and tell of a service you may not have seen in the real world, and that's Key Vault for Secrets Management. So we'll take a quick look at some of the features in Azure Key Vault. I'm here in the Azure portal. I'm going to search for Key Vault, and I'll look at one of my existing Key Vault instances here in Azure. I'll look under Access Control. This is where we configure access to the Key Vault itself, that management plane security. I'm going to click on Add. Role Assignment, and here I see a number of existing security roles with Key Vault in the name, which give me options for easily assigning least privileged access to delegates who need access to this Key Vault, so I can give them just enough permissions. Now under Access Policies, I can configure the permissions at the data plane to the secret types and the operations themselves. We're going to look at my permissions at the data plane here. And I see I have permissions for keys, for secrets, for certificates. And I'll scroll down here. I see some other privileged operations, some key rotation uh, permissions. So quite a lot of granularity in permissions there. Now I'm going to jump down to the objects menu here. And here I'll see my secret types. I have keys, secrets, certificates. And if we look at keys, I'll just click generate or import, and I can generate or import or restore a key from backup. We see I can choose my key type here, RSA or elliptic curve, my key size. I can set activation and expiration dates. I can enable or disable this key. I have rotation policy options, exportability. Now more interesting perhaps are certificates, and I think you'll find generally speaking some advanced functionality across all your CSPs. We'll look at the Azure capabilities here. So I can generate a new cert. I can import an existing. I see here I can create a self-signed certificate, perfectly okay for development purposes, but I can also issue a certificate from an integrated CA or a non-integrated CA. So an integrated CA in this case is a trusted certificate authority that has been integrated into Azure Key Vault to provide enhanced lifecycle Capability. So you'll notice here I can automatically renew the certificate at a given percentage lifetime or a number of days before expiry. So I have some advanced functionality here. And we'll go away from here. I want to look at the properties just to show you one more area where we see some advanced functionality built into the Key Vault feature. So there's a soft delete feature. Think recycle bin for Key Vault, so the soft delete's been enabled for this vault, and we can also set a retention period for deleted vaults and secrets. So you see for deleted vaults we have 90 days, and we have purge protection. So if we enable purge protection, it enforces a mandatory retention period for deleted vaults and vault objects. So I have quite a lot of functionality in the Key Vault. So that's just a quick tour if you've never seen a Key Vault before, now you have. Next, I want to look at digital signatures with you. Digital signatures are similar in concept to handwritten signatures on printed documents that identify individuals, but they provide more security benefits. It's an encrypted hash of a message, encrypted with the sender's private key, and in a signed email scenario, it provides three key benefits. Authentication, it positively identifies the sender of the email. Ownership of a digital signature or secret key is bound to a specific user, so it gives us non-repudiation. The sender cannot later deny sending the message. 
This is sometimes required with online transactions. And integrity, it provides assurances that the message has not been modified or corrupted. Recipients know that the message was not altered in transit. These basics should be more than enough for the CCSP exam if you see a digital signatures question. So key management refers to the management of cryptographic keys in a crypto system, and operational considerations include dealing with generating keys, exchanging these keys, storing these keys securely, their use, uh, destruction of keys at the end of their life cycle, crypto shredding we talked about earlier, as well as replacement of keys when they are lost or compromised. Design considerations would include cryptographic protocol design, uh, your key server configuration, the number of key servers, their roles, uh, user procedures, and other relevant protocols. Now, the certificate authority, sometimes called a certification authority, depending on the vendor you're working with, certificate authorities create digital certificates and own the policies related to those certificates. And a PKI hierarchy can include a single certificate authority that serves as the root certificate authority and the issuing authority, the one that's issuing the certificates. This is not recommended. The reason being... In a single layer PKI hierarchy, if the server is breached, no certificate, including the root certificate, can be trusted. Your entire PKI hierarchy at that point is suspect and untrustworthy. Let's talk certificate types for a moment. So we have a user certificate that's used to represent a user's digital identity, and more often than not, that certificate is mapped back to a user account. A root certificate is a trust anchor in a PKI environment. It represents the root certificate authority from which trust of the entire chain is derived. In a conversation where entities, be those users or servers, are authenticating one another with certificates, each side must trust the root of the opposing side. If it's not trusted, the certificate's not going to be accepted. But that root is the root certificate authority. A domain validated certificate is an X.509 certificate that proves ownership of a domain name. And extended validation certificates provide a higher level of trust in identifying the entity that's using the certificate. These are commonly used in the financial services sector. And our PKI hierarchy includes an issuing CA, a subordinate CA, or intermediate or policy CA it's sometimes called, and the root CA, or Certificate Authority. So let's look at the roles of these three in a bit more detail. So the root Certificate Authority is usually maintained in an offline state. It issues certificates to new subordinate Certificate Authorities, and the root CA, other than when it needs to issue those certificates, where there's an operation where it is absolutely required, it's powered off. The subordinate CA is also called a policy CA or an intermediate CA. It depends on the vendor you're working with. But that subordinate CA issues certificates to new issuing CAs. And the issuing CA is where certificates for clients, servers, devices, websites, etc. are all issued. All of your day-to-day -day certificate issuance comes from here. So that path, that chain from the issuing CA up to the root, is your chain of trust. And we could consolidate these functions into fewer servers. You can have a two-level hierarchy or even a single-level hierarchy, but you're going to have a less resilient public key infrastructure. In that single-level hierarchy, if the server is compromised, your root of trust is compromised as well. So your entire PKI is, is blown. At that point, you have to go to ground. And a three-tier hierarchy, if the issuing CA is compromised, we can, we can recover without having to reestablish the entire org. So let's just unpack a few important details about that subordinate CA, that intermediate CA, and talk about how it helps us in the event of compromise. So the subordinate CA regularly issues certificates, so typically we don't have them staying offline as often as you would a root. 
they do have the ability to revoke certificates, making it easy for us to recover if a breach does happen. So if a if we have a breach at an issuing CA, the subordinate can revoke that issuing CA certificate. We can issue a new one and deploy a new issuing CA. Now, any certificates coming from that issuing server that was compromised, those will have to be reissued as well, but we can recover. So when that issuing CA is breached, we just revoke the certificate and issue a new one and then reissue those affected client certificates. But a single compromise CA does not result in compromise of the root when we have that multi-tier hierarchy. If we have two or three layers, we're good. So let's talk about the certificate revocation list, which contains information about any certificates that have been revoked by a subordinate CA due to a compromise to the certificate or the PKI hierarchy. CAs are required to publish CRLs, but it's up to certificate consumers, the client, if they check these lists and how they respond if a certificate has been revoked. So it's up to client behavior. So let's talk about certificate revocation. So revoking or invalidating a certificate before it has actually expired. A certificate in this case is effectively canceled and the certificate serial number is added to that certificate revocation list or CRL. But parties checking the certificate to verify identity or authenticity must check the issuing authority on validity. Two potential options for tracking revocation are to ask for the CRL or if available, the OCSP endpoint or service, the online certificate status protocol endpoint. The endpoint to query for CRL or OCSP is actually listed on the certificate itself. And if the other client or service, again, doesn't check the CRL or the OCSP for validity, they may accept an invalid certificate as valid. The benefit of online certificate status protocol is that it offers a faster way to check a certificate status compared to downloading a CRL, which contains a list of all the certificates that have been revoked in that organization, and that list can grow quite long. So it's not great performance. With OCSP, the consumer of a certificate can submit a request to the OCSP endpoint listed on the certificate to obtain the status of a specific certificate. Now a certificate signing request records identifying information for a person or a device that owns a private key as well as information on the corresponding public key. It's the message that's sent to the CA in order to get a digital certificate created. And the common name is the fully qualified domain name of the entity, like a web server, which you'll see on a certificate. You'll see a CN. It might help you if we take just a minute and look at these properties on an actual certificate. So if you just click the Windows key on a Windows machine and type certificates, you'll get the certificates snap in. And I'll go to trusted publishers and certificates, and I'm going to look at this VPN certificate I use for testing every now and again. And I click on that cert and it brings up the properties here. If I go to details, I can see the serial number of the cert, the uh, signature algorithm, so the cryptographic algorithm used, validity, to and from dates. If I scroll down just a bit here under the subject, I'll see that common name, the CN I mentioned right there on the top line. And I scroll a bit further, I can see the usage of this certificate. So it's a code signing cert. I see the CRL distribution point. So the CRL distribution point or CDP gives us the path to the certificate revocation list. And you see it's expressed in the form of a URL, which ends in a file with a .crl extension. Scroll down a bit further, if I look at authority information access, this is where the OCSP endpoint is published, the Online Certificate Status Protocol endpoint. And there you'll see that's also expressed as a URL. So it's really just up to your client to make the call. And moving on, that brings us to 2.4, which is Implement Data Discovery. And in this section, we'll be focused on structured data, unstructured data, and new in the 2022 exam, they mention semi-structured data directly here in the syllabus. And we'll also talk about the effects of data location on 
the data discovery process. Let's start with a look at structured data. This is data that's contained in rows and columns like an Excel spreadsheet or a relational database. So Microsoft Excel, Microsoft SQL, MySQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, all relational databases that would fall into this structured category. It often includes a description of its format known as a data model or a schema, which is an abstract view of the data's format in a system. We'll often hear relational databases referred to as schematized data. And the data is structured as elements, rows, or tuples, and given context through that schema. So how do we discover data, sensitive data, in a structured database? Well, metadata that describes the data is a critical part of discovery because it will give us some hint as to what the data represents. Semantics, or the meaning of the data, is described in the schema or the data model and explains relationships expressed in data. Next, we have unstructured data. This is data that cannot be contained in a row-column database, and it does not have an associated data model. There is no schema. Images, video files, social media posts generally fall into this category. Discovery occurs through content analysis, which attempts to parse all data in a storage location and identify sensitive information. So how does that content analysis, that discovery take place? Well, there are a few methods. Uh, pattern matching is one which compares data to known formats like credit card numbers. DLP tools often have predefined sensitive data types that will look for credit cards, social security numbers, banking information, and the like. And many of these DLP tools will have some image-based recognition as well, some OCR and other capabilities. There's lexical analysis, which attempts to find data meaning and context to discover sensitive information that may not conform to a specific pattern. And then there's hashing, which attempts to identify known data by calculating a hash of files and comparing it to a known set of sensitive file hashes. This is only useful for data that does not change frequently. And then there's semi-structured data, which is a combination of structured and unstructured data. Quite often it's unstructured content that contains metadata that facilitates organizing the data. It's fluid, but it's organizable by properties or metadata. Good examples here would include JSON, XML, HTML, email messages, NoSQL databases. This is really a mix of data types that will require a combination of discovery methods and tooling capable of discovery in these commingled data types. So really it's going to take elements of structured and unstructured discovery to fully discover data in a semi-structured scenario effectively. But let's talk about that a bit further in the context of data location and discoverability. The location of data will impact both its discoverability and the choice of tools we use to perform discovery. So tools must be able to access data to perform the scanning and analysis needed in the discovery process, of course. This may require different tools for cloud and on-premises discovery. Not all cloud solutions may offer a local agent for on-premises, something we need to consider in tool selection. Network-based DLP tools may not analyze all traffic between on-premises endpoints and the cloud, so another consideration. An optimal DLP approach will discover data in on-premises and in cloud repositories as well as data in transit. Well, why would that be important? Well where the data is going could matter, right? If we have a sensitive email going out and that's going from one employee to another who are both authorized to see the data, that may be no problem. But if that email is going to an external party, we may want to encrypt that automatically on the way out the door so the recipient can't read it. The same could be true of oversharing of sensitive data through a collaboration platform like SharePoint. If we can't evaluate our data in transit, there's potentially a big gap there that leads to data leakage. And our tools must be able to scan unstructured data within structured data sources like relational databases. A good example of this would be a problem description inside a help desk ticket stored in a SQL database. We have a problem description that's just unstructured free text, but it's stored within a structured data repository. So when we have both structured and unstructured data in the same repository, it's often going to increase our tool cost and complexity. 
it may also present classification challenges. We might not be able to classify that specific row of data if our tool won't support it, and that can lead to some less attractive consequences. If we have to put a single classification label on a large data source, the most sensitive classification found would apply. So in the case of that help desk ticket stored inside a SQL database, if there's sensitive data within that ticket, we might have to put a single very sensitive classification on a large repository that has a bunch of less sensitive data there. So tooling will matter in that case. So data discovery ensures that data is appropriately classified for protection. Discovery is really the first step, so we can then classify. So metadatabase discovery is a list of traits and characteristics about specific data elements or sets. It's often automatically created at the same time as the data. And then there's label-based discovery, which is based on examining labels created by the data owners during the create phase of our secure data lifecycle. Or we can do that in bulk with a scanning tool often, which may use built-in sensitive data types that I described earlier. You might see this used with structured data with a relational database. It's certainly going to be much more common with file data. That brings us to 2.5, which is implement data classification. Once we've discovered our data, we're now going to classify. We'll talk about data classification policies, data mapping, and data labeling. So let's just do a simple comparison of data classification in the government context versus a public entity or a commercial company. So at the lowest level of classification, we have unclassified data, what we'd call public data in the non-government space. So no damage if exposed. One level higher, we have confidential or sensitive data where the organization is going to sustain some damage. Now, the type of damage that the organization would sustain in the government context at a certain level of classification, we're talking about national secrets that could endanger human life. In the public context, we're talking about corporate reputation, uh, competitive disadvantage, or monetary loss. The next level of classification, we have secret, or what we call private data on the public side, uh, where the organization could sustain serious damage. And then at the highest level of classification, we have top secret and confidential or proprietary. And we see some common terms here, right? We see serious damage at the secret slash private level. And then for top secret or confidential, we see exceptionally grave. And non-government scenarios are often called commercial or public. So let's talk through some common sensitive data types you want to know for the exam. The first is personally identifiable information, or PII. That's any information that can identify an individual, uh, their name, social security number, birth date or birthplace, biometric records. We have protected health information, or PHI, which is health-related information that can be related to a specific person. PHI is actually regulated by HIPAA High Trust. And then cardholder data, that's allowable storage of information related to credit card and debit cards and transactions. That's defined and regulated by PCI DSS, which isn't regulated in law. That was a standard put together by the big four credit card companies. Now let's talk data policies. We have a data classification policy, which would be labeling or tagging of data based on type, like PII or PHI that we just described. You could have data retention policies that ensure legal and compliance issues are addressed, retaining data for a period of time as specified in law. And then we have regulatory compliance, which for legal and compliance reasons may require us to keep certain data for different periods of time and will drive classification. It's going to be a driver of classification and retention. Just a couple of simple examples. Some financial data needs to be retained for seven years by law, and some medical data may need to be retained for 20 to 30 years, and we'll need to classify that data appropriately. Going a bit further, data classification is a process for categorization of data and defining the appropriate controls based on that category. So categories could include the data type based on its format or its structure, jurisdiction or any other legal constraints, ownership, the context of the data can be important, 
uh, contractual or business constraints. Think PCI DSS, which is contractually enforced. Trust levels and the source of origin. Value, sensitivity, criticality. We want to protect intellectual property, trade secrets, and retention and preservation. Again, retention and preservation may be driven by regulatory compliance requirements or even legal proceedings. But data should be classified as soon as possible after creation. We'll go back and look at that secure data lifecycle here in a couple of minutes and I'll remind you of where that happens. But we classify as soon as we can after creation so we can get protection in place. So mapping and labeling. So mapping informs the organization of the locations where data is present within applications and storage. It brings understanding that enables implementation of security controls and classification policies. Usually precedes classification and labeling though. Labeling goes hand in hand with the mapping process and labeling requirements that apply consistent markings to sensitive data should accompany classification. It's often applied through classification policies in DLP tools, providing a target for data protection. It's often applied in bulk using classification tools, but we discover our data, we map our data, we label our data, we classify our data, and then we protect our data. And I've talked a fair bit about the DLP process here in DLP tools, and it does occur to me that maybe you've never seen one. Maybe that's not been your role. So I think this is a great opportunity for some quick show and tell. I'm going to show you data discovery, mapping, labeling, and classification in Microsoft's cloud-based DLP solution. For a quick example of data loss prevention and information protection functionality, here is the Microsoft Purview portal at compliance.microsoft.com, and I'll start under data classification. I mentioned that some of your DLP solutions have some predefined sensitive information types. So Microsoft, for example, has over 300 here, and if I type words like driver, for example, I see predefined information types that will help me to identify driver's license numbers. There should be a credit card number identification, a sensitive info type. If I type social, I'll see social security numbers for a variety of countries. So many predefined information types. Now you can create your own custom types using regular expressions and other matching capabilities, but a lot out of the box. And there's the concept of trainable classifiers, so I can train the system to recognize documents for what they are, bank statements, my company's invoices, and the like. And you'll see that there are several here that are published off the shelf, and we can train these to be smarter based on our company's documents. So just worth noting we have that off the shelf. And I'll go over to the Content Explorer tab here under Data Classification, and the system will show me sensitive information types for which the system has already identified documents and data. For example, for all full names, it shows me 350 matches and it shows me the repositories where it's found that information. So whether it's Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, so whether it's email, collaboration, or chat, US driver's license number, similar capabilities and I can drill down to see what it's found just to make sure that it's matching as I expect. And then real quickly I want to show you the label label policy and auto labeling capability. So I'll go down the menu here to information protection and here I'll find the labels and I see some default labels have been created for general, public, confidential, highly confidential. Here's a confidential finance. And when I go to label policies, this is how I publish a label to my users so they can apply these labels from their office apps or in SharePoint sites or in email. And once published, they can apply those labels to protect their document. Now I'll go over to the auto labeling policy tab here and I'll click on create auto labeling policy just to show that we can pick the info easily that we want this label to be applied to. So for example, if my company's in the United States, I'll pick United States of America, and now I can see some of the categories and the templates that are created for me in advance. So GLBA, HIPAA, US Patriot Act, when I go to financial, I see PCI DSS, 
medical and health, there's HIPAA. So we can create these auto labeling policies using off the shelf functionality that's been created for us. And then I can choose the locations where I'd like to apply that label, or I can even configure some custom functionality there. And every platform is going to be different, but in the enterprise space, what you're going to find is that many of your DLP and information protection solutions have this sort of enhanced functionality right off the shelf. Okay, I hope that little show and tell was helpful. Now I'd like to revisit with you the secure data lifecycle, looking at the lifecycle through the lens of data classification. So as we've said in the past, data can be created by users, data can be created by systems, but after that data is created, we need to classify that data as soon as possible. It's only through classification that we can then determine appropriate protections for that data. Ideally, the data will be encrypted at rest regardless of its sensitivity. And data should be protected by adequate security controls based on its classification. So classification will drive the need for protection. And as data is used and modified, classifications may change. So our process of scanning and labeling and classifying data is an iterative process. We're scanning these repositories repeatedly. You know, certainly a user may reclassify a document when they take a harmless low sensitivity Word document and incorporate protected health information into that document. But we also need an automated bulk classification process that's going to catch those changes and reclassify that data on the fly. And then as data is shared, of course, when we're transmitting data over a network, sharing a document through a collaboration platform like SharePoint, we need to make sure that we protect that data from data leakage. If we have sensitive company information in a document, it may be fine for that data to be shared in that document within our employees, but we want to block that sharing to external entities, whether that's going through just a simple share link or through the email channel. We need to have data loss prevention capabilities to help us to secure our data and prevent that leakage in use. So data protection policies may block external sharing many times. And archival, again, is sometimes driven by laws or regulations that require us to retain data for a specific period of time, and classification can drive data retention policies. For example, the organization's annual financial reports would be classified as financial data, and that sensitive data classification will drive retention of that data based on the type of information in that document. And when data is no longer needed, it should be destroyed in a way that it is not readable, nor is it recoverable, but classification really drives the rest of the life cycle if you look at it from this perspective, including destruction. And that brings us to section 2.6, design and implement information rights management. Only two topics in this section, IRM objectives and appropriate tools. So let's start with a definition of information rights management. So an IRM program is designed to enforce data rights, provisioning access, and implementing access control models. It's often implemented to control access to data that is designed to be shared, but not freely distributed. It can be used to block specific actions, like print, copy, paste, download, and sharing. And it can provide file expiration so that documents can no longer be viewed after a specified time. Many popular SaaS file sharing platforms implement these concepts as sharing options, which allow the document owner to specify which users can view, edit, download, and share, and for how long. This always includes a cloud service. It may also include a local agent. The objectives of information rights management. You know, one is persistence. Our ability to control access, to enforce our restrictions, must follow the data meaning protection must follow that document or data wherever it travels. Dynamic policy control. So an IRM solution must provide a way to update the restrictions even after the document has been shared. IRM tools 
can enforce time-limited access to data as a form of access control. The ability to expire or revoke access require the user to check in from time to time to see if they still have access, to contact that cloud service as a prerequisite for continuing access. Continuous audit trail. An IRM solution must ensure that protected documents generate an audit trail when users interact with protected documents. It's required for accountability and non-repudiation. Interoperability. IRM solutions must offer support for users across different system types. We need support for Windows and Mac OS, desktops, laptops, mobile phones, tablets, and different apps will be important. Appropriate tools. So IRM tools comprise a variety of components necessary to provide policy enforcement and other supporting attributes of that enforcement capability. So a centralized service is one for identity proofing, certificate issuance, store of revoked certificates and access, and for unauthorized identity information access. This enables enforcement from anywhere. Secrets storage. So IRM solutions require local storage for encryption keys, tokens, or digital certificates used to validate users and access authorizations. Local storage requires protection primarily for data integrity to prevent tampering with the material local to the device used to enforce information rights management. But IRM must prevent local modification of access controls and credentials. Otherwise, a user might modify the permissions granted to extend their access beyond what the data owner originally specified, whether that's extending the period of time or the level of access. Bottom line, local changes must never supersede controls implemented by the cloud service. Now, since certificate revocation was called out in the syllabus in section 2.6, I want to revisit the key management strategy for the encryption key lifecycle just to touch on certificate revocation, which we talked about a bit earlier. So the process for revoking access at separation, a policy breach, device or key compromise happens in the revocation stage. And how exactly that revocation goes down will depend on the IRM solution you're working with, but if we think about it in the PKI context with certificate revocation, you would revoke the certificate on the issuing certificate authority. Presumably you would remove access control settings for a particular user, revoke that access, and the IRM solution would handle some of this in the background for you. But at the end of the day, that revocation of the certificate would be recorded on the certificate revocation list and activity logged as part of the audit trail. So let's talk about intellectual property protections for just a moment. And I want to talk about intellectual property not because you will be tested on this directly, but because I see these mentioned uh, in part at least in the official study guide and to a lesser degree in the common body of knowledge. So I think the basics of intellectual property protections in the U.S. may be something you're just expected to already have knowledge of. So we'll touch on these just briefly. So there's trademarks, which cover words, slogans, and logos used to identify a company and its products or services. So that would be a trademark to cover the Apple logo, for example, or Nike's slogan, Just Do It. A trademark lasts 10 years, it can be renewed. Patents protect the intellectual property rights of inventors. A patent provides the inventor exclusive use of their invention for a period of time, generally 20 years. And filing requires public disclosure, which is undesirable in some cases. That's where trade secrets come into play. Intellectual property of an inventor that is absolutely critical of their business and must not be disclosed is a great candidate for a trade secret. It's valid as long as secrecy is maintained and not discovered by others. Once it's no longer a secret, protection is lost. And then there's copyright, which is automatically granted to the creator of a work upon creation, but can be registered. It prevents others from reusing. And copyright protection lasts 70 years beyond the creator's death. Then the work moves into the public domain where it is freely reusable. And that brings us to 2.7, plan and implement data retention, deletion, 
and archiving policy. So here we'll touch on data retention policies, data deletion procedures and mechanisms, data archiving procedures and mechanisms, and the concept of legal hold. So I want to revisit the secure data life cycle with you in the context of retention and data destruction. So retention is driven by security policies and regulatory requirements. Retention happens here between archival and destruction. Audits or lawsuit may require production of some data and that may trigger retention. Now Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, requires tax returns are kept for seven years and payroll and bank statements are kept forever. Sarbanes-Oxley is a regulatory requirement of every publicly traded company in the U.S. Now, when data is no longer needed, it should be destroyed in a way that it is not readable. And keeping data longer than needed increases risk, and organizations know this. They know they cannot produce data that they do not have for a legal case. So when data hits the end of its retention requirement, it should be destroyed. And that's where crypto shredding, secure destruction, comes into play. We touched on crypto shredding briefly in Domain 1. We'll touch on it again here. So this is cryptographic erasure. Data is encrypted with a strong encryption engine. The keys used to encrypt the data are then encrypted using a different encryption engine. Then keys from the second round of encryption are destroyed. On the pro side, data cannot be recovered from any remnants. The downside here is high CPU and performance overhead. There's a lot of processing involved. Now, if the exam poses questions on secure data destruction, this is almost certainly the answer. But know the steps of crypto shredding for the exam. So data archiving refers to placing data in long-term storage for a variety of purposes. The optimal approach in the cloud differs in several respects from the on-premises equivalent. So key elements of data archiving in the cloud. Data encryption, data monitoring, e-discovery, and retrieval. We need all of these capabilities. Backup and DR options. And the data format and media type do matter. We need to think about our ability to search and retrieve data from an archive. So let's talk about each of these six at greater depth. So we'll start with encryption. Our encryption policy should consider which media is used and our data search and restoration needs as well as our regulatory obligations. We need the right balance of security and retrievability, searchability. What threats should be mitigated by the encryption? How will the encryption keys be managed? Long-term archiving with encryption can present key management challenges. Access controls and encryption are important to protect data integrity by preventing unauthorized access. Then we have data monitoring. So data stored in the cloud tends to be replicated as part of storage resiliency or business continuity and disaster recovery. To maintain data governance, it is required that all data access and movements be tracked and logged. Monitoring to ensure all security controls are being applied properly throughout the data lifecycle, also important. Accountability, traceability, and auditability should be maintained at all times. E-discovery and retrieval. Archived data may be subject to retrieval according to certain parameters like dates, subjects, and authors. This could be due to audit requirements or even a legal proceeding, but retrieval can definitely become important. The archiving platform should provide the ability to perform e-discovery on the data to determine which data should be retrieved. So we only retrieve the data that is necessary, the minimum necessary. Data that is subject to more frequent search should be kept in a service that enables e-discovery with a manageable level of effort. We need to ensure that staff can manage the e-discovery support burden. If we take logs and store them in a raw format in blob storage in the cloud, that's not going to give us great searchability. That's going to be high effort for our staff. So we need to balance the need for security and cost controls with our operational overhead. Then we have backup and DR operations. 
So all requirements for data backup and restore should be specified and clearly documented. And business continuity and disaster recovery plans are updated and aligned with whatever procedures are implemented. We need to know our options here. And when it comes to backup and DR of our archive data, both resiliency to disaster, ensuring archive data availability and knowledge and control of data replication are both important. So data format and media type. This is an important consideration because it may be kept for an extended period and the format needs to be secure, accessible, and affordable. Media type should support the other data archiving requirements, but physical media concerns fall to the CSP. At the end of the day, we want to make sure we are storing our data in a secure, easily accessible, but also affordable fashion. You're often paying by the gig in the cloud, so we want to be careful. Now, AWS S3 and Azure Storage both offer cool tier, infrequent access storage for low cost archiving, and they generally speaking have an immutability flag you can flip to ensure integrity. You might get your data storage down to less than a penny a gig in those cool tier options, but your searchability, your accessibility is certainly going to be less versus keeping that uh, accessible and indexed through an e-discovery feature. Often cloud storage is billed by the gig, so beware of cost. However, just balance with your access needs. That's the bottom line. That's your takeaway for the exam. And legal hold is called out explicitly in the exam syllabus, so let's touch on some details here. Legal hold protects any documents that can be used in evidence in legal proceedings from being altered or destroyed. Data protection suites in the cloud often have a feature to ensure immutability, which ensures that the data marked immutable cannot be modified. In fact, when we look at cloud storage like Azure Storage or AWS S3, they offer an immutable storage feature, so I can mark a container as immutable. When we think about data protection software, Legal Hold generally implements permanent retention until a human authorizes release when the possibility of production and legal proceedings has passed. A legal hold is sometimes called a litigation hold. And that brings us to another good opportunity for a quick show and tell. And we'll revisit that same cloud suite we explored for data classification, for labeling and mapping. And we'll have a look this time at data retention. Again, just for some real world context as you consume these concepts for exam day. So we're back again to the Microsoft Purview Compliance Portal at compliance.microsoft.com. And to see the retention label functionality, I'll scroll down here to data lifecycle management and under Microsoft 365, I see retention policies. And here I will find some retention policies that have already been created. So for example, let's just click on personal financial PII and I'll click on edit so we can look at how this policy is configured. And I see here it has a name, a description, and they have options here for adaptive or static scopes. So I can configure a policy to be adaptive where it automatically uh, adapts based on labels and other functionality to include new locations in the retention policy. So we'll look at the current settings, which are static. And under here, I can see that it's applied to multiple locations to different types of data. So we see email, we see collaboration with SharePoint, OneDrive, which would be our file data, more mailbox data, Skype for business. So applying across a number of locations, but if I also look over here to the included column, I can see to whom and what this applies. So for example, I see it applies to all mailboxes, all SharePoint sites, all user accounts, all Microsoft 365 groups for the group mailboxes and sites. And let's have a look at our retention settings. So I see here it's applying for seven years and it's applying that retention when the items are created. You see I have the option here to change that to apply that seven year retention to when the items were last modified. And then you'll notice I have some options here in terms of what to do at the end of the retention period. I can delete the item automatically, I can do nothing, I can retain the item forever, or only delete when they reach a certain age. So I have a number of functional options here in terms of 
what we call record disposition, what we do at the end of the retention life cycle. And that's really all I have to show you on this one. Quite simple, really. And again, this is a CSP agnostic exam. This is purely just to give you a real world example, to give you a bit of additional context for the concepts we were talking about here. And with our show and tell out of the way, we're now ready to move on to section 2.8, design and implement auditability, traceability, and accountability of data events. Our last section of domain two, We'll touch on definition of event sources and requirement of event attributes, logging, storage, and analysis of data events, as well as chain of custody and non-repudiation. So let's start with accountability. So accountability is maintained for individual subjects using auditing. Logs record user activity and users can be held accountable for their logged actions. It directly promotes good user behavior and compliance with the organization's security policy. When folks know someone is watching, they tend to behave. Simple as that. Security audits and reviews. So these help ensure that management programs are effective and being followed. They're commonly associated with account management practices to prevent violations with least privilege or need to know principles. They can also be performed to oversee many programs and processes. So security audits and reviews are useful in maintaining programs like patch management, vulnerability management, change management, configuration management. Periodic audits and reviews to ensure our processes are being followed are helpful in a wide variety of areas. So let's talk about event sources and attributes in the context of auditability, traceability, and accountability of our data events. So OWASP provides a comprehensive set of definitions and guidelines for identifying, labeling, and collecting data events. It ensures events are useful and pertinent to applications and security, whether in a cloud or a traditional data center. So the definition of event sources, which events are important, and available for capture will vary based on cloud service model that we're employing, whether that's IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. So let's take a look at that. And we'll start with IaaS, so with our IaaS event sources. Within an IaaS environment, the cloud customer has the most access and visibility into system and infrastructure logs of any cloud service model. That's because the cloud customer has nearly full control over their compute environment, including system and network capabilities. Virtually all logs and data events should be exposed and available for capture. This is because the customer has more responsibility than in any other cloud model. If you go back and look at the shared responsibility model in domain one, that becomes crystal clear. Moving on to PaaS event sources. A PaaS environment does not offer or expose the same level of customer access to infrastructure and system logs as IaaS. However, the same level of logs and events is available at the application level, again due to responsibility. Responsibility for system and infrastructure in PaaS belongs to the cloud service provider, so we have less access to those logs. And that brings us to software as a service. Now, because in a SaaS environment, the CSP is responsible for the entire infrastructure and application, the amount of log data available to the cloud customer is understandably less. Customer responsibility is limited to access control, shared responsibility for data recovery, and feature configuration. So in this case, service responsibility equates to log visibility. So let's take a look at the who, what, where, and when of logging from OWASP, where we find some excellent guidance. Ultimately, logs should be able to answer the question, who did what and when. Sufficient user ID attribution should be accessible or it may be impossible to determine who performed a specific action at a specific time. This is called identity attribution. In my mind, this goes a step further. Now it's, this is what's necessary for non-repudiation. When I think of it, I think of who did what, when, and from where. I like to know a bit about the device and the location as well. But at the end of the day, who did what and when is 
the minimum we should be focused on. So in terms of who, OWASP advises we need source address and user identity if known. And the what would include type of event, severity of event, security relevant event flags if the log contains non-security events, as well as a description. And the where, application provider, application address, the service, geolocation, window, four page, the URL, HTTP method, code location, the script of the module name, and the when. And for when, we see log date and time, event date and time, and the interaction identifier. So while the question we need to answer is who did what and when, you can see from the who, what, where, and when why I would also ask who did what, when, and from where. And you can find this OWASP guidance in the OWASP logging cheat sheets that they maintain for developers on building application logging mechanisms, especially related to security logging. You'll find these cheat sheets on GitHub at the URL you see here. I've also included that URL in the video description. You simply go to that URL, browse to the cheat sheets folder, and click on the logging cheat sheet.md. That's a markdown file. So logs are worthless if you do nothing with the log data. They're made valuable only through the process of review. That is, they are valuable only if the organization makes use of them to identify activity that is unauthorized or compromising. Now, a security information event monitoring tool can help solve some of these problems by offering some key features. Log centralization and aggregation, data integrity, and normalization, giving us a standardized event format, even when it's pulling data from many disparate sources. Automated or continuous monitoring, alerting, and investigative monitoring. Now we will cover the SIM in depth in Domain 5, but while we're here, let's touch on these six key concepts that are called out. So the SIM features necessary to optimize event detection and visibility and to scale our security operations. So log centralization and aggregation, so rather than leaving log data scattered around the environment on various hosts, the SIM platform can gather logs from a variety of sources, including operating systems, applications, network appliances, user devices, providing a single location to support investigations. And when we have all those disparate sources of data, it gives us greater context as to how activities, including bad actors, are moving about our environment. It gives us a better idea of the scope of an incident. There's data integrity, so the SIM should be on a separate host with its own access control, preventing any single user from tampering. Very easy to do in the cloud. Normalization. SIMs can normalize incoming data to ensure that data from a variety of sources is presented in a consistent format. Automated or continuous monitoring, so sometimes referred to as correlation, SEMs use algorithms to evaluate data and identify potential attacks or compromises. And alerting, SEMs can automatically generate alerts like emails or tickets when action is required based on analysis of incoming log data. Investigative monitoring, so when manual investigation is required, the SEM should provide support capabilities such as querying log files and generating reports. So broad SIM visibility across the environment means better context in log searches and security investigations. When we can see into data, apps, identities, endpoints, and infrastructure all in one place, we're going to have a better idea of the big picture as it relates to a potential security incident or malicious activity. And you should be familiar with Chain of Custody, which tracks the movement of evidence through its collection, safeguarding, and analysis lifecycle. This is evidence in a legal proceeding. So what are the functions and importance of Chain of Custody? Well, it provides evidence integrity, if I were to coin a phrase. Through convincing proof, evidence was not tampered with in a way that damages its reliability. So it documents key elements of evidence movement and handling, including 
each person who handled the evidence, the date and time of movement or transfer, and the purpose for the evidence, movement, or transfer. So what if evidence is left unattended or handled by unauthorized parties? Well, then criminal defendants can claim the data was altered in a way that incriminates them and thus the evidence is no longer reliable. Chain of custody is a foundational principle of evidence handling in legal proceedings. And you should also be familiar with non-repudiation. Non-repudiation is the guarantee that no one can deny a transaction. There are a few methods to provide non-repudiation. So systems enforce non-repudiation through the inclusion of sufficient evidence and log files, including unique user identification and timestamps. Digital signatures prove that a digital message or document was not modified, intentionally or unintentionally, from the time it was signed. Based on asymmetric cryptography, a public-private key pair, it's the digital equivalent of a handwritten signature or a stamp seal. We talked about digital signatures a bit earlier. I want to just reinforce this in your memory. It's, it's definitely part of what you'll want to be familiar with on exam day. Multiple accounts make non-repudiation more difficult. If we have a user logging in with different identities, it's more difficult to track their movements and activities throughout our environment. Shared accounts make non-repudiation virtually impossible because we can then no longer tie individual actions to a specific individual beyond their ability to deny they performed those actions. And that brings us to the end of Domain 2. So let's get into Domain 3, Cloud Platform and Infrastructure Security. As always, I will cover every topic mentioned in the official exam syllabus. I'll also provide examples of concepts wherever I can to give you some additional context. And as in Domain 2, I'll also do a bit of show and tell in a real cloud environment. Again, the CCSP is CSP agnostic. It doesn't focus on any one cloud platform, but I do find a bit of show and tell in a real environment gives you some context for those areas where maybe you don't have any experience in your work life yet. So let's have a look at a few exam essentials applicable to Domain 3, those areas the official study guide promises will factor significantly on exam day. We have risks associated with each type of cloud computing. Essentially, more services generally equals more risk, and more control over your environment means more risks you are responsible for mitigating. It goes back to that shared responsibility model we first talked about in Domain 1, and we'll touch on here again in this session in multiple respects. Explain key business continuity terms like RTO, RPO, and RSL. If you are not familiar with these acronyms, you will be by the time we're done with this session. These are key concepts that help set the bar for your business continuity plan and disaster recovery plan requirements. Responsibility sharing between customer and provider. So essentially, who is responsible? Customer or CSP in each area of cloud infrastructure. We'll talk about design and description of a secure data center. We'll look at the build versus buy decision, physical and environment design considerations, and the pros and cons in each area. Business continuity and disaster recovery in the cloud. That's similar to on-premises, but there's certainly more complexity in the agreements between the cloud customer and the cloud service provider. I will add that these exam essentials are my rough mapping from the official study guide because the fact of the matter is the exam essentials and the book chapters themselves in the official study guide do not map one-to-one -to, -one to exam domains. You'll notice there are more than six chapters in the book because some domains are covered in part across each of multiple chapters. So let's jump into 3.1, Comprehend Cloud Infrastructure and Platform Components. We'll touch on several areas of infrastructure and platform here, including physical environment, network and communications, compute, virtualization, storage, and the management plane. Now, in the shared responsibility model, customer and CSP share security responsibilities. So in each area, we will review responsibilities and security controls. And who owns them? So you can imagine in... A cloud scenario will talk a bit less about the physical environment because that physical data center is entirely the domain of the cloud service provider. We will talk about how you can do 
your due diligence on ensuring that your cloud service provider is designing and managing that data center effectively. So let's start with a talk about the physical environment. So there are infrastructure components that are common to all cloud service delivery models. Most of those components are physically located with the CSP, but many are also accessible via the network. So the CSP is taking on customer data center facilities, infrastructure, and management responsibilities. They are responsible for the physical by and large. In the shared responsibility model, though, we know some elements of operation are shared by the CSP and the customer. Just a reminder for the exam, you want to know who owns which roles, who is responsible for what from that shared responsibility model. So if we think about it from a physical perspective, the CSP owns all aspects of physical security in their data centers. They own it down to the wire, the facilities, the equipment, the environment, and the personnel that care for that physical infrastructure. But the CSPs utilize common controls to address these risks. So for physical security standard measures like locks, security personnel, lights, fences, and visitor check-in procedures, just as we do in our own data center. Logical access controls like identity and access management, single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and logging, so they have an audit trail. And controls for data confidentiality and integrity, just as any cloud customer would, but with much broader controls. So let's look at what I mean by broader controls in the form of an example. So for example, ensuring that communication lines are not physically compromised by locating telecommunications equipment inside a controlled area of the CSP's building or campus. So physical security, that would be broader control. It protects data integrity and service and resource availability for that matter. So let's move on to network and communication. We'll start with IaaS, where we know the customer is responsible for configuring VMs, the virtual network, and guest OS security. But the CSP is responsible for the physical host, physical storage, and the physical network. Moving into platform as a service, the CSP is responsible for the physical components, the internal network, and the tools. It's cheaper for the customer, but the customer has less control, if you remember that diagram. In the SaaS model, the customer remains responsible for configuring access to the cloud service for their users, as well as shared responsibility for data recovery. The CSP owns physical infrastructure as well as network and communication security. So let's break it down another way. So if we just look at those three models, we'll look at IaaS first where we know that the customer is responsible for configuring the VMs, the virtual network, and the guest OS security as if the systems were on-premises. The CSP provides the tooling to secure the VM, but the customer must configure those tools. And the CSP is responsible for configuring the security of the network, the storage, and the software for the physical host. The CSP owns all physical security here. Moving into PaaS, where we know that the CSP is responsible for everything from the IaaS model, all the physical components. They are also responsible for internal network and tooling. The customer is responsible for configuring the application and data access security. Any additional customer control is generally provided through service SKUs or service tiers. And what I mean by that, for example, in a PaaS web application, uh, context, for example, you'll find some service tiers may give a customer their own physical host or access to greater compute capacity, but they have to spend to get that greater control in the form of a different service tier within that past service. So moving on to software as a service, where the customer remains responsible for configuring use access to the service. They are configuring access control for their users. The customer also has shared responsibility for data recovery. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the CSP may provide tools for recovery, but the customer may need to perform recovery themselves in some cases. Perfect example, in Office 365, users have access to hundreds of previous versions of a document available for self-service recovery right there from within Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, but the user must perform that recovery themselves. Next, we have compute. The infrastructure components that deliver compute resources like our VMs, disk, processor, memory, and network resources for customers. So how does the CSP manage compute capacity? 
Well, reservation is one way, a minimum resource that's guaranteed to a customer. You'll see that in the form of a VM SKU, for example. Limits, maximum utilization of compute resources by a customer. That's handled through a VM SKU. We can set a minimum and a maximum. Limits are allowed to change dynamically based on current conditions and consumption, remembering that a CSP is going to oversubscribe their infrastructure by design. And shares, a weighting given to a particular VM used to calculate percentage-based access to pooled resources where there's contention. And you'll even see VM SKUs that allow us to select a lesser SKU at a lesser price for non-production workloads where we know we're going to be deprioritized in times of contention, but we pay less for that resource over the course of the month as we're paying for that subscription. In case of a shortage, though, host scoring will determine who gets capacity, generally speaking. But what we see in those VM SKUs is that we can choose inexpensive SKUs that get deprioritized and have low resource limits, or expensive VM SKUs that give us very high resource guarantees. So in each delivery and service model, the CSP remains responsible for the maintenance and the security of the physical components of compute. They are dealing with that physical host and that physical storage and that physical network. The customer remains largely responsible for their data and their users, but between the physical components, there can be a, quite an array of software and other components. So who is responsible for each of these remaining parts varies by service and delivery model and sometimes by the CSP. The details should be spelled out in the contract and you want to be familiar before you enter into a production workload scenario. The CSP also deals with the challenge of multi-tenancy, and we could argue that customers deal with multi-tenancy in their own private clouds, but those multi-tenant customers are all internal customers, generally speaking, where the CSP is dealing with external customers with signed contracts, so it's certainly a stickier situation. But let's shift gears and talk about virtualization responsibilities and risks. So the security of the hypervisor is always the responsibility of the CSP. The virtual network and the virtual machine may be the responsibility of either the CSP or the customer. It depends on the cloud service model. And there are risks associated with virtualization you should be familiar with. A flawed hypervisor, for example, can facilitate inter-VM attacks. Network traffic between VMs is not necessarily visible, so bad actors posing as customers could certainly carry out attacks of their own if we don't have the right network controls in place. Resource availability for VMs can be impacted. Now we talked about how the CSP can prioritize resource allocation, but we still have that lingering worry about noisy neighbors, those neighbors that are sharing our physical infrastructure and always consuming maximum capacity. And VMs and their disk images are simply files. They can be portable and movable. So if the CSP doesn't have the right controls in place, we could fall prey to a different sort of malicious insider attack if they don't have their own separation of duties and access controls in place to limit access to those files. So let's talk through security recommendations for the hypervisor. Installing updates to the hypervisor as they're released by the vendor, of course. Restricting administrative access to the management interfaces of the hypervisor. Capabilities to monitor the security of activity occurring between guest operating systems, the VMs essentially, and then security recommendations for the guest OS. So again, installing all updates to the guest OS promptly, backing up virtual drives used by the guest OS on a regular basis. Those hypervisor recommendations are all the responsibility of the CSP. The security recommendations for the guest OS are customer responsibility, though the CSP may provide tools to facilitate ease of patching and backups. So the CSP's hypervisor security includes preventing physical access to the servers, limiting both local and remote access to the hypervisor, and the virtual network between the hypervisor and the VM is also a potential attack surface. Responsibility for security in this layer is often shared between the CSP and the customer. These components include the virtual network, virtual switches, virtual firewalls, virtual IP addresses. The responsibility is going to vary by model, whether it's IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. And when I say hypervisor in this case, just to make sure we're crystal clear, 
We talked in domain one about the hypervisor types. We have the type one, which is the bare metal hypervisor. That's VMware ESXi, Microsoft Hyper-V, KVM, dedicated host, no operating system in the middle. Whereas a type two hypervisor is hosted on a guest operating system. That would be VMware Workstation, Oracle VirtualBox. So type one is that production scenario hypervisor. Type two is much more common in development and test scenarios. So we're always talking about a type one hypervisor in this case. And again, the CSP is always responsible for security of that physical host and the hypervisor running there. Now there is a virtualization focused attack called out in both the official study guide and the common body of knowledge I wanted to mention, and that's VM escape. This is where an attacker gains access to a VM and then attacks either the host machine that holds all the VMs, the hypervisor, or any of the other VMs. Or a malicious user breaks the isolation between VMs running on a hypervisor by gaining access outside their VM. Now, VM escape is generally preventable. One protection would be ensuring patches on the hypervisor and VMs are always up to date. We do know that the CSP is responsible for patching that hypervisor. Who's responsible for the VM depends on the model. We know that the customer is responsible in the IaaS model for patching and backing up their VM. The CSP can also ensure guest privileges are low, they have server level redundancy in place, as well as host based intrusion prevention and detection. So let's shift gears and talk about storage. So, cloud storage has a number of potential security issues. Various types of cloud storage are discussed in domain one. We're going to touch on some of the highlights here in terms of risk. So, data spends most of its life at rest, so, understanding who is responsible for securing cloud storage is very important. Now, CSP responsibilities include physical protection of data centers and the storage infrastructure they contain, security patches and maintenance of the underlying data storage technologies and other data services they provide. On the customer side, properly configuring and using the storage tools. We know that sometimes the CSP is re responsible for giving us tools potentially, but the customer must configure and use those tools. And then logical security and privacy of data they store in the CSP's environment. So I want to unpack customer responsibilities a bit further. I mentioned CSPs often provide a set of controls and configuration options customers can use to secure the use of their storage platforms, but they may need to make some specific configurations beyond the default. So the customer is going to be responsible for assessing the adequacy of these controls and properly configuring and using the available controls access over public internet, VPN, or internal networks, for example. As I actually showed you in domain two, in the world of cloud storage, when we're looking at a storage account, your CSPs often give you the ability to block internet access altogether, to force TLS security for data in transit, and to limit access from internal networks. But you have to use those controls as a customer. Ensuring adequate protection for data at rest and motion is based on the capabilities offered by the CSP. Feature configuration, key management would even be a customer concern if the, the customer is managing their own keys. And configuring secure access, whether that's private or public. At the end of the day, when you're looking at a cloud service provider's storage account they've issued to you, the data is generally going to be encrypted at the account level at rest but you have a number of additional configuration options to restrict access. But the bottom line here is in the cloud, the customer loses some control over storage. They lose control of the physical medium where the data is stored, but they retain responsibility for data security and privacy. So how can customers deal with their challenges and responsibilities without control of the physical storage medium? Because after all, the inability to securely wipe physical storage and the possibility of another tenant being allocated the same previously allocated physical storage space is a definite concern. Our logical storage account sits on a physical storage medium somewhere, and the customer retains responsibility for secure deletion in spite of that lack of control over the physical medium. And that's where compensating controls come into play. For example, only storing data in an encrypted Format. As we saw in domain two in some of our show and tell, the cloud storage account was encrypted by default. We had the option 
to add another layer of encryption called double encryption. And a customer can choose to retain control of the keys needed to decrypt the data, so not allowing the cloud service provider to hold those keys. Together, these permit crypto shredding when data is no longer needed, rendering any recoverable fragments useless. So let's talk about the management plane. So what is the management plane exactly? Well, it provides the tools, the web interface, and the APIs necessary to configure, monitor, and control your cloud environment. It provides virtual management options equivalent to the physical administration options a legacy data center would provide. So we can power VMs on and off, provision new VM resources, migrate VMs, just as a few examples. You interact with the management plane through tools, including the CSP's cloud portal, PowerShell or other command line, or even client SDKs. Now, this is separate from and it works with the control plane and the data plane. So let's talk about these two for just a moment. The control plane is what you're calling when you create top-level cloud resources, such as with ARM or BICEP in Azure, CloudFormation in AWS, or even Terraform. Infrastructure as code is what I'm talking about here. And the data plane performs operations on resources created through that control plane. Essentially, management plane control equals environment control. So let's talk about securing the management plane. So the key interfaces we're worried about include the cloud portal, the main web interface for the CSP platform the Azure Portal, AWS Management Console, the Google Cloud Console. From a scheduling perspective, our ability to stop or start resources at a scheduled time, we have tools available like the Instant Scheduler or Lambda in AWS, Azure Automation or Azure Functions on the Microsoft platform. And then orchestration, automating processes to manage resources, services, workloads, and infrastructure as code deployments. Cloud Formation in AWS, Azure DevOps, on the Microsoft Platform Cloud Build in Google Cloud Platform. And then we have our maintenance functions, updating, upgrading, security, patching, etc. We can secure all of the above in the same fashion across these platforms. We secure management plane interfaces with multi-factor authentication, role-based access control, and role management. Next up is 3.2, design a secure data center. Here we'll talk through logical design elements like tenant partitioning and access control, physical design elements like location selection and the build or buy decision, environmental design, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and multi-vendor pathway, and then what the syllabus calls design resilience, so building resiliency into design. And since the CSP is responsible for design of the physical data center, we'll talk about how customers can do their due diligence to ensure that the CSP's physical data center design decisions are adequate. So we'll start with logical design, where I expect more focus will be given on the exam. And the logical design of a data center is an abstraction. In the now legacy co-location scenario, customers were separated at the server rack or cage level, so it's a physical isolation. In a logical data center design in the cloud, customers utilize software and services provided by the CSP. And the logical design of the cloud infrastructure should create tenant partitioning or isolation, limit and secure remote access, monitor the cloud infrastructure, and allow for the patching and updating of systems. The CCSP exam focuses largely on tenant partitioning and access control, which are called out in the syllabus. So we'll take a look at both of those. So in the cloud, logical isolation and CSP multi-tenancy makes cloud computing more affordable, but it creates some security and privacy concerns in the process. If isolation between tenants is breached, customer data is at risk. Multi-tenancy is a concept that was developed decades ago, though. Business centers physically housed multiple tenants. Co-location data centers supported multiple customers, but their isolation was in many respects physical, and the risk in these scenarios is largely physical. It's a server, rack, or cage isolation. In the public cloud, tenant partitioning is largely logical. Customers are sharing capacity across the CSP data center, including the physical components. CSP and tenants share responsibility for implementing and enforcing controls that address the unique multi-tenant risks of the public cloud. In this scenario, access control is a primary, if not the primary, concern. 
A single point of access certainly makes access control simpler. It facilitates monitoring through an audit trail, but any single point can become a failure point as well. In the hybrid cloud, which is very common in large organizations, a single login for on-premises and cloud can simplify identity and access management, a very common identity model. One method of access control is to federate a customer's existing identity and access management system with their CSP tenant. Another method is to facilitate identity and access management between cloud and on-premises using identity as a service. A couple of examples of identity as a service would be Azure Active Directory used in Office 365 or Google's cloud identity used with Google Workspace. There are multiple local and remote access controls available, including Remote Desktop Protocol, the native access protocol for Windows operating systems, as well as Secure Shell, which is the native remote access protocol for Linux and Unix operating systems, and very common for remote management of network devices as well. And RDP and SSH both support encryption and MFA in their modern versions. Now, Secure Terminal or console-based access is a system for secure local access. In the legacy co-location scenario, we would commonly see a keyboard, video, mouse, or KVM system with access controls to limit console access in a scenario where multiple customers have physical servers in a single shared rack. You could actually rent rack space without committing to a full rack, and that would be coupled with oversight from the Colo data center staff to ensure that one customer didn't touch another customer's physical server in that rack. Jumpbox is a bastion host at the boundary of lower and higher security zones. Your CSPs offer this as a service in some cases. We have Azure Bastion and AWS Transit Gateway as a couple of very popular examples. Virtual clients, software tools that allow remote connection to a VM for use as if it is your local machine. Virtual desktop infrastructure, or VDI, for contractors is very common in this scenario. So let's take a look at physical design, starting with the build versus buy decision. Building your own data center from scratch and buying an existing facility each have their advantages and disadvantages. So let's compare build versus buy. Build requires significant investment to build a robust data center that has the resiliency we need. Buying that capability is generally a lower cost of entry, especially in a shared scenario. The build option offers the most control over data center design. So buy has less flexibility in service design because it's limited to what the provider offers. The build option requires knowledge and skill to match the quality of the buy option. In the buy scenario, we know someone with a high level of skill, generally speaking, is designing that data center. Shared data centers do come, though, with additional security challenges. The fact of the matter is CSPs offer many advantages of the build option at a buy price tag. Customers can leverage the CSP's experience to get that build level quality and near build level flexibility, but at a buy cost of entry. So in physical design, location selection is one of the first decisions. So availability of affordable, stable, resilient electricity is important. Natural disaster exposure needs to be considered. Are we exposed to flood, hurricane, tornadoes? Availability of high-speed redundant internet connectivity, as well as other utilities. Add, say, propane, natural gas, and diesel to run your generators. Physical site security, so securing against vehicular approaches, bollards, gates, visibility. Location relative to existing customer data centers, so business continuity, disaster recovery considerations. And geographic location relative to customers. And when you move to the public cloud, most of these are CSP decisions. A customer just chooses which CSP regions they're going to reside in. And you need to know the challenges of physical security belong to the CSP. A strong fence line of sufficient height and construction, lighting of facility perimeter and entrances, video monitoring and alerting, electronic monitoring for tampering, Visitor access procedures, so guest access, for example, with controlled entry points. Interior access controls, badges, key codes, secured doors, fire detection and prevention, protection of sensitive asset systems, wiring closets, etc. Due to its cloud focus, the CCSP exam spends little time on physical security, but focuses more on the aspects of logical security and design. 
It is a fact that there is no security without physical security. But in the cloud, this is a CSP responsibility. I will, a bit later in this session though, show you how you can verify that your CSP has taken the appropriate steps to build excellent physical security into their data center design. Now you may see questions on the exam around the data center tier standard, which lays out a four tier standard for data center availability and uptime and redundancy. So availability and uptime are often used interchangeably. There is actually a difference. Uptime simply measures the amount of time a system is running. Availability encompasses availability of the infrastructure, the applications, and the services that are hosted. It's generally expressed as a number of nine, such as five nines, 99.999% availability. It should be measured by the cloud customer to ensure the CSP is meeting their SLA obligations. These tiers come from a company called the Uptime Institute. This is an organization that publishes specifications for physical and environmental redundancy expressed in these four tiers that organizations can implement to achieve high availability. So let's take a look at each of these tiers, starting with tier one, which is basic site infrastructure. This involves no redundancy and the most amount of downtime in the event of unplanned maintenance or an interruption. It must have a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, that can handle brief power outages as well as sags and spikes in power. It must have dedicated cooling equipment that can run 24-7 and a generator to handle extended power outages. The expected availability of Tier 1 is 99.671%. Moving into Tier 2, we have redundant site infrastructure. This provides partial redundancy, meaning an unplanned interruption will not necessarily cause an outage. It adds redundant components for important cooling and power systems. Facilities must also have the ability to store additional fuel to support the generator, and it's expected to provide 99.741% availability. Tier 3, concurrently maintainable site infrastructure, adds even more redundant components. It has a major advantage in that it never needs to be shut down for maintenance. Enough redundant components that any component can be taken offline for maintenance and the data center continues to run. It's expected to provide 99.982% availability. And then finally, we have Tier 4, fault-tolerant site infrastructure, which can withstand either planned or unplanned activity without affecting availability. This is achieved by eliminating all single points of failure. And it requires fully redundant infrastructure, including dual commercial power feeds, dual backup generators, and is expected to provide 99.995% availability. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC, is also a concern because an HVAC failure can reduce availability of computing resources just like a power failure. Customer reviews of a CSP should include review of the adequacy and redundancy of their HVAC systems. Now, I mentioned that the physical aspects of security and the physical aspects of data center design belong to the CSP, but also that I'd show you a way that as a customer or on behalf of your customers, you can validate, you can do some due diligence to ensure that CSP has made good decisions in their data center design. And one of those documents is the SOC 2 Type 2 Report. Now, because of the confidential information in a SOC 2 Type 2 report, some CSPs will require a non-disclosure agreement prior to sharing, or at least that you are a customer. And a routine review of the most current SOC 2 report is a critical part of a customer's due diligence in evaluating CSPs. So let's unpack that SOC 2 Type 2 report. What is that exactly? It is part of the Statements on Standards for Attestation Engagements, which is a set of auditing standards issued by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And SSA 18 is an audit standard that enhances the quality and the usefulness of system and organization control or SOC reports. So they're designed for larger organizations like cloud providers because the cost of a Type 2 report can run $30,000 or more. They're not inexpensive. Now, the SOC Type 1 report assesses the design of a security process at a specific point in time. So it's looking at your processes at a point in time, a snapshot. SOC Type 2, on the other hand, assesses how effective those controls are over time 
by observing operations for six months. And it is that type two report that we're interested in. So what I'd like to do now, just to give you some context, is show you how to retrieve a SOC 2 type two report from a CSP. And we'll start with Microsoft. I'm here at servicetrust.microsoft.com, their service trust portal. And you'll notice here under certifications, regulations, and standards, they show us some of the certifications with which Microsoft Azure and other cloud services Microsoft offers comply. I'll click on all documents, which takes me to the list of documents that I can retrieve related to certifications. And if I go down the list, way down here under SOC, I will find a number of SOC type two reports. So you see there is a SOC one, here's a SOC two type one, SOC two type two. And if I just click on one of these, what you'll find, I mentioned these are available, but often considered sensitive. If I click this to download, you notice here I'm prompted to authenticate. You must be a customer. And incidentally, if you sign in and go a couple of steps further, you'll be prompted to agree to an NDA. Now I've pulled up one of these reports just so you can see what you get. It's a PDF that goes line by line through the SOC requirements with those details. So out of respect for that NDA, I'll stop there. And I'm going to just mention that AWS, similar uh, path to get that SOC 2 Type 2 report. You'll see here they post on their blog when those reports are available. And it mentions we can go to the AWS customer uh, portal, the AWS artifact in the AWS management console. And in fact, that will prompt us for authentication and we'll get to those reports. So fairly similar. And another area we need to be concerned with is multi-vendor pathway connectivity as another element of environment design. So connectivity to data center locations from more than one internet service provider is what we call multi-vendor pathway connectivity. Using multiple vendors is a proactive way for CSPs to mitigate the risk of losing network connectivity. And a best practice for CSPs or data centers is dual entry, dual provider for high availability. That means two providers entering the building from separate locations. And likewise, customers should consider multiple paths for communicating with their cloud vendors. So if a customer has site-to-site -site connectivity with a VPN, building some redundancy into that connectivity. In the end, this protects availability, whether we're talking about the CSP and their two providers, two paths, or that customer to CSP connectivity. And finishing out 3.2, design resilient. So resilient designs are engineered to respond positively to changes or disturbances like natural disasters, or even man-made disturbances for that matter. A few examples of resilient design. High availability firewalls, whether that's active, passive, or active, active. Multi-vendor pathway connectivity that we just spoke about. A web server farm behind redundant load balancers. A database cluster, like a Windows or a Linux cluster feature. Service level resiliency requires identifying single points of failure throughout a service chain. So if we're thinking about an end-tier application, resilient design means we're looking at the application layer, any middleware, at the data tier on the back end, and thinking about resiliency in the systems and facilities that surround that application's service chain. And that brings us to section 3.3, analyze risks associated with cloud infrastructure and platforms. Here we'll talk about risk assessment, identifying and analyzing risks, cloud vulnerabilities, threats, and attacks, and we'll finish up section 3.3 with a look at risk mitigation strategies. The risk management on the whole is so important because it's the practice of mitigating and managing the risks to our sensitive data and to our business critical systems. Careful selection of CSPs is important as is development of service level agreements and our contractual agreements. So when we look at the cloud, the service level SLAs are pretty well established. We do have a responsibility as a customer to make sure that we monitor and hold our CSP to account, but SLAs can also factor when we think about vendors in our supply chain, for example. Organizations can balance cost savings with risk by building a system on top of IaaS or PaaS rather than utilizing a SaaS solution. 
Bearing in mind that if we go that IaaS route, as a customer, IaaS means more control, more responsibilities, and ultimately more risks that are our responsibility to mitigate and manage. Customers need to be proactive in addressing their responsibilities under the shared responsibility model and making sure that their CSP does the same. And that last point is important because even when a CSP cloud service of one form or another doesn't meet its mandated contractual SLA, it doesn't mean every CSP is going to proactively give you a partial credit in response to that SLA breach. I've seen CSPs that have a major outage and they come back and provide a partial credit to customers due to the SLA failure. I've seen others that definitely do not. Identifying risks is the first step in the risk management process. And to identify risks, we first need to identify the organization's valuable assets. Once we have identified our assets, then we can identify potential causes of disruption to those assets. There are actually some risk frameworks that can provide us with processes and procedures and give us a more systematic and consistent approach. One of those is ISO IEC 31000, Risk Management Guidelines. Another comes from NIST, SP 800-37, which is a guide for applying the risk management framework to federal information systems. And while NIST guidance is applicable to government information systems, you're definitely going to find guidance in there that's equally applicable in commercial businesses. Now, I want to talk about another aspect of risk assessment called out in the official study guide, and that is quantitative risk assessment, which assigns a dollar value to evaluate the effectiveness of countermeasures. Quantitative risk assessment is objective. It ensures our controls are cost effective. In other words, that our countermeasures are not more expensive than the impacts themselves. And risks specific to cloud environments should be identified when we're making a decision to use a cloud service. We should assess that risk before we take that step into that cloud service. And analysis is our next step. Analyzing risks continues the conversation we started by asking what could go wrong. And it seeks to answer two primary questions. What will the impact be if that situation occurs, if the potential impact is realized? And that's what we call the single loss expectancy in quantitative risk assessment. That's expressed as a dollar value. And how likely is that impact to happen? That's what we call our annualized rate of occurrence. So how frequently is it going to occur? That would be expressed as a decimal. So for example, an impact that happens twice a year has an annualized rate of occurrence of two. An impact that happens once every two years has an annualized rate of occurrence of 0.5. And an impact that happens once every five years is 0.2. So by those numbers, you can guess that a risk that happens once a year would have an annualized rate of occurrence of 1.0. And with these two figures, with single loss expectancy and the annualized rate of occurrence, we can calculate our annualized loss expectancy. Annualized loss expectancy is the possible yearly cost of all instances of a specific realized threat against a specific asset. So I'd like to look at this with you in the form of a simple example. And we'll at that point calculate our annualized loss expectancy. The formula is single loss expectancy times annualized rate of occurrence equals annualized loss expectancy. So let's just step through an example. We have a scenario. A tornado may strike one of our branch offices once every five years causing a 30% loss to a $1 million building. So we'll begin by calculating the cost of a single occurrence. So what will be the impact if that goes wrong? Well, the single loss expectancy we express as a dollar value. How significant will the loss be? That's our exposure factor. We express that as a percentage. The formula for that single loss expectancy is the asset value times the exposure factor. So doing the math, if we have a million dollar building, we have an exposure factor of 30%. That means we expect a $300,000 loss in a single incident. So that's our 
percentage loss, that exposure factor. So 1 million times 30% or 0.3 uh, when expressed as a decimal is a $300,000 single loss expectancy every time a tornado hits that building. Now let's calculate our annualized cost, our annualized loss expectancy. We said our single loss expectancy is $300,000. Our annualized rate of occurrence once every five years is expressed as a decimal as 0 0.2. So let's calculate our annualized loss expectancy. We have the $300,000 single loss expectancy. We take that times our annualized rate of occurrence, 0 0.2, equals an annualized loss expectancy of $60,000. That's that 300,000 single loss expectancy spread across the five years for every single occurrence. And that is a simple example. I won't uh, try to tell you that that simple example is really simple, but you now have the PDF that you can download with this video so you can watch this video over and again and look at those formulas and commit these to memory. I'm not certain you're going to see a lot of quantitative risk assessment on the exam, but since it's called out in the official study guide, I want to make sure that you are prepared for exam day. So analyzing our CSP risks. So when we're analyzing a CSP or a cloud solution in the associated risk, it's going to involve many departments and focus areas. Our business units will likely get involved, vendor management, our supply chain potentially, our privacy specialists when we're dealing with risks that involve data breach or data leaks, and our information security department, the folks responsible for securing our cloud infrastructure. And CSP operations should also be considered, but most major CSPs are audited for ISO, IEC 27001, 27017, and 27018. Now, what are those exactly, do you ask? Well, these are standards to guide CSPs in their preparation or for customers evaluating potential CSPs. So ISO IEC 27001 is a framework for policies and procedures that include legal, physical, and technical controls involved in an organization's risk management processes. But the focus is on policies and procedures. Then we have ISO IEC 27017, which is a standard developed for cloud service providers and users to make a safer cloud-based environment and reduce the risk of security problems. And then ISO IEC 27018, which is the first international standard about the privacy in cloud computing services. Now we actually covered ISO IEC 27017 in depth in domain one in section 1.5. We will cover ISO IEC 27018 a bit later in this series in domain six in section 6.2. Repetition is good for memorization. I'm going to call these out in various facets throughout the series so you'll be ready on game day. And CSPs like Microsoft and Amazon do provide resources that demonstrate their compliance with standards like ISO IEC 27001 as well as the 27017 and 18 standards. So we're going to revisit in the Microsoft example here, the Service Trust portal at servicetrust.microsoft.com, and I will search for 27017. And what I'll find here are documents demonstrating compliance for various Microsoft cloud services with ISO 27001, 27018, and 27017, all in a single document in the example of that cloud service. And you'll find similar resources in the AWS Management Console. Again, a cloud agnostic exam, but I just want you to understand what your recourse is as a customer or a consultant to customers when you want to verify that your CSP or prospective CSP meets your quality bar when it comes to compliance with well-known security standards. Continuing with risk analysis, let's look at a couple of CSP risks. And risks with a cloud solution are mainly associated with data privacy and information security. There's authentication risk. So does the CSP provide a solution or is this a customer responsibility? We talked about 
federation versus identity as a service a bit earlier in this session. So if it's customer managed, we have more control. If it's CSP managed, we're transferring some of that risk over to our cloud service provider. Then data security. How a vendor encrypts data at rest, the strength of the cryptography, and the access controls that prevent unauthorized access by cloud service personnel and other tenants. So some controls may be on by default, but the customer may have to enable others. We saw this in Domain 2 when we looked at cloud storage, where we saw encryption at rest enabled by default. We saw that forcing encryption in transit. So TLS encryption was a feature we needed to turn on as was double encryption, which would facilitate crypto shredding down the road. Supply chain risk management. So evaluating vendor security policies and processes. Now, most CSPs don't allow direct auditing of their operations, due in part to the sheer number of customers they support. Instead, they provide standardized reports and assurance material regarding their security practices, such as a SOC 2 report, ISO 27001 certification, and specialized reports for regulated data, like HIPAA, FedRAMP, and ISO IEC 27017 and 18. And you saw exactly how we retrieved those standardized reports in one example demonstrated earlier in this session. So let's shift gears and talk about common cloud risks. Now, one risk that's been discussed is the organization losing ownership and full control over system hardware assets. Careful selection of CSPs in the development of SLAs and other contractual agreements are critical to limiting risk. Organizations can balance cost savings with risk by building a system on top of IaaS or PaaS rather than utilizing a SaaS solution. Remember, the service model affects the level of control. But Regardless of which deployment or service model is used, some risks are common to all cloud computing environments. So geographic dispersion of CSP data centers. If the cloud service is properly architected, the disruption at one data center should not cause a complete outage, but customers must verify the resilience and continuity controls in place at the CSP. Downtime. Resilience for network disruptions can be built in multiple ways, such as multi-vendor connectivity zones and regions. We discussed these earlier in this session, as well as in cloud shared considerations in Domain 1. Compliance. Compliance data in some jurisdictions cannot be transferred to other countries, so data dispersion is inappropriate. Now, your major CSPs have compliance-focused service offerings, so you'll have some mitigations enabling you to control data residency. Then there's general technology risk. So cloud systems are not immune to standard security issues like cyber attacks, and CSP defenses should be documented and tested, and customers should be aware of their configuration responsibilities, remembering that some security features are enabled by default, and others must be configured by the customer, and it's customer responsibility to know which, and to be aware of which. Let's shift to risk types. So we have external risks, different threat actors ranging from competitors and script kiddies to criminal syndicates and state actors. Capabilities will depend on their tools, their experience, and certainly their funding. Other external environmental threats like fire and floods and man-made threats, such as accidental deletion of data or users. Internal threats, a malicious insider, a threat actor who may be a dissatisfied employee like someone overlooked for a promotion. Another internal threat is human error, which is when data is accidentally deleted. CSPs also face these risks, and customers have to verify their CSP has addressed them or provided tools to help customers address them. But customers should know who is responsible for configuration. That's going to be a recurring theme when it comes to security feature configuration. So let's shift gears and talk about cloud vulnerabilities, threats, and attacks. The primary vulnerability in the cloud is that it is an internet-based model. Organizations could be at risk if the CSP's public-facing infrastructure comes under attack. Any attack on your CSP or cloud vendor may be unrelated to you as an organization. Threat actors may be targeting the CSP, 
or another tenant of the CSP. Risks can come from other tenants as well. Customers may be collateral damage of an attack on the CSP. Now I want to talk about cloud-specific risks. The uh, Cloud Security Alliance details the top cloud-specific security threats in their list titled the CSA Egregious 11. And they cover the top 11 threats from year to year. So a recent list included data breaches, misconfiguration and inadequate change control, lack of cloud security architecture and strategy, insufficient identity, credential access, and key management, account hijacking, insider threat, insecure interfaces and APIs, weak control plane, meta structure and Apple structure failures. We'll talk about those two terms if you're not familiar. Limited cloud usage visibility, and abuse and nefarious use of cloud services. So let's break these 11 down a bit further. First, we have data breaches, which are loss of sensitive data due to a security breach. Now, an unintentional loss or oversharing is a data leak. A data breach is loss due to a security breach. You'll want to know the difference for exam day. Misconfiguration and inadequate change control. Software can offer the most secure configuration options, but if it's not properly set up, then the resulting system will have security issues. The same is true of any cloud service. We can remediate this risk through change and configuration management, a deliberate written plan that goes through a review process to reduce errors. Lack of cloud security architecture and strategy. As organizations migrate to the cloud, some overlook security or they fail to consider their obligations in the shared responsibility model. Insufficient identity, credential access, and key management. It's important to remember that the public cloud offers benefits over legacy on-premise environments, but it can also bring additional complexities. Identity and access management, encryption, and secret and key management are different than on-prem and essential in the cloud, but we need to spend time in architecting those solutions to make sure we're following best practices for the cloud so we modernize our approach to these areas as we modernize our approach to compute and service delivery. Account hijacking, credential theft, abuse, and or elevation to carry out an attack. Phishing is actually the most common approach to account hijacking. Insider threat, disgruntled employees, employee mistakes, and unintentional oversharing. Job rotation, privileged access management, auditing, and security training are all potential mitigations. Insecure interfaces and APIs. Customers failing to secure access to systems gated by APIs, web consoles, and the like. Controls like multi-factor authentication, role-based access control, and key-based API access are all controls that can help mitigate these threats. Next, we have weak control plane issues, weaknesses in the elements of a cloud system that enable cloud environment configuration and management. This would be our web console, our command line interfaces, and our APIs. The good news is most CSPs offer reference architectures to ensure customers secure and isolate their dev, test, and prod environments as well as their production data. So now let's take a quick look at insider threat protections offered by CSPs. And again, I'm just going to show you one example here of insider threat protections available with a CSP just for context. So I'll switch to a browser and I'm going to browse to compliance.microsoft.com, which is home of Microsoft Purview, which includes an array of compliance solutions. And here I see the insider risk management solution and when I go to the Policies tab here, I can create a policy to define what types of behavior I'd like to monitor for. And you'll see there are templates here that allow me to monitor for malicious behaviors like data theft, but also unintentional leakage, data leaks by my higher priority users or my habitually risky users. I see security policy violations, even misuse of health records. So a number of templates that get me off to a good start if I'm not quite sure what sorts of behaviors I want to monitor for. Now I'll quickly create a policy here just so we can look at the types of behaviors 
these policies will monitor for a bit more specifically. And when we get into the details here, I see I can look at the indicator. So for office indicators, I can look at sharing behaviors. I can look at deleting of SharePoint files. As I scroll down here, I see adding users from outside the organization. I see removing sensitivity labels. And when I look at the CASB solution, I see unusual mass deletion. Another great example of tooling provided by the CSP that requires customer configuration. Continuing with the CSA Egregious 11, we have metastructure and structure failures. These are vulnerabilities in the operational capabilities that CSPs make available, like APIs for accessing various cloud services. Now, if the CSP has inadequately secured these interfaces, any resulting solutions built on top of those services will inherit these weaknesses. Now let's break these down just a bit further. The metastructure is the protocols and mechanisms that provide the interface between the cloud layers, enabling management and configuration. And Appla structure are applications deployed in the cloud and the underlying application services used to build them. That would include PaaS features like message queues, functions, and message services. So who's responsible and how do we mitigate? Well, mitigating risks in this area is the responsibility of the CSP. So customers should verify the CSP has implemented their own secure software development lifecycle to ensure service continuity. And remembering that your CSPs generally don't allow direct audit, that's where we're going back to read assurance materials in which the CSPs tell us about their compliance with various audit standards and compliance standards. And rounding out the list, limited cloud usage visibility, which refers to when organizations experience a significant reduction in visibility over their information technology stack as a whole. Now this is because in some models, the CSP owns the stack, so visibility is limited by design and by responsibility. And finally, abuse and nefarious use of cloud services. Now, while low cost and high scale of compute in the cloud is an advantage to enterprises, it's also an opportunity for attackers to execute disruptive attacks at scale. This makes executing DDoS and phishing attacks easier, so CSPs have to implement mitigating security controls to address these risks. Remember, CSPs are dealing with multi tenancy at higher scale and with a more varied customer base than we are in a private cloud in a corporate environment. There are several approaches to risk mitigation in cloud environments, and the first of those is selecting a qualified CSP. The next is designing and architecting with security in mind. Security should be considered at every step, and that starts with the design process. The next risk mitigation tool is encryption, and data should be encrypted at rest and in transit. So that means storage and database encryption at rest, TLS and VPN for data in transit. And finally, ongoing monitoring and management to maintain security posture. Major CSPs generally provide tools to manage and monitor configuration security and to monitor changes to cloud services and to track their usage. So let's take a quick look at an example of this in a live cloud environment. Ongoing monitoring and management to maintain security posture. In fact, we call this capability Cloud Security Posture Management and Cloud Workload Protection. So I'm going to look on the Microsoft platform and Microsoft Azure at Defender for Cloud, which gives us that security posture management. AWS and Google Cloud Platform absolutely have equivalent tools. So here I can see my security posture. I can see recommendations coming from the CSP. And it even goes a bit further than that. So when I drill down into these recommendations, for example, uh, encrypting data at rest, I see here it tells me I have a VM and a database. Now it tells me the status is completed. So if I had a regression, if somebody were to reverse a secure configuration, that would appear here as well. And a recommendation would be provided. And you can see that it's even been gamified to a certain degree. There's a score here in addition to that recommendation. So I'll go to security alerts 
any alerts that require my attention, any configuration recommendations come up here. And going down the list under cloud security, I see that security posture. I see regulatory compliance. So this is going to show me some default configurations. Now this tool has dozens of compliance templates I can apply, but you see here SOC and ISO 27001 right out of the box. Here's that cloud workload protection. So any of my specific workloads are going to be surfaced here so I can thumb through my VMs and then my PaaS services right here in one place. But just a quick look. So know that your cloud service providers have that capability baked in for you. And that brings us to section 3.4, design and plan security controls. Here we'll cover physical and environmental protection. This would include on-premises for private and hybrid cloud scenarios. System storage and communication protection. Identification, authentication, and authorization in cloud environments. And audit mechanisms, functions like log collection, correlation, which would be a SIM function, and packet capture. We're going to touch on a few concepts related to physical and environmental protection, and in some cases, revisit concepts we've touched on previously. But the primary consideration is site location, as that will have an impact on both physical and environmental protections. Your cloud data centers share many requirements with traditional co-location providers or individual corporate data centers, including the need to restrict physical access at multiple points, ensuring a clean and stable power supply, adequate utilities like water and sewer, adequate workforce. Remember for the exam that these considerations are a customer responsibility in on-premises or private cloud data centers and a CSP responsibility in the public cloud. I do expect overall to see less exam focus on physical considerations since it's a CSP area of responsibility for public cloud. We saw how to track down those CSP assertion documents that articulate the CSP's compliance with various regulatory and audit standards and frameworks. So site selection and facility design. The key elements in site selection and facility design include visibility, composition of the surrounding area, accessibility, uh, effects of natural disasters. We don't want to build a data center in a site that's not easily accessible by automobile, for example, or that would have undue exposure to natural disasters. You know, for example, I, I might not build a data center on the coast. Now, these are all problems for the CSP and the public cloud again. Customers need to focus on selecting CSP data center locations to meet their disaster recovery and data residency requirements. Remember, CSPs auto-select region pairs for redundancy, something to just bear in mind. So if we revisit the region pairs concept we talked about in a previous installment in the series, for example, we have East U.S. as a primary data center region the CSP will pair a secondary region to serve as the backup, and that's generally 300 plus miles away chosen by the CSP. So in my example, Microsoft uses West US as the region pair for East US. Moving on to system storage and communication protection, we'll touch on a few concepts you've seen at least once before. We wanna make sure that we encrypt and protect data at rest, in transit, and in use, and protect systems and services from disruptive attacks at scale like denial of service and distributed denial of service, certainly made easier in the cloud. Boundary protections for ingress and egress, firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention, and key management, so protecting secrets of all kinds, passwords, keys, certificates, etc. That's really the technology half of the equation. And security practices, automation of configuration, think infrastructure as code, Responsibilities for protecting cloud systems and services should be well-defined. Monitoring and maintenance in place. This is a little more people and process focused. And remembering that customer and CSP roles in all of these areas are going to vary based on the shared responsibility model. So your responsibilities as a customer vary from IaaS to PaaS and, to, and SaaS, and we need to make sure you know the difference on exam day. And properly securing information systems can be a difficult task due to the sheer number of elements that make up a system. It can actually help to break these systems down into components and then apply security controls 
to make the overall task a bit more manageable, to kind of piece it out. Now, one source of controls is NIST Special Publication 800-53, Security and Privacy Controls for Information Systems and Organizations, which contains a family of controls specific to systems and communications. In fact, that control family includes more than 50 controls, many of which are relevant to system storage and communication. Now, to get a bit more specific, we'll break this down into policy and procedures, separation of system and user functionality, security function isolation, denial of service protection, boundary protection, and cryptographic key establishment and management. So starting with policy and procedures, we establish requirements for system protection and define the purpose, scope, roles, and responsibilities needed to achieve it. Separation of system and user functionality. Essentially, no single person can control all of the elements of a critical function or system. And separating user and admin functions can also prevent users from altering processes or misconfiguring systems, sometimes unintentionally. Security function isolation. Separating security-specific functions from other roles is just another flavor of separation of duties, really. Configuring data security controls like encryption and logging configuration would be perfect examples of that security function isolation. Denial of service protection. So denial of service is a disruptive attack at scale. It's definitely more difficult for smaller organizations to combat effectively, but most of your CSPs offer denial of service or DDoS mitigation as a service, and there are also dedicated third-party providers like Akamai and Cloudflare that offer DDoS mitigation protections. Now, in the big three, we have Azure DDoS, AWS Shield, and Google Cloud Armor, which are all DDoS mitigation as a service features. And on at least a couple of those platforms, they offer a basic tier of that service at no charge and requiring no real configuration. Then we have boundary protection, which deals with both ingress and egress protections, including preventing malicious traffic from entering the network, preventing malicious traffic from leaving the network, protecting against data loss, so data exfiltration, and configuring rules and policies in your routers, gateways, or firewalls. And your large CSPs generally have a policy engine that allows you to configure centralized policies to apply to your network virtual appliances, your virtual firewalls and gateways as you bring those devices or new regions online, so you don't have to configure those individual devices manually. So you're really codifying your configuration in infrastructure as code. And finally, cryptographic key establishment and management. So cryptography provides a number of security functions, including confidentiality, integrity, and non-repudiation, and it helps to match these functions to the protections they offer. So encryption tools like TLS or a VPN can be used to provide confidentiality. Hashing can be implemented to detect unintentional data modifications. That's really an integrity function. So if I hash a file, I calculate a hash, I send you the file, you calculate the hash on the file you receive. If the hashes match, we know the file has reached you intact. Its integrity remains intact. And additional security measures like digital signatures or hash-based message authentication code or HMAC can be used to detect intentional tampering. So HMAC can simultaneously verify both data integrity and message authenticity. So that's really a non-repudiation function. Let's move on to Identification, authentication, and authorization. So authentication, sometimes abbreviated as AuthN, is the process of proving that you are who you say you are. That's identity. Authorization, sometimes abbreviated AuthZ, is the act of granting an authenticated party permission to do something. That's access. So permissions, rights, and privileges are granted to users based on their proven identity for resources to which they have been assigned access. And users should be granted minimum necessary permissions. This is called the principle of least privilege. I want to touch on accountability, which is a challenge with cloud identity. Users who perform activities on a system need to be held accountable for following policies and procedures. Accountability is typically enforced with adequate logging and monitoring 
of system activity. Now, cloud brings with it some challenges in enforcing accountability. For example, SaaS apps used as users travel make identifying anomalous or malicious behavior much more difficult. Bad password practices with our users, specifically users reusing passwords across services is a problem, and the use of personal devices in BYOD or bring your own device scenarios. Now, modern identity as a service tools in the cloud provide solutions for these challenges, which we'll talk through and I'll show you a bit in just a moment. So let's start with multi-factor authentication, which works by requiring two or more of the following authentication methods. Something you know, like a pin or a password, something you have, like a trusted device, or something you are, a biometric authentication. That second factor can be authenticator apps, like the Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator, a voice call, an SMS or text message, though SMS is considered a very weak second factor, and organizations like the Cloud Security Alliance have been recommending against that for some time. We have the Oath hardware token, which provides a time-based one-time password. And if that one-time password concept isn't crystal clear, think about any authenticator app you use, Microsoft, Google, One Login, any third party. They also generally serve as a software oath, providing that time-based one-time password in the form of a numeric sequence that changes every couple of minutes. Continuing with multi-factor authentication, so two or more authentication factors, obviously more secure than a single authentication factor. If you talk to some of the identity as a service providers, you might be surprised to learn that in the opinion of many experts, passwords are the weakest form of authentication. Now, password policies help increase their security by enforcing complexity and history requirements. Smart cards are a good option, which include a microprocessor and cryptographic certificates. Uh, oath tokens are a stronger second factor option, creating a one-time password, whether that's a hardware token or a software token like the Authenticator app on your phone. Biometric methods, identifying users based on a fingerprint or facial recognition. Every modern iPhone features facial recognition. Your Android phones that don't offer facial ID do have fingerprint, generally speaking. So lots of options to go beyond a simple text message for that second factor. Now let's shift gears and talk about conditional authentication policies. This capability is increasingly common in identity as a service platforms. Uh, we've seen this in Azure Active Directory used with Office 365 for a lot of years now. So. A conditional authentication policy will typically look at the signals around the authentication attempt. The user and their location, the device they're authenticating from, is it a known device? Is it compliant with our security policies? Is the application an approved application? What is the real-time risk rating of this user? And typically that risk rating comes from machine learning and AI processing data from that user's past behaviors, potentially some user entity behavioral analysis that tell us if conditions are unusual, if risk is medium or high potentially. These signals will be processed together and then the platform will allow access, block access, or potentially require multi-factor authentication. We can throw an additional prompt at that user if the conditions tell us that there's something a bit unusual. And if they meet the bar, then they are granted access to our data and resources. And this functionality works seamlessly with the Authenticator app on our mobile device that's ubiquitous today, the Authentication Application, it's also called. So it's a software-based authenticator. It implements two-step verification services using the time-based one-time password algorithm and HMAC-based one-time password algorithm for authenticating users of software applications. That's the Authenticator app. And we know Microsoft Authenticator and Google Authenticator are really just two of many. But the Authenticator apps from companies like Microsoft and Google generate one-time passcodes using these open standards that are developed by the Initiative for Open Authentication, so OATH. You'll hear HMAC and TOTP tokens called OATH tokens with some of these providers, just different names for the same functionality. We have push notifications where the server is pushing down the authentication information to your mobile device. So you have 
notifications enabled on your phone and really there's a finer grain of notifications it's time sensitive notifications so that push notification will push a notification from your authenticator app directly to you on your phone right away when you need to respond to that second factor but the identity platform is using the mobile device app to be able to push that message to you in real time or near real time so you can respond to that second factor on your phone now i'd like to take just a minute and show you conditional authentication policies in an identity as a service platform just to give you some real world context for how that functionality increases the security around identity and access management in the cloud so i'll switch to a browser here and i'm looking at the azure active directory admin center so this is microsoft's identity as a service platform so if you've not used this with microsoft azure maybe you used an azure ad account with office 365 this is the platform that supports Office 365 for identity. Now I'm going to scroll down and look at the security features of Azure Active Directory and conditional access is what Microsoft calls their conditional authentication functionality that I was describing in the presentation. Now I'm going to look at an existing policy here. Exchange Online requires compliant device. So I can see it's already configured to look at some of the signals as part of that user's authentication attempt. So I can apply this policy to all users or specific groups of users, even guests and external users. I can apply this to specific applications. I can drill down to a specific app or apply it to all apps. Now let's look at conditions. So I see here I can act based on the user's location. And in fact, I can exclude certain locations. So I might not want to apply additional factors of authentication to trusted locations. So it's certainly possible that when someone is on a compliant device in a trusted location we're going to skip this policy and i'll just exclude them and i can look at device platforms so i can apply this to specific types of devices windows mac os ios android etc none or low, maybe I want to apply these additional authentication conditions. Now I'll look at user risk. So this is the risk level for the user itself for that identity. And again, giving me the option to configure my tolerance there. Now I'll scroll down a bit and look at my access controls here so I can configure some conditions around access. So I can choose to grant or block access. Now blocking access is a pretty straightforward decision I'm just checking block but under grant what you'll notice here is I can require MFA I can require specific authentication strength a compliant device a device that's hybrid Azure AD joined so joined to my on-premises Active Directory and synced to my identity provider in the cloud in Azure AD I can require an approved client app and an app protection policy, which would be something we'd set up in our mobile device management platform. And then you'll notice down here, I can require one of these controls or all of these controls. So I have a lot of flexibility in the functionality. And on this platform, they actually offer the option to straight up enable that policy or to put it into report only mode, which can be handy because we can assess what the impact of the policy would be before we roll it out to live users. So again, just a quick look. Hope that gives you some context. So back to our presentation, let's talk about federation, which is a collection of domains that have an established trust. So the level of trust may vary. It typically includes authentication and almost always includes authorization. We're typically using this for identity and access management. It often includes a number of organizations that have established trust for shared access to a set of resources. For example, you can federate your on-premises environment with your Azure Active Directory and use this federation for authentication and authorization. This sign-in method ensures that all user authentication occurs on-premises. We are federating to our on-premises directory. It allows administrators to implement more rigorous levels of access control. So historically, we would use federation so we could leverage certificate authentication or a key fob or a card token. 
Some of these methods are making their way into the identity as a service platform, so federation has become less necessary in some circumstances. I'd like to talk through a quick identity federation example I think might resonate with you. So I have a website, let's say it's hosted in Microsoft Azure, that's my CSP. So that's going to use Azure Active Directory as its identity as a service, that's Identity Provider A, IDPA, that's Identity Provider A. I have a user who wants to authenticate with Identity Provider B, let's say they're a Facebook user, so they don't have an Azure Active Directory account and I want to facilitate easy authentication of Facebook users to my website without requiring everyone to have an Azure AD account. So what I can do is configure federation. I can configure Azure Active Directory to trust Facebook as an identity provider. So identity provider A, Azure AD, trust identity provider B, Facebook. And that way my user can authenticate with their Facebook account and then they are granted shared access. Now this may be cloud or it may be on-premises. We definitely see identity federation happening between identity providers in the cloud and on-premises, like Active Directory on-premise, quite common. And trust is not always bi-directional, as in this example, trust only happens in one direction. And incidentally, configuring Facebook as an identity provider in Azure Active Directory is not that difficult. In fact, I'm just going to go back to the portal quickly and I'll click on external identities here just to show you all identity providers and you'll notice Facebook is right there. So many of your identity as a service platforms are going to have similar functionality to allow Facebook, Google, Twitter as potential identity providers. And with identity and access management, audit mechanisms are top of mind. We need to collect logs so we have an audit trail and your cloud services will offer different controls over what information is logged. What they will have in common is they collect a minimum level of security relevant events like the use of privileged accounts or changes to privileged accounts. And a log aggregator like a security information event management system or SEM can ingest logs from all of your on-premises and cloud resources for review and correlation. So NIST SP800-53 and the OWASP logging cheat sheet both offer guidance on specific information to capture in audit records. And good news there, we covered both of these in domain two of this series. So correlation that I just mentioned refers to the ability to discover relationships between two or more events across logs. This capability is commonly associated with a SIM, a security information event management system, which correlates events and logs from many sources. This is very important in investigation and incident management, security incidents, because we can correlate activities across a broad variety of sources to provide a more comprehensive picture of the actor's activities in our environment. We touched on some of the core tenets of a SIM in Domain 2, and we'll talk about SIMs in greater depth later in this series. And to round out 3.4, we'll touch on packet capture and replay. So packet capture tools are also called protocol analyzers, and in the cloud, some cloud environments may not provide any facility for capturing packets, particularly in SaaS scenarios where the customer is not responsible for anything related to the environment. Certainly, you'll see that your CSPs offer some facilities for IaaS and other foundational scenarios. Now, Wireshark is a free open source protocol analyzer. It has CLI and GUI versions, Windows and Linux versions. It is really ubiquitous. This is the de facto standard for packet capture. Now some of your CSPs support Wireshark directly. Others have specialized services to perform packet capture on virtual networks. So two good examples. In Microsoft Azure there is Network Watcher which is a specialized packet capture medium. AWS supports Wireshark directly. Incidentally Network Watcher in Azure produces PCAP output that we can open in Wireshark. So your CSP protocol analyzers can actually save the data that they collect to a Wireshark compatible packet capture file or PCAP, which is the case in Azure and a couple of other platforms that come immediately to mind. And that brings us to section 3.5, plan disaster recovery and business continuity. So here we'll touch on business continuity and disaster recovery strategy. Business requirements. We're going to touch on three key acronyms. 
recovery time objective, recovery point objective, and recovery service level. And creation, implementation, and testing of our business continuity and disaster recovery plans. A good place to start is by identifying the difference between a business continuity plan and a disaster recovery plan. So the BCP focuses more on the whole business where the disaster recovery plan focuses more on the technical aspects of recovery. The business continuity plan will cover communications and process more broadly. Another way to think about that is the business continuity plan is an umbrella policy and the disaster recovery plan is part of it. So what are the goals of DRP and BCP? Well, it's all about minimizing the effects of a disaster by improving responsiveness by the employees in different situations, erasing confusion by providing written procedures, and participation in drills to ensure folks know what they are doing in the event of an actual disaster, ultimately helping your important users executing the plan to make logical decisions during a crisis. There are a few core definitions related to business continuity planning that are worth knowing for exam day. So the business resumption plan, this is the plan to move from the disaster recovery site back to your business environment or back to normal operations, in other words. Mean time between failures, that's a determination of how long a piece of IT infrastructure will continue to work before it fails. Mean time to repair, or sometimes mean time to recovery, a time determination for how long it will take to get a piece of hardware or software repaired and back online. Max tolerable downtime, the amount of time we can be without the asset that is unavailable before we must declare a disaster and initiate our disaster recovery plan. So let's shift and talk about business continuity and disaster recovery strategy. And I wanted to provide just a couple of definitions here that may come in handy on exam day. So the business continuity plan is the overall organizational plan for how to continue business after an event has occurred. It's a proactive risk mitigation strategy that contains likely scenarios that could affect the organization and guidance on how the organization should respond. In other words, the business continuity plan is going to focus on the most likely scenarios. This plan is sometimes called a continuity of operations plan. Now, depending on the sources you look at, some sources will define a difference, call out a subtle difference between a business continuity plan and a continuity of operations plan. If you look at the common body of knowledge for the CCSP exam, these two are considered one and the same. And then the disaster recovery plan, again, is the plan for recovering from an IT disaster and having the IT infrastructure back in operation. One is business focused, the other is more tech focused. And the business impact assessment, which we talked about earlier in this series, is used to determine which processes are critical and which are not. It measures the impact of specific systems and processes, and any that are deemed critical to the organization's functioning must be prioritized in an emergency situation. The business impact assessment contains typically a cost-benefit analysis and a calculation of the return on investment. And just pivoting to look at business continuity and disaster recovery from a CSP perspective, a cloud data center that's affected by a natural disaster will likely activate multiple BCPs and DRPs. A CSP will activate both plans to deal with the interruption to their service. Now one key element of the BCP is communicating incident status to relevant parties. Now, the customer is responsible for determining how to recover in the case of a disaster in the cloud. So, recovery of our applications is not necessarily going to be automatic, and a customer may choose to implement backups or utilize multiple availability zones, load balancers, or other techniques. In other words, the CSP is going to give us the tools, but they're not necessarily going to do all of that design and implementation work for us. We have to use the tools we're given. CSPs can further protect customers by not allowing two availability zones within a single physical data center within a cloud region. Now, we talked about availability zones 
all the way back in domain one. So let's just briefly revisit the concept of availability zones in a cloud data center to refresh your memory here. So availability zones are unique physical locations within a region with independent power, network, and cooling. And they're comprised of one or more data centers. If we look at a region for a cloud service provider like US East, for example, that region is going to consist of multiple data centers in fairly close proximity. And availability zones will provide a way for us to spread our infrastructure within that region within those data centers to tolerate data center failures via redundancy and isolation. The focus there is really on providing redundancy within that data center region. So if I put a load balancer in place with multiple web application instances, I would hope to spread those throughout the data centers in that region across availability zones. So I make my load balancer zone redundant, in other words. But the focus, again, is on data center failures within a region. So our hope is that our CSP doesn't provide availability zones that leave us stuck in a single data center. And your major CSPs have multiple data centers within a region, so it can be safely assumed this is true. So let's talk about the communication plan, the plan that details how relevant stakeholders will be informed in the event of an incident, like a security breach. It would include a plan to maintain confidentiality, such as encryption, to ensure that the event does not become public knowledge, at least before we're ready. The contact list should be maintained that includes stakeholders from government, police, customers, suppliers, and internal staff. Now, compliance regulations like GDPR include notification requirements, relevant parties, and timelines. For example, GDPR has a 72-hour time limit on the point by which certain notifications must go out. But confidentiality amongst internal stakeholders is desirable, so external stakeholders can be informed in accordance with the plan. You want to be the one as an organization informing your stakeholders, not allowing them to get that information from a news bulletin. So when we have an incident, there are multiple groups of relevant stakeholders that we need to inform and manage, and they may include internal stakeholders, a cyber insurance provider, business partners, customers, law enforcement. A stakeholder in this case is a party with an interest in an enterprise. Corporate stakeholders include investors, employees, customers, suppliers. Uh, regulated industries like banking and healthcare will have requirements driven by the regulations governing their industries. So stakeholder management and communication plans will certainly be influenced by the industry that your organization works in. So let's talk business requirements. These are the three acronyms called out in the exam syllabus. There's the recovery point objective. That's the age of data that must be recovered from backup storage for normal operations to resume if a system or a network goes down. Next, we have the recovery time objective, or RTO, which is the duration of time in a service level within which a business process must be restored after a disaster in order to avoid unacceptable consequences associated with a break in continuity. SLAs between a company and its customers will definitely influence the RPO and the RTO. In fact, they will be determined based on contractual SLAs between a company and its customers or operating level agreements or OLAs between the IT department and other departments within the organization. And finally, we have the recovery service level which measures the compute resources needed to keep production environments running during a disaster. It is a percentage measure, zero of 100, of how much computing power you will need during a disaster. And based upon a percentage of computing used by production environments versus other environments like development, test, and QA. So for example, if I have a 10 web server environment and eight of those servers are used for dev, test, and QA, I'd only need to bring the two production servers into my DR environment. I'm only going to migrate what I need to keep the production trains running, so to speak. But that recovery service level answers the question, what needs to be migrated to keep production running? And 
Another quick real world look, this time at data backup and retention features in platform as a service offerings. This will only take a minute, but it'll be a good reminder of the pros and cons, the trade-offs in platform as a service. So I'm going to look at Azure SQL, so Microsoft's PaaS offering for SQL Server. So I'm looking at a SQL instance here and I'll go down under data management to backups. And what I see down here are my available backups, but I'm going to look at my retention policies. And what I want to show you here, is when I look at the retention policies for this server, uh, we'll notice here that for PITR, which is point in time restore backups, I only have so many days that I can select there. There's a sliding scale that gives me one to seven days. And I can then look at my differential backup frequencies. I have a drop down that gives me a limited number of options. I have a little more control in my long term retention. You'll see here it mentions that I can keep my long term backups for up to 10 years. So I have that long term retention flexibility, but less flexibility in some of the short term point in time recovery options. So the upside is configuration is very simple. It's just a few clicks. The downside is I have to accept the limitations that come with that platform as a service offering. Next up is BCDR, or Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery Plan Creation, Implementation, and Testing. And I'd like to talk through the process with you beginning with the design phase. We design our BCDR plans based on priorities from the business impact analysis. And FEMA and InfraGuard are organizations that can also advise us on likely disasters for a region, so we prioritize our planning around the most probable impacts. Then we implement our plan to protect critical business functions. Again, we're always focused on valuable assets, so when we're designing plans to recover business operations and infrastructure, we're focused on critical business functions first. We also need to identify key personnel as they will be the ones carrying out these BCDR plans. Now in the testing process, we're testing to make sure our plans function as expected and that the people involved know their roles and responsibilities and that the plans actually work. Testing both BCP and, and DRP plans is essential and disaster recovery and business continuity plans that are not tested seldom work as expected in live use if we haven't tested and refined them first. And when we conduct these tests, we then report and revise. So our business continuity and disaster recovery plan should be revised as necessary based on test results. And test will definitely identify need for revision because our business evolves. And so these plans must evolve and be refined over time to continue to align with our critical business functions and processes. So let's talk through a few disaster recovery test scenarios. We need to test our business continuity and disaster recovery plans at least annually. Most organizations will test them in part in various forms more than once a year. Common disaster scenarios would include data breach, data loss, power outage or other utilities, network failure. So notice that not every impact is the most significant impact. We want to test a range of impacts. Natural disasters, civil unrest or terrorism, we're getting more serious now, and pandemics. And the plans should also test the most likely scenarios first, but can also be tested in a number of ways. So there are different types of tests we can carry out. So for example, tabletop testing. Members of the disaster recovery team gather in a large conference room and role play a disaster scenario. Usually the exact scenario is known only to the test moderator who presents the details to the team at the meeting. So they are responding in the moment. The team members refer to the document and discuss the appropriate responses to that particular type of disaster. So a couple of benefits to this type of testing is that a tabletop test is role play only, so it's a minimal impact on productivity. And it's also a great way in your early revisions to identify revisions to the plan steps. When you write out that first draft of a disaster recovery or business continuity plan, nobody's going to get it perfect on the first draft. So the tabletop testing can help us refine the plan. So we are ready for a real impact. 
Then there's a dry run. In this test, some of the response measures are tested on non-critical functions, so there's a bit of doing in this case. And then we have a full test, which involves actually shutting down operations at the primary site and shifting them to the disaster recovery site. When the entire organization takes part in an unscheduled, unannounced practice scenario of full business continuity and disaster recovery activities. And just a couple of notes on plan implementation. So implementing business continuity or disaster recovery processes may necessitate utilizing cloud computing for critical services. So customers can take advantage of the cloud's high availability features like multiple availability zones, automatic failover to backup regions, direct connection to a cloud service provider, and most of these choices come with costs that have to be considered. Even if we're talking about intra-region features like availability zones, protecting us against a data center failure, or if it's automatic failover to a backup region, when we're implementing that type of redundancy, there's going to be some infrastructure involved that has a subscription cost. But the cost of high availability in the cloud is generally less than a company trying to achieve high availability on their own, but it needs to be cost effective. At the end of the day, the cost of building resiliency should be less than the cost of business interruption. And with that in mind, let's get started with Domain 4 Cloud Application Security. So let's take a look at the exam essentials, those areas the official study guide advises will factor prominently on exam day, beginning with cloud development basics, pitfalls, and vulnerabilities. So here we'll talk about performance, scalability, portability, and interoperability as they pertain to cloud, as well as the popular threat lists from OWASP and SANS. Up next, we'll talk about the application of the software development lifecycle, or as you'll hear it referred to in the CCSP context, the secure software development lifecycle. We'll touch on development models like Agile and Waterfall, threat models, as well as secure coding practices and standards. Then applying test methodologies to application software. We'll touch on functional and non-functional testing, static and dynamic testing, as well as the QA process. We'll touch on managing software supply chain security and secure software usage practices. Common application security technology and security controls. We'll look at elements of design, and data encryption, as well as orchestration and virtualization. And finally, identity and access management solutions, as well as common threats to identity and access. We'll start with 4.1, advocate training and awareness for application security. And here we'll drill down on cloud development basics, common pitfalls, and common cloud vulnerabilities with some focus on the OWASP top 10 and SANS top 25 lists. We'll start with cloud development basics and we see th three key concepts called out in the official study guide. There is security by design, which declares security should be present throughout every step of the process. And various models exist to help like the building security and maturity model. This pairs well with DevSecOps. Then there's shared security responsibility. The idea that security is the responsibility of everyone from the most junior member of the team to senior management. That describes the primary principle of DevSecOps where security is present throughout the software development lifecycle and everyone is responsible for security. And finally, we have security as a business objective where risk mitigation through security control should be a key business objective similar to customer satisfaction or revenue. This does require organization-wide security awareness and commitment in order to be effective. Common pitfalls of application security in the cloud. So we'll touch on performance, scalability, interoperability, portability, and API security. You'll want to know the common pitfalls and the advantages of avoiding each of these. So we'll start with performance. So cloud software development often relies on loosely coupled services. This makes designing for and meeting performance goals more complex as multiple components may interact in unexpected ways. You want to verify 
functionality and performance through end-to-end -end load and stress testing. And we have scalability. One of the key features of the cloud is the ability to scale, allowing applications and services to grow and shrink as demand fluctuates. It does require developers to think about how to retain state across instances and handle fault with individual servers. Scale out tends to be better than scale up in the cloud. We can scale out with additional instances to meet demand and scale back during times of lesser demand and our overall run rate is going to be less than deploying a smaller number of larger instances that run billing us all the time for unused capacity. Next, we have interoperability. This is the ability to work across platforms, services, or systems, and can be very important, especially in multi-vendor and multi-cloud scenarios. Interoperability across platforms increases service provider choice and can ultimately reduce costs. Then we have portability, designing software that can move between on-premises and cloud environments or between cloud providers. That's what makes it portable. Portability in a hybrid scenario requires avoiding use of certain environment or provider-specific APIs and tools. That additional effort can make it harder to leverage some cloud advantages, and it may require some compromises. Because not all tools we use on-premises may translate to the cloud, and certainly not all the features in the cloud are going to be available back on-premises. And finally, API security. So application programming interfaces or APIs are relied on throughout cloud application design, development, and operation. And designing APIs to work well with cloud architectures while remaining secure are both common challenges for developers and architects. Our API considerations need to include access control, data encryption, throttling, rate limiting, your CSPs offer PaaS services that simplify addressing API concerns. And you'll find the CSP offerings also address the need to present your APIs in multiple regions and multiple geographies. Well, let's talk for a moment about cloud vulnerabilities, common cloud vulnerabilities. There are several groups that provide guidance on common application vulnerabilities and related security threats. So in terms of vulnerabilities, we're, we're talking about common cloud vulnerabilities to avoid within the secure software development lifecycle. These include data breaches, data integrity issues, insecure application programming interfaces, and denial of service. And there are organizations that provide information on security threats. The Cloud Security Alliance, the SANS Institute, and the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP. And later in this domain, we will dive into some of the top security concerns and risks as identified by some of these organizations. Next up is 4.2, describe the secure software development lifecycle process. Here we'll focus on business requirements as well as phases and methodologies. We'll touch on the phases of the secure software development lifecycle as well as waterfall and agile methodologies for managing software development efforts. So first we have business requirements. So mature software development shops utilize a secure software development lifecycle because it saves money and it supports repeatable quality software development. The secure software development lifecycle is fully successful only if integration of security into the organization's existing software development lifecycle is required for all development efforts. It must be mandatory. We have business requirements that capture what the organization needs its information systems to do. And then we have functional requirements which detail what the solution must do, such as supporting max concurrent user requirements, which then turn into business requirements like supporting all workers being able to access a system to perform their assigned duties. In addition to these functional requirements, the organization must also consider security, privacy, and compliance objectives and requirements. So when regulatory requirements are involved, objectives become requirements in a hurry. Moving on to the secure software development lifecycle, if we take a look at the common phases of a typical lifecycle, we have planning that leads to requirements, and then a design, and then coding that design, and then testing, 
and then ongoing care and feeding, which we call maintenance. These are the common phases of the secure software development lifecycle. Now, there are multiple variations of the secure software development lifecycle. I did want to just briefly mention that if you see the acronym SSDLC, that's just another way of saying secure software development lifecycle. And I saw that acronym called out in the common body of knowledge. Now, regardless of which SDLC model a company uses, there are a few phases that appear in all models. Planning, requirements definition, design, and coding. These are mentioned in the official study guide, so ensure you're familiar. We have planning, which considers potential development work, focusing on determining need, feasibility, and cost. Do we need it, and is it possible for a reasonable cost? Requirements definition. So once an effort has been deemed feasible, user and business functionality requirements are captured. This involves user, customer, and stakeholder input to determine desired functionality, identify current system or app functionality, and the desired improvement. And then the design phase focuses on designing functionality, architecture, integration points and techniques, data flows, and business processes. The solution is designed based on requirements that we gathered in the requirements definition. And then in the coding phase, this is where the actual coding, the work, happens. Now the CCSP exam outline mentions four phases in a secure software development life cycle, or at least it calls out these four phases of the life cycle, and those phases are design, code, test, and maintain. So these are mentioned in the official study guide, so make sure you're familiar. We have the design phase. Again, the solution is designed based on requirements gathered. Code, this is where the coding work, the real work happens. Then the test phase, this is testing to ensure software is functional, scalable, and secure. And then maintain, ongoing maintenance updates, patching, and checks to ensure software remains functional and secure. Now, there are only two software development models called out in the official exam syllabus and only two likely to appear, and the first is Agile, which places an emphasis on the needs of the customer and quickly developing new functionality that meets those needs in an iterative fashion, through iterations. And then there's the Waterfall model, which describes a sequential development process that results in the development of a finished product. So Agile is defined by its ability to allow quick response to changing requirements and rapid iterations of prototypes, where Waterfall requires clear requirements, a stable environment, and a low rate of change. The Waterfall model has seven phases, seven stages. There are system requirements, software requirements, preliminary design, detailed design, code and debug, testing, and operations and maintenance. So these phases happen in sequence and the waterfall model only allows returning one phase back for correction. So it's a bit inflexible, much like we cannot change the direction of a waterfall. The waterfall model does not allow us to easily pivot to new directions. As a result, the waterfall model has declined in popularity in recent years. It is relatively uncommon in cloud development, and it's seen as legacy by many. The agile model for software development is based on the following four principles. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And responding to change over following a plan. Agile was first described in the Manifesto for Agile Software Development back in 2001. And it leverages an iterative, a repeating process called a sprint. So we have sprint planning, development, testing, demonstration, and then we repeat that through iterative sprints. We plan our work, we do the development work, the coding, we test, we demonstrate, we have a demo day at the end of every sprint, and then we do it over and again. And a standard sprint is two weeks. You'll see some organizations that'll run one week sprints. And a small project might be something you can complete in a single sprint. You may have large projects that take 
many sprints over a period of months, but we'll repeat that process from the first sprint to sprint N, however many that is, to the end of our project, at which point we have a working piece of software. Up next in 4.3, apply the secure software development lifecycle. Here we'll touch on cloud-specific risks, threat modeling, avoiding common vulnerabilities during the development process, secure coding, and we'll focus on some specific secure coding standards that are expected to appear on the exam, and software configuration management and versioning. So cloud-specific risks are called out in section 4.3 and are actually revisiting a concept we covered Previously, these were covered in Domain 3. They come straight from the CSA website. This is the CSA Egregious 11, and they're covered in depth in the common body of knowledge as well. So in Domain 3, we covered them from an architecture perspective. Here, we will cover them briefly from a software development lifecycle or secure software development lifecycle perspective in the context of DevSecOps and continuous integration and continuous delivery. We have data breaches, loss of sensitive data due to a security breach, and from a development perspective, we'd want to implement centralized secrets management using a vault solution in the cloud, which all the major CSPs offer. Data masking to obscure visibility of sensitive data at the database tier, even from our database administrator. So we can leverage a solution like data masking to allow our database administrator to manage the data without being able to fully see sensitive data. And then misconfiguration and inadequate change control. And here is where CICD and infrastructure as code come into play. We define our application infrastructure in code. We deploy it hands-free through a CICD process through a pipeline to eliminate human error. And we implement release management. So we have human approval gates, we have checkpoints to make sure that a smart person in the chair with the right training verifies that the code we're about to release has in fact gone through all the appropriate validation procedures. It's gone through testing and QA, and we know that code is functional and secure before we release it into production. And then there's lack of cloud security architecture and strategy. We really need to implement security from the design phase and we need to remember our obligations in the shared responsibility model. So whether we're implementing an IaaS or PaaS or leveraging a SaaS service, remembering where our security responsibilities begin and end. An insufficient identity, credential access, and key management. So we're really talking about identity and access management here, identity providers. And a great solution here is developers can leverage identity as a service rather than building their own, resulting in stronger authentication and authorization controls quite typically and certainly a more mature approach. And in this case, it's really about making good decisions as to where we want to innovate and where we want to leverage existing solutions that come in the cloud. Account hijacking, credential theft, abuse, or elevation to carry out an attack. Again, using existing identity providers. Identity as a service for your app reduces risk. Insider threats. Here we leverage separation of duties, checks and balances in the release management process like those approval gates I just mentioned. Insecure interfaces and APIs. So failing to secure our APIs. We implement access controls like role-based access control, and for our APIs, we'd implement access keys, API keys. And a weak control plane, weaknesses in the elements of a cloud system that enable the environment configuration and management. Here, continuous integration and continuous deployment. We're not deploying through the web console or from the command line. It's codified, automated, and deployed through a pipeline. And that brings us to threat modeling, which allows security practitioners to identify potential threats and security vulnerabilities. It's generally used as an input to risk management. And it can be proactive or reactive, but in either case, the goal of threat modeling is to eliminate or reduce threats. There are three approaches to threat modeling, three common approaches, I'll call it. There's 
the asset focus, which uses asset valuation results to identify threats to the valuable assets. That's where we want to focus our effort. We're focused on attackers, identifying potential attackers and identifying threats based on the attacker's goals. We're focused on software, considering potential threats against software the organization develops. So either assets, attackers, or software. So now let's look at some common threat modeling approaches. First, we have Stride, which was developed by Microsoft, and it stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. So going back to the three approaches, it's focused on potential threats against software the organization develops. Then we have the DREAD model, which is based on the answer to five questions. What is the damage potential? The reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. So DREAD is looking more from an attacker's perspective. What is the potential damage? Can it be reproduced? Is it a vulnerability that can be exploited? And who would our effective users be? What would the scope of the exploit be? And how discoverable is the vulnerability? If it can't be discovered, it can't be exploited, and therefore we'll worry less about it. Next up, we have the PASTA model, which focuses on developing countermeasures based on asset value, the third of those three approaches to threat modeling. PASTA involves seven stages. We have definition of objectives, then definition of the technical scope, app decomposition and analysis, stage four, threat analysis, stage five, weakness and vulnerability analysis, stage six, attack modeling and simulation, and stage seven, risk analysis and management. So PASTA will bring us to answers to many of the same questions we saw in DREAD. Damage potential, exploitability, discoverability, just coming at it from a different angle. And finally, we have ATASM, and this acronym stands for architecture. So the process begins with analysis of the system's architecture. This is followed by an examination of threats, listing all possible threats, threat actors, and their goals. And then examining attack surfaces, identifying components that are exposed to attacks. And finally, mitigations, analyzing the existing mitigations in place, those security controls already protecting the system to determine if they are indeed adequate. Now the thing about ATASM is it's not actually a threat model itself. It's a series of process steps for performing threat modeling. And because it is not actually a threat model itself, it can be used with threat models like Stride, Dread, and Pasta. It's some really common sense thinking. Now we're going to talk a bit about how to avoid common cloud vulnerabilities. And like all risk mitigations, a layered approach combining multiple types of controls is a best practice, including training and awareness of our developers, which is critical because they make decisions about how to design and implement system components. Awareness of common flaws, like injection attacks, for example, prevent coding mistakes. And in the next section, when we talk about secure coding, we'll take a look at some artifacts from organizations like OWASP and SANS that can help us in training our developers around awareness of those common flaws. Documented process. Secure SDLC should be well documented and communicated to all team members designing, developing, and operating systems. It's similar to security policies, and it has to be understood and followed by our developers. Test-driven development, focusing on meeting acceptance criteria, can be one way of simplifying the task of ensuring that security requirements are met. Having well-defined test cases for security requirements can help avoid vulnerabilities like OWASP Top 10 Application Security Risks. This ensures developers know what test will be conducted against their code. And common cloud vulnerabilities are well known and they're documented in lists like the OWASP Top 10 list and the CSA Egregious 11. And we can use these to build our well-defined test cases. These documented vulnerabilities can guide what we're testing against and testing for. Let's shift gears and talk about secure coding. 
So this is the practice of designing systems and software to avoid security risks. It's essentially a proactive risk mitigation practice. We are, through secure coding, avoiding potential security risks. And there are multiple organizations out there that exist and work to mature secure coding practices. The syllabus calls out three of these. OWASP, which produces the Cloud Native Application Security Top 10 list, and their better known and older Top 10 Web Application Security Risks. The exam also mentions the SANS Top 25 as well as Safe Code standards, and we'll touch on all of these. So let's start with the OWASP Top 10 Web Application Security Risks, which is an awareness document that represents a broad consensus about the most critical security risks to web applications. So quickly running through these 10 in order, we have broken access control, cryptographic failures, injection, insecure design, security misconfiguration. You'll notice that some of these are really self-explanatory vulnerable and outdated components, identification and authentication failures, software and data integrity failures, security logging and monitoring failures, and server-side request forgery, which is a pretty common, or at least a well-known attack. Two things about this list. Number one, it changes from year to year. So you'll see these risks moving up and down the list or potentially off the list as they become less common. For example, server-side request forgery was higher up this list five years ago. For the exam, be familiar with the meaning around these concepts. Don't worry about memorizing these specific items or their order. Now let's move on to OWASP Cloud Native Application Security Top 10. The primary goal of this draft is to provide assistance and education for organizations looking to adopt cloud native applications securely. And in this top 10, we have insecure cloud container and orchestration configuration, injection flaws, improper authentication and authorization, CICD pipeline and software supply chain flaws, insecure secret storage, over-permissive or insecure network policy. So you'll notice again, many of these are self-explanatory. Using components with known vulnerabilities, improper assets management, inadequate compute resource quota limits, and ineffective logging and monitoring. And for the exam, you want to be familiar with the common solutions around these problems and best practices, which are all covered in this series. So there's really not any real additional reading that you need to worry about here. So moving on to the SANS top 25 most dangerous software errors. This list is not specific to cloud native environments like the OWASP cloud native app security draft we just looked at. And because it's not specific to cloud native environments, uh, it seems to get a bit less attention in the official study guide and in the common body of knowledge. But we're going to cover it anyway for reasons that will be apparent in a moment. You're going to see some patterns developing here across these various standards. So going through the top 25, these do change from year to year in this list. And for the exam, you'll want to know the attack types. Don't memorize this list. It's an even longer list. Don't memorize the list, but I'm going to call out the attack types for you here, and we'll cover those at the end. So when we get to the end of all of these mini lists, you'll be ready for exam day. So from number one to number 25, we have out of bounds write, which is a type of buffer overflow attack. There's an improper neutralization of input, a cross-site scripting attack. Number three is a SQL injection. Number four, improper input validation. Input validation actually prevents injection attacks. If I validate the input to a form, it prevents a SQL injection, for example. Out of bounds read is another buffer overflow type attack. Improper neutralization of special elements, that's an operating system command injection, so another injection attack. Use after free, another buffer overflow type attack. Improper limitation of a path name, that's a path or directory traversal, we'd call it. Now this SANS top 25 list uses the Common Weaknesses Scoring System, or CWSS, 
by the by. So continuing down the list here, number nine, cross-site request forgery. Pretty widely explained attack, less common than it used to be. Unrestricted upload of file with dangerous type. Null pointer reference. Deserialization of untrusted data on number 12. Number 13 is integer overflow or wraparound. What I will tell you about numbers 11 through 13 is input validation of various sorts will fix all three of these. The type of input you're validating varies, but input validation is helpful in all of these. Number 14, improper authentication. Number 15, use of hard-coded credentials. Then missing authorization. Then improper neutralization of special elements, another injection attack, and then rounding out this page, missing authentication for critical functions. So you'll notice authentication and authorization as a theme surfacing here. So knowing the best practices there will be important. Now that CWSS, that scoring system, is actually composed of three scores, I should mention. There's the base finding score, the environmental score, and the attack surface score. I'm not sure the exam is going to get that deep, but I wanted to call those out just so you have them top of mind. And finishing out the top 25 list, we have improper restriction of operations within the bounds of a memory buffer. That's another buffer overflow attack. Incorrect default permissions, so identity and access related, let's call it. Server-side request forgery, another fairly well-known attack, less common than it used to be. That's actually on the OWASP list, you may remember. Concurrent execution of shared resource with improper synchronization, a, a race condition, this is called, another type of attack you should be familiar with. Number 23, uncontrolled resource consumption. So this would be a denial of service attack. Improper restriction of XML external entity reference. So number 24 isn't a directory traversal attack, but it does result in some unauthorized local file access, basically. And number 25 on the list, improper control of generation of code, another injection type attack. So I want to just recount for you some attack types and concepts here, some themes, if you will. So we have injection attacks, buffer overflow attacks, directory or path traversal, denial of service or distributed denial of service, race condition, and then authentication and authorization. So an understanding of the attack types should be enough for exam day. And you saw these themes across all of these lists to varying degrees. The authentication and authorization is really more a matter of knowing best practices. And we're going to touch on authentication and authorization from multiple directions in this course and in this series, so I don't think you have much to worry about there. But what I would like to do is, just in case you're not familiar with these types of attacks, I'm going to just walk you through a simple explanation of numbers one through five, so in case you haven't been exposed to these in your work life, you'll have a, a good foundational knowledge. So let's start with injection attacks. Improper input handling is really the, the source cause here. These are used to compromise web front-end and back-end databases. SQL injection is the most widely known. That's where the attacker uses unexpected input to a web application to gain unauthorized access to an underlying database. It's not new. It can be prevented through good code practices. Essentially, the countermeasure is input validation and using prepared statements like stored procedures rather than allowing SQL queries to be generated from that front-end web application. We don't allow the front-end web application to issue select statements. Instead, we limit that front-end web application to calling stored procedures, which are pre-compiled and allow us better control. But input validation is the key. Now, another I mentioned was buffer overflows. These are attacks used to exploit poorly written software. This exists when a developer does not validate user input to ensure that it's an appropriate size. For example, it allows an input that is too large to overflow a memory buffer. But you see a theme here, right? We can prevent this with input validation. Another attack type is directory traversal we saw on the list, gaining access to Restricted directories. If an attacker can gain access to restricted directories through HTTP, that's what we call a directory traversal or path traversal attack. 
One of the simplest ways to perform direct reach reversal is by using a command injection attack that carries out the action. And if successful, it may allow the attacker to get to the site's root directory. Most vulnerability scanners will check for weaknesses with direct reach reversal or command injection and inform you of their presence. So to secure your system, you should run a vulnerability scanner and keep the web server software patched. It's as simple as that. Another type of attack we saw called out in the list was a resource consumption attack or a denial of service. There's denial of service, which is a resource consumption attack intended to prevent legitimate activity on a victimized system. It essentially consumes all of the processing and memory resources on that system. There's a distributed denial of service attack, or DDoS, and that's a DOS attack utilizing multiple compromised systems as sources of attack. The distinction here is the distributed denial of service, or DDoS, involves multiple systems, where denial of service may involve just a single system. Your countermeasures here are several. Good firewalls, routers, intrusion prevention systems, security information event management so we can identify malicious activity more quickly across our estate, disabling broadcast packets entering and leaving our trusted network, disabling echo replies, the ping echo or ICMP echo reply, and keeping our systems patched. So many of these attacks exploit known vulnerabilities that just patching systems goes a long way. But denial of service and distributed denial of service represent a class of attacks. These aren't specific attacks. There are many variations of denial of service and distributed denial of service. So we call these a class of attacks. And we've already discussed in this series how CSPs provide some built-in protections or some premium tier capabilities to protect against distributed denial of service attacks. We're really approaching it from a more fundamental perspective here as some of those lists amongst OWASP and SANS are not specific to cloud computing and certainly in a hybrid cloud scenario one would want to know how to protect against these sorts of attacks. Now the last attack type I want to cover with you is the race condition. This is where the system's behavior is dependent upon the sequence or timing of other uncontrollable events. A common race condition is the time of check to time of use condition. This is a timing vulnerability that occurs when a program checks access permissions too far in advance of a resource request. The problem occurs when the state of the resource changes between the time the application checks the state of the resource and the time the application or service attempts to use that resource. A great example is file locking. The application checks the file to ensure it's not locked so it can write to the file presumably and then in the time between the check and the attempt to actually access and write to the file, the state of the file has changed because some other process has locked that file. So to the degree this becomes undesirable, that becomes a bug in your software and a developer can avoid that time of check to time of use problem by really checking the state of the resource it wants to access just in time. And I want to talk about the safe code standard, the last that's called out in the official exam syllabus. Safe code was first published as fundamental practices for secure software development. It's informed by existing models, including OWASP, the Microsoft Software Development Lifecycle, and others. And it's designed to help the software industry adopt and use these best practices effectively. Safe code itself covers topics like software design, secure coding practices, testing, validation, third-party risks, handling vulnerabilities. I will say safe code is certainly the least well-known of these standards. It was last updated in 2019, and in my opinion, fairly unlikely to appear on the CCSP exam, and certainly not in more than one question if it does. Now we'll just switch over to a browser and take a quick look at the SANS, OWASP, and safe code standards on the web so you'll know them when you see them. I'll have links in the PDF that you download with this course. Now here's SANS.org, the top 25 most dangerous software errors. You see a rank, you see the name, and in the middle here you have a link to read about the details. Again, the reading of the details here absolutely unnecessary if you've listened to my video here. 
And next we have the OWASP Cloud Native Application Security Top 10. So this one was last updated in April 2022. And then we have the OWASP Top 10 Web Application Security List. And you see here they even give you some visualization of how these risks have moved up and down the list over time. And then last on the list was safe code. So here is the fundamental practices for secure software development. This is a, a PDF you'll find from safe code. Again, at the end of this section in the PDF, you will find links to all of this additional reading if you like. So I want to shift gears and talk through some foundational concepts related to software configuration management and versioning that's called out in the syllabus. So let's talk about code repositories for a moment. This is where the source code and related artifacts, like our libraries, are stored. This is where our infrastructure as code is stored. So how do we handle source code securely? Well, we don't commit sensitive information. We're not keeping secrets on disk, for example. We protect access to our code repository. So we have authentication and authorization gating access to our code repositories. But protect access means we're only going to allow certain people to commit code to those repositories, to those repos, as we call them. Signing your work. So typically code signing is assumed for your third-party commercial software vendors. If you look at any application in Microsoft Office, for example, you'll see that it is signed with a Microsoft certificate. Keep your development tools, your IDE, up to date. Most code repositories today use Git. Virtually everyone is using Git. It's the most widely used modern version control system created by Linus Torvalds. Incidentally, the creator of Linux also created Git. So IDE, if you're not familiar, is integrated development environment. So that would be a tool like VS Code, which is the most common IDE today in use anywhere in the world. So let's move on to configuration and change management. So configuration management ensures that systems are configured similarly and configurations are known and documented. This is where baselining comes in. That ensures our systems are deployed with a common baseline or starting point. And imaging is a common baselining method, for example, in IaaS. But that baselining exercise can carry over to a number of technologies. We could baseline our configuration in a containerized environment, for example. Change management helps reduce outages or weaken security from unauthorized changes. So versioning is a way we can track our software lineage, uses a, a labeling or a numbering system to track changes in updated software versions. Now how folks do this differs. There are many approaches. What I often see is a major version, a minor version, and a patch version. So like 23.05.02, major, minor, patch. But all of these practices can help us prevent the shift and drift that results in security-related incidents and outages. So I want to dig into baselining just a bit further for a moment. So baselining is how we track how our systems are set up, not just our software, our applications, but our virtual infrastructure as well. That baseline is effectively a snapshot of a system or an application at a given point in time. It is our starting point. This process should also create artifacts that can be used to help understand our system configuration and probably include some metadata. And we also want system and component level versioning. For example, if I have a VM that requires a Java library, I want to make sure that at a system level, I know what that operating system is, but I also know what that Java library is. You know, how we capture that depends on the type of underlying compute we're dealing with, the infrastructure, but at the end of the day, our applications depend on compute resources and other software components. There are many layers between the wire, between the network, and that application user interface that our end user is working in. And baselining is going to help us capture all of the details in between those two points. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about here in section 4.3 is the Software Bill of Materials, which is an emerging strategy and standard in tracking software versions. The SBOM lists all of the components in an application or a service, including open source libraries or proprietary code libraries for that matter. Think of it as a full inventory of the components of an application. And we really started seeing this get a lot of attention 
after Solarigate, where SolarWinds had a breach that reached all the way into their source code. But SBOM is mentioned briefly in the official study guide. It's not mentioned in the exam syllabus. You may see a question on there. I doubt it, though. But do expect that SBOM is something you will see more and more of in the future. There are multiple standards coming together. And you'll see production of a software bill of materials integrated into pipelines as a future standard. It will be fully integrated into the CICD process. Now you know what it is, and that should be enough for exam day. So moving on to section 4.4, apply cloud software assurance and validation. So here we're going to talk about testing. We'll talk about functional versus non-functional testing, security testing methodologies like black box, white box, static and dynamic testing, and one you may not have heard of before, the interactive application security test. We'll talk about quality assurance and abuse case testing. Before we delve into testing methodologies, I want to talk for a moment on environment. So secure environments for development, testing, and staging before moving an application into production are absolutely necessary. And environments map to phases of application development, debugging, testing, and ultimately release. So the development environment is where an application is initially coded, often through multiple iterations. That's where Agile comes in. We iterate quickly through our sprints. Testing is where developers integrate all of their work into a single application. So we may have developers working independently in the development environment. They need to roll their code together in testing, where we can then integrate that work into a single application. Regression testing to ensure functionality as expected, for example, can happen here. Then we have the staging environment, where we ensure quality assurance before we roll out to production. QA happens here at minimum. QA may happen before this phase, but certainly in the staging environment, we're going to see some QA happening, often taking the form of what we'd call UAT, or user acceptance testing, making sure that application functions exactly as we expect in production, or the changes to the application. Then finally, production, where the application goes live and end users have the support of the IT team. So let's talk testing. So functional and non-functional testing. So functional testing determines if software meets functionality requirements defined earlier in the secure software development lifecycle. And it takes multiple forms, including integration testing that validates whether components work together, regression testing that validates whether bugs were reintroduced between versions, and user acceptance testing, which tests how users interact with and operate the software. Functional testing focuses on specific features and functionality. That's important. Now let's compare that to non-functional testing, which focuses on the quality of the software. It looks at software qualities like stability and performance. Methods here include load testing, stress testing, recovery testing, and volume test. It examines the way the system operates as a whole, not the specific functions. So continuing down the thought path here, functional and non-functional, let's talk about functional versus non-functional security requirements. And we're revisiting this concept from domain one. So what is the difference? Functional security requirements define a system or its components and specifies what it must do. It's captured in use cases defined at a component level. For example, application forms must protect against injection attacks, which we do with what? Input validation. Non-functional security requirements specify the system's quality, characteristics, or attributes. And again, it applies to the whole system. It's a system level assertion. An example here would be security certifications, which are non-functional. So if we're looking to see that an application is HIPAA compliant, for example, or complies with PCI DSS, that's looking at the quality of that application as a whole. It's not a functional requirement. Again, we touched on this in domain one. I just wanted to refresh your memory and bring that forward here in context. So let's talk about static and dynamic testing. So static application security testing. It's analysis of computer software performed without actually executing programs. The tester has access to the underlying framework design and implementation. It requires source code access. 
And then there's dynamic application security testing, which is where a program communicates with a web application and it executes that application. It's exercising the application. The tester has no knowledge of the technologies or the frameworks that the application is built on. There's no requirement for source code access. So we say static testing tests the application from the inside out. Looking at the source code, dynamic application security testing tests the application from the outside in, exercising the application in live use, throwing unexpected input at forms, for example, to make sure that it protects against injection attacks. Next, we have white box testing, which is conducted with full access to and knowledge of systems, code, and environment. Static application testing is one example of white box testing. Remember that required source code access. And then we have black box testing, which is conducted as an external attacker would access the code, the systems, and the environment. The tester has no knowledge of any of these elements at the outset of a test. So obviously no source code required there. Sometimes white box testing is called full knowledge testing and black box testing is referred to as zero knowledge testing. Next, we have interactive application security testing, IAST, which analyzes code for vulnerabilities while it is being used. It focuses on real-time reporting to optimize testing and analysis processes. So unlike static and dynamic testing, IAST analyzes the internal functions of the application while it's running. So it's testing the application from the outside in, but analyzing those internal functions at the same time. It's often built into CICD automated release testing. And then we have software composition analysis, which is used to track the components of a software package or application. And it's of special concern for apps built with open source software components. Because open source components often involve reusable code libraries. And SCA tools are going to identify flaws and vulnerabilities that are included in these components. They're going to ensure we're working with the latest versions. It's really automated and combines application security and patch management, so to speak. It's making sure that we're using the latest versions of the libraries and we're not exposing ourselves to vulnerabilities unnecessarily by not working on the latest version or potentially working with the latest version that has a known vulnerability. And then there's quality assurance, which is responsible for ensuring that the code delivered to the customer through the cloud environment is quality code, defect-free, and secure. From a process perspective, it's frequently a combination of automated and manual validation testing techniques. It typically involves reviews, testing, reporting, and other activities to complete the QA process. So it's going to be a combination of people and process. The goal of QA is to ensure software meets standards or requirements. Because DevSecOps preaches security as everyone's responsibility, the role of QA is significantly expanded in a DevOps or DevSecOps team, and it tends to be embedded throughout the development process. Because security is an element of quality, and in DevSecOps where security is everyone's responsibility, we shift left and we start looking at security from the very beginning of the software development lifecycle. And QA should be involved in many testing activities, including load and performance test, stress testing, as well as vulnerability management. So QA testing is looking at functionality, performance, and security. So what is an abuse case? Well, an abuse case is a way to use a feature that was not expected by the implementer allowing an attacker to influence the feature or outcome of use of the feature based on the attacker's action or input. It describes unintended and malicious use scenarios of the application, describing how an attacker could do this. And an abuse case test takes that abuse case and puts it into action. It focuses on using features in a way that weren't intended by the developer. It may exploit weaknesses or coding flaws, from the perspective of multiple personas, a malicious user, abusive user, and even an unknowing user. It can help organizations to consider security features and controls needed for an application. In fact, OWASP provides an abuse case cheat sheet in their cheat sheet series at OWASP.org that we've looked at earlier in this series. 
but testing generally focuses on documented abuse cases. And those test cases could come from a number of sources, including our outputs from threat modeling, where we're looking at the vulnerabilities of our services and the attack surface. And that brings us to section 4.5, use verified software. Here we'll talk about securing application programming interfaces, APIs. We'll touch on supply chain management and vendor assessment and vendor assessment traditionally versus in the cloud third-party software management, and validated open source software. So by the by, if you're using the official study guide, these last two come from chapter five of the official study guide. Beyond that, the entirety of domain four is covered in chapter six of the official study guide. So let's talk about APIs. We have SOAP and REST. So an API is a set of exposed interfaces that allow programmatic interaction between services. That means no user or human involved. SOAP is a standard communication protocol that uses XML. REST is an architectural model that uses HTTPS for web communications to offer API endpoints. And your security features from the CSP include API gateway functionality, authentication, IP filtering, throttling quotas, data validation, generally offered through those PaaS services that I've mentioned in the past, in previous domains in this series. So you have API management in Azure, you have the API gateway offering in AWS. You also need to make sure that you have a plan for storage, distribution, and transmission of your API access keys. Those need to be maintained in a secure fashion, both at rest and when they're being transmitted between parties for whatever reason. So let's talk supply chain. Today, most services are delivered through a chain of multiple entities. A secure supply chain includes vendors who are secure, reliable, trustworthy, and reputable. Due diligence should be exercised in assessing vendor security posture, business practices, and reliability. This may include periodic attestation requiring vendors to confirm continued implementation of security practices. I can tell you firsthand this typically happens on an annual basis at least. We'll typically see an annual vendor survey from Microsoft as well as customers in regulated industries. And a vulnerable vendor in the supply chain puts not only the organization at risk, but potentially other members of the supply chain. So let's examine vendor assessment in our supply chain from a couple of perspectives. So Traditional vendor evaluation would occur through a number of different options. So on-site assessment is an option, visiting the organization, interviewing personnel, and observing their operating habits. So in extremely sensitive scenarios or where human safety is involved, that's certainly an option we'd see exercised. Document exchange and review, investigating data set and document exchange. Process and policy reviews, we request copies of their security policies, processes, and procedures to make sure that the security they attest is in place is actually in writing. And then third-party audit, having an independent auditor provide an unbiased review of an entity's security infrastructure. Now, these are all options a CSP like AWS or Azure or Google might use to evaluate a vendor. Now, in the cloud, companies with hundreds or thousands of customers, like our CSPs, cannot support direct vendor assessment. So we can't perform the same type of review of these major CSPs. Instead, we're going to review, audit, and certification reports provided by the CSP directly. These could include a third-party audit, a review of an independent auditor's unbiased review of an entity's security infrastructure provided to us by the CSP. We could also review a SOC 2 Type 2 report. We could look at the ISO IEC 27001, 27017, and 018 reports to verify the efficacy of the CSP's physical and logical security controls. And as we saw in Domain 3, your major CSPs generally make these reports available to customers for review on demand. We went to one of the CSP portals and actually retrieved these reports. We did have to sign an NDA to get to that SOC 2 Type 2 report, but as a customer, that was very possible. 
but this is how we evaluate a cloud vendor like a CSP or a SaaS offering. Third-party software also adds additional risk to our organization. A third party may have limited access to your systems, but will often have direct access to some portion of your data. If you think about Office 365 applications, storing our documents in SharePoint and OneDrive, that's absolutely true. Limited system access, but direct access to our data. Typical issues addressed in software vendor assessment would include where in the cloud is the software running, is this on a well-known CSP or does the provider use their own cloud service? That's going to give us some insight into reliability or at least raise additional concerns potentially to go assess this vendor further. Is the data encrypted at rest and in transit and what encryption technology is used? Not only are they encrypting the data, but have they made good decisions in terms of encryption algorithm selection? How is access management handled? Access management is going to be tied to our identity provider there. So really, what is the identity and access management system that service runs on? For example, with Office 365, we're talking about Azure Active Directory. With Google Cloud Platform, we're talking about Google's own identity platform. So identity as a service often makes us feel a bit better, a bit more comfortable. What event logging can you receive? We talked about the level of logging across different cloud deployment models, and we know we're going to have greater access to logs in areas where we have greater responsibility. So our log access is greater in IaaS than it is in PaaS, and it's greater in PaaS than it is in software as a service. And what auditing options exist? And we just talked about auditing in the cloud, and we know that even when we are working with a vendor that has many hundreds of thousands of customers and we can't audit directly, generally speaking, we're going to have access to their audit documentations and assertions in the form of SOC 2 Type 2 reports and the like. The focus here is on risk to data security. So let's talk open source software versus proprietary. Open source is one where the vendor makes the license freely available. They allow access to the source code, though they may ask for an optional donation in exchange for access to source code. There is no vendor support with open source, so you might pay a third party company to support in a production environment. We definitely see this with certain flavors of Linux. Another example is one of the more popular open source firewalls, PFSense. Now, proprietary, on the other hand, tends to be more expensive, but tends to provide more and better protection and more functionality and support, albeit at a cost. So in the firewall example, there are many vendors in this space, including Cisco, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Barracuda, and we don't get source code access in the case of proprietary either. So if we're using open source software, we want to use validated open source software. It must be validated in a business environment. So we have some risk when it comes to open source. And some argue that open source software is more secure because the source code is available for review. I would say that we can definitively prove through evidence that is not guaranteed. Now, adequate validation testing through sandbox testing, vulnerability scans, third-party verifications all reduce our risk, but more visibility into a problem can result in better outcomes, but the transparency is not itself a guarantee of security. And I can cite two great examples here. And that would be open source projects like OpenSSL and Apache, which have contained serious vulnerabilities in the past, just because everyone's watching doesn't mean every security issue is identified and remediated. And that brings us to section 4.6, comprehend the specifics of cloud application architecture. In this section, we'll cover supplemental security components. We're going to talk about flavors of firewalls or gateways in the cloud. We'll talk about cryptography, sandboxing, as well as application virtualization and orchestration. We'll start with supplemental security components, which are called out here in the syllabus, beginning with a web app firewall, often abbreviated as WAF, which protects web applications by filtering and monitoring HTTP traffic between a web app and the internet. It typically protects web applications from common attacks like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, attacks on the OWASP top 10 quite often. 
And you'll often find these WAFs include default OWASP core rule sets. And this is fairly common in your CSPs. We'll take a look at a WAF here in just a moment. And then there's the XML firewall, which is used to protect services that rely on XML-based interfaces, including some web apps. It provides request validation and filtering, rate limiting, and traffic flow management. I think the main thing you need to remember here is that it services XML traffic, usually implemented as a proxy. Then we have Database Activity Monitoring, abbreviated as DAM, that's the uh, associated acronym. This combines network data and database audit info in real time to analyze database activity for unwanted, anomalous, and unexpected behavior. It monitors application activity, privileged access, and it detects attacks through behavioral analysis. So there's some in intelligence to this tooling. And most of your CSPs offer some form of DAM tooling as a service that you can enable. And finally, we have the API Gateway, which provides traffic monitoring for your application services exposed as API endpoints. It provides authentication and key validation services that control access to your APIs. In the cloud, your CSPs, Amazon offers the API Gateway, Azure offers the API Management Service. Both of those are PaaS offerings that I have alluded to previously in the series as providing a number of services to secure your APIs. Okay, so I'd like to do some quick show and tell here. This is a good opportunity. We're going to look at a web app firewall in a CSP and examine the OWASP core rule sets. We'll just switch over to a browser here and I'll start at the OWASP.org website. I wanted to point you to the OWASP core rule sets here. It's just a set of generic attack detection rules for use with compatible web application firewalls. So it gives you a broad range of protection against many of those attacks defined in the OWASP top 10. Injection attacks, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, just to name some of those more popular. Now I will switch over to my portal here. So I'm at portal.azure.com looking at the Microsoft Azure portal and I've drilled down to a web application firewall instance. And if I look at managed rules, I'll see here that by default, they have implemented the OWASP 3.2 core rule sets. And the way it tends to work in the Microsoft uh, scenario anyway, is they support the last three sets of the OWASP core rule sets. It's going to vary by CSP, but the point is you can deploy a firewall and by default it's going to have these built-in web protections you can run your web traffic through here and feel pretty good about your security posture right out of the gate. So just a very quick look but if you go down the list here you'll see the rules in the set are numbered so you can go find some additional explanation for those rules out on the OWASP website if you're interested. But for the exam just know that's really one of the key value propositions of a web app firewall. And finishing up our discussion on firewalls, obviously any time we're in an internet connected environment, a firewall is important for filtering incoming traffic in a perimeter network. But that web app firewall, the WAF, is one that you're gonna find is very common. It's really the most popular firewall, generally speaking. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is cost. It meets a common need, it's easy to configure, it comes with those default OWASP core rule sets, and it's less expensive than the more function rich next generation firewalls and secure web gateway firewalls. Now we will see those more feature rich firewalls implemented as well, but for other reasons. Now the need for network segmentation, for example, should be supported with appropriate traffic filtering and restriction with the firewall that's most appropriate for the use case. And when we get into heavier traffic filtering and cross cloud scenarios or hybrid scenarios, that's where you're going to step up to a next generation firewall. It'll have advanced functionality, centralized policy capabilities, uh, real-time threat intel connected to that device. In fact, real-time threat intelligence is part of what makes a next generation firewall a next generation firewall. And that firewall can filter traffic between our virtual networks and the internet or our virtual networks and our corporate network. The common theme there is segmentation. When we think about zero trust network architecture, it focuses on micro segmentation. And you'll find your firewall functionality maps to different layers in the OSI model. 
So we have a seven layer OSI model. A network firewall works at layer three of the OSI, stateful packet inspection at layer three and four. And many of your cloud firewalls, like the web app firewalls, work at layer seven of the OSI model, which is the application layer. Now, cryptography is mentioned in this section of domain four, and it really touches on three areas, data at rest, data in motion, and key management. And I've talked about key management endlessly throughout the series, so I want to just say a couple of words on data at rest and data in motion. So data at rest. We need to encrypt our storage accounts and your CSP storage providers usually protect data at rest at the account level by automatically encrypting before persisting it to manage disks, blob storage, file, or queue storage. But you have a default layer of encryption. What you'll find sometimes is they offer an additional layer of encryption, what we call double encryption. So the customer can hold the keys. It enables crypto shredding, secure deletion in an environment where you don't own the physical storage medium. We talked about this earlier in the series. And then full disk encryption. This is BitLocker or DMcrypt on the Linux platform. If you've ever worked in the Windows ecosystem, a Windows desktop, you're probably familiar with BitLocker. You'll find CSPs offer this capability in their IaaS model when you're working with VMs. And then there's transparent data encryption for SQL databases and data warehouses that uh, give us protection against the threat of malicious activity with real-time encryption and decryption of the database backups and the transaction log files at rest without requiring app changes. These features generally include a customer managed key option. And I use that acronym SQL generically here. You'll find transparent data encryption is available on more than just the Microsoft SQL platform as you look at MySQL and PostgreSQL. How do we encrypt data in motion? Well, there are a couple of most common methods. The first being transport layer security over HTTP, so HTTPS. And in hybrid cloud scenarios and cross-cloud connectivity, we often see traffic tunneled over a VPN connection. You'll sometimes hear TLS referred to as SSL. The terms are used interchangeably, but TLS replaced SSL a long time ago. Shifting gears, let's talk about sandboxing for a moment, placing systems or code into an isolated, secured environment where testing can be performed. Cloud sandboxing architectures often create independent ephemeral environments for testing and serving multiple purposes. We can enable patch and test scenarios, ensuring a system is secure before putting it into a production environment. It also facilitates investigating dangerous malware. And you'll see that in a couple of scenarios. In email protection, you'll see email attachments and URLs delivered in messages detonated in a sandbox before they are delivered to the recipient. And you'll also find some of your XDR functionality, your desktop protections, your endpoint protections that will have some sort of sandboxing scenario where you can isolate a potentially infected node and investigate before restoring full network connectivity. And at the end of the day, sandboxes provide an environment for evaluating the security of code without impacting other systems as well. We'll round out section 4.6 with a talk about app virtualization and orchestration. So let's start with a quick refresher on containerization. And I'm thinking about Docker and Kubernetes here, where one of your key value propositions is containers do not have their own OS, so we get greater density in our virtualization infrastructure. And we can use containerization in some cases to isolate existing applications developed to run in a VM with a dedicated operating system. Containerization can fool an application basically into thinking it has its own kernel when in fact it doesn't, it's sharing. So in terms of hypervisors, you remember we have the type one hypervisor, which is the bare metal hypervisor, VMware, ESXi, Microsoft Hyper-V, what you'll generally be dealing with in a CSP scenario. And our VM runs atop that hypervisor. Each VM has its own OS kernel and memory, which results in more overhead. With a container host, which is a virtual machine typically, we have containers running in that single operating system. So the containers are isolated, but they share an OS kernel, as well as binaries and libraries where possible. So we're getting greater density, essentially. So core components in a container platform, we have the orchestration or scheduling controller, 
network and storage, a container host, container images, which are functionally parallel to what we'd see with a VM template, and your container registry where we store our container images. The isolation is logical. Isolating processes, compute, storage, network, secrets, and management plane. But Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform for scheduling and automating the deployment, management, and scaling of containerized applications. And all of your major CSPs have a managed Kubernetes flavor. Your container hosts are the cloud-based virtual machines. This is where the containers run. Most of your CSPs offer that hosted service. It's a PaaS offering. And you only pay for the agent nodes within your cluster. You don't pay for the Kubernetes management cluster. That's why it's a managed Kubernetes environment. And your major CSPs generally offer a monitoring solution that will identify at least some potential security concerns in the environment. And those offerings are AKS in the Microsoft world, EKS on the AWS platform, and GKE in Google Cloud Platform. And finishing out 4.6, we have cloud orchestration, which allows a customer to manage their cloud resources centrally in an efficient and cost-effective manner. The intent of reducing effort, cost, and complexity. And this is going to be very important in a multi-cloud environment. And we're seeing more customers move to a multi-cloud stance to reduce their risk exposure. And management of the complexity of corporate cloud needs really only increases over time as more and more workloads move to the cloud and we see more and more multi-cloud scenarios. But it allows the automation of workflows, the management of accounts, in addition to the deployment of cloud and containerized applications. And it implements automation in a way that manages cost and enforces corporate policy in and across cloud. Your major CSPs offer orchestration tools that work on their platform and the third parties offer multi-cloud orchestration solutions. In fact, your CSPs will offer orchestration capabilities for customers as well as their service partners who manage environments for multiple customers. And that brings us to 4.7, Design Appropriate Identity and Access Management Solution. So here we'll touch again on federated identity, identity providers, single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, cloud access security brokers, or CASB, and secrets management. So definitely topics we've seen before in the series. There'll be a bit of refresher here, but I'm going to interlace this with some new details. So let's start with federation. So federation is a collection of domains that have established trust. The level of trust may vary, but it typically includes authentication and almost always includes authorization. In fact, it has always included both in the scenarios I've been exposed to. And it often includes a number of organizations that have established trust for shared access to a set of resources. For example, you can federate your on-premises environment with Azure Active Directory and use this federation for authentication and authorization. This sign-in method ensures that all user authentication occurs on-premises, which allows administrators to implement more rigorous levels of access control. For example, historically we'd use federation when certificate authentication or key fob, or a, a card-based token was desired. Now, some of this capability, certificate authentication in particular, is possible with some identity as a service providers, cloud identity providers, but that was one of the core value propositions of federation when we wanted authentication and authorization to take place on premises and we wanted to implement more rigorous methods. Now let's look at a federation scenario I think will resonate for you. So we have a website that authenticates with identity provider A. Let's say that's Azure Active Directory, the identity provider of Office 365. And we have a user that authenticates with identity provider B. Let's say that's their Twitter account. So we configure federation. So identity provider A trusts identity provider B. And identity provider B then has shared access. And this may be cloud or on-premises. And trust is not always bi-directional. But this sort of support for federation is quite common in your identity as a service providers. In fact, earlier in the series, I showed you how easy it was to add identity providers like Facebook and Google and others to Azure Active Directory. It has some built-in support 
or social identities. And on that note, let's talk about identity providers. So identity providers create, maintain, and manage identity information while providing authentication services to applications. For example, Azure Active Directory is the identity provider for Office 365. Some of your other identity as a service options include Okta, Duo, One Login. And on that topic of social identity providers I mentioned, uh, social identity providers that support OAuth, like Google, Facebook, and Apple, are common in federation scenarios. Think about all the cloud apps that you subscribe to where you can log in with your Google account or your Microsoft account or your Facebook account. And single sign-on is a concept where a user doesn't have to log in to every application they use. They essentially sign in once and they can use that credential for multiple applications. Single sign-on based authentication systems are sometimes called modern authentication. And this is a very common user experience issue in enterprise desktop scenarios. We have to create a user experience so the user can log in one time and more or less have access to all the applications installed on their desktop, whether those are authenticating locally or to an Active Directory domain or to a cloud identity provider like Azure Active Directory for your Office suite. Multi-factor authentication. So let's talk about MFA attack prevention, for example. So we know multi-factor authentication are two or more methods combining something you know, like a pin or a password, with something you have, like a trusted device, something you are, so a biometric authentication method, like fingerprints on most of your mobile devices out there, and potentially facial recognition if you're using a fancier smartphone. But MFA is a preventative security control for multiple attacks. So MFA can prevent phishing attacks, spear phishing, key loggers, credential stuffing, brute force and reverse brute force attacks, man in the middle attacks, in large part because we're tying that second factor back to something the user has or something that they are. And most of your data loss or data breaches happen as a result of credential theft, and all of these attacks are used in credential theft. In fact, in talking to some of Microsoft's Dart organization, the folks who go out and help customers who have been breached, one of those consultants told me that a lack of MFA is a causal factor in almost every security breach they've gone out to clean up. And to dig a little deeper on a concept we'd mentioned briefly before, the CASB, the Cloud Access Security Broker, which enforces the company's data security policies between on-premises and the cloud. Really, anywhere a user is trying to access and share and store company data. It can detect and optionally prevent data access with unauthorized apps and data storage in unauthorized locations. So if, for example, we wanted to prevent a user from accessing a Word document or a text document with some third-party generic app, we could stop that. If we wanted to prevent storage in a third-party cloud repository like Box or Dropbox, we could implement protections to prevent that. It combines the ability to control use of services with data loss prevention and threat management features. It's often used in enterprise scenarios where high levels of control and assurance in cloud usage are necessary. Now, there are on-premises, hybrid, and cloud-hosted models of CASB. I really see cloud-hosted CASBs everywhere I look these days. And just a quick reminder on secrets management. Remember, CSPs offer a cloud service for centralized, secure storage, and access for application secrets, a vault solution. A secret's anything you want to control access to, your API keys, passwords, certificates, tokens, cryptographic keys. The service will almost always offer programmatic access via API to support DevOps and continuous integration and continuous deployment, your CI-CD pipeline. Access control is generally offered at the vault instance level as well as to the secrets stored within the vault. Your CI-CD pipelines should leverage centralized storage of secrets rather than hard-coded values or storage on disks. And Microsoft AWS and Google Cloud Platform all have a vault for storing your secrets centrally. And that does it for Domain 4. So moving on to Domain 5, 
cloud security operations. And we'll begin with a look at the exam essentials, those topics the official study guide promises will factor on exam day. We have how to ensure clustered host and guest availability. So we'll touch on resource scheduling and dynamic optimization, two topics we haven't talked about yet in the series. Explaining the importance of security hygiene best practices, in particular here security baselines. Standard processes used for IT service management in an organization. We will touch on roughly a dozen processes in this session. Change management, continuity, incident problem, availability, configuration. Access control for local and remote system access. Here we'll discuss popular remote access options, some of the finer points of security around those. Network security controls as part of a cloud environment. So we'll touch on a variety of network virtual appliances and security concepts. So intrusion detection and prevention, firewalls, honeypots, the role of the security operations center. We'll dive into incident response and we'll dive into SIM in this session as promised as security information event management is a core tool of the SOC. And finally, the role of change and configuration management. So we'll get into each of these and talk about how the two work together and how one influences the other. So that brings us to 5.1, implement and build physical and logical infrastructure for a cloud environment. So in this section, we'll cover hardware specific security configuration requirements and drill down on the HSM and the TPM. Installation and Configuration of Management Tools Virtual Hardware Specific Security Configuration Requirements So we'll touch on a handful of topics here, some the responsibility of the CSP, some the responsibility of the consumer, assuming we're talking about public cloud scenarios. And Installation of Guest Operating System Virtualization Tool Set. So we'll start with the Trusted Platform Module, the TPM which is a chip that resides on the motherboard of the device. It's a multi-purpose device. It handles functions like storage and management of keys used for full disk encryption solutions like BitLocker, like DMCrypt on the Linux platform. It provides the operating system with access to keys, but it prevents drive removal and subsequent data access. You can certainly remove the drive, but without that TPM, you're not going to access the data on that drive. You'll also hear this called a cryptographic processor on occasion. Virtual TPMs are part of the hypervisor and provided to VMs running on a virtual platform. And unlike the HSM, it is generally a physical component of the system hardware and it cannot be added or removed at a later date. The hardware root of trust. Now, when certificates are used in full disk encryption, they use a hardware root of trust for key storage. It verifies that the keys match before the secure boot process takes place. The TPM is often used as the basis for that hardware root of trust. It is usually that hardware root of trust. And next we have the hardware security module, HSM. This is a physical computing device that safeguards and manages digital keys performs encryption and decryption functions for digital signatures, strong authentication, and other cryptographic functions. It's like a TPM, but often a removable or external device. It's what I call a function-specific device. It's not a component of a computer, like a chip on a motherboard as a TPM is. Key escrow uses an HSM to store and manage private keys. Cloud service providers all offer cloud-based HSM solutions for customer-managed key scenarios. So the examples there would include the dedicated HSM in Azure, Cloud HSM in AWS, and Google KMS on the Google Cloud Platform. Software-defined networks may come up on the exam. So this is a network architecture approach that enables the network to be intelligently and centrally controlled or programmed using software. And SDN enables us to reprogram the data plane at any time. So if I can update the data plane using infrastructure as code or as security conditions evolve, this is going to be great for security, for a micro-segmentation strategy and a zero-trust network architecture. 
Common use cases, SD-LAN and SD-WAN. So separating the control plane from the data plane opens up a number of security challenges. What I'd say in short is the SDN vulnerabilities by and large come from a malicious entity inside the network. So an SDN is not really vulnerable from outside the network, but vulnerabilities can include a man in the middle attack or a, a service denial, a denial of service attack. And both of these would come from a compromised endpoint on the network. And because it's software based, it supports CICD, infrastructure as code and micro segmentation. The segmentation of virtual networks, both your public and private subnets, are important elements of cloud network security. We'd call that segmentation or micro-segmentation in a zero-trust network architecture scenario. One concept related to segmentation is the virtual private cloud or VPC. This is a virtual network that consists of cloud resources where the VMs for one company are isolated from the resources of another company. And separate VPCs can be isolated using public and private networks. So the VPC term is applicable in AWS and Google Cloud Platform. They call it a VNet in Azure. And we have public and private subnets, a familiar concept even with on-premises networks. The environment needs to be segmented. Public subnets that can access the internet directly and protected private networks. Virtual networks can be connected to other networks with a VPN gateway or network peering. So within the private networks of our cloud subscription, typically we're going to use network peering. It's going to be better in terms of performance. And you should have isolation as a customer on the CSP's backbone. A VPN gateway for scenarios, site-to-site -site connectivity, for example, scenarios where you need encryption. But generally speaking, we see VPN gateway in the site-to-site -site scenario and network peering within the subscription. For VDI and client scenarios, a NAT gateway for internet access usually makes sense. Section 5.1 also calls out installation and configuration of management tools, so there are a few considerations you should be aware of here. The first is redundancy. Any critically important tool can be a single point of failure, so adequate planning for redundancy should be important. Uh, just one real world example, in hybrid cloud, we have a sync tool that synchronizes our on-premises identities with the cloud, and we typically have a backup instance on standby. So if we have a problem with that primary, we can bring the secondary online. That way, users changing passwords, group memberships that are being updated will continue to sync to the cloud and not be out of sync because our primary instance of the tool is down. And that need for redundancy really comes down to is the tool we're talking about a runtime tool or is it a design time or other ad hoc tool that doesn't affect service operation. Scheduled downtime and maintenance. Downtime may not be acceptable for some tooling so we need to make sure that these tools are patched or taken offline for maintenance on a rotating schedule or during acceptable windows when we don't need them. For example, having our monitoring system that monitors our critical services offline for an extended period of time would more likely than not be unacceptable. Isolated network and robust access control. So with any management tooling, uh, we wanna make sure that access to our tools is tightly controlled with our virtualization management tools even more so because access to the physical hosts and the VMs running there certainly increases the scope of the risk. So adequate enforcement is very important. We can use not only access control, but need to know least privilege encryption with our tooling like our remote desktop client, for example, and require VPN access into a secure access workstation in the cloud, for example, to get to systems that host sensitive data and critical services. Now, when we're talking about virtualization management tools, that's a bit of a vague term. If we're thinking about the physical hypervisor host in a public cloud, that's going to be a CSP responsibility. In a private cloud, that's going to be an organization responsibility. Configuration and change management. So tools and the infrastructure that supports them should be placed under configuration management to ensure that they stay in a known hardened state, that we don't have drift in the configuration there.
And then logging and monitoring. Audit trail is important, but logging activities can also create additional overhead, so we need to moderate and balance the need for logging in a manner that doesn't impact performance of the system we're collecting logs from. There are also some virtual hardware specific security configuration items called out. Because a VM shares physical hardware with potentially hundreds of other VMs, the biggest issue related to virtual hardware security is enforcement. For the hypervisor, we need strict segregation between the guest operating systems running on a single host. In a public cloud, that is especially important because we're dealing with potentially hundreds of other customers who are not part of our organization. There are two main forms of control you should be aware of. There's configuration, just ensuring that the hypervisor has been configured correctly to provide the minimum necessary functionality. So disallowing inter-VM network communications if not required, and encrypting snapshots. Now, in a public cloud scenario where you're consuming VMs in an IaaS model, we're talking about responsibilities of the CSP. And since you can't audit your CSP directly, that's where you go to their portal and find the documents that give you confirmation that they have implemented the necessary controls. And then there's patching. So a customer would be responsible for patching VMs in the IaaS model while the CSP patches the hypervisor. And if there are VMs in a PaaS service you're running, the CSP owns VM patching there as well. And in the vein of virtual hardware, there are a couple of particular concerns for virtual network security controls and a couple of concepts we've visited before. So virtual private cloud gives a customer a greater level of control at the network layer, including managing non-routable IP addresses and control over inter-VM communication. Now that's not talking about inter-VM communication at the host level, but within our own network, we can create multiple VPCs to prevent groups of VMs from communicating with one another, even in our own subscriptions. And this is exceedingly common in a zero trust network architecture. We'll carve out a VPC for app servers and other for the database tier. And we will restrict ingress traffic to those networks using security groups. A security group is similar to an access control list for network. In fact, it looks a lot like a firewall. It has distinct rules for inbound and outbound traffic. And in AWS, they call it a security group. In Azure, they call it a network security group. So in Azure, the interface for configuring that network security group looks a lot like a firewall. In AWS, they call a security group a virtual firewall. So just to give you some exposure to the concept I'm talking about there, I'd like to do a quick demo and we'll take a look at securing virtual networks with security groups. And notice here, when I say security groups, I'm talking about a security group in this specific network context. This isn't like a security group that contains users and is used to provide access to resources assigned to people. So I'll just switch over to a browser to the Azure portal here, portal.azure.com, and I'm going to take a quick look at network security groups from a couple of different angles. So we'll start by looking just at the network security groups themselves. And you'll notice here that I have network security groups for FE, which is front end, so think front end app server, back end, think back end database server. So if I click on front end NSG here, what it's going to show me are the configuration elements of this NSG. So I can see the inbound security rules and take a look at these rules here. So we see the name of the rule, we see the priority, and when we scroll over, we can see the port and protocols that are applied and if it's an allow rule or a deny rule. And as you might imagine, you see the rule at the bottom there is a deny rule. So if no allow is found, all inbound is denied if not explicitly allowed. So I'll click add here so we can just add a rule and you'll see I can define source port ranges so I can make very specific rules. So if I want to create an RDP rule, for example, for remote desktop, I'm going to use 3389 and lock that rule down to that specific port. And you'll see I can get down to IP addresses or specific application security groups and tags. That's something 
specific to Microsoft Azure, but in any cloud provider, you're going to find that typically you can define IP addresses or ranges of IPs, and then we can pick services. So you'll notice here it gives me a standard list of services so I can decide what protocol I'd like to send through. So you notice when I pick HTTPS, the destination port is automatically set to 443. Now, in the Azure context, these network security groups can be applied in two ways. They can be applied to the network interface of a VM directly, which is fairly common, and I can click the Associate button and it will show me any network interfaces that don't have an NSG. And I can assign them to subnets. This is much more common. So you'll notice this NSG is assigned to the FE subnet. So the front end NSG is assigned to the front end subnet. So that inbound outbound rule set applies to that entire subnet in that case. Now I'm going to just give you a look from another angle. Here's a virtual machine and I mentioned that an NSG, a network security group, can apply to a VM interface as well, to its network adapter. So if I scroll down and get into the networking here, you can see that an NSG has been applied to this network adapter and there's the name of the network security group and the inbound rules. So notice there, there's an RDP rule, remote desktop protocol, and I can add inbound rules right here. So what you have here looks a lot like a layer four stateful packet inspection firewall. So that's a quick look at NSGs. I hope that gives you a better idea of what security group means in the network context. And finishing up section 5.1, guest operating system virtualization tool sets. So the tool sets that exist that I'm talking about would come from the maker of the hypervisor and provide extended functionality for various guest operating systems, be those Windows or Linux. For example, Hyper-V integration services enhance VM performance and provide several useful features. Things like guest file copy, time sync, guest shutdown. In the public cloud, these tool sets will typically be provided by the CSP in some capacity. That brings us to 5.2, operate physical and logical infrastructure for a cloud environment. So let's look at the roughly dozen topics we need to touch on here beginning with access controls for local and remote access. So we'll touch on RDP, SSH, jump boxes, and more. Secure network configuration, topics like VLAN, DHCP, DNSSEC, and VPN. And in network security controls, we have some overlap here with a discussion we're going to have in section 5.6. So I'm going to carry a few topics from this section of 5.2 forward. I'll let you know when we get there. Uh, know that we won't skip them. I just want to consolidate this to, to a more natural single discussion of topics like firewalls, IDS, IPS, and honeypots. Operating system hardening through the application of baselines, monitoring, and remediation. Patch management. Infrastructure as code strategy. Infrastructure as code is foundational in the public cloud in particular. Absolutely the norm, so we'll dig in to the details there. Availability of clustered hosts. This delves into the physical and isn't really even specific to cloud, so this will be a bit more academic in terms of discussion. Availability of guest operating systems. Performance and capacity monitoring. Hardware monitoring. Again, an area outside your corporate data center that is the responsibility of the CSP. Configuration of host and guest operating system backup and restore functions. And we'll finish up 5.2 with a look at scheduling, orchestration, and maintenance in the management plane. Because this is such a big section of Domain 5, I'm going to track this a little more closely for you. So we'll begin with 5.2.1, access controls for local and remote access. So we have in local and remote access, remote desktop protocol, the native remote access protocol for Windows. We have Secure Shell, which is the go-to for Linux operating systems, very popular in remote management of network devices. So these are going to be utilized by the CSP and the consumer alike. RDP and SSH both support encryption and MFA. 
Secure terminal or console based access. This is a system for secure local access. This is going to be the realm of the CSP in the public cloud. So that's using a KVM typically with access controls, basically allowing you keyboard access only at your system through a layer of security at that physical shared keyboard. Jump boxes, at least what they call jump boxes in the CCSP exam. You might hear these called jump servers elsewhere, but it's a bastion host at the boundary of lower and higher security zones. So CSPs offer services for this. Azure Bastion on the Microsoft platform, the AWS Transit Gateway for Amazon. Virtual clients, software tools that allow a remote connection to a VM for use as if it's your local machine. R very common example here would be VDI, Virtual Desktop Infrastructure for Contractors. And access to any of these can generally be gated with some form of privileged access management solution on the identity and access management platform used by the CSP. Next we have VPN. So this extends a private network across a public network, enabling users and devices to send and receive data across shared or public networks as if their devices were directly connected to the private network. And you have split tunnel versus full tunnel. So full tunnel means using VPN for all traffic, both to the internet and corporate network. Split tunnel uses VPN for traffic destined for the corporate network only and internet traffic direct through its normal route. You'll see split tunnel very commonly in work from home scenarios. And then we have remote access versus site to site. So in site to site, IPsec site to site VPN uses an always on mode where both packet header and payload are encrypted. This is IPsec tunnel mode. And in a remote access scenario, a connection is initiated from a user's PC or laptop for a connection typically of shorter duration. That's IPsec transport mode. So data in a remote access session must be encrypted in transit using strong protocols like TLS 1.3 and session keys, session keys that ideally are good only for that session, so they are useless if discovered for later sessions. Strong authentication you know, may be combined with cryptographic controls such as a shared secret key for SSH and or MFA. And previously in the series, we've talked about strong MFA factors, device state, and other conditions of access being applied to an authentication request. Enhanced logging and reviews. All admin accounts should be subject to additional logging and review of activity and frequent access reviews. Privileged access solutions in identity as a service solutions often include an access reviews feature. Use of identity and access management tools. So many CSPs offer that identity as a service option that enables strong authentication and access control schemes right out of the box. Examples would include Azure Active Directory on the Microsoft platform, Google Identity Services for GCP. And single sign-on is very important to the user experience. So your identity as a service solutions typically enable users to log into other services using their company accounts. Many identity as a service solutions function as a single sign-on provider. A general best practice for administrative users is the use of a dedicated admin account for sensitive functions and a standard account for day-to-day -day use. I want you to remember that for the CCSP exam. For the real world, I want to tell you that while that's listed in the common body of knowledge for the exam, it is not always true. And that's because increasingly, identity as a service solutions offer privileged identity management or privileged access management for just-in-time privilege elevation, enabling us to run an account without privilege day-to-day, -day, and when we need admin access for a few minutes or a few hours, we can elevate, do our work that requires privilege, and then our elevation either expires or we self-revoke. It's a more granular version of least privilege, and I'll show you in a live cloud environment here in just a moment. So solution features typically offer temporary elevation of privilege, approval gates, an audit trail when privilege is activated, and an access review process to avoid permissions sprawl. So again, the CCSP is not focused on one CSP, but we'll take a look 
at Privileged Access Management and one of the major providers here. Just for context, understanding that the features will vary by cloud service provider. Now I'll just switch to my browser here and I'm in the Azure portal and have navigated to the Azure Active Directory Admin Center. I'll click on Azure Active Directory and we're going to look at the Privileged Identity Management feature, which is one of several Privileged Access Management capabilities we find on the Microsoft platform. I'll click on Identity Governance and under Privileged Identity Management, I'll click Azure AD Roles and I'm going to look at the Global Admin role. So if I just type Global Administrator, we have a privileged identity profile here, and I see Adele has been assigned access to this profile. So let's look at the settings of the profile and see what that means when she activates this Global Administrator profile. Well, it means she gets Global Administrator rights for up to eight hours, at which point it's automatically revoked. Upon activation, we're requiring Azure multi-factor authentication. We are requiring justification, so she has to write us a little note in a long text box to tell us why she's activating. We can require a ticket on activation. This is set to no at present, and we're not requiring approval, though those are features we can turn on. So I'll click Edit here, and you'll notice here I can turn this up to as much as 24 hours. So we were at eight hours in our current settings. And I can turn on notification. Notification is a popular option when we decide not to require approval. Folks always behave when they know everybody else is being notified that they've activated this privileged role. So it gives us a nice audit trail, but it gives us something almost as good as approval. But in that case, the user doesn't have to wait for approval. And we no doubt trust the folks that we're assigning access to this privileged role. And you see here I can require the ticket. I can turn those extra features on if I like. Now I want to just back out of here and talk for a moment about the access review option. So you'll see here under manage I have access reviews. For the privileged identity management feature I can configure access reviews for my privileged roles to see if users still need access. So here's my global admin review. I can set a start date. I can set a frequency. I like to review these sensitive roles at least quarterly. And if I scroll down here, you'll see that I can select the role or roles that I would like to audit. So I could basically configure one review that kicks off for all the roles. So a user will have to review any role that they're a member of. So I see all active and eligible assignments. So eligible is how we do this. The user is eligible to activate the role. It's not permanently activated, meaning they don't have privilege all the time. And for reviewers, you'll notice here that I can assign a manager. I can select a specific reviewer or my favorite, let the reviewers basically self-review and tell me if they still need access. And when I scroll down here, you'll notice that Upon completion, once the review period is over, if the users don't respond, I can make no change. I can remove their access or automatically approve their access. I can choose how I respond if the user fails to reply. And I have a healthy number of notification options that I can configure here to make sure the right people are in the loop that we've gone through that access review process. So that's just a quick look. Again, there are multiple privileged access management features in Azure AD, and you'll find similar features on other identity as a service platforms. I just wanted to give you some context for some of those capabilities we were talking about earlier in this session. And we're gonna move on to 522, secure network configuration. So we'll talk security around VLANs, DHCP, DNSSEC, TLS, VPN, just to name a few. I want to start by revisiting the zero trust security concept, which we've touched on earlier in the series, a strategy where no entity is trusted by default, moving on from the trust but verify strategy of years past. And it addresses the limitations of the legacy network perimeter based security model, where we trust everything on our trusted network and everything outside that perimeter firewall is untrusted. Now we're trusting no entity. It treats 
user identity as the control plane, and it assumes compromise or breach in verifying every request. But zero trust network architecture is another element of a zero trust strategy in an enterprise. So network security groups factor here, network firewalls, inbound and outbound traffic filtering, inbound and outbound traffic inspection, and centralized security policy management and enforcement. So network security, the network security group provides an additional layer of security for cloud resources. It acts as a virtual firewall of sorts for virtual networks and resource instances like VMs, databases, subnets. It carries a list of security rules, IP addresses, and port ranges that allow or deny network traffic to resource instances on a subnet. It provides a virtual firewall for a collection of cloud resources with the same security posture. It exists in multiple CSPs. The details are going to vary slightly with each. They call it a security group in AWS. They call it a network security group in Azure. So when we segment our network, we can use a security group to act as an ingress and egress filter for the segments of our network. So perhaps I have a subnet for my app, a subnet for my databases, a subnet for management infrastructure. So that's enough for now. We're going to revisit this a bit later and I'll actually get into a security group with you hands on so you can get a good look at that feature. So segmentation that I was just referring to, restricting services that are permitted to access or be accessible from other zones using rules to control inbound and outbound traffic. So we use rules that are enforced by the IP address ranges of each subnet, and within a virtual network, segmentation can be used to achieve isolation. It's port filtering through a network security group. We can do filtering through a firewall. But in that micro-segmentation scenario, we're going to use a security group, or what they call a network security group in Azure. It's a security group in AWS. And our VPC, our Virtual Private Cloud, contains private subnets, and each of these subnets has its own site or IP address range and cannot connect directly to the Internet. They could be configured to go through the NAT gateway if outbound Internet connectivity is necessary. Client VMs and database servers will often be hosted in a private subnet. And there are actually three private subnets that are predefined. So private subnets are not for public services like websites, but there are three private IP address ranges that are defined. There's the 10.0.0.0, so that's a class A. You have the 172.16 to 172.31, that's a class B. And then the 192.168.00, which is a class C. These private ranges are defined in RFC 1918 and not routable over the public internet. All other IP address ranges, except the self-assigned range, the 169.254, all others are public addresses. So just as you would use these in your own data center, these same private ranges are equally applicable in the cloud and used frequently. So in a secure network design, we have to account for east-west traffic. This is where traffic moves laterally between servers within a data center, or in this case, within our virtual data center, which is our cloud subscription. North-south traffic moves outside of the data center. That's ingress and egress. VLAN, which is a collection of devices that communicate with one another as if they made up a single physical LAN. And it creates a distinct broadcast domain that can span multiple physical network segments. So on a switch, we can assign ports to a VLAN. So if I have my finance department spread across multiple floors, I could have members of the finance department on their own private VLAN so their work with sensitive data never leaves that distinct broadcast domain. They're within their own virtual local area network. Then we have a screened subnet. That's a subnet placed between two routers or firewalls. Bastion hosts are often located within a subnet like this as maybe web servers. You hear this called a perimeter network or a DMZ sometimes. 
So to wrap up the VLAN discussion, many public clouds offer the virtual private cloud functionality, essentially a sandbox area within the larger public cloud. It's network space dedicated to a specific customer. Different CSPs have different names for it. Microsoft calls the VPC a VNet, a virtual network. But VPCs take the form of a dedicated VLAN, essentially, for a specific user organization. It means other cloud tenants are blocked from accessing those resources. And a given customer can spin up multiple VPCs within their subscription and allow or prevent communication between those VLANs, those essentially dedicated VLANs. So we have a couple of options for VPC connectivity, connecting those virtual networks, so to speak. So we can create a VPN connection using L2TP or IPsec using a VPN gateway or a transit gateway it's sometimes called. Now, to connect VPCs within our subscription, we can use network peering. That's another method for connecting virtual networks in the cloud. So peering is the more common option between cloud networks within a subscription. And then for hybrid connectivity back to our corporate network, that's when we'd use a VPN. We'd use a site-to-site -site VPN, effectively creating a hybrid cloud. Moving on, let's talk DNS security. So DNSSEC, DNS Security Extensions. It's a set of specifications primarily aimed at reinforcing the integrity of DNS. It achieves this by providing for cryptographic authentication of DNS data using digital signatures. It provides proof of origin and it makes cache poisoning and spoofing attacks more difficult. It does not provide for confidentiality since digital signatures rely on publicly decryptable information. Encrypting data in motion is often achieved through transport layer security. That's how it's done for secure HTTP, for secure web sessions. And TLS, in that web context, uses an X.509 certificate with a public-private key pair. So for customer public-facing websites, you'll typically use a certificate from a trusted provider like a DigiCert or a GoDaddy. For secure sessions on internal sites within your organization, many organizations will have their own public key infrastructure to issue certificates because it only needs to be trusted by members and devices of their organization. If you're preparing for the CCSP exam, you're likely already familiar with the core functionality of DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, issuing IP addresses dynamically to endpoints coming onto the network. There are a couple of niche security discussions to be had here relevant for the exam. So one is the idea that the IP address associated with a system event can be used when identifying a user or a system. So our SIM, our Security Information Event Management solution, can leverage this data to track an IP address to a specific endpoint. We really need to just let our SIM ingest those DHCP logs to leverage that data for greater context. There's another niche discussion to have, and that's that some hypervisors offer a feature to limit which network cards are eligible to perform the DHCP offer, which can prevent rogue DHCP servers from issuing IP addresses to clients and servers, so we can prevent a rogue VM from being spun up and configured as a DHCP server. So that sort of protection is going to be the responsibility of the CSP in a public cloud scenario, as the CSP is responsible for the configuration of that physical host, that type one hypervisor. And in a private cloud and a corporate data center, that's going to be the responsibility of the organization. You should be familiar with methods to provide non-repudiation. So the guarantee that no one can deny a transaction. Digital signatures prove that a digital messenger document was not modified intentionally or unintentionally from the time it was signed. Digital signatures use asymmetric cryptography, a public-private key pair, the digital equivalent of a handwritten signature or a stamped seal. A couple of common methods for implementing non-repudiation include message authentication code, or MAC, where the two parties that are communicating can verify non-repudiation using a session key. Electronic financial transfers or electronic funds transfers frequently use MACs to preserve data integrity. 
And then there's HMAC or hash based message authentication code, which is a special type of Mac with a cryptographic hash function and a secret cryptographic key. So HTTPS, some secure FTP options, and other transfer protocols use HMAC. So just breaking down a few cryptographic concepts. Cryptography provides a number of security functions, including confidentiality, integrity, and non-repudiation. So your encryption tools like TLS or a VPN can be used to provide confidentiality. Hashing can be implemented to detect unintentional data modifications. Integrity is the focus there. Additional security measures like digital signatures or HMAC can be used to detect intentional tampering. HMAC and simultaneously verify both data integrity and message authenticity. And up next is network security controls, topic number three in that long list of 12 topics within section 5.2. We'll start with the last one on this list, Bastion Host. So a Bastion Host is a host used to allow administrators to access a private network from a lower security zone. So the system We'll have a network interface in both the lower and higher security zones, and the host itself will be secured at the same level as the higher security zone it's connected to. When you're accessing sensitive resources, generally speaking, the system you are accessing them from should be secured at the same level or greater. Now, we've talked about Bastion Host by another name already in this series, and that is Jumpbox. Jumpbox or Jump Server are two common names for Bastion hosts. And CSPs offer services for this. There's Azure Bastion and AWS Transit Gateway, which offer Bastion host functionality, usually with additional conveniences. For example, Azure Bastion allows you to connect via RDP or SSH to Windows and Linux systems directly from a browser, so you don't need an endpoint client. You don't need an RDP or SSH client. But in whatever form, think of a Bastion host as a dedicated host for secure admin access. There are several other network security controls in the list there you should have basic familiarity with in terms of functionality and their strengths. So in the realm of firewalls, stateless and stateful, application host and virtual firewalls, web application firewalls or WAFs, the next generation firewall, or NGFW. In the intrusion detection and prevention systems, host-based IDS, HIDs and HIPS, network-based IDS, NIDs and NIPS, and hardware versus software. And in terms of other security controls, the honeypot and vulnerability assessments. Now, we're going to touch on all of these in section 5.6, and the conversation would be largely redundant. So we're going to press pause on these, and we'll cover these in detail later in this session in 5.6. And for now, we'll move on to the fourth item on the list, operating system hardening through the application of baselines, monitoring, and remediation. The OS hardening is the configuration of a machine into a secure state through application of a configuration baseline. Baselines can be applied to a single VM image, or we can apply that baseline to a VM template, which we create once and then use that to deploy all our VMs. And a hardened image may be a customer-defined image, a CSP-defined image, or it could be from a third party often available through a cloud marketplace. A great example of a third party is the hardened image set you can get from the Center for Internet Security, CIS, who offers hardened images in CSP marketplaces. In fact, if you want to build your own hardened image, you can also buy the scripts from the Center for Internet Security directly. But I find many customers just opt to use the CIS images from the marketplace of their chosen CSP. Let's dig a bit deeper into configuration baselines and related concepts. So we have the concept of a control, which is a high-level description of a feature or an activity that needs to be addressed, and it's not specific to a technology or an implementation. A security control is an example where we describe a level of security that needs to be achieved without 
discussing the specific implementation. A benchmark contains security recommendations for a specific technology, like an ISVM, or maybe we're talking about an identity as a service provider, like Azure Active Directory or Cisco Duo, or Google's identity services. And then we have a baseline, which is the implementation of the benchmark on the individual service. So a control is expressed as a benchmark, and a benchmark is implemented as a baseline, through a baseline. The benchmarks describe configuration baselines and best practices for securely configuring a system. You'll often see platform or vendor-specific guides released with new products so that they can be set up as securely as possible, making them less vulnerable to attack. Web servers, for example, the two main web servers used by commercial companies are Microsoft's Internet Information Server and the Linux-based Apache. Because they're public-facing, they're prime targets for hackers. And to help reduce the risk, both Microsoft and Apache provide security guides to help security teams reduce the attack surface, making them more secure. These guides advise updates being in place, unneeded services are disabled, and the operating system is hardened to minimize risk of security breach. And just as with web servers, operating system vendors like Microsoft have guides that detail best practices for installing and securing their operating systems. OS benchmarks are also available from CIS and other third parties. Application servers. Vendors produce guides on how to configure application servers like email servers or database servers to make them less vulnerable to attack. And the list goes on. Network infrastructure devices from companies like Cisco produce network devices and offer benchmarks for secure configuration of their network hardware. At the end of the day, Benchmarks aim to ease the process of securing a component, reducing the attack footprint, and minimizing the risk of security breach. And diving into some of the details of OS hardening, we want to minimize listening ports and running services, restricting to those that are absolutely necessary, filtering traffic, disabling some ports entirely if unneeded. We can block ports through firewalls. We can Disable listening ports entirely by disabling the underlying Windows service many times. Then there's the Windows registry, and access should be restricted and updates controlled through policy wherever possible. We always want to take a backup of the registry before we start making changes. Disk encryption, so drive encryption, full drive encryption we call it, can prevent unwanted access to data in a variety of circumstances. So full disk encryption is BitLocker on the Windows platform or DMCrypt on Linux. And OS hardening can often be implemented through security baselines that come from the vendor. And they can be applied through Active Directory group policies or management tools like mobile device management platforms such as Microsoft Intune or AirWatch. And we can implement all of these using configuration baselines. I wanted to call out a few sources for configuration baselines for OS hardening in particular. That is the exam objective called out in the syllabus, after all. So we have vendor-supplied baselines. Again, Microsoft, VMware, and Linux all offer configuration guidance for their products that point out specific security options and recommended settings. But they all have configuration guidelines, and in the case of Microsoft, for sure they offer configuration baselines you can download as a starting point. DSA STIGS, so the Defense Information Systems Agency produces baseline documents known as Security Technical Implementation Guides, or STIGS. Now I will warn you that the DSA STIGS may include configurations that are too restrictive for many organizations. After all, their audience is government, so the regulations around security on the whole are going to be more stringent in that space. And then we have NIST checklists. So the National Institute of Technology and Standards maintains a repository of configuration checklists for various OS and application software. Another agency focused on a government audience. So likely, again, 
some guidance you can use and some that may be a bit too stringent for the average commercial company. Then we have CIS Benchmark. So the Center for Internet Security publishes baseline guides for a variety of operating systems, applications, devices, all of which incorporate many security best practices. And CIS offers benchmark scripts that are priced based on environment size. If you go to your CSP marketplace, you'll find VM images that give you a ready-made hardened image if you want to go that route for your OS hardening. But as you can see here, you have a number of options available to you. Next on the agenda in 5.2 is patch management. There are a few basics you want to be familiar with on exam day. Patch management is sometimes called update management, really just two names for the same discipline. And it ensures that systems are kept up to date with current patches. The process will evaluate, test, approve, and deploy patches. So we need to design that process. Often we use what I call a ring strategy, where we'll deploy to a small group of users, usually within the IT department, then in a second ring to a broader sampling, a pilot group across business units before we deploy broadly to the organization. System audits verify the deployment of the approved patches to the system. And we want to make sure we patch both native OS and third-party applications. It's pretty common that organizations of lesser maturity will not get around to patching third-party apps, which leaves security holes. And we want to apply out-of-band updates promptly. So if a software provider supplies a security patch out-of-band, it's usually because it is an urgent situation. And cloud service providers generally provide a patch management feature tailored to their IaaS offering. Up next is infrastructure as code strategy. Infrastructure as code is the management of infrastructure, our networks, VMs, load balancers, and connection topology described in code. Just as the same source code generates the same application binary, code in the infrastructure as code model results in the same environment every time it's applied. In fact, infrastructure as code is a key DevOps practice, and it's used in conjunction with continuous integration and continuous delivery. In fact, infrastructure as code is very common. It's really the standard in the cloud. Now, the CSPs typically offer cloud-native controls for implementing infrastructure as code. Microsoft offers Azure Resource Manager. Amazon offers AWS Cloud Formation. These tools make managing the respective Cloud resources easier on each platform, supporting infrastructure as code, but they are separate tools for separate platforms. They're platform specific. Now, third party tools add more flexibility, functionality, and multi platform support. Organizations will typically move to third party IAC solutions when the native cloud solutions do not meet their functionality needs or they become a multi cloud customer. So, for example, some organizations move to Terraform for infrastructure as code because it supports the major CSPs using a single language. And CSPs offer a marketplace where third parties can publish offers related to infrastructure as code. Now, there are two distinct characteristics of infrastructure as code that improve resiliency in IaaS and PaaS service models. And I want to make sure you're familiar with these for the real world, if not for the exam. So the term declarative. Infrastructure as code must know the current state. It must know whether the infrastructure already exists to know whether or not it needs to create it. Imperative deployment methodologies are unaware of current state. If you write a PowerShell script, for example, or a Python script, that is an imperative deployment methodology. It doesn't know if the infrastructure already exists. Infrastructure as code, when implemented through the CSP native tools or solutions like Terraform, are also idempotent. Deployment of an infrastructure as code template can be applied multiple times without changing the results. For example, if the template says deploy four VMs and three exist, only one more is deployed. But these characteristics help reduce errors and configuration drift because we can apply 
the infrastructure as code template multiple times and the result will always be the same. It will be an environment exactly as is described in the infrastructure as code template. Up next, we'll talk about the availability of clustered hosts. And we're really talking about clustered virtualization hosts, the physical servers hosting our hypervisor. So that's the realm of the CSP in the public cloud, but our responsibility in the corporate data center in a hybrid cloud scenario. The cluster advantages include high availability via redundancy, optimized performance via distributed workload as the cluster can push VMs to different members of the cluster to distribute the load, and availability to scale resources. So let's start with the cluster management agent. It's often part of the hypervisor or load balancer software. It's responsible for mediating access to shared resources in a cluster. Reservations are guarantees for a certain minimum level of resources available to a specified virtual machine. A limit is a maximum allocation. A share is a weighting given to a particular VM. A share value is used to calculate percentage-based access to pooled resources when there is contention in those resources. Distributed resource scheduling is a coordination element in a cluster of VMware ESXi hosts. So DRS is VMware specific. It mediates access to the physical resources. It handles resources available to a cluster, reservations and limits for the VMs running on the cluster, and maintenance features. Dynamic optimization is Microsoft's DRS equivalent delivered through their cluster management software. Storage clusters pool storage, providing reliability, increased performance, and possibly additional capacity. All of this tech is CSP owned in the public cloud and organization owned in a private or hybrid cloud. Next, we're going to talk availability of the guest operating system. And we're really talking about the guest operating system in the IaaS context in this case. We've deployed a virtual machine in the IaaS model. And it's important to recognize that once a VM is created in IaaS, the CSP no longer has direct control over that guest operating system. The customer can use baselines, backups, and cloud storage features to provide resiliency in the guest OS using vendor-supplied OS baseline templates, for example, or cloud storage redundancy features like zone or geo-redundancy, or backups, and in virtualized cloud infrastructure, this might involve the use of snapshots. Fortunately, your CSPs offer backup features for VMs in the IaaS model. Resiliency is achieved by architecting systems to handle failures from the outset rather than needing to be recovered. For example, virtualization host clusters with live migration provide resiliency. But resiliency of the physical hypervisor cluster, networks, and storage are responsibility of the CSP. So next we'll take a look at performance and capacity monitoring. Now, the CSP should implement monitoring to ensure that they're able to meet customer demands and promised capacity because the cloud provides the perception of unlimited capacity, but in reality is a highly scalable platform of finite infrastructure resources cleverly oversubscribed. So consumers should monitor to ensure the CSP is meeting their obligations in terms of performance and availability. Most monitoring tasks will tend to be in support of the availability objective, monitoring for service availability first and foremost. Alerts should be generated based on established thresholds and appropriate response plans initiated when objectives are not being met, when thresholds are breached. Monitoring should include utilization performance and availability for compute, for CPU, memory, storage, and network. That's what we call the core four. And just as reviews make log files impactful, appropriate use of performance data is also essential. If it's not used, it is wasted and increasing cost and nothing more. Next up is hardware monitoring. So this is definitely in the public cloud going to be the purview of the CSP. In the private cloud, that's where it falls to the customer in their corporate data center. 
So physical hardware is necessary to provide all the services that enable the virtualization that enables cloud computing. And again, hardware monitoring should monitor CPU, RAM, fans, disk drives, network components, any point of failure in that physical infrastructure. Environmental monitoring is also important. Computing components are not designed for use in very hot, humid, or wet environments. So HVAC temperature and humidity monitoring are all important. And in public cloud, hardware monitoring will be the responsibility of the CSP and not the consumer. As with many topics, it comes down to that shared responsibility model and knowing our role. Next, we'll talk configuration of host and guest operating system backup and restore functions. So responsibility varies by category. So we're going to go beyond the OS for just a moment here. In the SaaS model, the CSP retains full control over backup and restore. So if there are operating systems behind the scenes, the CSP owns it all. The only customer responsibility there is typically a shared responsibility for their own data. In the PaaS model, shared responsibility, CSP owns the infrastructure backups, consumer owns backups of their data. In the IaaS model, the consumer owns backup and recovery of VMs. So consumer backups may include full backups, snapshots, or definition files used for infrastructure as code deployments. Customer choice in that case. There are a few additional considerations. So sensitive data may be stored in backups, and in this case, access controls and need-to-know principles will limit exposure. Physical separation is important. Backups should be stored on different hardware or availability zones. So using zone-redundant or geo-redundant cloud storage, for example. Integrity of all backups should be verified routinely to ensure they're usable. And that brings us to our final topic in Section 5.2, the Management Plane. So the Management Plane in the cloud provides virtual management options analogous to physical admin options of a legacy data center. For example, the ability to power VMs on and off, provisioning virtual infrastructure for VMs like RAM and storage. It includes orchestration. This is the automated configuration and management of resources in bulk. This would include features like patch management and VM reboots, which are very commonly orchestrated tasks. And the management console is the web-based consumer interface for managing resources. And they'll typically be command line equivalents as well. It's very important though that the CSP ensure that management portal calls to the management plane only allow customer access to their own resources. Up next is 5.3, implement operational controls and standards like ITIL and ISO IEC 20000-1 or part one. In short, we're talking service management and topics in 5.3 will run the gamut of service management, including change management, continuity management, information security management, continual service improvement management, incident, problem, release, deployment, configuration, service level, availability, and capacity management. So fully a dozen different subsections within 5.3. So what is ISO IEC 20000-1? Well, it specifies requirements for establishing, implementing, maintaining, and continually improving a service management system. It supports management of the service lifecycle, including planning, design, transition, delivery, and service improvement. So these topics are all relevant for both the consumer and the CSP. Your role varies based on the cloud model, but relevant to the CSP and the consumer just the same. So we'll start with a look at configuration change and asset management. And I'm covering these three together because of their interrelated nature. One does impact the other. So change control refers to the process of evaluating a change request within an organization and deciding if it should go ahead. Requests are generally sent to a change advisory board, or a CAB for short, to ensure that it's beneficial to the company. 
This typically requires changes to be requested, approved, tested, and documented. So we have change management, which is the policy that details how changes will be processed in an organization, and change control, which is the process of evaluating a change request to decide if it should be implemented. So change management is guidance on the process. Change control is the process in action. And in an environment that leverages CICD and infrastructure as code, change reviews may be partially automated when new code is ready for deployment. The level of automation is going to vary by maturity, whether it's continuous delivery or continuous deployment, but automation is quite common. And this reduces operational overhead and human error, reduces security risk, enables more frequent releases while maintaining a strong security posture. And if you haven't already, you'll find that CICD and infrastructure as code are the norm, not the exception, in the cloud. Configuration management ensures that systems are configured in a similar way. Configurations are known and they're documented. Baselining ensures that systems are deployed with a common baseline or starting point. And imaging is a common baselining method, whether it's in IaaS with virtual machines or it's containerization, imaging. VM templates or container images are very common. A baseline is composed of individual settings called a configuration item. Change management, on the other hand, reduces outages or weakened security from unauthorized changes. Versioning uses a labeling or numbering system to track changes in updated versions of software. And configuration management and change management together can prevent incidents and service outages. Continuity management focuses on the availability aspect of the CIA triad, and there are a few standards out there related to continuity management. The CCSP exam may mention the NIST Risk Management Framework, or RMF, and ISO 27000, both of which deal with business continuity and disaster recovery terms that fall under the larger category of continuity management. We have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, which governs healthcare data in the United States and mandates adequate data backups, disaster recovery planning, and emergency access to healthcare data in the event of a system interruption. Remember, your number one responsibility as a security professional is human safety, nowhere more apparent than with HIPAA. And then there's ISO 22301, Security and Resilience in Business Continuity Management Systems. This specifies the requirements needed for an organization to plan, implement, and operate and continually improve the continuity capability. So for the exam, remember these are all associated with business continuity, disaster recovery, and availability. They are in one way or another relevant for both customer or consumer and the CSP. The goal of information security management is to ensure a consistent organizational approach to managing security risks. It's the approach an organization takes to preserving confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad, for systems and data. There are several standards that provide guidance for implementing and managing security controls in a cloud environment, and those include ISO 27001, 27017, 27018, 27701, the NIST Risk Management Framework, NIST SP800-53, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, and the SOC 2 standard from the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants of all places. And we've talked about the importance of SOC 2 reports already. And being familiar with all of these at a high level will be good insurance on exam day and very useful to you throughout your cybersecurity career. So the standards we're talking about here are all related to development of information security management standards for an organization. So let's just cover these a bit further at a high level. We have ISO IEC 27001, which is a global standard for information security management that helps organizations protect their data from threats. There's ISO 27017, which is a security standard developed for cloud service providers, for CSPs, and users 
to make a safer cloud-based environment and to reduce the risk of security problems. We actually cover 27.017 at some depth back in Domain 1 in Section 1.5. Then there's 27.018, which is the first international standard about the privacy in cloud computing services. It is a code of practice for protection of personally identifiable information in public clouds acting as PII processors. This will be covered in depth in Domain 6 and Section 6.2, so we'll get a bit further into 27.018 a bit later in this session. ISO 27701 extends the guidance in 27001 to manage risks related to privacy by implementing and managing a Privacy Information Management System, or PIMS. I think it's best if I describe the NIST RMF and CSF together, that's the Risk Management Framework and the Cybersecurity Framework from NIST. So the Risk Management Framework's audience is the entire federal government, and the CSF is aimed at private commercial businesses, although both address cybersecurity risk management. The RMF is mandatory, and the CMF is voluntary, of course. Then NIST SP800-53 provides a catalog of security and privacy controls for all U.S. federal information systems except those related to national security, so it's a government audience there again government-focused, and the guidance follows FIPS 200. And then the SOC 2 standard is a framework that's seen wide adoption among CSPs as well as the use of a third party to perform audits. And that's important because it provides increased assurance for business partners and customers who cannot audit the CSP directly because they have far too many customers to allow it. You remember earlier in the series when we went to the CSP portals, and so we can download that SOC 2 report to gain that assurance. This is another standard that will be covered in depth in Domain 6 in Section 6.2. Moving on to Continual Service Improvement Management. One critical element of Continual Service Improvement includes the areas of monitoring and measurement, which often take the form of security metrics. And metrics need to be tailored to the audience they will be presented to, which often means executive-friendly. Business leaders will be less interested in technical topics. The metrics should be used to aggregate information and present it in an easily understood, actionable format. Next up is incident management, and there are a couple of concepts you want to be familiar with here. The first is an event. Events are any observable item, including routine actions, such as a user successfully logging into a system. Incidents, by contrast, are events that are unplanned and have an adverse impact on the organization. Now, all incidents should be investigated and remediated to restore the organization's normal operations and to minimize adverse impact. Not all incidents will require the security team, but certainly the CCSP exam focus is security. So the incident management framework that you can expect to see in focus on this exam is quite likely going to be NIST 800-61, the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. It's a very popular standard. It's called out in the common body of knowledge. It's covered in depth in this course in Section 5.6, Manage Security Operations. So we'll be talking about the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide from NIST here very shortly, greater depth. I did want to mention the Incident Response Framework from SANS, SANS 504-B. That includes six steps, which starts with preparation, where incident response plans are written and configurations documented. Identification, which determines whether or not an organization has been breached. Is it really an incident, in other words? Step three is containment, limiting damage, the limiting the scope of the incident. Step four is eradication. Once affected systems are identified, coordinated isolation or shutdown, and then rebuild and notify relevant parties. Step five is recovery, root causes addressed, and time to return to normal operations is estimated and executed. And then step six, or phase six, 
helps prevent recurrent and improve IR processes. I wanted to share the SANS incident response phases here for two reasons. Number one, you're going to see them again in your cybersecurity career. Number two, when we dive into NIST 800-61 a bit later, you're going to notice a number of parallels. Problem management. So in the ITIL framework, problems are the causes of incidents or adverse events that impact the CIA triad. Problems are, in essence, the root cause of incidents. Problem management utilizes root cause analysis to identify the underlying problems that lead to an incident. It also aims to minimize the likelihood of future recurrence. An unsolved problem will be documented and tracked in a known issues or known errors database. And in the world of problem management, a temporary fix is called a workaround. Next up is release management. So today, traditional release management practices have been replaced in large part with release practices in agile development methodologies. The primary change is the frequency of releases due to the increased speed of development activities in continuous integration and continuous delivery, or CICD. Release scheduling may require coordination with customers and the CSP, so it may not be fully automated, but it's certainly going to be partially automated. The release manager is responsible for a number of checks, including ensuring change requests and approvals are complete before approving the final release gate. Changes that impact data exposure may require the security team. Some of the release process is often automated, but manual processes may be involved, such as updating documentation and writing release notes. From a security perspective, it's worth noting that the increased automation and pace of release in Agile and CICD typical to the cloud necessitates automated security testing and policy controls. Agile and CICD are the norm for the cloud. Deployment management. So in more mature organizations, the CD in CICD stands for continuous deployment, which further or fully automates the release process. Once a developer has written their code and checked it in, automated testing is triggered, and if all tests pass, code is integrated and deployed automatically. Less manual effort means lower cost, fewer mistakes, faster releases. Although it's worth mentioning that even organizations with continuous deployment may still require some deployment management processes to deal with deployments that can't be fully automated. Processes for new software and infrastructure should be documented. Containerization, managed Kubernetes, is common in mature organizations supporting more frequent deployment in public cloud environments. Kubernetes is the de facto standard for containerization. And fully automated deployment requires greater coordination with and integration of information security throughout the development process. So security is everyone's responsibility. We call that DevSecOps. Next, we have service level management, which focuses on the organization's requirements for a service as defined in a service level agreement, or SLA. SLAs are like a contract focused on measurable outcomes of the service being provided. And SLAs should include clear metrics that define availability for a service and exactly what availability means. SLAs require routine monitoring for enforcement, and this typically relies on metrics designed to indicate whether the service level is being met. And as a consumer or a customer of a CSP, your cloud infrastructure decision should be made with your application's SLA in mind, because defining the levels of service for your cloud infrastructure is usually up to the cloud service provider in public cloud environments. So you need to make sure that the IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS components that you choose as part of your solution architecture have SLAs that will support your overall service SLA. But customers should monitor their CSP's compliance with the SLAs promised with the various services, including service credits for SLA failures. Oftentimes, your CSPs provide financial backing for their SLAs, so you want to make sure that those credits are received when they're due. Availability management. Now, a service may be up, that is to say the service is reachable, but not available, meaning it cannot be used. 
And availability and uptime are often used synonymously, but there's an important distinction. Availability means the specific service is up and usable. For example, authentication and authorization must work and request must be fulfilled. If the users can't get their request fulfilled, the service is not truly available. Many of the same concerns that an organization would consider in business continuity and disaster recovery apply equally in availability management. BCDR plans aim to quickly restore service availability in adverse events. So BCDR and availability management align in many respects. Other concerns and requirements like data residency or the use of encryption can complicate availability, but customers have to configure services to meet their requirements. This responsibility lies firmly on the customer or consumer in most cases. Cloud consumers do have a role to play in availability management. How much depends on the cloud service category, whether it's IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. We know the customer has the most control in the IaaS category. And to round out section 5.3, we have capacity management. So one of the core concerns of availability is the amount of service capacity available compared with the amount being subscribed to. For example, if a service has 100 active users but only 50 active licenses available, that means the service is over capacity and 50 users will be denied service. Which calls attention to the fact that capacity issues can be physical, such as the underlying CSP's infrastructure, or logical issues like licenses, for example. Measured service is one of the core elements of cloud computing, so metrics that illustrate demand for the service are relatively easy to identify generally. Responsibility for capacity management belongs to the CSP at the platform level, but belongs to the customer for deployed apps and services. So the customer, the consumer, must choose appropriate service tiers and design their app to scale to meet demand. The cloud provides the perception of unlimited capacity, but in reality is oversubscribed by design, and our CSP must monitor how much is too much oversubscription. And here again, customer versus CSP responsibility will vary in accordance with the cloud service category, whether we're talking about IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. Up next is 5.4, Support Digital Forensics. In this section, we'll talk about forensic data collection methodologies, evidence management, and collecting, acquiring, and preserving digital evidence. The CCSP exam does not expect that you're a digital forensics expert, but it does assume that you're familiar with the special challenges of forensic data collection in the cloud, as well as the standards that outline best practices and processes for digital forensics. You may see questions on e-discovery. So e-discovery, or electronic discovery, is the identification, collection, preservation, analysis, and review of electronic information. E-discovery is usually associated with the collection of electronic information for legal purposes or in response to a security breach. There are roughly a half dozen forensic standards you should be familiar with for the exam. Most of these are ISO IEC standards, so that's the International Organization for Standardization. And there's one from the Cloud Security Alliance you should be familiar with as well. So we'll go through each of these at a high level. So ISO IEC 27037 is a guide for collecting, identifying, and preserving electronic evidence. ISO IEC 27041, a guide for incident investigation. 27042, a guide for digital evidence analysis. And 27043, a guide for incident investigation principles and processes. ISO IEC 27050 is a four-part standard within the ISO IEC 27000 family of information security standards. It offers a framework, governance, and best practices for forensics, e-discovery, and evidence management. If you were going to do your own investigation, this would be a standard to be familiar with, but generally speaking, hiring an outside forensic expert is the best path for most organizations if they don't have a forensic expert on staff. Now the CSA security guidance comes in Domain 3 Legal Issues, Contracts, and Electronic Discovery. 
This offers guidance on legal concerns related to security, privacy, and contractual obligations. It covers topics like data residency and liability of the data processor role. The data processor role has a lot of responsibility around data security, storage, tools, collection, and transfer. Next, let's talk about some considerations around forensic data collection. Number one, logs are essential. All activities should be logged, including time, the person performing the activity, the tools that are used, the system or data inspected, and the results. You should document everything, including physical or logical system states, applications running, any physical configurations of hardware, as well as any security around the system, including physical security, physical access. The person on the other side of the conversation may be an opposing party trying to identify instability in the system state or a lack of physical security that places the data that's been collected into question. And consider volatility. Volatile data, data that is not on durable storage, requires special handling and priority. Generally speaking, you want to collect data from volatile sources first. An example of a volatile data source would be system memory, which is going to be potentially erased over time or on system reboot. We'll get a bit deeper on volatility a bit later in this section when we talk about data collection, handling, and preservation. There are also a handful of evidence collection best practices called out that you should be familiar with. Utilize original physical media. So use physical media whenever possible, as copies may have unintended loss of integrity. But this is during collection. Verify data integrity at multiple steps using hashing, especially when you're performing operations such as copying files. You'll want to run a hash on the original file and then a hash of the file after the copy to ensure that they match, that there's no loss of integrity or data in that copy. Follow documented procedures. Dedicated evidence custodian, logging all activities, leaving systems powered on to preserve volatile data. And establish and maintain communications with relevant parties such as the CSP, internal legal counsel at your organization, and law enforcement in the case of a security breach for guidance and requirements. The considerations we covered right there are enough to send many organizations to an external forensics expert. We will talk about communication with relevant parties and communication plans in section 5.5. Next, we're going to move into evidence management, and I want to just refresh your memory on a couple of concepts we touched on in domain two. The first is legal hold, which involves protecting any documents that can be used in evidence from being altered or destroyed sometimes called a litigation hold. If you see litigation hold, that's just another name for legal hold, generally speaking. And another very important concept when it comes to forensic data collection, chain of custody. This tracks the movement of evidence through its collection, safeguarding, and analysis life cycle. It documents each person who handled the evidence, the date and time it was collected or transferred, and the purpose for that transfer. It confirms appropriate collection, storage, and handling. And chain of custody is of paramount importance in legal proceedings. Scope of evidence is very important as well. So this describes what is relevant when collecting data. And in a multi-tenant cloud environment, this can be particularly important because collection from shared resources like cloud storage may expose other customers' data if they did not fully erase their data before they left. And if the CSP does not adequately manage scope, they may expose sensitive data of an unrelated company, potentially exposing you, the consumer, to unneeded liability. The scope of data collection is definitely going to be a bit more challenging in the cloud for this reason alone. But it's certainly not the only challenge. So the cloud comes with several challenges when it comes to forensic investigation and data collection. So one of these is data location. Do you know where the data is hosted and the laws of the country it's hosted in? Many cloud services store copies of data in multiple locations. 
rights and responsibilities. So what rights for forensic data collection are listed in your CSP contract? And if it requires CSP cooperation, what is their response SLA? Tools. Are your forensic tools suitable for a multi-tenant environment, for a highly virtualized environment? What is your organization's liability if you unintentionally capture another customer's data on a shared resource because of inadequate tooling decisions that you made? Remnants of a previous customer's data on physical storage, for example. Because as we've discussed in previous domains, the consumer is responsible for data destruction, and if they don't practice crypto shredding, they may leave remnants behind for the next customer to find in a situation such as forensic data collection. But these aren't the only considerations. So laws and regulations also impact a consumer's ability to perform forensic data collection in the cloud, because cloud data should generally be stored and have data sovereignty in the region or country where it's stored. And many countries have laws requiring businesses to store data within their borders. So when we talk about that problem of knowing where your data is, many times the law requires you to know where your data is. The U.S. introduced the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data, or Cloud Act, in 2018 due to problems the FBI faced in forcing Microsoft to hand over data stored in Ireland. It aids in the evidence collection in investigation of serious crimes. That was the intent. And in 2019, the U.S. and the U.K. signed a data sharing agreement to give law enforcement agencies in each country faster access to evidence held by cloud service providers. So while there are certainly many laws that are targeting consumers, commercial companies with customer data, there are also laws targeting the CSPs. So a lot to consider there, which means verifying audit and forensic data collection rights with your CSP to ensure you understand your rights and their legal obligations before you sign contracts is very important. So going a bit further down the road here, forensic investigators should know their legal rights in every jurisdiction, every region or country where the organization hosts data in the cloud. Some countries will not allow e-discovery from outside their borders, so you may be required to hire an agent in-country. Now, chain of custody in traditional forensic procedures is easy to maintain an accurate history of time, location, and handling, due at least in part to the fact that we know where the data is located. In the cloud, physical location is somewhat obscure. However, investigators can acquire a VM image from any workstation connected to the Internet. And because your cloud data centers where you store data may be hosted around the world, timestamps and offsets can be more challenging due to the varying geographic locations. And maintaining a proper chain of custody, thus more challenging in the cloud, because we have to record that sequence of events. Who collected the data, how they collected the data, what data was collected, and when they collected that data, and from where. But with the variance in physical location, it means the where and when can be more challenging to track. And breach notification laws vary by country and regulations. For example, GDPR requires notification within 72 hours. And that applies to all with EU customers, even if it's a third-party breach. So if you are a company located in the United States and your CSP experiences a breach in the EU, you are responsible for notifying your customers if that breach impacts their data. So remember, a first-party breach begins within the company. A third-party breach would be outside the company. But data residency and data sovereignty are certainly more challenging in the cloud due to the many potential locations of our data centers and the fact that many cloud services will make multiple copies of our data and store them in multiple regions for redundancy reasons. So once we've managed to collect the data, let's talk about the utility of evidence or the usefulness of that evidence. So evidence should possess five attributes to be useful. It needs to be authentic. The information should be genuine and clearly correlated to the incident or crime to which it's attributed. It needs to be accurate. The truthfulness and integrity of the evidence should not be questionable. So evidence should be complete and all evidence should be presented in its entirety even if it might negatively impact the case that's being made. In fact, it's illegal in most jurisdictions to hide evidence that disproves a case. 
Evidence should be convincing, so the evidence should be understandable and clearly support an assertion being made. And that is to say evidence presented to support a fact should clearly support that fact. Chain of events presented from audit logs, for example, should be clear and show the chain of events clearly. Admissibility. So evidence must meet the rules of the body judging it, such as a court, and the bar for admissibility will vary based on the body judging it. Hearsay evidence, which is indirect knowledge of an action or evidence that has been tampered with, may be thrown out by a court. Courts typically set a higher standard than regulators for admissibility of evidence. And chain of custody is going to be one of the many key elements that support or negate admissibility. The so requirements for evidence to be admissible in a court of law, going one level deeper, evidence must be relevant to a fact at issue in the case, makes a fact more or less probable, essentially. The fact must be material to the case. The evidence must be competent, which means reliable. It must be obtained by legal means. Evidence obtained by illegal means will be thrown out by a court. To prevail in court, Evidence must be sufficient, which means convincing without question, leaving no doubt. Now we're going to shift gears and talk evidence, acquisition, and preservation. So let's start with the importance of collecting evidence. So as soon as you discover an incident, you should begin to collect evidence and as much information about the incident as possible. Evidence can be used in subsequent legal action or in finding an attacker's identity. Evidence can also assist you in determining the extent of damage. And as we discussed, some evidence is volatile. It's not going to be there forever. It will disappear over time and with system reboots. So collecting evidence as soon as you know there's an incident is very important. Control is important. Using a cloud service involves loss of some control and different service models offer varying levels of access. On the whole, we have the most control as a customer or consumer in the IaaS model, and the least in the SaaS model. Multi-tenancy and shared resources factor, because evidence collected while investigating a security incident may unintentionally include data from another customer. This is most likely if the CSP or delegate were performing forensic recovery from a shared physical resource, like a storage array. If a customer managed to not encrypt data or they were not holding the keys, there's potentially some residual data there that could be uncovered in a forensic data collection operation. Data volatility and dispersion. So cloud environments support high availability techniques for data like data sharding. Sharding breaks data into smaller pieces, storing multiple copies of each piece across different data centers. I've mentioned data volatility a few times, so let's unpack that a bit further. So to determine what happened in a system, you need a copy of data, and volatility tells us which evidence we should collect first. If it disappears in a system reboot or power loss or the passage of time, that evidence is volatile. So here's the approximate order of volatility. It starts with CPU cache and register contents. It goes down through routing tables, live network connections, memory, so your RAM, temporary files, all the way down to data stored on archival media and backups. So pretty common sense in most cases here. For the exam, remember that volatile, perishable information should be collected first. You don't need to remember the order of volatility. I just wanted to make sure that the concept of volatility is crystal clear. This is a niche topic of one subject within a large exam, but bottom line, remember that volatile information should be collected first. Now there are four general phases of digital evidence handling, starting with collection, examination, analysis, and reporting. And there are a number of concerns in the collection phase relevant to the CCSP exam. So proper evidence handling and decision-making should be part of the incident response procedures and training for team members who are performing response activities. Now let's talk evidence preservation and the concerns in preserving evidence. So this is really about how to retain logs, drive images, VM snapshots, any other data sets 
for recovery or internal and forensic investigations. Protections for evidence storage would include locked cabinets or safes, dedicated or isolated storage facilities, environment maintenance, making sure that we maintain proper temperature and humidity, access restrictions, and documentation or tracking of activity. So when evidence is checked out, there should be a record of that. When evidence is checked in, there should be a record of that. What and who and when. And blocking interference, so shielding data from wireless access. And that speaks to integrity. If someone came in to investigate or view evidence with a mobile device, they could potentially access that data through wireless. That's where a Faraday cage comes into play. If evidence is being examined, that examiner would not have a mobile phone with them. And bottom line here, you collect originals and you work from copies so you don't impact the integrity of the original unintentionally. Let's take just a minute or two and look at a few examples of areas and considerations around evidence acquisition. And most of these examples are applicable to the IAS model. So we have disk, also known as hard drive. So was the storage media itself damaged? Uh, random access memory, which is volatile memory used to run applications. The swap or page file, which is used for running applications when RAM is exhausted, also itself somewhat volatile. The operating system, was there corruption of data associated with the OS or applications? The device, when police are taking evidence from laptops, desktops, and mobile devices, they take a complete system image. And the original image is kept intact, installed on another computer, hashed, and then analyzed to find evidence of any criminal activity. Are you seeing the underlying theme here of integrity? So continuing on, firmware, embedded code, this is going to be more applicable to the virtualization host, which could be reversed engineered by an attacker, so an original source code would have to be compared to code in use. That really steps out of our role as the consumer down to the CSP who's hosting in a public cloud scenario. So in this case, we'd need a coding expert to compare both lots of source code in a technique called regression testing because rootkits and backdoors are concerns in this area. But in a public cloud situation, this would essentially be a third party breach. This would be the CSP's responsibility to deal with. So we'd hope that they have incident response procedures in place and are going to be cooperative with us if we're impacted as a customer. A snapshot, if the evidence is from a virtual machine, a snapshot of the virtual machine can be exported for investigation. Cache, special high speed storage that can be either a reserved section of main memory or an independent high speed storage device. Doesn't matter if it's memory cache or disk cache, both are going to be volatile. Network, so the OS includes command line tools like Netstat that provide information that could disappear if you reboot the computer, so you'll want to run those commands soon after the incident is discovered. Like RAM, connections are volatile and lost on reboot. And in the TCP IP world, may be lost before that, just through the passage of time. Artifacts, any piece of evidence, including log files, registry hives, DNA, fingerprints, or fibers of clothing, normally invisible to the naked eye. We're focused on cloud computing here, so you know which of these apply to cloud computing, but now you know what an artifact is. Integrity, so I've mentioned integrity as an underlying theme here, so hashes. When either the forensic copy or the system image is being analyzed, the data and applications are hashed at collection. It can be used as a checksum to ensure integrity later. Files can be hashed before and after collection to ensure a match on the original hash value to prove data integrity. I even use hashing when I am archiving my system log files. When I archive my syslog, I hash the file I'm about to upload to the cloud before I copy it and after I copy it so I know that the hashed copy of the file that arrived matches what I sent from the syslog server so it ensures integrity. Provenance. So data provenance effectively provides a historical record of data and its origin and forensic activities performed on it. It's similar to data lineage, but it also includes the inputs, entities, systems, and processes that influence the data. Uh, in case you're not familiar with data lineage, that's the process of tracking the flow of data over time, showing where the data originated, how it's changed, 
and its ultimate destination. So provenance also shows us what happened to that data, the inputs, the entities, the systems, and the processes that touched it. For the exam, hashing is far and away the most likely of these to appear on the exam. So make sure you understand the importance of hashing in integrity. And just some final words on evidence preservation. So data needs to be preserved in its original state so that it can be produced as evidence in court, whether that's legal proceedings or if we are pursuing legal action against an attacker in a data breach. Original data must remain unaltered and pristine. So what is a forensic copy? Well, an image or exact sector-by-sector -sector copy of a hard disk or other storage device taken using specialized software, preserving an exact copy of the original disk, whether that is a physical disk or a copy of our virtual VM disk, which is stored on physical shared storage at our CSP. Deleted files, slack space, system files, and executables, and documents renamed to mimic system files and executables are all part of a forensic image. And putting a copy of the most vital evidence in a worm drive will prevent any tampering with the evidence because you cannot delete data from a worm drive. And you could also write protect or put a legal hold on some types of cloud storage. And on that topic, I want to jump into a live CSP subscription and look at log collection and retention across a few different cloud services to talk about how that relates to preserving potential evidence. We'll switch over to a browser here and take a look at a Microsoft Azure subscription. So that's my primary CSP. And I'll take a look at a storage account here. So I'm just going to look at a pretty standard storage account. And right up here under overview, I see activity log. And if I look at the logs here, I can export my activity logs. It tells me that when I configure this export, that I can export different log categories. And you'll notice I can choose my destination here. So I can archive to another storage account. So that's a form of retention. I can send this over to a log analytics workspace, which would allow me to then query on that data, potentially generate alerts. And I can even send over to some other sources, not so important here, including a partner solution. So if I had a third party SIM, I might send over there. Now in this case, if I don't know exactly what these categories mean, the CSP, Microsoft in this case, gives me a link to learn more about those categories, and they are well explained here in a web page, so that's really helpful. And if we just back out of there, I want to scroll down and look under redundancy here. I talked more than once about the challenge of just knowing where your data is located. So in the redundancy area here, I see this is a geo-redundant storage account and the CSP provides me a map to show me where my data is hosted. So I see here that my primary region is South Central US and its geo-redundant partner for disaster recovery is North Central US. So they generally pick a backup more than 300 miles away as we talked about back in domain one. So let's switch gears here and jump over to a PaaS service. We're going to look at SQL Server and here under the overview, I do see an activity log area and I can export my activity logs. And again, similar interface as we saw with the IaaS service with the VM. I have an option here to configure some category exports to in fact the same locations. Now jumping over one level down, I wanna look at a virtual machine, so an IaaS scenario. And there's a logging option here. It appears to be more performance based. So this is more about monitoring system health and performance than the activities of the VM itself. And we can look around here to see if we have absolute consistency in the types of logs. And sure enough, we do see activity logging available here in that same export function. So it's fairly uniform across the various services, but if we come over here to our cloud-based SIM, Microsoft Sentinel, which is what I've shown you in previous examples, if we go down to the data connectors, which is how we ingest data into a, a typical SIM, we can see here that if I just search, for example, by the word Windows, I see I can ingest Windows Firewall data. So that's going to give me a lot of relevant information for my SIM. 
in terms of the events, what's coming in, so the ingress, and what's going out, the egress. If I also search on the word security, I see that when I scroll down here, I can gather security events from a Windows system using the Azure Monitoring Agent. If I search for SQL, I can expect to find an option for my Azure SQL databases. So the PATH service has an option here for data ingestion that eases that burden. And just switching gears one more time, I want to go back to the storage account. So if I decide that I'm going to archive data in a storage account, and I do this frequently myself, for example, with syslog data. So I come to my storage account here. If I go down to containers, which is where I would store data, think of it as a folder. If I come into my backups folder here, for example, you'll see that I can establish an access policy. And there's an option for immutable blob storage. So storage that cannot be altered, ensuring the integrity is intact. And I see here I can use this for time-based retention, which is something I do all the time. So if I want to keep my archive logs for seven or eight years, I'm going to set a retention here based on the number of days up to the level of retention that I'm comfortable with. But there's also an option here, which is the legal hold, a concept we talked about briefly in this domain and prior. And with a legal hold, we'd typically associate this with one or more tags, which is an identifier like a case ID as in a legal case. So point being, in the cloud, we have many options for data logging, log aggregation, and log retention. It's up to you as the consumer to be familiar with the options your CSP makes available to you. And that brings us to 5.5, manage communication with relevant parties. We'll touch on our communication strategy with vendors, customers, partners, regulators, and other stakeholders, which will vary by situation. And while best practices certainly exist for communication plans, we'll talk about the influence of company security policies and regulatory compliance requirements on our communication plan. And just like disaster recovery and business continuity come with a plan, communication starts with a plan, a plan that details how relevant stakeholders will be informed in the event of an incident, like a security breach. That would include a plan to maintain confidentiality, such as encryption, to ensure that the event does not become public knowledge, at least before we are ready. That plan should include a contact list that includes stakeholders from the government, police, customers, suppliers, our internal staff, and the order of operations. Compliance regulations like GDPR include notification requirements like relevant parties and timelines. For example, GDPR has a 72-hour clock on a security breach that involves sensitive data. I want to just unpack confidentiality one more time. So confidentiality amongst internal stakeholders is important, so our external stakeholders are informed in accordance with our plan, so they are not surprised by a news report. This sort of breach could have long-reaching consequences. It can affect the stock price in the short term. It can impact customer and partner trust in the long term and for the long term. So I mentioned a plan needs to include our stakeholders, who we need to inform and manage. And other stakeholders is that nebulous category we should unpack. A stakeholder is any party with an interest in an enterprise. For example, corporate stakeholders include our investors, employees, customers, and suppliers, our supply chain. And regulated industries, like healthcare and banking, are going to have requirements driven by the regulations governing their industries. That will influence who we need to have on this list to communicate with. The first step in establishing communication with vendors is an inventory of critical third parties upon which the organization depends. This inventory will drive vendor risk management activities in two ways, really. Some vendors may be critical to the company's ongoing function, like the CSP, for example. Others may provide critical input to a company's revenue generation, such as a partner who processes credit card transactions. And vendor communications may be governed by contract and service level agreement. Now, as cloud consumers, most companies will be the recipient of communication from their chosen CSPs. 
And while customers should define communication SLAs where they can, they should at least monitor those of the big CSPs, which are typically going to be predefined. Partners often have a level of access to a company's systems similar to that of the company's own employees, but they are not under company control. Communication needs to evolve with your partners through that relationship. Communication at onboarding will evolve into a maintenance mode as we have a day-to-day relationship with that partner, and then there's certainly an offboarding communication sequence, which may involve handoff to a new partner. So you'll notice not all of the communication we're talking about here is strictly incident-driven, but I think we can safely assume there's going to be a bit of an incident-driven focus on the exam. Then we have regulators. Most regulators have developed cloud-specific guidance for the compliant use of cloud services. And your regulatory standards like GDPR, HIPAA, and PCI DSS all have communication requirements that are well-defined. Other stakeholders the company may need to communicate with include the public, investors, and the company's cyber insurance company in a crisis. And procedures for the order and timing of contact should be created so we know who we're contacting first and what that flow looks like. Incidentally, I'm seeing increasingly that cyber insurance providers require that they are the first point of contact in the event of a security incident in which case they may actually drive the communication sequence for you. I don't expect you're going to be tested on that last bit. I just wanted to throw that real-world experience in there for you. So who is responsible for communication? Well, if a customer has impacted data, the company is always responsible for timely communication with that customer. If we have a data breach, the company must contact customers. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. This is true regardless of the cloud service model that's in use, and even if the CSP is at fault. So the bottom line with timely communication and shared responsibility is it's not really a shared responsibility. So let's talk about shared responsibility for security. So application security, for example. Responsibility varies by model, and we always as a customer have the most responsibility in the IaaS model, and our responsibility is less as we move through PaaS and to software as a service. Network security, same thing, although you'll notice there that our customer responsibility is, is nil for PaaS and SaaS. Host infrastructure, our service provider is dealing with all of the physical and most of the host level requirements even in the IaaS model. Physical security, that's the CSP responsibility across the board. Data classification is customer driven. As a customer, we have to classify and protect our data. That's our responsibility. And then identity and access management. You see that the customer has at least shared responsibility throughout all cloud models. The bottom line here is that the customer has responsibility throughout the process when it comes to application security and access and data protection and identity and access management. The customer always plays a role in access control and data security. And the customer is always in the driver's seat and fully responsible when it comes to timely communication with impacted parties in the event of a security incident. Up next is 5.6, Manage Security Operations. In this section, we'll touch on the Security Operations Center, intelligent monitoring of security controls with a look at firewalls, IDS and IPS, honeypots and more, log capture and analysis, and here we're going to get further into the SIM function and the log management function related to the SIM, and we'll finish up 5.6 with a look at incident management and vulnerability assessments. But let's start with the Security Operations Center. This is a support unit designed to centralize a variety of tasks and personnel at the tactical and operational levels. We typically refer to the Security Operations Center as the SOC, and it's worth noting that both the CSP and a consumer should typically have a SOC function. So what are the key functions of the Security Operations Center? Well, they include functions like threat prevention, threat detection, incident management, continuous monitoring and reporting, alert prioritization, and compliance management. Now, your CSP dashboards 
like Azure Status, the AWS Service Health Dashboard, and the Google Cloud Status Dashboard, give us a look at service health, but also the scope of the services that our major CSPs are managing through their SOC function. So here's another opportunity for a quick real world glance. Let's take a look at those cloud health and service status dashboards from our major CSPs. I'll switch to a browser and we'll take a look first at the AWS health dashboard. And you see here, I can look at service health by region, by date, and then by service listed in alphabetical order. And that's without being logged in. So anyone can see that status. And I'll switch over to the Azure status portal. And if I scroll down here again, I see some service health by region and services listed in alphabetical order. And if I then switch over to Google Cloud Service Health, we get again a similar view. And you will find that some aspects of service health, like if you'd want to look at the aspects of service health that apply to your subscription and your resources, you may have to log in with read access or better. Next, we have monitoring, which is really a form of auditing that focuses on active review of log file data. And monitoring can take many different perspectives. We can hold subjects accountable for their actions, for example. Another aspect of monitoring would focus on system performance. And another facet of monitoring would include tools like IDS or SIMS to automate monitoring and to provide real-time analysis of events from our logs, and in the case of SM, potentially correlating events across those logs. Now, monitoring security controls used to be an activity closely related to formal audits that occur relatively infrequently, often annually or less. But monitoring is something we now do continuously, and it's described, the, the concept of continuous monitoring, in NIST SP800-37, the Risk Management Framework. And the risk management framework specifies the creation of a continuous monitoring strategy for getting real-time risk information. Network firewalls, web app firewalls, your intrusion detection and prevention systems provide critical sources of information for our network operation center or security operation center teams. And your firewalls and your IDS and IPS devices are processing a lot of information, and they should be continuously monitored to ensure they are functional so we don't miss any important events. Monitoring for functionality would include monitoring log generation, centralized log aggregation, and the device analysis of those logs. Let's take a look at a few different firewall concepts, and we'll start with hardware versus software firewalls. So a hardware firewall is a piece of purpose-built network hardware. It may offer more configurable support for LAN and WAN connections versus a software firewall. It's also typically going to have better throughput versus software because it's hardware designed for the speeds and connections common in an enterprise network. Now in the cloud, a hardware firewall is virtual. It's a network virtual appliance or NVA for short. Now a software-based firewall is software that you would install on your own hardware. You'd put a software firewall on a physical or virtual server, for example. Now this is going to give us flexibility because we can place firewalls anywhere we'd like in the organization simply by installing that software. On servers, workstations, and you can run any sort of host-based firewall as long as you have a server to install it on. The downside that comes with that flexibility is host-based software firewalls are more vulnerable to being disabled by attackers. You know, oftentimes they simply have to disable a service to disable that firewall if they can establish a presence on that host. An application firewall caters specifically to application communications, layer seven in the OSI model. This could be any application traffic. Web traffic is very common. An example would be a web application firewall, or WAF for short. And a host-based firewall is a software firewall, an application installed on a host OS, like a Windows or Linux client or server operating system. You'll find host-based firewalls on both the client and server flavors of Windows and Linux. And then virtual firewalls. So in the cloud, firewalls are implemented as virtual network appliances, or VNA. Just a moment ago, I called that a Network Virtual Appliance, or NVA. 
That's not an accident. I wanted you to see it both ways. You'll see it referred to differently in different scenarios with different CSPs. And these are available both from the CSP directly and often from third party partners, commercial firewall vendors that will be listed in some sort of online marketplace attached to that CSP's cloud. And then we have stateless and stateful firewalls. So stateless means the firewall can watch network traffic and restrict or block packets based on source and destination addresses or other static values. It's not aware of traffic patterns or data flows. Typically it's faster and it performs better under heavier traffic loads because it's doing less work, frankly. A stateful firewall can watch traffic streams from end to end. It's aware of communication paths and it can implement various IP security functions such as tunnels and encryption. And it's better at identifying unauthorized and forged communications. But greater work means a stateful firewall is going to require greater processing power on the whole. There are several varieties of modern firewalls available in the cloud. A couple that you're likely to encounter at some point in your career are the web application firewall, which protects web applications by filtering and monitoring HTTPS traffic between a web application in the internet. It typically protects web applications from common attacks like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, the top 10 OWASP threats. In fact, some of these firewalls will come pre-configured with OWASP rule sets, what they call the OWASP core rule sets. We actually looked at that earlier in the series. And then there's the next generation firewall, which is a deep packet inspection firewall that moves beyond port and protocol inspection and blocking, and it adds application level inspection, intrusion prevention, and it typically brings intelligence from outside the firewall, generally in the form of a threat intelligence feed that feeds real-time threat information or near real-time threat information to the firewall, enhancing its ability to block information coming from malicious sources. And that ability to block traffic from malicious sources with that real-time information is something you will find commonly in the native firewall features that you get on your major CSP platforms like Azure and AWS. You may see these two abbreviated. The web app firewall is commonly called a WAF and the next generation firewall may show up as NGFW. You should also be familiar with the different types of intrusion detection and prevention. So an intrusion detection system, or IDS, generally responds passively by logging and sending notifications. It will identify a problem and notify us, but it typically does nothing, little or nothing, to correct it. An IPS system, or intrusion prevention, is placed in line with the traffic and includes the ability to block malicious traffic before it reaches the target. And then we have the host-based variety, so HIDs, or host-based intrusion detection systems, which can monitor activity on a single system only. The drawback is that attackers can often discover and disable these. And you may have some HIDs that are hardware-based and others that are software-based, but the host-based aspect can be considered a weakness. And then we have network-based intrusion detection, which can monitor activity on a network NIDS tends to not be as visible to attackers. Incidentally, the same distinction exists for intrusion prevention systems, so you'll also see reference to HIPS and NIPS, host-based IPS and network-based IPS. Next, we have a honeypot. So a honeypot is a system that has pseudo flaws and fake data designed to lure intruders. As long as the attackers are in the honeypot, they're not in our live network. It's worth touching on the goals of a honeypot a bit more specifically. So it's to lure bad people into doing bad things with some limits. You want to entice folks, not entrap them. You're not allowed to let them download items with enticement. For example, allowing download of a fake payroll file would be what we call entrapment in U.S. law. So to be clear, the goal of a honeypot is to distract from real assets and to isolate that threat in a padded cell until you can track them down. 
And incidentally, a group of honey pots is called a honey net. Now, monitoring tools like a security information event management system, or SIM, use AI and machine learning to automate investigations and response. So I wanted to touch on these briefly to make sure you understand the difference. So artificial intelligence focuses on accomplishing smart tasks, combining machine learning and deep learning to emulate human intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of AI that involves computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and the use of data. Machine learning gets smarter by processing data. And then deep learning is a subfield of machine learning concerned with algorithms inspired by structure and function of the brain called artificial neural networks. Then we have user entity behavior analysis, or UBA, which is based on the interaction of a user that focuses on their identity and the data they would normally access during a normal day. It tracks the devices the user normally uses and the servers that they normally visit. And then we have sentiment analysis, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify attacks. Cybersecurity sentiment analysis can monitor articles on social media, look at the text, and analyze the sentiment behind the articles. And over time, can identify a user's attitudes towards different aspects of cybersecurity. Now we're going to move into log capture and analysis in the context of the tooling we use in our security operations center that allows our organization to define our incident analysis and response procedures in a digital workflow format. So we're integrating our security processes and tooling in a central location, our SOC, leveraging response automation using machine learning and artificial intelligence in our SIM and SOAR functions. Now these make it faster than humans in identifying and responding to true incidents. It reduces mean time to detection and accelerates security response. It uses playbooks that define an incident and the action that will be taken. The capabilities are going to vary by the situation and the SIM vendor and your CSP for that matter. But over time, it should produce faster alerting and response for the SOC team. So let's break these down. We have SIM, Security Information Event Management, which is a system that collects data from many other sources within the network. So it is ingesting logs from many different sources and it provides real-time monitoring, analysis, and correlation, as well as notification of potential attacks. And then we have the SOAR function, Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response, which is centralized alert and response automation with threat-specific playbooks. I use that playbook term loosely. Many solutions use that term playbook, but it's going to be a bit different based on vendor. And the response may be fully automated or single click, what we'd call semi-automated. Some of these systems will do the analysis and the correlation and recommend an action, but require you to single click approve before it implements that action, before it takes that response. Many providers deliver these SIM and SOAR capabilities together in a single solution. And with very few exceptions today, they use AI, machine learning, and threat intelligence. So I promised we'd dig a bit deeper into the SIM function in Domain 5, but first I want to just do a quick recap of our introduction to the SIM function back in Domain 2. So, number one, our logs are worthless if you do nothing with the log data. Logs are made valuable by review, whether it's human, manual review, or it's automated. That is, they're valuable only if the organization makes use of them to identify activity that is unauthorized or compromising. The SEM function can help solve some of these problems by offering some key features. Log centralization and aggregation, data integrity, and normalization. So normalizing our logs into a common format that we can then hunt and query through. Automated or continuous monitoring, alerting, and investigative monitoring. Some automation of the investigation process. So let's take a look at some key SIM features necessary to optimize event detection and visibility and to scale security operations. First and foremost is log centralization and aggregation. So rather than leaving log data scattered around the environment on various hosts, the SIM platform can gather logs from a variety of sources, operating systems, applications that can be PaaS and SaaS applications for that matter, 
network appliances, user devices, providing a single location to support investigations. And with all that log data in one location, you can imagine that data integrity is very important. The SIM should be on a separate host with its own access control, preventing any single user from tampering with that log data. So separate host really speaks to physical or at least logical isolation, and that's where a cloud SIM can solve that problem for us. A cloud-based SIM is going to use cloud storage, will have its own access control, and can ensure that we have that access control boundary. Then normalization. A SIM can normalize incoming data to ensure the data from a variety of sources is presented consistently, and we can query across all of that log data from those many different sources. Automated or continuous monitoring, so sometimes referred to as correlation. SIMs use algorithms to evaluate data and identify potential attacks or compromises. So because we have centralized log data that's been normalized into a common format that we can query across, the automated investigative capabilities are going to have greater context because it can look at entity activity across our endpoints in our identity system with our applications on our network. So it's going to do a better job of capturing the full scope of a potential security incident and then can alert us automatically generating alerts like emails or tickets when action is required based on analysis of that incoming log data. But not everything can be automated, and that's why a SIM should support investigative monitoring. So when manual investigation is required, the SIM should provide support capabilities like querying log files and generating reports. But the SIM is giving us visibility across our entire technology estate, our data, apps, identities, endpoints, and infrastructure through that log centralization and aggregation. That broad SIM visibility across the environment means better context in log searches and security investigations. It really allows us to get our arms around the full scope of a potential security breach. And the key to that visibility is log collection. Of course, it will vary by SIM solution, but let's talk through some common log collection methodologies we see with a SIM. So a SIM typically has built-in log collector tooling that can collect information both from a syslog server and multiple other servers. Often we can place an agent on a device that can collect log information and parse and restructure the data and then pass that to the SIM for aggregation. Ingestion might be with an agent, such as on a Windows or a Linux server, or a syslog server, we can capture that syslog data and forward that, and in some cases, we'll see that data capture, that log aggregation happening through an API. Pretty common with SaaS services that API is our route for aggregation. But that aggregation is really correlating and aggregating events so that duplicates are filtered and a better understanding of network events is achieved to help identify potential attacks. And then packet capture. We can capture packets and analyze them to identify threats as soon as they reach your network, providing immediate alert to the security team if desired. And while I see that called out in SIM discussions, you know, packet capture is really more of a network construct. We're going to see that packet level focus happening with our IDS and IPS solutions and rolling some of that data up through our logs. Or with the SIM, we're really looking at the data coming from those devices that are at the front lines of the packet analysis. And then data inputs. Our SIM can collect a massive amount of data from a variety of sources like our network devices, our identity management system, our mobile device management system, our CASB, the Cloud Access Security Broker, our extended detection and response function at our endpoints, and really many more. So let's just talk about log ingestion with a SIM. Here's an example. So we have our SIM. It can collect logs from our SQL servers, for example, both IaaS and PaaS. Now, how that happens is going to vary by the solution. For IaaS, commonly we'll see an agent installed on that system. PaaS, we may be consuming those logs from storage or through an API. Our identity as a service solution, typically via an API connector. Our network virtual appliances, quite commonly we're collecting via a syslog connector of some sort. One of the solutions I work with very commonly, we install an agent on 
that syslog server and the agent then proxies that syslog data over to our sim. Our XDR solution, that's our endpoint activity data. When we see a best in suite solution where the vendor that gives us our XDR functionality and our sim vendor are one and the same, sometimes we'll see that the XDR will simply forward alert data over. Then we have our infrastructure as a service, our IaaS, our virtual machines. We're often collecting via a local agent. And then we have our CASB solution, our cloud access security broker. That's usage alerts, events related to how users are accessing and using our data with apps. So the data we collect from a CASB might be events, it might be alerts, it might be incidents. And again, a lot of times what we're collecting there depends on if the SEM vendor and the CASB vendor are the same vendor. For example, if Microsoft Azure is where you source your SEM solution, Microsoft Sentinel, and then Microsoft CASB solution, since you have a single vendor there, the vendor knows what data they've already processed on the CASB side, so maybe they'll just forward over the resulting alerts instead of sending over all the raw event data. Again, just an example. The CCSP is cloud agnostic. CSP agnostic. We're not focused on one vendor here. But with all that functionality, it's no wonder that the SIM is really a core tool of the Security Operations Center. Let's take a minute and go a level deeper on some of the log file data that our SIM solution might be ingesting. Because in any given environment, data is recorded in a variety of databases and different types of log files. System logs, security logs, application logs, firewall logs, proxy logs, syslog, and that data should be protected by centrally storing that log data and using permissions to restrict access. That's one of the functions of our SIM. And archive logs should be set to read only to prevent modification. But log files play a core role in providing evidence for our investigations. You want to be familiar with the many different types of log files a typical SIM solution might ingest. A network log. This log file can identify the IP and MAC addresses of devices that are attached to your network. This data is commonly sent to a syslog server, often a central syslog server. Our network-based intrusion detection and prevention can be important in identifying threats and anomalies from these. Log files from a proxy server can reveal our users who are visiting malicious sites intentionally or otherwise. The collective insight may be useful in stopping a distributed denial of service attack. When we have eyes on all of that network data across our network segments and devices, we can see common patterns in there. It allows our SEM to investigate with greater context. Web server logs can provide many types of information about web requests, so evidence of potential threats and attacks will be visible here. Information collected about each web session, IP address, request date, and time, the method that we see in HTTP like GET or POST, the browser that's used, what we call the user agent, and the HTTP status code. For example, the 400 series HTTP response codes are client-side errors, and the 500 series response codes are server-side errors. But these logs must be fed to our SIM in order for it to analyze that data. And these files may exist on client systems as well as server systems. So sending these to a SIM can help establish that central audit trail across all of our endpoints to give us greater visibility, greater context into the scope of the attack. So on a Windows system, for example, we'll have a system log that contains information about hardware changes, updates to devices, date and time synchronization, group policy application. We have the application log that has information about software applications, when they're launched, success or fail, warnings about potential problems or errors, and then the security log that contains information about successful login as well as unauthorized attempts to access the system and its resources. It can identify attackers trying to log into your computer systems. It captures information on file access and can determine who has downloaded certain data. You will find these log files with these names in the event viewer on any Windows client or server machine. As the administrator of your client and server systems, you are responsible for dialing up or down the level of security event logging to make sure that you are at the very least capturing the minimal audit trail. Virtually every DNS server will log server level activity like zone transfer, DNS server errors, 
caching and DNSSEC event. Most of your DNS servers will have query logging disabled by default due to the sheer volume of DNS queries that come in to the typical DNS server. Authentication logs, information about login events, logging success or failure can come from a variety of sources depending on your identity and access model. Those sources might include the RADIA server for your VPN access, Active Directory domain controllers, and cloud providers like Azure Active Directory and Google's identity provider if you have a hybrid cloud environment. And log files related to voice applications even can be valuable in identifying anomalous activity, unauthorized users, and even potential attacks. I'm a bit in the weeds here, but your VoIP and call managers capture information on the calls being made and the devices they originate from, and they may capture call quality by logging some mean optical score and jitter data, and significant loss in quality may indicate attack. So typically from these call managers, we would want to be capturing these potential events and alerts indicative of attack. This may come from a syslog, but we'd want to capture some of that data. And each call often is logged inbound and outbound, the person making the call and receiving that, including long distance calls. That goes beyond what you typically collect in a SIM, but you have another level you could go to for some manual investigation. And your session initiation protocol information, this is used for internet-based calls and the log files generally show the 100 series event known as the invite, the initiation of a connection that relates to the ringing, the 200 event which is followed by an acknowledgement. A large number of calls not connecting may indicate attack. At the end of the day, VoIP phones are embedded systems. It's an embedded computer of sorts that must be secured, and the logs generated here can be significant. We might just be capturing this data via syslog, but it's another source of information, another source of context for a SIM solution. Okay, moving on to reporting. So a SIM typically includes dashboards and collects report data that can be viewed regularly to ensure that the policies have been enforced and the environment is compliant. And they can also highlight whether the SIM system is effective and working properly. Are incidents raised truly positives or are we seeing a lot of false positives in there? False positives may arise because the wrong input filters are being used or the wrong hosts are being monitored or some hosts are not being monitored that should be. And SIM solutions will typically have dashboards that include views into the status of log ingestion as well as potential security concerns identified through correlation and analysis of the logs the SIM has ingested. So this is a good opportunity to take another detour and a quick look at a real SIM solution. We're going to take a look at a cloud-based SIM just to give you some context into SIM functionality in case you're not familiar. So I'll just switch over to the Microsoft Azure portal here and I'm going to look at Microsoft Sentinel, which is Microsoft's cloud-based SIM. And I'm looking at the Sentinel portal here, just the central dashboard. And if I scroll down, I see functions here such as a view into incidents under threat management. I see a hunting interface where I can make raw queries against that normalized data. And in fact, this solution provides many canned queries that I can simply enable or pull in from a gallery. And if I scroll down a bit further, we see data connectors. This is what I wanted to talk to you about, and that is that log collection focus. So you'll notice here it mentions there are 127 connectors. They appear to be listed alphabetically. I can filter them by providers, for example, and you'll notice a wide variety of providers here. Now I'll just search on some keywords to show you some themes. Let's search on the word firewall. We see here Azure Firewall, Microsoft's native firewall, the Microsoft WAF, but also a variety of third-party solutions. I can also search for syslog, and just as you'd imagine, there's a syslog connector that allows me to ingest data from my central syslog solution. And you'll even notice here in the A's that we see Amazon Web Services, so I can ingest data from another CSP's platform. Uh, common web servers, there's Apache. Scrolling down here, Azure Active Directory, I can get into my identity provider. Some DDoS data from Azure DDoS, uh, logs from my Key Vault solution. 
And what you'll find with some of these connectors, depending on the solution you're working with, if it's collecting data from a service on the same CSP platform, the connector may just require a couple of clicks. So I'm going to look at the Azure Active Directory connector and I'll open that connector page and see what sort of configuration is required. And I notice here it's quite simple. I can tell it which Azure AD logs I would like to collect and it's going to begin collecting those for me. All I have to do is apply those changes. So that's just a quick look, but you see now that with a modern enterprise SIM solution, with a cloud SIM in particular, we're going to have some built-in connectivity to a wide variety of sources that make that wide ingestion of log data much less work for us. We're going to shift gears now and talk incident response, and the CCSP Common Body of Knowledge explores NIST SP800-61, the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. So that's the methodology I'd suggest you focus on for the exam. Now, first-party incidents are internal to the organization. These are incidents that begin inside our organization and we are principally responsible for handling. Third-party incidents affect an external entity like our CSP or a vendor in our supply chain. We certainly may have a role in incident response there, although it may be simply as an informed party. The first phase in the NIST model is preparation. This refers to the organization's preparation necessary to ensure they can respond to a security incident, including tools, processes, competencies, and readiness. So those details should be documented in a security incident response plan that is regularly reviewed and updated. Typically, plan review happens multiple times per year in a walkthrough, what we call a tabletop exercise, where we walk through the plan together in a sample scenario to make sure that the steps we need documented in our response are present and we are familiar with our role. Then we have detection and analysis, the activity to detect a security incident in a production environment and to analyze all events to confirm the authenticity of the security incident. In other words, do we really have a security incident on our hands? Next is containment, eradication, and recovery. So in containment, the required and appropriate actions taken to contain the security incident based on the analysis done in the previous phase, in detection and analysis. This limits the damage, the scope of the incident we're containing. Eradication is the process of eliminating the root cause of the security incident with a high degree of confidence. And during the incident, our focus is on protecting and restoring business critical processes. Recovery should happen after the adversary has been evicted from the environment and known vulnerabilities have been remediated. Recovery returns the environment to its normal, fully functional, original state prior to the incident. And a post-mortem analysis is often performed after the recovery of a security incident. And actions performed during the process are reviewed to determine if any changes need to be made in the preparation or detection and analysis phases. Basically, how can we improve our incident response process. And those lessons learned drive continuous improvement ensuring effective and efficient incident response. We're going to talk about vulnerability assessments now, but first I want to touch on our right to audit in the cloud. So when we're talking about vulnerability scanners, the use of scanners and pen testers may be limited by your CSP's terms of service. And you should understand the type and frequency of testing the CSP allows. Now the good news is CSPs typically have penetration testing and scanning rules of engagement. In fact, I'll just switch over to a browser here and I'll show you these. If you just go search for AWS pen testing rules of engagement, do the same for Azure and Google, you'll find pages like this. This is AWS's customer support policy for penetration testing. The Microsoft version, in fact, is listed as the pen testing rules of engagement. So this will let you know what is okay and not okay in terms of turning your vulnerability scanner on your CSP's platform. 
Our vulnerability management process includes routine vulnerability scans and periodic vulnerability assessments. We use a vulnerability scanner, a tool, that can detect known security vulnerabilities and weaknesses and absence of patches or weak passwords on the systems in our environment. And we can use that scanner to facilitate a vulnerability assessment to extend just beyond technical scans and include review and audit to detect vulnerabilities and to further assess their severity. So going a level deeper on vulnerability scans, a scan can assess possible security vulnerabilities in computers, networks, and equipment that can be exploited. And this scanning can sometimes require authentication for access. So a credentialed scan is typically a much more powerful version of the vulnerability scan because it has higher privilege than a non-credentialed scan. This can spot vulnerabilities that require privilege like non-expiring passwords. A non-credentialed scan has lower privileges than that credentialed alternative and it will identify vulnerabilities that an attacker would easily find. A non-credentialed scan is going to find missing patches, some protocol vulnerabilities, but the credentialed scan is going to allow you to go a level deeper. And we can perform non-intrusive scans, which are passive and merely report vulnerabilities. They don't cause damage to your system. We can perform intrusive scans that can cause damage as they try to exploit the vulnerability and should be used in a sandbox, not your live production system, of course. And then we have a configuration review. Now, configuration compliance scanners and desired state configuration in PowerShell, for example, ensure no deviations are made to the security configuration of a system. It allows us to catch shift and drift in our configuration, so to speak. But the combination of techniques can reveal which vulnerabilities are most easily exploitable in a live environment. So network scans. These are scans that look at computers and devices on the network and help identify weaknesses in their security. We have application scans. So before applications are released, coding experts perform regression testing that will check code for deficiencies, but we can also turn a scanner on those applications before they go live. Web application scans will crawl through a website as if they are a search engine looking for vulnerabilities can perform an automated check for site and application vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting and SQL injection. There are many sophisticated web application scanners out there due in part to mass adoption of cloud computing. You'll also want to know the difference between static application security testing and dynamic application security testing for the exam. We covered that in a previous domain. And Common Vulnerability Exposure and Common Vulnerability Scoring System. So CVE and CVSS. If you've spent any time in the security world, you've probably seen these acronyms. CVSS is the overall score assigned to a vulnerability. It indicates a severity and it's used by many vulnerability scanning tools. If you're using a vulnerability scanner, you're almost certainly going to see that CVSS scoring metric. And CVE is simply a list of all publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. Included is the CVDID, a description, dates, and comments. Both of these are used broadly in vulnerability scanners. The CVSS score is not reported in the CVE listing. You actually have to use the National Vulnerability Database to find CVSS scores. The CVE list feeds into the National Vulnerability Database. And the National Vulnerability Database is a database maintained by NIST that is synchronized with the MITRE CVE list. I do not expect the exam to go this deep on CVE and CVSS. I just thought it would be helpful for you to know and appreciate the relationship between the two. So a vulnerability scanner can identify and report various vulnerabilities before they're exploited. So examples here would be software flaws, missing patches, open ports, services that should not be running, weak passwords. This is going to help companies avoid known attacks like the SQL injection, your buffer overflows, denial of service, other types of common malicious attacks. And that credentialed vulnerability scan is really going to be the most effective because it gives us more information than any other variety of scan. 
and it's going a layer beyond what a typical attacker will have available to them in their initial passes in our environment. So a scan assesses the possibility of the exploit, and when we get that report, we'll see sometimes false positives, which is where the scan believes that there is a vulnerability, but when we physically check it, it's not there. A false negative, when there is a vulnerability, but the scanner doesn't detect it. The true positive, which is where the results of the system scan agree with the manual inspection we perform after the scan. But the fact that we have false positives and false negatives point to the reality that log reviews are very important. After the scan, it's important we look at the log files and reports that come from our scanner. And that's it for domain five. Moving on to our final domain and one of the most important areas of cloud knowledge, in my opinion, legal risk and compliance. And as always, we're going to begin with a look at the exam essentials, those topics the official study guide promises will factor on exam day. And domain six is some of the most important content, not only for this exam, but for your cybersecurity career. We'll touch on the different sources of law in the United States. We'll have a look at the difference between criminal and civil liability and what liability is exactly. The four elements of tort of negligence. Then we'll get into e-discovery issues. We'll talk chain of custody when it comes to digital evidence, knowing the purpose of e-discovery, the role of ISO 27050, and some guidance from the Cloud Security Alliance. Really frameworks that help guide our efforts in e-discovery. Describing the sensitive information types, as well as the major laws that govern security and privacy in the cloud. We're going to take a look at many different frameworks with heavy focus on digital forensics, incident response, and risk management. Common policies used in an organization's security program. We'll spend a fair bit of time on vendors, supply chain and external risk, and risk management strategies that an organization may adopt. And here we'll spend some time on what we call risk treatment, talking through responses to risk, like mitigation, avoidance, transference, acceptance. We'll start with 6.1, articulate legal requirements and unique risks within the cloud environment. Here we'll cover conflicting international legislation, evaluation of legal risks specific to cloud computing, legal frameworks and guidelines, e-discovery, and forensic requirements. Let's start with conflicting international legislation. So it's important to be aware of the various laws and regulations that govern cloud computing and remembering that our presence in the cloud is quite often global. Our customers and customer data may be stored in multiple countries and laws can introduce risks to a business, fines, penalties, even the loss of the ability to do business in a certain place. It's important to identify these risks and make recommendations to mitigate them just like any other risk. So there's a really easy example I can cite where two laws conflict in the cloud, or at least may conflict in the wrong situation. So for example, GDPR, an EU law that forbids the transfer of data to countries that lack adequate privacy concerns. I can promise you the EU is none too excited about sensitive information being transferred to the United States. However, the Clarifying Law Overseas Use of Data, or Cloud Act, requires CSPs like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google to hand over data to aid an investigation of serious crimes, even if that data is stored in another country. And for a customer, that raises a very serious question. Which law prevails when the two are in conflict? Well, things can get complicated here. And as with many aspects of security, legal compliance requires collaboration. Legal counsel should be part of the evaluation of any cloud-specific risks, legal requests, and the company's response to these, remembering that the consumer is responsible for navigating these challenges. The CSP will give you third-party audit documents, other assurance documents explaining how they will respond in particular situations, but ultimately legal responsibility falls to the consumer. And whether we say consumer or customer, we're talking about the organization who is the customer of the CSP. 
couple of high-level concepts related to encryption and privacy I want to mention. So computer export controls. U.S. companies can't export certain computer tech to what are deemed rogue nations. Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, and Syria. And the Department of Commerce also details some limitations on export of encryption products outside the U.S. I'm not sure either of those will come up on the exam. It is worth mentioning that the basis for privacy rights in the U.S. is the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution. And you'll likely see GDPR multiple times on the exam. It's not a U.S. law, but it's very likely to be mentioned because it is the gold standard when it comes to privacy protections for users. And it applies to any company with customers in the EU. So it doesn't matter the country in which the company is based. If they have customers in the EU, then they are subject to GDPR regulation if they want to do business in the EU. And we'll look at GDPR from a couple of different angles in this domain. So moving on, cloud practitioners do need to be aware of multiple sets of laws and regulations and the risks introduced in conflicting legislation across jurisdictions. So I gave you an example, but let's just talk through some of the scenarios where conflicts can come into play. Copyright and intellectual property law, particularly the jurisdictions that companies need to deal with local versus international to protect and enforce their IP. Not every country respects intellectual property rights as the United States does. There are safeguards and security controls required for privacy compliance, particularly details of data residency or the ability to move data between countries, as well as varying requirements of due care in different jurisdictions. You know, as we've talked about a couple of times already with GDPR, we have a pretty high bar of due care around data privacy in the EU. Data breaches in their aftermath, particularly breach notification. A bit later, we'll call out the laws that include a breach notification requirement. And finally, international import and export laws particularly technologies that may be sensitive or illegal to import or export under various international agreements. So when we are consuming services and running subscriptions in multiple countries, we need to be familiar with the guardrails that the laws of each country impose upon us. So for the exam, you'll want to know the difference between laws, regulations, standards, and frameworks. So we'll break the difference down here quickly. First, we have laws, which are the legal rules created by government entities like the U.S. Congress. And we have regulations, which are the rules created by governmental agencies. These will include rules for regulated industries like financial services and healthcare. Laws and regulations both have to be followed or they can result in civil or criminal penalties for the organization for failing to comply. Then we have standards which dictate a reasonable level of performance. For example, we'll talk a bit later about ISO 31000, which includes several standards around creating and operating a risk management program. They can be created by an organization for its own purposes, so internally, or they can come from an industry body or a trade group, an external group. PCI DSS, for example, which came from the four major credit card companies coming together to create a standard. And finally, frameworks, which are a set of guidelines helping organizations improve their security posture. We'll touch on frameworks for e-discovery, for risk management, from organizations like NIST, from the Cloud Security Alliance. But just commit these concepts to memory and you're going to see plenty of examples in this session. You'll also want to be familiar with types of law for the exam. So for example, criminal law contains prohibitions against acts such as murder, assault, robbery, and arson. Not our primary focus for the CCSP exam. Civil law examples would include contract disputes, real estate transactions, employment matters, estate and probate procedures. But contract disputes, when we're talking about agreements between an organization and a CSP, you can imagine civil law is something we may think about. Vendor contracts fall into this category. 
And then there's administrative law, policies and procedures and regulations that govern daily operations of government and government agencies. Regulations like HIPAA fall into this category. And a fourth type of law to be familiar with is constitutional law. The U.S. Constitution is the highest possible source of law in the United States, and no laws from any other source may conflict with the provisions in the Constitution. In fact, if Congress passes a law that is later found to be in conflict with the Constitution, the law is declared unconstitutional and can be struck down by the courts. So I quickly want to touch on the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution and point to what you want to remember for exam day. So Article 1 of the Constitution establishes the legislative branch of government. That includes our House of Representatives and the Senate. Article 2 establishes the executive branch, the office of the president. Article 3 establishes the judicial branch, that's our courts. Article 4 defines the relationship between the federal government and state governments. Article 5 creates a process for amending the Constitution itself. Amendments are not something that happen very often. We've had two amendments in the last 53 years. Article 6 contains the Supremacy Clause, establishing that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And Article 7 sets forth the process for initial establishment of the federal government. For exam day, remember this one. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. What I said in the very first sentence on this topic, which is that it's the highest possible source of law and no laws from other sources may conflict with the Constitution. Continuing with types of law, we have case law. Interpretations made by courts over time establish a body of law that other courts may refer to when making their own decisions. And in many cases, the case law decisions made by courts are binding on both that court and any subordinate courts. Those are lesser courts in the hierarchy of the judicial system. And we have common law, which is a set of judicial precedents passed down as case law through many generations and stand as examples cited in future court cases. Contract law, violations of a contract generally do not involve law enforcement agencies, so they're treated as a private dispute between parties and handled in civil court. A violation is known as a breach of contract, and courts may take action to enforce the terms of a contract if one of the party fails to honor the terms of the contract they agreed to and signed. Related to types of law, are types of legal liability. Liable means responsible or answerable in law, legally obligated. And that can mean legal obligation to do something or obligation to not do something. For purposes of our discussion, there are two types of legal liability you want to be familiar with. Criminal liability, which occurs when a person violates a criminal law and civil liability, which occurs when one person claims that another person has failed to carry out a legal duty that they were responsible for. Civil cases are brought to court by one party called the claimant, who is accusing another party of a violation called the respondent. The claimant may be an individual, a corporation, or the government, as may be the respondent. You're also expected to be familiar with legal risks specific to cloud computing. Legal, regulatory, and compliance risks in the cloud can be significant for certain types of data or industries. So there are differing legal requirements to consider. For example, state and provincial laws in the United States and Canada have different requirements for data breach notifications, such as the timeframes. Different legal systems and frameworks in different countries. In some countries, clear written legislation exists. In others, legal precedent is more important. Precedent refers to the judgment in past cases and is subject to change over time with less advance notice than updates to legislation. We talked about precedent when we were discussing common law and case law in the U.S. just a bit earlier. And conflicting laws. The European Union's GDPR and the U.S. Cloud Act directly conflict on the topic of data transfer, as we saw in the example we looked at earlier. But these unique legal risks specific to the cloud are a direct result of the global nature of the cloud. The fact that as a 
cloud consumer, we're very likely to have data and services residing in data centers in multiple countries around the world, subject to the unique legal regulatory and compliance restrictions of the jurisdiction where they reside. So a few things to bear in mind when it comes to the bottom line on legal risks specific to cloud computing. Responsibility for compliance with laws and regulations. Researching and planning response in case of conflicting laws. Ensuring necessary audit and incident response data is logged and retained and any additional due diligence and due care are all the responsibility of the cloud consumer, the customer. There are several legal frameworks and guidelines you should be familiar with for the exam that affect cloud computing environments. One of those is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, which is an international organization. It's comprised of 38 members, including the United States, but members from around the world, and it publishes guidelines on data privacy. Many of its principles are aligned with European privacy law, including consent, transparency, accuracy, security, and accountability. Then there's the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Privacy Framework, or APEC, which is comprised of 21 member economies in the Pacific Rim. APEC incorporates many standard privacy practices into their guidance, including preventing harm, notice, consent, security, and accountability, many of the same standards that we see represented in OECD and GDPR. But APEC promotes the smooth cross-border flow of information between APEC member nations. That is the scope of their focus. Then we have the European Union's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is perhaps the most far-reaching and comprehensive set of laws ever written to protect data privacy. It mandates privacy for individuals, it defines companies' duty to protect personal data, and it prescribes punishments for companies violating these laws. It includes mandatory notification timelines in the event of data breach. And for this exam, I expect you'll need awareness of standards, laws, and regulations that include mandatory notification timelines for data breach, I don't believe you'll be quizzed on any specific timeline limits. For example, in GDPR, that timeline is 72 hours. I don't believe the exam is going to get that deep on you. GDPR does formally define many data roles as well related to privacy and security like subject, controller, and processor. We will touch on those later in this session. You will want to be familiar, understand the difference, and understand who is liable in the event of data breach, who the owner is. Some additional legal frameworks and standards likely to get mentioned on the exam include Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, commonly referred to simply as HIPAA. It's a law that regulates privacy and control of health information data in the U.S. Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS, which is an industry standard for companies that accept, process, or receive payment card transactions. Next is Privacy Shield, which exists to solve the lack of a U.S. equivalent to GDPR, which impacts rights and obligations around data transfer. And Sarbanes-Oxley, commonly called SOX, is a law enacted in 2002, and it sets requirements for U.S. public companies to protect financial data when it's stored and used. So this exam does not expect you to be a legal expert, but you'll notice here when I'm calling out legal frameworks, standards, and guidelines, I'm giving you some identifying characteristics. You don't need to be an expert on HIPAA or PCI or SOX to pass this exam, but you do need to know what their content covers and where they apply. If you see a question about U.S. law and protected health information, HIPAA is quite likely going to be an answer. If you hear anything about protecting financial data in a publicly traded company, SOX is the first regulation I'd think of. You'll also need to know the difference between statutory, regulatory, and contractual requirements. Statutory requirements are required by law. For example, HIPAA, GDPR, and FERPA are three statutory requirements. Then we have regulatory requirements 
which may also be required by law, but refer to rules issued by a regulatory body that is appointed by a government entity. FISMA and FedRAMP are two good examples. And then we have contractual requirements, which are required by a legal contract between private parties. And these agreements often specify a set of security controls or a compliance framework that must be implemented by a vendor. For example, the contract may require that we leverage SOC or generally accepted privacy principles or CSA's cloud controls matrix. PCI DSS is a good example of a contractually enforced regulatory requirement. And there are some challenges and complexities that we need to consider in the cloud, especially when it comes to e-discovery and our supply chain. So an organization investigating an incident may lack the ability to compel the CSP to turn over vital information needed to investigate. This is where a good contract with your CSP is going to be important. The information may be housed in a country where jurisdictional issues make the data more difficult to access. Like the EU, where GDPR applies. Maintaining a chain of custody is more difficult because there are more entities involved in the process and their physical location more geographically dispersed on the whole. Three important considerations include vendor selection, architecture, and understanding your due care obligations going into the situation. As we're evaluating a CSP selection or a vendor selection, we need to think about the architecture that they're working with and our due care obligations because that will impact our ability in an e-discovery scenario to capture the data we need for response. Let's unpack those three a bit further, starting with vendor selection. So when considering a cloud vendor, e-discovery should be considered a security requirement during the selection and contract negotiation phases. We know we're going to be limited in our ability to compel a CSP to produce data during e-discovery unless it is mandated in writing in a contract. Architecture considerations. We know data residency and system architecture are important because our data is going to tend to be distributed in the cloud. We need to think about the impact to e-discovery proactively, such as when designing or deploying a system or a business process. So we're thinking about how data privacy regulations and e-discovery are going to impact us before they are impacting us. And do care considerations. Cloud security practitioners must inform their organization of any risks and require due care and due diligence related to cloud computing. As security practitioners, we need to ensure the organization is prepared for digital forensics and incident response. On the topic of e-discovery, it's important to remember that CSPs may not preserve essential data for the required period of time to support historical investigations. In fact, they may not even log all of the data relevant to support an investigation. This shifts the burden of recording and preserving potential evidence onto the consumer. That's a theme we're seeing as we move through here, right? So consumers must identify and implement their own data collection. There are e-discovery frameworks that include cloud-specific guidance that may help. So let's touch again on some of those complexities that we see in terms of digital forensics and e-discovery in the cloud, and then talk about some of those frameworks. So in the cloud, we know it's difficult or impossible to perform physical search and seizure of cloud resources like storage or hard drives. Organizations like ISO IEC and the Cloud Security Alliance provide guidance on best practices for collecting digital evidence and conducting forensics investigations in the cloud. Every security practitioner should be familiar with the following standards, even if they don't specialize in forensics. We touched on all the relevant standards in Domain 5. We're going to revisit them again here in this context. And I did want to call out NIST IR8006. So NIST IR8006, Cloud Computing Forensic Science Challenges. So NIST IR is an acronym that may not be familiar to you. It stands for NIST Interagency or Internal Reports. It addresses common issues and solutions needed to address digital forensics and incident response in cloud environments. So DFIR, just make sure you're familiar with that acronym for the exam. 
if I were to just quote the summary of NIST IR8006 from the abstract, it summarizes research performed by the members of the NIST Cloud Computing Forensic Science Working Group, and it aggregates, categorizes, and discusses the forensic challenges faced by experts when responding to incidents that have occurred in a cloud computing ecosystem. In short, it is guidance for DFIR in the cloud. And that's the only net new framework I wanted to call out here. So let's revisit domain five. We had ISO IEC 27050, which is a four part standard within the ISO 27000 family of information security standards. It offers a framework, governance, and best practices for forensics, e discovery, and evidence management. Hiring an outside forensic expert is something we should all recognize as potentially the best path for many organizations. If you don't have an expert on staff, an expert makes sense because there are legal implications in digital forensics, such as chain of custody, such as how we process the evidence, capturing the original, but working on a copy so we don't unintentionally modify the original. Many details in that process that can go wrong if you don't have the expertise. And then there's Cloud Security Alliance security guidance. There's free guidance in their domain three legal issues, contracts, and electronic discovery. It offers guidance on legal concerns related to security, privacy, and contractual obligations. It covers topics like data residency and liability of the data processor role. In fact, if we just call out all the forensic investigation standards that may come up on the exam, you see the ISO family here from 27037, 27041, 42, 43, 27050 that we just mentioned, and then the CSA guidance. So recapping the ISO family here, 27037 focuses on collecting, identifying, and preserving electronic evidence. 27041 is a guide for incident investigation. 27042 covers digital evidence analysis. And 27043 covers investigation principles and processes. Again, you don't have to be an expert on the details of these standards. You do need to know, in summary, the focus of each of these standards. So I'm trying to call out the summarization that will be relevant for you on exam day. That brings us to 6.2, understand privacy issues. Here we'll take a look at the difference between contractual and regulated private data, country-specific legislation related to private data, jurisdictional differences in data privacy, which gets interesting in the cloud where our data is generally hosted in multiple regions in different countries quite often, standard privacy requirements, so here we'll dig into GDPR a bit further, ISO 27018, as well as the generally accepted privacy principles. And we'll take a look at privacy impact assessments. Let's start with a look at types of private data at the highest level. First, we have personally identifiable information, or PII, which is any information that can identify an individual. Name, birth date and place, social security number, biometric data. This is defined by NIST Special Publication 800-122. Then we have Protected Health Information, or PHI, which is health-related information that can be related to a specific person. It must be protected by strong controls and access audited. It's regulated by HIPAA High Trust. HIPAA is the original healthcare privacy regulation and high trust came along later and specifically updated HIPAA regulations. And the third type of private data is payment data. So think credit card data, allowable storage of information related to credit card and debit card and transactions is defined and regulated by PCI DSS and it is contractual. It applies to those who are processing the transactions. And because it's contractual, when you decide to become a credit card processor, when you're processing transactions, the contract you sign 
includes your contractual agreement to be regulated by PCI DSS standards. To effectively secure this data, a security team must understand what types of data an organization is processing, where it is being processed, and any associated requirements like contractual obligations. And in any cloud computing environment, the legal responsibility for data privacy and protection rests with the cloud consumer. And the individual in the data controller role is always responsible for ensuring that the requirements for protection and compliance are met, even if that data is processed in a CSP's cloud service. The data controller cannot transfer responsibility, but risk can be mitigated. And you will find that components of a contract may include requirements and restrictions on how data is processed, security controls, the deletion of data, physical location, audit requirements, the use of subcontractors, and if subcontractors are allowed, it may restrict their physical location. And all of these considerations fall back to the data controller as responsible. Next, we have the Australian Privacy Act which allows that organizations may process data belonging to Australian citizens offshore. At the same time, it demands that the transferring entity, the data owner, must ensure that the receiver of the data holds and processes it in accordance with the principles of Australian privacy law. The data owner, the controller, again, is responsible for data privacy. Compliance is often achieved contractually through contracts that require recipients to maintain or exceed the data owner's privacy standards. However, the entity transferring the data out of Australia remains responsible for any data breaches by or on behalf of the recipient entities. So even if the data owner and their organization have a contract with an entity processing that data, they are responsible for that entity's compliance with these standards. So again, the data owner, the controller, can mitigate the risk, but they cannot transfer the responsibility. And Canada also has a privacy law when it comes to private data. That's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. It's a national level law that restricts how commercial businesses may collect, use, and disclose personal information. And it covers information about an individual that is identifiable to that specific individual. DNA, age, medical data, education, employment information, any identifying numbers, information about their religion, race or ethnic origin, financial information. It's quite thorough in its coverage of what falls under personally identifiable information. And it includes a data breach notification requirement as well. And it's worth noting that the PEPIDA standard may also be superseded by province-specific laws that are deemed substantially similar to the national law. Next, we have GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. This is the law of data privacy in the European Union, and it includes the following on data subject privacy rights. The data subject is the individual about whom data is being collected. It includes the right to be informed, the right of access, the right to rectification, the right to erasure, the right to restrict processing, the right to data portability, the right to object, and rights in relation to automated decision-making and profiling. So in short, this all adds up to a lot of control for the individual to understand what information is being collected, how it is being processed, to ask for a copy of that data, to ask an entity processing that data to stop and to erase their data, the right to correct any inaccuracies. It's really considered the gold standard when it comes to data privacy law. And other private data types in GDPR, race or ethnic origin, political affiliations or opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, and sexual orientation. To summarize GDPR, it deals with the handling of data while maintaining privacy and rights of an individual. It's international because it was created by the European Union, which has 27 different countries as its members. And GDPR applies to any company with customers in the EU without regard of where that company is located. So if you're a U.S.-based company with customers in the EU, GDPR compliance applies to you. And GDPR includes a 72-hour notification deadline in the case of data breach.
Now we'll shift focus to some U.S.-based laws, beginning with the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999, which focuses on services of banks, lenders, and insurance. GLBA severely limits the services they can provide and the information these entities can share with each other. This act consists of three main sections. The Financial Privacy Rule, which regulates the collection and disclosure of private financial information. The Safeguards Rule, which stipulates that financial institutions must implement security programs to protect such information. And the Pretexting Provisions, which prohibit the practice of pretexting, which is accessing private information using false pretenses. In other words, when these entities are accessing your private information, they must state a true and accurate reason for that access. Next, we have Privacy Shield, an international agreement between the U.S. and the European Union, which allows the transfer of personal data from the European economic area to the U.S. by U.S.-based companies, but is not an indicator of GDPR compliance. So organizations under Privacy Shield commit to seven principles of the agreement. Notice, choice, security, access, accountability for onward transfer, data integrity and purpose limitation, and finally, recourse enforcement and liability. So all things said, Privacy Shield extends transparency and control to the data subject, similar to what we see in GDPR. Next, we have the Stored Communications Act of 1986, an early effort in data privacy in the electronic realm. It created privacy protection for electronic communications like email or other digital communications stored on the internet. It effectively extends the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution to the electronic realm. So the Fourth Amendment is where individual privacy has its roots. The Fourth Amendment details the people's right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. This act outlines that private data is protected from unauthorized access or interception by private parties or the government. Next, we have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, commonly known as HIPAA, which implements privacy and security regulations requiring strict security measures for hospitals, physicians, and insurance companies. HIPAA-covered entities are those organizations that collect or generate protected health information, PHI. Under HIPAA, there are separate rules for privacy, security, and breach notification, and flow of these rules down to third parties. And flow of these rules down to third parties is important because that tells us that when data is transferred, it does not relieve the data controller of responsibility. Under HIPAA, PHI may be stored by cloud service providers, provided that the data is adequately protected. And finally, we have the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data, or Cloud Act, which aids in evidence collection in investigations of serious crimes. It was created in 2018 due to the problems the FBI faced in forcing Microsoft to hand over data stored in Ireland in the prosecution of a crime in the United States. The Cloud Act essentially requires U.S.-based companies to respond to legal requests for data no matter where the data is physically located. So it's not hard to imagine how the Cloud Act could certainly come into conflict with the EU's GDPR. Which country or countries have jurisdiction, which determines which laws apply in data security, may depend on the location of the data subject, which is the individual about whom data is being collected the data collector, the cloud service provider, subcontractors processing that data, or even the headquarters of the entities involved. And this raises some legal concerns. These can impact the utilization of a particular cloud service provider, add costs and time to market, and drive changes to technical architectures required to deliver the services. In other words, which laws are going to apply in a given situation may substantially impact how we deliver a service and from where, and may significantly impact the cost and level of effort based on changes we make to technical architectures and legal red tape. 
We never replace compliance with convenience when evaluating services as this increases risks. So even if it proves inconvenient or expensive, we can never skimp on compliance because many privacy laws impose fines or other action for non-compliance that will far outpace the money we save. So let's shift gears and have a look at a couple of those data privacy standards called out in the syllabus, starting with ISO IEC 27018 which was published in July 2014 as a component of the ISO 27001 standard. Adherence to the privacy principles in the 27000 family enables customer trust in a CSP. Major CSPs like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon all maintain ISO 27000 compliance. It can provide a high level of assurance. So digging into some of the principles in 27018, consent. Personal data obtained by a CSP may not be used for marketing purposes unless expressly permitted by the subject. A customer should be permitted to use a service without requiring this consent. Control. Customers shall have explicit control of their own data and how that data is used by the CSP. Transparency. CSPs must inform customers of where their data resides and any subcontractors that may process their personal data. Communication. Auditing should be in place and any incidents should be communicated to customers. And audit. Companies, the CSP in this case, must subject themselves to an independent audit on an annual basis. And that's a key phrase there, independent audit. That Annual audit from an independent and trustworthy source takes us to a high level of assurance with the ISO IEC 27018 standard. Next, let's talk generally accepted privacy principles. GAP is a framework of privacy principles created by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. GAP are widely incorporated into the SOC 2 framework as an optional criterion. And organizations that pursue a SOC 2 audit can include these privacy controls if it's appropriate. Whether or not it makes sense will generally depend on the type of service they're providing. The principles we see in the generally accepted privacy principles are similar to ISO 27018, which is an optional extension of the controls defined in ISO 27002. And an audit of these controls results in a report that can be shared with customers or potential customers who can use it to assess a service provider's ability to protect sensitive data. And you'll remember from previous domains where we went to the CSP portals and we pulled down a SOC 2 Type 2 audit. It can increase assurance. Now I want to cover with you the categories of the 10 main privacy principles covered in the generally accepted privacy principles, not because you need to memorize these for the exam, but understanding these principles will make tackling data privacy questions on the exam easier, and it's going to make you better at your job going forward. So let's get into it here. We'll start with management. The organization defines documents, communicates, and assigns accountability for its privacy policies and procedures. And remember, responsibility goes back to the data controller, to the owner. Notice, the organization provides notice of its privacy policies and procedures. The organization identifies the purpose for which personal information is collected, used, and retained. Choice and consent. The organization describes the choices available to the individual and secures implicit or explicit consent regarding the collection, use, and disclosure of the personal data. Collection. Personal information is collected only for the purposes identified in the notice provided to the individual. And use, retention, and disposal. The personal information is limited to the purposes identified in the notice the individual consented to, which is the why the org can retain and when they must dispose of that data. But you should notice some themes in here when we're looking at these standards and the laws around data privacy. GDPR may be the gold standard, but you'll notice some themes in terms of the privacy principles that frameworks like the generally accepted privacy principles put out here. So these are the first five. And moving on, we have access. The organization provides individuals with access to their personal information for review or update. 
Disclosure to third parties. Personal information is disclosed to third parties only for the identified purposes with implicit or explicit consent of the individual. Security for privacy. Personal information is protected against both physical and logical unauthorized access. Quality. The organization maintains accurate, complete, and relevant personal information that is necessary for the purposes identified. And monitoring and enforcement. The organization monitors compliance with its privacy policies and procedures, and it also has procedures in place to address privacy-related complaints and disputes. We see a lot of themes here very similar to the rights outlined for data subjects in GDPR, which is a good thing. So 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 right here. And again, you don't need to memorize these as GAP privacy principles, but understanding these concepts as they broadly apply across many laws, frameworks, and standards, it's going to make the exam easier and it's going to make you more effective in your job going forward. To polish off section 6.2, we have the Privacy Impact Assessment. So what is a PIA? It is designed to identify privacy data being collected, processed, or stored by a system and to assess the effects of a data breach. So when is a PIA necessary? Well, several privacy laws explicitly require PIAs as a planning tool for identifying and implementing required privacy controls. That would include GDPR and HIPAA. Conducting a PIA typically begins when a system or process is being evaluated, so before implementation. However, evolving privacy regulation often necessitates assessment of existing systems. To conduct an effective PIA, you have to define the assessment scope, the data collection methods, and plan for data retention. And in fact, the International Association of Privacy Professionals has published guides and resources related to privacy efforts, including conduction of a privacy impact assessment. And that brings us to section 6.3, understand audit process, methodologies, and required adaptations for a cloud environment. There's quite a lot of ground to cover in section 6.3. We'll talk about internal and external audit controls, the impact of audit requirements, identifying assurance challenges of virtualization and cloud, types of audit reports, restrictions of audit scope statements, gap analysis, audit planning, internal information security management system, or ISMS, internal information security control system, policies, the identification and involvement of relevant stakeholders, specialized compliance requirements for highly regulated industries, and finally, the impact of distributed information technology models, really speaking to the geographically diverse nature of the cloud. We'll start with a look at a few core auditing concepts, beginning with the question, what is auditing? So auditing is the methodical examination of an environment to ensure compliance with regulations, detect abnormalities, unauthorized occurrences, or outright crimes. The process of auditing is a detective control. Frequency is based on risk, and the degree of that risk also affects how often an audit is performed. So when we think about external independent audits, often annual is the frequency. But internal audits should be happening much more often on the whole. So IT relies on audits to identify issues before we expose our environment to external auditors. And audits are an element of due care. Security audits and effectiveness reviews are key elements in displaying due care because without them, senior management would likely be held accountable and liable for any asset losses that occur. And that due care obligation is very important. We have to demonstrate that we're acting with common sense, prudent management, and taking responsible action to address risk. And some of those due care obligations that come with regulation roll up to your executives in terms of responsibility just as the data controller is responsible for any data breach and ensuring that due care is taken to secure data, ultimate responsibility for compliance of an organization rolls up to its leadership. And security and audit reviews 
serve important internal functions. They help ensure that management programs are effective and being followed. And they're commonly associated with account management practices to prevent violations with least privilege or need to know principles. Can also be performed to oversee many programs and processes, so a layer of governance. Patch management, vulnerability management, change management, configuration management. All important processes that impact security and all processes that can be audited or reviewed on a periodic basis to ensure they are still relevant and effective in our environment. And just a side note from the real world about controlling access to audit reports, because audit reports often contain sensitive information, and they often include the purpose and scope of the audit, and the results that were discovered or revealed, and we may not want that to be widespread knowledge throughout the organization. They can include sensitive information like problems, standards, causes, and recommendations. Details about security deficiencies that have been discovered, for example. So only people with sufficient privilege and need should have access. For example, senior security administrators would see the full detail of an audit, particularly if they are responsible for closing the gaps. Your senior management would get a high-level summary. Senior management would want to know if deviations or deficiencies had been discovered and that there was a game plan to close those gaps. So the internal auditor acts as a trusted advisor to the organization on risk, educating stakeholders, assessing compliance. Compliance may mean company policies or regulatory compliance. The definition is going to vary based on the company and the environment. And an internal audit can provide more continuous monitoring of control effectiveness and policy compliance, more so than an annual audit. And it enables the organization to catch and fix any issues before they show up on a formal audit report. Internal audits can also mitigate risk by examining cloud architectures to provide insights into an organization's cloud governance, data classification strategy, identity and access management effectiveness, regulatory compliance, privacy compliance, cyber threats. What's the security posture? An internal auditor is an independent entity, though, who can provide facts without fear of reprisal. And some legal and regulatory frameworks require the use of an independent auditor. Others demand a third-party auditor. But that's an important implementation detail, that even an internal auditor should be independent. Which in this case means essentially free to speak their mind. The requirement to conduct audits can have a large procedural and financial impact on a company as well. So in regulated industries, for example, we see numerous auditing requirements like banks, critical infrastructure providers, and healthcare. So more auditors and more specialized audit requirements are going to increase that cost. With multinational companies, audit complexity may be higher due to conflicting requirements, conflicting laws, for example. And in large environments, we'll see representative samples used to assess compliance on a manageable scale. So a random sample rather than an explicit check of every one of a hundred servers, we'll see a representative sample of 20 of those servers pulled, for example, to ensure that configuration is consistent across the sample. Multi-region data dispersion in the cloud and dynamic VM failure in hypervisors can definitely also complicate the audit process for the simple reason that it can be difficult to locate exactly where that virtual infrastructure was hosted. So getting to the audit trail itself can be a challenge. And with that being said, you may see questions around assurance challenges with virtualization and cloud on the exam, because the cloud is made possible by virtualization technologies that enable dynamic environments needed for a global provider platform. And it's that dynamic nature that can make audit very challenging. Because depending on the cloud architecture employed, a cloud security professional may need to go through multiple layers of auditing. And to be effective, the auditor must understand the virtualization architecture of the cloud provider. In fact, it will be absolutely necessary in tracing the true sequence of events and finding that true audit trail. So the provider, the CSP, really owns the audits of controls over the hypervisor. So Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they're basically in control of the logging and monitoring of the physical virtualization infrastructure. And the customer 
has VMs deployed on top of that hardware, and those are usually owned, managed, and audited by the customer, the cloud consumer. So let's switch gears and talk through a few types of audit reports, some audit standards. And we'll start with the statements on standards for attestation engagements. The SSAE 18 is a set of standards defined by the American Institute of CPAs. It's designed to enhance the quality and usefulness of system and organization control, or SOC, reports. It includes audit standards and suggested report formats to guide and assist auditors. And you want to be familiar with the SSAE report types. So there's the SOC 1, which deals mainly with financial controls, and these are used primarily by CPAs auditing financial statements. Where you want to focus is on the SOC 2. So there's the SOC 2 Type 1, which is a report that assesses the design of security processes at a specific point in time. There's the SOC 2 Type 2, often written as Type 2 with Roman numerals, assesses how effective those controls are over time by observing operations for at least six months. It often requires an NDA in order to see that report due to sensitive contents. In fact, you'll see that with your major CSPs. As a customer, you'll have access to a SOC 2 Type 2 report since you can't perform a direct audit, but you will typically have to agree to an NDA before that report is served up to you in the cloud portal. Then there's the SOC 3 report, which contains only the auditor's general opinions and generally non-sensitive data and is shareable publicly. So the SSAE is US-based, of course, but SOC 2 has become something of a de facto global standard when it comes to audit, especially in the technical realm and in the cloud. SOC 2 Type 2 gives us that high assurance we're looking for as a cloud consumer. And next we have the International Standard on Assurance Engagements, the ISAE. This is the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, which issues the ISAE report. And this board and its standards are similar to what we see in the SSAE. The ISAE 3402 standard is roughly equivalent to the SOC 2 reports, just used less frequently. And then we have the Cloud Security Alliance, which has the Security Trust Assurance and Risk Certification Program, or STAR program it's called. And this can be used by cloud service providers, cloud customers, auditors, consultants. It's designed to demonstrate compliance to a desired level of assurance. And STAR consists of two levels of certification, which provides increasing levels of assurance. So breaking that down just a bit further, Level 1 is self-assessment, a complementary offering that documents the security controls provided by the CSP. Level 2 would be a third-party audit, which requires the CSP to engage an independent external auditor to evaluate the CSP's controls against the CSA standard. So, of course, that Level 2 external audit is going to be stronger as it's conducted by an external, definitely independent, trained, qualified auditor. And audit scope statements provide the reader with details on what was actually included in the audit and what was not. An audit scope statement generally includes a statement of purpose and objectives, the scope of the audit and explicit exclusions, the type of audit, security assessment requirements, assessment criteria and the rating scale that's going to be used in the report, the criteria for acceptance, expected deliverables, so what are the outputs of the audit, and classification, which is going to determine who gets access, how restrictive we are of visibility of the outcome of this audit. And setting parameters for an audit is known as audit scope restrictions. So who determines audit scope? Well, audit scope is usually a joint activity performed by the organization being audited and their auditor. And that's not to say that that auditor won't have their limits, especially in a third-party audit. So why limit the scope of an audit? Well, audits are expensive endeavors that can engage highly trained and highly paid content experts. Auditing of systems can affect system performance and in some cases require the downtime of production systems. And a new system not yet in production without all the planned controls in place is not ready to audit anyway. 
And in other cases, the cost of implementing controls and auditing some systems is too high relative to the revenue the service generates. Now, a gap analysis identifies where an organization does not currently meet requirements, and it provides important information to help the IT organization remediate gaps, particularly before a third-party audit. The main purpose is to compare the organization's current practices against a specified framework and to identify gaps between the two. And it may be performed by either internal or external parties. And that is to say some organizations, especially in regulated industries, will hire an external auditor to come assess their readiness before the third-party independent auditor comes in to perform the actual audit. The choice of which is usually driven by cost and the need for objectivity. So know when a gap analysis is useful on exam day. You know, as a precursor to a formal audit process so the organization can close gaps before that third-party external audit. Or when assessing the impact of changes to regulatory and compliance frameworks which introduce new or modified requirements. So ISO 27002 and the NIST cybersecurity frameworks are two frameworks commonly used for gap analysis. So let's have a look at audit planning and audit phases. So the audit process can generally be broken down into four phases, starting with audit planning. Audit planning includes documenting and defining the audit program objectives, and this is collaborative internal planning of audit scope and objectives. This will involve the security organization, key business stakeholders, potentially legal in regulatory situations. Gap analysis or readiness assessment, basically assessing the organization's ability to undergo that full audit. Defining audit objectives and deliverables, that's going to be important to identify the expected outputs from the audit. And finally, identifying auditors and qualifications. Compliance and audit frameworks usually specify the type of auditor you need. Then there are phases to the audit itself. And in fact, there are three major phases of an audit, which include the audit field work, which involves the actual work the auditors perform to gather, test, and evaluate the organization. Audit reporting, and that report writing begins as the auditors conduct their field work, capturing their notes and any findings they're going to put into their final report. And the audit follow-up, the uh, activities that may be conducted after the audit, including addressing any identified weaknesses that come in that audit report. You'll want to be familiar with Information Security Management System, ISMS for the exam, which is a systematic approach to information security. It focuses on processes, technology, and people, and it's designed to help protect and manage an organization's information. ISO 27001 addresses need and approaches to implementing ISMS. ISMS functions include quantifying risk, developing and executing risk mitigation strategies, and providing formal reporting on status of mitigation efforts. And there are several benefits to ISMS as well including improving data security, increased organizational resilience to cyber attacks, central information security management, and formal risk management. And then we have internal information security control systems. It sounds quite a lot like information security management systems, but you don't want to get these two mixed up. So an information security control system provides guidance for mitigating the risks identified as part of the ISMS risk management processes. And there are several frameworks to choose from for your information security control system. The scoping controls refer to reviewing controls in the framework to identify which controls apply to the organization and which do not. Tailoring is a process of matching applicable controls with the organization's specific circumstances to which they apply. And organizations implementing ISO 27001 ISMS will find that the ISO 27002 controls are very easy to use because they're actually designed to work together. They fit together. Other control frameworks include NIST SP800-53, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, the Secure Controls Framework, and the Cloud Security Alliance Cloud Controls Matrix, or CCM. You'll want to be familiar with the function of policies and a couple of specific policy types 
for the exam, particularly organizational versus functional policies. So policies are a key part of any data security strategy, and they facilitate a number of capabilities for an organization. For one, they provide users and organizations with a way to understand and enforce requirements in a systematic and consistent way. They make employees and management aware of their roles and responsibilities. They standardize secure practices throughout the organization. You want to know the difference between organizational and functional policies and how they should be applied to the cloud. So let's dive into those just a bit further, starting with organizational policies. So companies use policies to outline rules and guidelines, usually complemented by documentation, such as procedures and job aids. Organizations will typically define policies related to proper use of company resources like expense reimbursements and travel. Policies are a proactive risk mitigation tool designed to reduce the likelihood of risks like financial losses, data loss or leakage, reputational damage, statutory and regulatory compliance issues, abuse or misuse of computing systems and resources. And to that effect, employees should generally sign policies to acknowledge acceptance. And we can juxtapose the organizational policy to a functional policy. So what is a functional policy? Well, it's a set of standardized definitions for employees that describe how they make use of systems or data. They typically guide specific activities crucial to the organization, like appropriate handling of data, vulnerability management, and other security activities, for example. Functional policies typically codify requirements identified in the ISMS, and they align to your chosen control framework. So a few examples of functional policies, not an exhaustive list, but to give you an idea for the exam. Acceptable use, what is and is not acceptable to do on company hardware and networks. Email use, what is and is not acceptable to do on email accounts. Password and access management. Notes on password complexity, expiration, reuse, requirements for MFA, and requirements for access management tools like a password manager. Incident response. Details on how incidents are handled and requirements for defining an incident response plan. Data classification, which would identify types of data and how each should be handled. Network services, how issues like remote access and network security are handled. Vulnerability scanning, the routines and limitations on internal scanning and penetration testing. And patch management, how equipment is patched and on what schedule. So as you can see, a lot of very function-specific policies. Policies are even more important when we move to the cloud, in part due to ease of use. The ease of deploying cloud resources without governance results in what we call shadow IT, basically resources deployed without IT approval and sometimes without IT knowledge. This can create security risks, like data loss or leakage through unauthorized use of cloud storage services. And cloud storage, to my recollection, is really where we saw shadow IT first crop up with the widespread use of Dropbox and Box and OneDrive when our non-IT users discovered that it was an easy way to collaborate with people in the organization and even at other organizations. It also creates financial risks such as spending being more difficult to measure and control. And these financial risks are real. I remember one organization where the CIO was told he was out of budget and he said, no, here's my budget. We're well within range. But when the expense reports came in, it turned out that the development organization was using a massive amount of public cloud on their own expense accounts in order to get their work done more quickly. And that's true of shadow IT. It's generally not a malicious activity. It's simply well-meaning users trying to be more effective in getting their job done and potentially working around the delays of IT. So cloud services should be included in organization policies and requirements for use clearly documented. In fact, you want to sanction or approve which services can be used for which functions. Which public cloud are you going to use for IaaS, for example, what will be your cloud storage vendors? What are you going to use for a password vault? But policies should define requirements users must adhere to and specify which services are approved for those various uses. 
And in fact, a cloud access security broker can help identify and stop shadow IT. We'll use a CASB to monitor our users' use of our data and their use of apps to identify unsanctioned or unapproved apps and potential oversharing of data, just as a couple of examples. In fact, a CASB is frequently a good way to identify insider threats, identify mass deletion or mass download of documents, of sensitive data. We see identification and involvement of relevant stakeholders called out explicitly in the syllabus. And one key challenge of the audit process is the inclusion of any relevant stakeholders. So who are relevant stakeholders exactly? Well, organizations management who will likely be paying for the audit, security practitioners responsible for facilitating the audit, employees who will be called on to provide evidence to auditors in the form of documentation, artifacts, or even sitting for interviews, and we'll see oftentimes that cloud computing environments can include more stakeholders than on-premises or even multiple CSPs, simply more parties involved in service delivery and infrastructure management. You may see some questions around requirements for highly regulated industries, and many CSPs have compliance-focused cloud service offerings which meet the requirements of specific regulatory or legal frameworks. In fact, it is a big selling point that those big CSPs will leverage. For example, NERC requirements, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation Critical Infrastructure Protection, regulates organizations involved in power generation and distribution. So you can imagine requirements are very stringent where human safety is involved. On that note, HIPAA High Tech both deal with PHI and implement specific requirements for security and privacy protections, as well as breach notification requirements. And HIPAA high tech don't specifically address cloud computing. High tech came along later and updated HIPAA, but it's very much a regulation that your major CSPs will address in providing their certifications to prospective customers. Then we have PCI DSS, which specifies protections for payment card transaction data. Also, no specific mention of cloud here. Although we can certainly expect that will change over time as these laws and standards are revised. CSPs generally make the controls available, but remember responsibility for compliance to any relevant regulations ultimately rests with the cloud consumer. The syllabus explicitly calls out the impact of the distributed IT model. Because cloud computing enables distributed IT service delivery with systems that can automatically replicate data globally. So just one impact of the distributed model is the additional geographic locations auditors must consider when they're performing an audit. And we've talked about some of the potential legal conflicts this can generate. A common technique in cloud audits is sampling, which is the act of picking a subset of the system's physical infrastructure to inspect. In fact, we looked at an example of this a bit earlier in this session. CSPs have found ways to collect evidence that provide auditors with sufficient assurance that they've collected a representative sample. For example, we talked about sampling 20 servers of 100 servers across many regions to save time and expense while maintaining accuracy of the audit process. And that does it for 6.3, so we're on to 6.4, Understand Implications of Cloud to enterprise risk management. Topics called out in the syllabus for 6.4 include assess providers' risk management programs. In particular, we we'll talk about risk profiles and appetite, the difference between the data owner or controller role versus data custodian or processor, regulatory transparency requirements in regulatory standards. We'll talk about breach notification and some of the requirements we see in regulations like SOX or GDPR. Risk treatment, responses to risk, in other words. Different risk frameworks we can use. Metrics for risk management and assessment of the risk environment. So assessing providers' risk management programs and reviewing provider controls can be particularly challenging in the cloud. So prior to establishing a relationship with a cloud provider with a CSP, a customer needs to analyze the risks associated with adopting that provider services. And rather than performing a direct audit, the customer generally has to rely on their supply chain risk management processes. 
and the third party audit reports that a CSP will provide. So the primary areas of focus of a supply chain risk management process include determining whether a supplier has a risk management program in place, and if so, whether the risks identified by that program are being adequately mitigated. But again, unlike traditional risk management activities we'd see on-premises, a CRM and a CSP scenario often requires customers to take that indirect approach by reviewing audit reports. And again, we've seen this in previous domains. Major CSPs all make available the SOC 2, ISO 27001, FedRAMP, or CSA star audit reports in lieu of a direct audit, providing that high level of assurance without the need for the cloud consumer, the organization, to audit the CSP directly. So in reviewing an audit report from a CSP, there are several key elements of the report you want to focus on, such as the scoping information or the description of the audit target. This is going to tell us how comprehensive the audit was in the report we're reading. Some compliance frameworks allow audits to be very narrowly scoped, like a SOC 2. But if the CSP's SOC 2 audit did not cover a specific service that a customer wants to adopt, then the audit finding doesn't provide any real value. That report may be assessing risk, but it's not that particular customer's risk if it doesn't have that specific service in scope. And this may drive changes like enhanced customer-side controls, tracking the CSP's mitigation and resolution efforts, or migrating to another CSP altogether. And there are some resources out there that can help organizations build or enhance their supply chain risk management program you'll want to be familiar with. NIST has a resource library that includes working groups, publications, and a number of other resources. You can get that URL from the PDF that comes with this course. And then we have ISO 27000, which is a security management system for security and resilience with particular focus on supply chain management. Now, the risk profile describes the risk present in the organization based on all the identified risks and any associated mitigations in place. And the risk appetite describes the amount of risk an organization is willing to accept without mitigating. And what an organization is willing to accept without mitigating really depends on the type of business they're in and, and the degree of risk we're dealing with. Regulated industries will be more apt to mitigation, transference, and avoidance of risk altogether. Smaller organizations and startups will be more apt to simply accept risks to avoid cost of treatment. You can imagine that an early stage startup without a lot of cash is going to opt for spending less where they can. So GDPR data roles and responsibilities. We saw specifically in the syllabus the call to knowing the difference between the processor and custodian roles. So the data processor is anyone who processes personal data on behalf of the data controller. So the data processor is also the data custodian in other standards. GDPR calls that role the data processor. And the processor is responsible for the safe and private custody, transport, and storage of the data. The data controller is the person or entity that controls processing of the data, the owner. So what GDPR calls the data controller role would be the data owner in certain other frameworks. They own the data and the risks associated with any data breaches. When data controllers use processors, they must ensure that the security requirements follow the data. And to be crystal clear, while the data processor is acting on behalf of the controller, the data controller ultimately owns responsibility. GDPR also defines the data protection officer who ensures the organization complies with data regulations. Under GDPR, the DPO is a mandatory appointment. And the data subject, again, is the individual or entity that is the subject of the personal data, the person about whom data has been collected. And because they're called out in the syllabus, you'll want to be sure you're able to identify each of these data roles. So the data owner usually a member of senior management, can delegate some day-to-day -day duties, cannot delegate total responsibility. The data custodian, usually someone in the IT department, does implement controls for the data owner, 
does not decide what controls are needed. In fact, on the exam, if the question mentions data day, it's likely data custodian is your answer. And remember for GDPR, the data owner is the data controller and the custodian is the data processor. Transparency requirements are called out in the syllabus as well, which speaks to breach notification. So a cloud security professional should definitely be aware of the transparency requirements imposed on data controllers by various regulations and laws around the world. Most recent privacy laws include a mandatory breach notification, and there are some variations amongst the laws how long an organization has to respond. In fact, mainly around issues of timing of the notification and who must be notified will vary across standards. But regulations that require breach notifications include GDPR, HIPAA, GLBA, and the Canadian PEPITA regulation. In fact, incident response plans and procedures should include relevant information about the time period for reporting as well as the required contacts in the event of a data breach. Essentially, who should be notified and how quickly. Sarbanes-Oxley. So if a company is publicly traded in the United States, they're going to be subject to transparency requirements called out in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So under SOX, specifically as data owners, these companies have to consider the following. Section 802, it's a crime to destroy, change, or hide documents to prevent their use in official legal processes. Section 804, companies must keep audit-related records for a minimum of five years. SOX compliance is often an issue with both data breaches and ransomware incidents at publicly traded companies. The loss of data related to compliance due to external actors does not protect a company from their legal obligations. That's kind of a, the dog ate my homework defense that doesn't protect the organization. Likewise, GDPR has some explicit transparency requirements. For companies doing business in the European Union or with citizens of the EU, transparency requirements under GDPR are laid out in Article 12. There's a link in the PDF with the course if you'd like to take a look. But GDPR states that a data controller must be able to demonstrate that personal data are processed in a manner transparent to the data subject. The obligations for transparency begin at the data collection stage and apply throughout the life cycle of processing. In fact, it stipulates that communication to data subjects must be concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible, and the use of clear and plain language, which means an organization cannot hide behind confusing jargon to take power away from the data subject or to fool them in any way. Meeting the requirements for transparency also requires processes for providing data subjects with access to their data. In GDPR, the subject has the right to ask an organization to correct the data if it's incorrect, and they can also ask to be forgotten, basically remove my data. Risk treatment is also called out in the syllabus. The practice of modifying risks, generally lowering risk. It typically begins with identifying and assessing risks by measuring the likelihood and the impact. Risks most likely to occur and most impactful would be prioritized for treatment. In a nutshell, risk treatment is the organization's response to risk. And you'll want to be familiar with these potential responses for the exam. We have risk avoidance where the organization changes business practices to completely eliminate the potential that a risk will materialize, a particular risk. This can negatively impact business opportunities because the organization may avoid certain business opportunities entirely to avoid the risk associated with them. There's risk mitigation, which is the process of applying security controls to reduce the probability and or the magnitude of a risk. There's risk transference, which shifts some of the impact of the risk from the organization experiencing the risk to another entity, for example, cyber insurance. And then there's risk acceptance, deliberately choosing to take no other risk management strategy and to simply continue operations as normal in the face of a risk. 
common when the cost of mitigation is greater than the cost of the impact of the risk itself. The mitigation would not be cost effective, so it is therefore unnecessary. You want to know these concepts and be ready to recognize examples on the exam. Also called out in the syllabus is risk appetite, sometimes called risk tolerance. It's the amount of risk a company is willing to accept. Now, these terms risk appetite and risk tolerance are sometimes used interchangeably. There are definitely experts out there that can articulate a subtle difference. For purposes of this exam, risk appetite and risk tolerance are the same. Regulations that affect risk posture. So regulations addressing data privacy and security that influence an organization's risk posture would include GDPR, SOX, HIPAA, and PCI DSS, just to name a few, and all called out in the exam syllabus in multiple places. So I mentioned security controls are used in risk mitigation. They are risk treatments for countering and minimizing loss or unavailability of services or apps due to vulnerabilities. Now the terms safeguards and countermeasures often seem to be used interchangeably. Technically, safeguards are proactive. They reduce the likelihood of occurrence. Countermeasures are reactive. They reduce the impact after occurrence. And there are definitely some risk management frameworks available for security practitioners to use as guides when they're designing a risk management program. And in the cloud computing arena, I'd suggest being familiar with these risk frameworks at minimum for the exam. We have ISO 31000, ENISA's Cloud Computing Risk Assessment, NIST 800-37, the Risk Management Framework, and another worth mentioning is NIST 800-146, the Cloud Computing Synopsis and Recommendation. This is not a dedicated risk management standard, but does mention the various risks and benefits associated with different deployment and service models. Let's go a bit deeper on these, starting with ISO 31000, which actually contains several standards related to building and running a risk management program. There's ISO 31000, Risk Management Guidelines, which provides the foundation of an organization's risk management function. You have IEC 31010, Risk Management Risk Assessment Techniques. It provides guidance on conducting a risk assessment. And ISO Guide 73, Risk Management Vocabulary, which provides a standard set of terminology used through the other documents, and it's useful for defining elements of the risk management program. Good for making sure everyone is speaking the same language, so to speak. And from NIST, we have NIST Special Publication 800-37, the Risk Management Framework. We have NIST Special Publication 800-146, Cloud Computing Synopsis and Recommendations, which provides definition of various cloud computing terms. And from ANISA, ANISA produces several useful resources related to cloud-specific risks that organizations should be aware of and plan for when they're designing cloud computing systems. The guide from ANISA identifies various categories of risks and recommendations for organizations to consider when evaluating cloud computing. And these include research recommendations to advance the field of cloud computing, legal risks, security risks. ANISA is a rough equivalent to the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology. ANISA is the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, so it's the European equivalent of NIST, more or less. Risk metrics are called out in the syllabus, and there are some key cybersecurity metrics that companies can track to present measurable data to company stakeholders. For example, patching levels. How many devices are fully patched and up to date? Unpatched devices often contain exploitable vulnerabilities. And Quarterly reports, I like to show not only our patching levels for devices, but to call out some little details, like the fact that we're patching firmware, for example, that we're patching our network devices, that we're patching not only the core operating system, our Microsoft software, but all of our third-party software. Time to deploy patches. How many devices received required patches in the divine time frames? This is a useful measure of how effective a patch management program is at reducing the risk of known vulnerabilities and getting some of those out of band emergency zero day type patches out the door quickly. 
Intrusion attempts. How many times have known actors tried to breach cloud systems? And how many of those attacks were effective in some way? Increased intrusion attempts can be an indicator of an increased likelihood of risk. And then some common acronyms. Mean time to detect, mean time to contain, and mean time to resolve. How long does it take for security teams to become aware of a potential security incident to contain the damage and resolve the incident? Inadequate tools or resources for reactive risk mitigation can also increase the impact of risks occurring. Cybersecurity metrics provide absolutely vital information for decision makers in the organization in prioritizing their treatment of risk and their need to evolve their strategy in particular areas. At the end of the day, cybersecurity metrics within expected parameters indicate risk mitigations are effective. Metrics that deviate from the expected parameters are no longer effective and should be reviewed. Assessment of risk environment is called out in the syllabus, and the cloud being a critical operating component for many organizations, it's very important to identify and understand the risks posed by the CSP, because the greater the dependency on the CSP, the greater the risk. We are handing over responsibility for elements of our compute environment, and with that, some level of control over our compute environment and our ability to respond and collect data in security incident circumstances. It's important to ask a number of questions when considering a cloud service, a vendor, or an infrastructure provider. For example, is the provider subject to takeover or acquisition? Are we going to see an ownership change that may result in a change to our contract terms? How financially stable is the provider? Will they be around for the long term? In what legal jurisdictions are the provider's offices located? In other words, what regulations and laws are we likely to be subjected to as a customer? Are there outstanding lawsuits against the provider that may affect their financial stability and their long-term presence? What pricing protections are in place for services we're contracting? How will a provider satisfy any regulatory or legal compliance requirements? Do they have those audit reports from third parties that give us that high level of assurance? And what does failover, backup, and recovery look like for the provider? Do they have regional support to give us that DR capability in a sustainable fashion? Designing a supply chain risk management program to assess CSP or vendor risks is a due diligence practice. Actually performing the assessment is an example of due care. Remember the customer organization is responsible and any organization that uses cloud services without adequately mitigating the risks is likely to be found negligent in a breach which is going to pose problems for the data controller. To guide their risk assessment process, customers can leverage ISO IEC 15408-1 also known as the common criteria. It enables an objective evaluation to validate that a particular product or system satisfies a defined set of security requirements. It assures customers that security products they purchase have been thoroughly tested by independent third-party testers and meet the customer's requirements. This certification of the product only certifies product capabilities. If it's misconfigured or mismanaged, software is no more secure than anything else the customer might use. So again, as with the CSP, a software company may put the capability there, but leave it up to the customer to properly configure. It's designed to provide assurances for security claims by vendors. The evaluation is often done through testing laboratories where the product or platform is evaluated against a standard set of criteria. The result is an evaluation assurance level which defines how robust the security capabilities are in the evaluated product. Most CSPs do not have common criteria evaluations over their entire environment, but many cloud-based products, SaaS products, may. It's up to the customer to review details of the common criteria assurances to make sure that the scope of the evaluation and the level of assurance meet their requirements. 
The Cloud Security Alliance offers up STAR, Security, Trust, Assurance, and Risk, which is their assurance framework. So when evaluating risks in a specific CSP or other cloud service, the STAR can be a useful lightweight method for ascertaining risks. It contains evaluations of cloud services against CSA's cloud controls matrix. Organizations can opt for self-assessed or third-party assessed cloud services. Now that will affect the level of assurance, whether it's low assurance in the case of self-assessment or high assurance in the case of third-party. Overall, CSA STAR is considered lightweight, lower assurance certification for the CSPs that use it. Another option is the EU Cybersecurity Certification Scheme on Cloud Services, or EUCS. So ANISA has published a standard for certifying the cybersecurity practices present in cloud environments. And that framework is the EUCS. It defines a set of evaluation criteria for various cloud service and deployment models. The goal is producing security evaluation results that allow comparison of the security posture across different cloud providers. This standard was still under development as of 2022, so adoption is not yet widespread. I would expect any coverage on the exam is also going to be similarly limited. And that does it for 6.4. So that brings us to 6.5, understand outsourcing and cloud contract design. So here we'll cover business requirements like SLAs, MSAs, and SOWs, vendor management, contract management, and the clauses that should be present in your contracts with CSPs and similar vendors, and supply chain management. And one thing these topics all share in common is that they pertain to customer dealings with third parties. So let's start with a quick look at third party risks. First, we have the supply chain, and supply chain security has become a significant concern for organizations in recent years. This includes suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, and even customers when we think downstream in the supply chain. And a breach at any link in the supply chain can result in business impact. And then there's vendor management. Many organizations today are actually reducing the number of vendors they work with and requiring stricter onboarding procedures. Every customer I work with has some sort of vendor self-assessment or survey so they can gather an initial round of data from a potential vendor to assess the risk they may pose to the organization. And vendors may be required to submit to an external audit and agree to strict communication and reporting requirements in the event of potential breach. Certainly when business critical infrastructure and services are involved, this is going to be true. A compromised vendor opens the organization to the risk of an island hopping attack, where a bad actor attacks the organization from the perch of a compromised vendor where they've established a presence. And then we have system integration. So system integration partners working on systems have privileged remote or physical access often, necessitating security measures and process controls beyond the norm. The potential for increased risk of insider attack is one of many concerns here. So you may simply think of systems integrators as IT consultants. So let's talk business requirements, specifically SLA, MSA, and SAO. So starting with the master service agreement. In legal terms, a cloud customer and a CSP enter into a master service agreement. This is defined as any contract that two or more parties enter into as a service agreement. And the MSA should address compliance and process requirements the customer is passing along to the CSP. The MSA should include breach notification, CSP duty to inform the customer of a breach within a specific period of time after detection. Legal counsel is most often responsible for contracts, but security should be involved to share requirements to ensure legal captures all of the necessary elements and concerns in the MSA and other contracts. Next, we have the Service Level Agreement, or SLA. So SLAs stipulate performance expectations, such as maximum downtime, and often include penalties if the vendor doesn't meet expectations. 
These are generally used with external vendors like the CSP, and an SLA is legally binding. More specifically, an SLA often includes financial penalties for non-performance and may even allow a customer to terminate their contract early. Let's go a level deeper on SLAs. So SLAs should be written to ensure that the organization's service level requirements are met, and we need to make sure that in the SLA we're defining recurring, discrete, measurable items that the parties agree on as a clear measure of whether the SLA has been met or not. Common elements documented in SLAs include uptime guarantees, SLA violation penalties, SLA violation penalty exclusions and limitations, so limiting the size of a penalty potentially, suspension of service clauses, provider liability, data protection and management, disaster recovery and recovery point objective, so RTO and RPO, security and privacy notifications, and time frames. Just as an audit can be too narrowly scoped to be useful to a customer, an SLA can similarly be too narrowly scoped to be useful to a customer when they need it. Remember, you're not only handing responsibility over to the CSP, you're handing over some elements of control. And contracts, including those around service levels, give back a level of control to the customer leverage of a fashion to ensure that the CSP meets their obligations or other vendor for that matter. So the statement of work. So this is a legal document usually created after an MSA has been executed and it governs a specific unit of work. The MSA may document services and prices, but a SAO covers requirements, expectations, and deliverables for a project. So in other words, the MSA focus is overall ongoing and a SAO is time limited and specific. A non-disclosure agreement. This is a contract with vendors and suppliers not to disclose the company's confidential information. A mutual NDA actually binds both parties in the agreement, and I do find those tend to be more common. Vendor management, also called out in the syllabus. Managing risk is complicated when parts of the organization's IT infrastructure exist outside the organization's direct control, as is the case in cloud computing. And the practices of supply chain risk management and vendor management overlap significantly. However, in many cases, vendor management will include more activities related to operational risks. Cloud computing involves outsourcing ongoing organizational processes and infrastructure to a service provider. Therefore, the cloud requires more continuous management activities to monitor and manage that vendor relationship. We're handling over a level of responsibility and a level of control that then requires continuous oversight on our part to manage our risk exposure. So cloud professionals also need strong project and people management skills to effectively perform vendor management activities. Key activities would be the initial vendor assessment, where security practitioners should be involved in that initial selection process, which involves assessing the security risks present in CSP and related services. For many customers, this process will entail reviewing security reports like a SOC 2 on an annual basis after the CSP has undergone their yearly audit, that indirect assessment through third-party audit documents. And we also need to assess vendor lock-in risks. This assessment will require knowledge of not only the CSP's offerings, but the architecture and strategy the customer organization intends to use. Using any unique CSP offerings, like artificial intelligence and machine learning platforms, can result in a service that is dependent on that specific CSP. We also need to assess vendor viability. This is often a process not conducted by the security team as it deals with operational risk rather than security risk. Assessing the viability of vendors may involve reviews of public information like financial statements, the CSP's performance history and reputation, or even formal reports like a SOC 1. A SOC 1 being a report that's more financially focused.
But all of these identify potential weaknesses that could impact the CSP's ability to continue operations. And then there are escrow options. So escrow is a legal term used when a trusted third party holds something on behalf of two or more other parties, such as source code or encryption keys. So let's just go through a common escrow scenario. A software development company may wish to protect the intellectual property of their source code. However, if they go out of business, their customers are left with an unmaintainable system, and customers want assurance. In this scenario, an escrow provider could hold a copy of the source code and release it to customers in the event the provider is no longer in business. Contract management is another concern. Organizations need to employ adequate governance structures to monitor contract terms and performance, to be aware of outages and any violation of stated agreements. And that's where contract clauses come into play. A contract clause is a specific article of related information that specifies the agreement between the contracting parties. Some common contract clauses that should be considered for any CSP or other data service provider include the right to audit, metrics, definitions, termination, litigation, assurance, compliance, and access to the cloud or to our cloud data. So let's go through these at another level of detail. So the right to audit. A customer can request the right to audit the service provider to ensure compliance with the security requirements agreed to in the contract. Many of your CSPs write into their contract that you can rely on their standard third-party audits, their SOC 2, their ISO 27001 certification to be used in place of a customer-performed audit, so an indirect uh, but high assurance. Metrics. If there are any specific indicators that the service provider must provide to the customer, they can be documented in a contract and should be. Metrics tell you how compliance with the agreement will be measured. Definitions. So a contract is a legal agreement between multiple parties. Essential that all parties share a common understanding of the terms and expectations in that contract. Defining key terms like security, privacy, key practices, breach notifications can all avoid misunderstandings when problems arise. Termination. So this refers to ending the contractual agreement. This clause will typically define conditions under which either party may terminate the contract. It may also specify consequences if the contract is terminated early. Litigation. This is an area where legal counsel really must be consulted. It's agreeing to terms for litigation and can severely restrict the organization's ability to pursue damages if something goes wrong. Some contracts, for example, will mandate arbitration before litigation. Assurance. So this is defining assurance, and these requirements set expectations for both the provider and the customer. Many contracts specify that a provider must furnish a SOC 2 or equivalent to the customer on an annual basis as that level of assurance. Then there's compliance. So any customer compliance requirements that flow to the provider must be documented and agreed upon in the contract. Data controllers that use cloud providers as data processors have to ensure that adequate security safeguards are available for that data in the cloud. Access to the cloud or data. So clauses dealing with customer access can be used to avoid risks often associated with vendor lock-in. In the vein of contract management, you'll want to be familiar with cyber risk insurance. So cyber risk insurance is designed to help an organization reduce the financial impact of risk by transferring it to an insurance carrier. In the event of a security incident, the insurance carrier can help offset associated costs like digital forensics and investigation, data recovery, system restoration. They may even cover legal or regulatory fines associated with the incident though that extra coverage you can bet will be reflected in the insurance premiums. Cyber insurance carriers are in the business of risk management, and as a result, they're unlikely to offer coverage to an organization lacking controls to mitigate risk. 
In fact, most will have specific requirements in terms of security controls they expect to be in place, language they expect to be in your contracts. And cyber insurance requires the organizations to pay a premium for the insurance plan, so they have to keep those premium payments up to date. And most plans will have a limit of coverage that caps how much the insurance carrier pays. In fact, there may also be sublimits which cap the amount that will be paid for specific types of incidents such as ransomware or phishing. An insurance broker can be a useful resource when investigating insurance options for your organization circumstances, including identifying the amount of coverage the organization needs, different types of coverage that are available such as business interruption or cyber extortion, security controls, that the insurance carrier requires, such as multi-factor authentication, for example. Now, cyber risk insurance usually covers costs associated with investigation, direct business losses, recovery costs, legal notifications, lawsuits, extortion, and even food and related expenses. So let's dig into these clauses that we'd see in a typical cyber risk insurance contract. So investigation, these are costs associated with the forensic investigation to determine the extent of an incident. This often includes cost for third-party investigators. And at least one of the cyber risk insurers that I work with requires that they are the first point of contact when an incident is detected. And they help manage the process, including the required communication. Direct business losses. These refer to direct monetary losses associated with downtime or data recovery, overtime for employees, and oftentimes reputational damages to the organization. Recovery costs. These may include costs associated with replacing hardware or provisioning temporary cloud environments during contingency operations. They may also include services like forensic data recovery or negotiations with attackers to assist in recovery. Legal notifications. So costs are associated with required privacy and breach notifications required by relevant laws. And lawsuits. Policies can be written to cover losses and payouts due to class action or other lawsuits against a company after a cyber incident. The insurance company may pay out ransomware demands. And this Extortion clause is growing in popularity. This may include direct payments to ensure data privacy or accessibility by the company. We don't like to encourage payout of ransom demands as a practice, but that extortion option is available. Food and related expenses. This is pretty simple, actually. Incidents often require employees to work extended hours or to travel to contingency sites. So these are just costs associated with incident response, including catering, lodging, and it may be covered even though they're not usually thought of as IT costs. And to wrap up 6.5, let's talk about supply chain management. The managing risk in the supply chain focuses on both operational risks, which ensures that suppliers are capable of providing the needed services, and security risks. The supply chain should always be considered in any business continuity or disaster recovery planning. And proactive measures include contract language and assurance processes that can be used to quantify the risks associated with using suppliers like CSPs, as well as to gauge the effectiveness of these suppliers' risk management programs. So there are some standards we can lean on here. There's ISO IEC 27036, which is cybersecurity supplier relationships. The ISO 27000 family of standards includes a specific ISO standard dedicated to supply chain cybersecurity risk management, and that is 27036. It provides a set of practices and guidance for managing cybersecurity risks in supplier relationships. The standard is particularly useful for organizations that use ISO 27001 for building an ISMS, or ISO 31000 for risk management. They're building on the concepts found in those standards in ISO IEC 27036. And ISO 27036 is comprised of four parts, including overview and concepts, requirements, 
Guidelines for Information and Communication Technology Supply Chain Security, and Guidelines for Security of Cloud Services. So we see cloud services get specific mention here. And ISO 27036, like the other ISO standards, is not a free resource. There's generally a cost associated with getting your hands on that document. So let's look at the four parts, beginning with overview and concepts, which provides an overview and foundation for a supply chain management capability. Part two covers a set of best practices and techniques for designing and implementing the supply chain management function. Part three is of particular concern for security practitioners as it lays out practices and techniques specific to managing security risks in the supply chain. And part four, which is most relevant to cloud security practitioners in particular. This standard deals with practices and requirements for managing supply chain security risk specific to cloud computing and the CSP. And some additional resources worth a mention when we're talking about supply chain. There's NIST IR 8276, which is Key Practices in Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management. NIST 800-161, which is Cybersecurity Supply Chain Risk Management Practices for Systems and Organizations, and the ANISA publication Supply Chain Integrity, an overview of the ICT Supply Chain Risks and Challenges, and Vision for the Way Forward that was published back in 2015. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the CCSP exam cram. I hope you've gotten value from the course. If you have any questions as you make your final preparations for the exam, leave a question in the comments or reach out on LinkedIn chat. And until next time, take care and stay safe.